The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. The si- the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you. With new Signal Gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The Strange Sisters. The three Randall girls were as different from each other as day and night. Even the people of Newton who had watched them grow up found it hard to accept the fact that they were sisters. Pamela, the eldest, was forceful and overbearing, heavy-set and unattractive. Kathy, the youngest, was a weakling. Life was a little too complicated for her, and she found the easiest solution was to let Pamela face it, to bring her problems to Pamela, to listen meekly to Pamela's instructions and then to quietly obey. Yes, Pamela and Kathy were two extremes. And Sally, the third sister, was in the middle, both in age and temperament. The combination of Pamela's strength and Kathy's frailty had produced in Sally a kind of radiance that had made life easy for her, that had made her sure of success where her sisters had failed. And the more she succeeded, the harder it became for Pamela and Kathy to face it, Until one morning, Mrs. Stokes, the housekeeper, called Kathy for breakfast. There was no answer. Miss Kathy, your breakfast is on the table. Oh, that girl takes a team of horses to get her out of bed. Miss Kathy! Your breakfast is ready, young lady, and I ain't going to keep it warm for you another moment. Miss Kathy, answer me. I know you're... Good Lord. Locked. Now, my key. Here. Miss Kathy, what are you... (coughs) Gas. The heater. Oh, where's the handle? (coughs) There. Miss Pamela! Miss Pamela, come up quick! The window. (coughs) There. Miss Pam! What's the matter? What's the matter with you? It's it's Kathy. She's... Oh, Miss Pamela. Yes. Uh, Miss Kathy... Miss Kathy. Here, here like me. Yes. Kathy. Kathy, dear. Yes. Let me see. Her pulse. Mm. Oh, she's alive. Call Dr. Johnson quickly. Do you think she... Don't stand there like an idiot. Call the doctor. Yes, Miss Pamela. Right away. Hello, Pamela. Well, it's nice of you to leave your work, Sally. That's a peculiar remark to make. I think it's apropos of the moment. I don't. As usual, I suppose we disagree. Well, where is she? In there with Dr. Johnson. Will she be all right? I don't know yet. Well, I'm going in and... Wait a minute. You're not going in there. You can't stop me, Pamela. I've got a right to know. And since you didn't choose to tell me over the phone, I'll find out for myself. I said wait. Kathy is my sister too, Pamela. She doesn't belong to you. You've had her under your thumb for so long, the poor girl can't even think for herself. All right, go on in if you want to kill her. What do you mean by that? I've managed to convince Dr. Johnson it was an accident. It was an accident. She left the gas heater on and... You've never been very clever, Sally. Kathy tried to kill herself. You're wrong. You're making it up. She didn't have a reason. I admit it wasn't a very good reason. But it's been used a thousand times. Go on. It's a man, Sally. And a rather shabby specimen at that. She was in love? Yes. How long has it been going on? Six months or more. You're sure? Of course I'm sure. Who is it, Pamela? Your fiancé. Henry? Why? Oh, you're wrong. You must be wrong. 
He never gave her any reason. He's, he's hardly even spoken to her. You asked me and I told you. Pamela, where did Kathy get the idea that Henry French was in love with her? Tell me, Pamela. Where did it come from? I don't know. You stepped into that part of her life too, didn't you? Answer me. Oh, come now, Sally. Don't distort that pretty finishing school face of yours. It's your biggest asset, you know. It's gotten you everything you ever wanted. There's no end to what it can do. How can you be so contemptible? Maybe I was wrong. Maybe you are clever. Insinuating your way into father's confidence. Bowing and scraping. Playing the faithful daughter when he was ill. That's why father left everything to you when he died. Fifty thousand dollars and two sisters to provide for. If and when you felt like it. We're your favorite charity, aren't we? That's part of the act, too. Lady Bountiful. I've heard all I want to hear, Pamela. Very well, perhaps you'd better go. I'm going to see Kathy whether you like it or not. You see, I was wrong. I'm admitting it. Oh? I was wrong in leaving you and Kathy under the same roof. I just hope it isn't too late to do anything about it. Perhaps you're forgetting it's my roof, too. As long as I choose to let you stay here, Pamela. Funny, isn't it, Pamela? You try to be fair. You try to do the right thing, and it all blows up in your face. Well, Dr. Johnson? I think she's going to be all right. May I see her, Doctor? Uh, she asked for Pamela. Oh, well, I'm sure if she knows I'm here. Uh, perhaps you'd better wait, Sally. She was rather specific. What do you mean, specific? She doesn't want to see you, Sally. Oh, I'll go in, Doctor. Are you going to wait, Sally? No. I'll go. I left her prescription on the dresser, Pamela. Three drops and half a glass of water every four hours. Uh, may I drop you off somewhere, Sally? Oh, thank you, Doctor. Kathy? Kathy, are you all right? No. No, I'm not all right. I'll never be all right anymore. You mustn't feel that way, dear. I made a mess of this, too. I never do things right, do I, Pam? What will... What will Henry think of me now? They only know what I told them, Kathy. They think it was an accident. Don't worry about Henry, dear. You must have been wrong, Pam. He doesn't love me. He couldn't. He would have told me. He wouldn't have just gone off with Sally. Well, maybe you'll believe me now, Kathy. She's capable of anything. She owns it all now. The house, the money, and now Henry French. Don't you see, Kathy? He was the only thing she didn't have. He was yours. And she made up her mind she wanted him to. He never told me. Of course me. he didn't. Sally never gave him a chance. I hate her. It's awful, Pam, but I can't help it. I hate her. So do I. What can we do? Well, well, maybe you'd better rest a while now. No, no. Now tell me, Pam. What are we going to do? There's a way. Yes, there is a way. What? Kathy. Kathy, we're going to kill her. <laughs> With the prologue of tonight's story, The Strange Sisters, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. You've no doubt noticed those big red and yellow billboards that tell you you now go farther than ever with new Signal gasoline. Well, that's important. But unfortunately, there isn't room on those billboards to tell the equally important part of the story, the finer performance in new Signal gasoline that makes this good mileage possible. Now, here's what I mean. New Signal's quicker starting naturally saves gas. Signal's smooth, fast pickup saves gas. And Signal's effortless anti-knock power that sends your motor purring up the steepest hills saves gas. So you see, the features in gasoline that make driving a pleasure are the very same ones that add up to more mileage. That's why we say your speedometer is the best proof of gasoline quality. If you want the tops in performance from your car, the logical place to find it is the new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever. New Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. Oh, 
Well, Pamela, jealousy can do strange things to a mind like yours, can't it? And it's a peculiar mind, filled to the bursting point with frustrated black hatred for your sister Sally, accumulated during the long years the three of you spent under the same roof with your father. She always had everything, didn't she? You and Kathy had to take what was left and like it. Yes, Pamela, that jealous hatred has brought you to the point where you'll stop at nothing. Lying, cheating, twisting the truth in such a way that your poor gullible sister Kathy believes the very existence of Sally condemns her to begging for crumbs at Sally's table when the bread is rightfully hers. And you've thought of everything, haven't you, Pamela? You're confident that Kathy is prepared for the talk with Sally that's bound to come sooner or later. But, Kathy, I know I'm right about Pamela. Why must you always talk about Pamela? Pamela did this if it wasn't for Pamela. Oh, stop it, will you? I tell you, Pamela is the only one in the world I can turn to. Please, Kathy, please believe me, you're wrong. I'm not wrong. You are, dear. She's filled your mind with all sorts of hateful lies about me and Henry. Why do you keep throwing that in my face? Henry, Henry, Henry! He's yours now, isn't he? You've got him. You were smart. Just like she said. All right, take him. Marry him, I don't care. Doesn't make any difference now. Kathy, apparently there's nothing I can do or say that will make any difference in the way you feel. I promised Father I'd take care of you. Well, I'm leaving you the house and all the furniture. And I'm making arrangements for a trust fund that'll provide for you both. That's charitable of you. Under the circumstances, I think it is. I'll expect you and Pamela to be civil to Henry until we leave. Is that clear? Is he coming here? Yes. To live? Yes, for a week or so. I don't understand. It's very simple. We're going to be married tonight. Yes, Pamela. Kathy was prepared, wasn't she? Sally was right. Nothing she could do or say would make any difference. Because Kathy is yours, isn't she? For too many years, she's depended on you for guidance, looked to you for advice, regarded everything you said as truth and everything else false. Yes, jealousy is a strange thing, Pamela. It's been there, deep inside you, for as long as you can remember. And it was convenient for you to find a cause for it. Sally and your father, the legacy, the house, the money... But that's gone now, isn't it, Pamela? Sally's been pretty fair about it. She and Henry are married now, and you have the house and your share of the money. That's what's strange about jealousy. The cause is gone, but it's still there, stronger than ever. And with it, your plan for murder. Did you get the key to their room for Mrs. Stokes? Yes. I... Here it is. She doesn't know you have it. No, she's gone to the store. I took it off the hook. Give it to me. What are you going to do? Just look around a little. Why? Henry's things are up there. He brought them in last night before they left. Well, I'm just curious, Kathy. Just curious. All right, Kathy, you can put the key back now. Did you find anything? Yes, several things. What? Kathy, I'll do the shopping tomorrow. Shopping? Pam, you never do... I'll tell you later. It seems Mr. French is a vicious man, Kathy. Perhaps you're just as well rid of him. Vicious? Of course. He must be, dear. Otherwise, why would he keep a loaded revolver in the upper drawer of his dresser? Miss Pamela, what are you doing around here? Why, well, you ain't been in the store for six months now. Oh, I thought the walk might do me good. Well, what'll it be? A small rolled roast, please. About three pounds, perhaps. I got just the thing for you here. You ain't looking too well, if you don't mind my saying so. Something wrong? No, nothing. Oh. Yeah. Will this do? Yes, that'll be fine. It's kind of small. Oh, it'll do, Mr. Watkins. You see, Kathy and I haven't been too well lately. Uh, I, I thought so. Now, come on. What's up? I... Oh, I know I shouldn't say anything, but 
I've got to talk to someone, Mr. Watkins. Gosh, is it that bad? I don't know. It's Sally and that husband of hers. Oh, you don't say. Oh, they've been quarreling dreadfully. It's been going on all morning, and I just had to get away from it somehow. It was only married night before last. You, you won't say anything, will you, Mr. Watkins? Promise me. Oh, sure, sure. Well, it's about the estate. Sally told him she was going to deed part of it to Kathy and me. And he flew into the most dreadful fit of temper. I could hardly believe my eyes. Uh, here's your sugar, Miss Pamela. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. I'm uh, I'm sure sorry about that. You you won't say anything, will you? Me? Oh, no, no. Ain't there anything you can do? Let's see now. You wanted a shampoo and a finger wave, Miss Pamela. Yes. Gosh, you know, I can hardly get my mind on my work after what you told me. Well, you... You won't say anything, will you? Oh, of course not, Miss Pamela. Not a word. You're very efficient, aren't you, Pamela? The town of Newton is like a smooth pond. All you have to do is cast a few pebbles here and there, and the ripples spread over the whole surface, clear to the edges. There's another step now, a very important one. Sally is hostile and suspicious, and you're going to need her confidence. Who is it? Pamela. Well, Pamela, may I come in? Must you? Please don't make it difficult for me, Sally. I don't understand. I have something to tell you. I'd like to come in and sit down if you don't mind. All right, Pamela. Now, I... Well, I've been doing a lot of thinking, Sally, and, and I haven't slept much. Not since you told us about the house and, and the money. Yes, it was so unexpected, I... Well, you see, it threw me a little off balance. What and are you I'm, trying to say? Well, you know me so well, Sally. The past few years have been hard, and I know I've been unreasonable and difficult. Pamela, you're trying to say you're sorry, aren't you? Oh, I... I'm so clumsy at this sort of thing. I, oh, I do so want to have you and Henry forgive me. Oh, my dear. I really believe you mean it. I do, Sally. I do mean it. And I'm going to try to make Kathy understand, too. You're right, Sally. I, I've been such a terrible influence on the poor thing. Oh, Pam, darling. I'm so happy that it's working out. Oh, Sally, I... Come on, now. Let's forget all about it. I'm sure Henry will understand. It's odd, isn't it? I had the feeling underneath that somehow it would work out. I just knew it, Pam. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. Now, you go on downstairs and tell Kathy. I've got to finish the packing. Packing? Well, but, but you're not leaving until the end of the week. Henry has to make a business trip to New York. Some things he has to settle up before we leave. When's he going? Tonight. He's leaving at nine. Oh, that reminds me. I must call the cab. He said to be sure to have it here for him promptly at nine. Now, you run down and tell Kathy it's all cleared up, will you? Oh, of course, Sally. Of course. That's what I get for avoiding them. How could I have been so stupid? Oh, it's all right, Pam. Henry will be back. Oh, don't be ridiculous. He's leaving for New York tonight, and they're taking the steamer from there in four days. No, Kathy. He's not coming back. He'll send for her and she'll meet him there. But isn't there some way? There's only one way. It's got to happen tonight. Oh, oh I'm scared. Pam, maybe... Oh, stop gibbering, Kathy. The town is ready for it and it's going to happen. Henry French is going to shoot his wife in a fit of temper and try to leave the country. Pam, Pam, the gun. How are we going to get the gun? You see, we can't do it. We can't do it without the gun. And, and, it, and it's in his dresser and, and she's up I there. I said stop gibbering. I've got to think... Turn on the light. It's getting dark in here. Yes, Pam. There. Light. Yes. The light. That's it. The light. What is it, Pam? The basement. Kathy, the fuse box is in the basement. In the furnace room. The fuse box. You'll get here about six. I'll go down in the basement and unscrew a fuse. The lights will go out. You know, Henry, he'll trot down to the basement to fix it. What about Sally? I'll wait till she's downstairs. 
You'll be on the second floor in a room at the end of the corridor. And then when he leaves, you can go into the room and get the gun. You can see it pretty clearly now, can't you, Pamela? The People versus Henry French. The charge murder. It's easy to think there in the basement as you wait in a dark corner after you unscrew the fuse and listen to the confusion upstairs as they stumble around in the dark. Then, as an afterthought, you find an old blown-out fuse on the shelf and screw it into place, just in case Henry might wonder how a perfectly good one could come unscrewed by itself. Then, when it's over, you return secretly to your room at the end of the second-floor corridor. Did you get it? Yes, here it is. I wore my gloves, Pam, just as you told me. All right, now listen. We haven't much time. He's down there now, waiting for the taxi. Have you got your watch on? Yes. Now, let's see. Ah, luminous dial, that's good. Now, listen carefully. The taxi is calling promptly at 9 o'clock. Understand, it's going to happen shortly after he leaves. About 5 past 9. Who's going to do it? You are. Oh, Pam. You've got to. I'll have to be upstairs. You'll be in the basement. Henry will leave in the taxi at 9, and I'll get Sally up on the second floor on some pretext. At 5 past 9, I'll scream that you've fallen down the basement stairs. She'll run down. Uh, yeah. Yes, Pam. I understand. Now, remember, not until after nine o'clock. We've got to be sure Henry is gone. All right, Pam. I'll look at my watch. I promise. Good. Now, you'd better get down there. It would be rude of me not to be there to say goodbye to him. So the time has come, hasn't it, Pamela? Forty years of pent-up hatred is about to find release at last. For the first time in your life, you're actually cordial to Henry as you make small talk with him in the entrance hallway. And you feel a glow of satisfaction as you watch him carry his bags to the waiting taxi. Then, just as you begin to wonder why Sally isn't there to see him off, you hear a foot on the stair and your heart stops. Sally. What's the matter? Why, the... The suitcase... You're in traveling clothes. Well, what's the matter with that? You're going to? Oh, that's it. <laughs> I guess I'm not used to having you concerned about me, Pam. As a matter of fact, we decided just five minutes ago, I convinced Henry that walking out on his wife after four days of marriage was a pretty dirty trick. <laughs> yes, dear, I'm coming. Well, goodbye, Pamela. I'll wire you if we decide not to come back. Sally, you... You can't... What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing, Sally. You watch unbelieving as she walks down the steps to the taxi cab. It failed, didn't it? Just like everything else you ever tried. Sally succeeded and you failed. There's a lump in your throat. You're all choked up with disappointment and bitter, corrosive hatred. Then suddenly, you realize there is another way. You've got to get to Kathy and tell her. You glance at the clock, 8.45. It's still safe. Then over to the basement door. Kathy! Kathy! Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to tell you about an interesting experiment I witnessed the other day. An automobile motor that had been driven 35,000 miles without taking the head off was being torn down for inspection. Ordinarily, you'd expect to find a good deal of carbon in the cylinder head and worn motor parts. But this motor was remarkably clean, free of carbon, and all parts were in excellent condition. Now, the thing which makes these results so interesting is that this motor was lubricated only with Signal 4-Star motor oil. A signal engineer who was present, however, explained to me why Signal 4-Star oil takes such good care of motors. Because of solvent refining, one of the latest and most costly developments in petroleum engineering, Signal 4-Star motor oil has three important advantages. 
One, forms less carbon, far less by actual test than many leading brands. Two, its tougher film clings to moving parts, protecting them from wear and sealing in power. And three, Signal Four Star Oil flows freely, instantly on coldest mornings, yet doesn't thin out when your motor is hot. In these days when motors have to last and last, your motor needs this triple protection. You can get it by making your next oil change a change to the better. A change to Signal Four Star Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. So it didn't work out, Pamela. You're a failure even in death. And without you, Cassie is lost. She's helpless now, cringing before the sharp questions the officers throw at her, trying futilely to lie her way out of a hopeless trap. And Sally stands there, unbelieving, as the hatred, the jealousies come to the surface for all the world to see. More questions, more stumbling answers, then still more and more, until finally... All right, we did it! We planned to kill her! <laughs> Leave me alone! Take her away, Joe. Well, there you are, Mrs. French. I... I can't believe it. It's so fantastic. Yeah, it is at that. They knew Mr. French was leaving at nine. Planned to kill you with his gun. In the dresser drawer. That's where he kept it. Pamela was smart, Mrs. French. But she forgot one thing. The clock on the wall read 845. So she figured it was safe to open the basement door where Kathy was waiting to kill you. She forgot it was an electric clock. When she pulled the fuse down there and cut out the current, the clock lost 18 minutes. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program, produced by George W. Allen, based on a story by Bernard Girard and Zane Mann, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign 
that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Three Times a Sinner. Lydia Hunter stood alone in the kitchen, watching the coffee bubble in the electric percolator. She knew Gerald would want his coffee when it was over. He always did when anything excited him. And she reasoned quite correctly that nothing excites a man more than being told by his doctor that he's going to die. The attack had come in the early evening while Gerald was seated at the organ playing a Bach fugue. The music had suddenly stopped. She'd run from the library into the study to find him unconscious on the floor. She'd called Dr. Farmer and then had made Gerald as comfortable as possible until the doctor arrived. Everything Gerald could expect from his dutiful wife. She stared down at the coffee bubbling in the glass top of the percolator, waiting. Then... That was just like him. The examination was over and he was back at the organ again. She filled his coffee cup and hurried to the study. There you are, Lydia. Just in time to celebrate Dr. Farmer's prophecy of my death. Oh, and coffee. My obedient wife is bringing me my coffee. No coffee for me, thanks, Lydia. I must be going now. But it's raining, Doctor. You see, Richard, I've implied to my wife that I'm dying, and she immediately goes into a report of prevailing weather conditions. Tell me, Doctor. Is Gerald just being dramatic, or is there something seriously wrong? Gerald is a sick man, Lydia. And I don't recommend too much of that coffee. Oh, nonsense. Coffee's my mainstay. Then it's true. Oh, Gerald. Oh, Gerald. Oh, come, come, Lydia. <laughs> Try those crocodile tears. They stain your makeup. Furthermore, you know you're deliriously happy. Why, just think, I can slip off at any moment now. Don't talk like that, Gerald. It may take years, old man, if you take things easy. Cut out drinking and smoking entirely, of course. Well, I've got to be running along now. I'll see you to the door, Doctor. Oh, really, Lydia? Don't you think you can find it after all these months? We don't keep changing around, you know. Good night, Gerald. Remember, you have as many years as you want. It's up to you. Of course, Doctor. It really is serious, Richard. Nothing to be alarmed about. No vigorous schedule or anything like that, though. He can't bear a quiet routine. He'll have to, poor beggar. You sound sorry for it. I am. And I wish you could make your pity sound more convincing, Lydia. Oh, he never believes me anyway. He's always been like that. Look at the rain. Yes. When am I going to see you again? Soon. That's all? Just soon? He's suspicious enough as it is. He's bitter and hurt. You've disappointed him as a wife... Perhaps through no fault of your own, but he is disappointed and bitter. Oh. That can make a man unscrupulous. So be careful. I don't understand. I won't say any more, Lydia. Just be careful and be honest with him. Take good care of him. He needs you, and you owe it to him. Good night. Good night, Richard. Richard. Yes? I love you. Oh. Yes, Mrs. Hunter. I didn't know you were here, Martha. Where are you going? Mr. Hunter told me I might go, ma'am. Well, I'd rather you stayed a while. Made him say that. I don't know, ma'am. I'd better see him. Well, Lydia, that was a long farewell. Why did you tell Martha to leave for the night? Is it difficult for you to understand that I might like to be alone with you? But surely, Martha... Martha has a perceptive eye and a very sharp ear, Lydia. You'd be shocked at the things she knows. Interesting creature, Martha. She has a sort of uh, feudal loyalty to the master of the house. You haven't drunk your coffee, Gerald. Lydia, since you and I are not even friends any longer, would you consent to a divorce? Leave you now. After Richard's diagnosis tonight? That was important to you, wasn't it? Why, of course. It was important because now you know that soon, perhaps even tonight... You'll be a wealthy widow, free to marry again. Gerald, must we go on talking like this? No, not at all, my dear. But I know that you're awaiting my death. Oh. That makes me feel as though I were loitering. 
I don't want to borrow time, a few weeks, a few months. I don't want to borrow your affection, kisses you don't mean, a few soft words of phony solicitude. Oh, really, Gerald? I don't see why I have to I don't want to borrow listen. anything, my dear. And I have a way. Gerald, where did you get that bottle? It's marked poison. Yes, it's quite a coincidence. It is poison. What are you going to do? You mean, what have I already done? As you see, there's precisely half a bottle. While you're gone, I pour the other half of my coffee. I'll never taste it. It's supposed to be like adding sugar. All I have to do is lift it to my lips like this and... <laughs> ah, I was hoping you'd stop me. You realize what will happen if I drink this, yet you stand there watching, letting your little dreams multiply. Well, I won't disappoint you, my dear. I shall drink it. Like that. And sail off happily on a requiem of Bach. Yes, a requiem, Lydia. Appropriate for the occasion. Tested in the crucible of time. You can hardly believe it, can you, Lydia? Here it is, happening before your very eyes. You hardly know what to think. All you can do is stand there, speechless, staring at him as he plays on and on. And then... It's happened. At long last, all those wretched years are over and he lies there slumped across the keys. You stifle an impulse to laugh. You've got to be shocked, Lydia. You've got to call Martha and go through with it. Martha! Martha, come quickly! What's the matter? Something has happened to Mr. Hunter. Is he ill? Oh, I'm afraid it's more than that. He's dead. I know it. <laughs> please, please, Martha. You've got to get hold of yourself. So soon. The doctor no sooner told him. Please, Martha. Please, please, please. come on. <laughs> Gerald! Mr. Hunter! Oh, Mr. Hunter! <laughs> oh, here they are. My servant and my bride. My servant weeps bitter tears over my corpse, but my wife, oh, hers have been lost. The woman who does not blush also does not cry. <laughs> my dear, you have disgraced your sex. With the prologue of Three Times a Sinner, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. Today being April 1st, I'd like to bring you this timely warning. April showers bring May flowers, but they also bring accidents. Here's what I mean. Of the deaths caused by autos, one out of five occur when roads are wet or slippery. One out of five when driver's vision is obscured. Fortunately, precautions can be taken to help prevent these two types of accidents. For instance, tires that are worn smooth tend to skid more readily. But a deep, heavy retread job, the kind signal gasoline dealers are prepared to give your tires, will restore their grip on the road, help you stop more quickly. And if a worn windshield wiper is leaving streaks across your vision, signal gasoline dealers will install a fine new Rainmaster blade while you wait. So next time you're at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers, have your tire tread and your windshield wiper checked. You'll feel a lot better knowing your car is prepared for any kind of weather. And it may help save a life. Possibly your own. And now, back to the whistler. Gerald had his little joke, didn't he, Lydia? Watching you out of the corner of his eyes, he slowly raised the cup of coffee to his lips, putting it down for a moment to tantalize you a little more, raising it again, chuckling to himself when you couldn't keep the eagerness from showing in your face. Yes, Lydia, it was Gerald's little joke. He's made a fool of you, hasn't he? Forced you to show your hand, to come right out and tell him you want him to die. The next morning at breakfast, you're tense and silent, watching Gerald munch happily on his buttered toast as he reads the morning paper. Uh, have some more coffee, Lydia, darling? No. Oh, come now, dear. It's perfectly all right. <laughs> Made it myself. 
Not a drop of poison in it. Will you be quiet? <laughs> oh, Lydia, Lydia. You're such a comfort to me in my last hours. The beautiful, dutiful wife offering peace and consolation to her lord and master in his declining days, giving freely of her strength. I've had all I can stand, Gerald. Now that's enough. Very well, my dear. There's a half bottle of poison on the shelf in the medicine cabinet. Oh, here. Let me butter you a piece of toast. I'm not hungry. When are you going to kill me, my dear? Oh, uh, pass me the marmalade, will you? Thank you. Gerald, why did you do it? You, um, didn't answer my question. When are you going to kill me? I... I can't stand this any longer! Sit down, Lydia. There. That's better. <laughs> I'm very happy about last night, you know. Yes, it brings things right out into the open. I've known for years that the only thing you wanted was my money. Awfully good marmalade, won't you have some? What did you do with a half bottle of poison that's missing, Gerald? I poured it into the fireplace. Still half left, though. Ought to do the job quite nicely. I signed for it at the pharmacy myself, if you're wondering. Told them it was for the moths. Oh, you see? It's all ready for you, Lydia. Any time you feel in the mood. What do you want me to say, Gerald? Well, nothing, Lydia. Very well. I'll go. Where? I have an appointment at the hairdresser's. Oh, um, Lydia. Yes? Give Dr. Farmer my regards, will you? I tell you, Gerald was tempting you, Lydia. But why, Richard? I don't see... By pretending to be dead, he gave you five minutes of being a widow. He wanted you to enjoy that feeling... At the same time, he's shown you how simple it would be to kill him. Practically put poison in your hands. Now he wants you to kill him with it. He wants to die, don't you see? No, I don't. It's very simple. He wants that death on your hands so you'll die with him. Oh, I can't believe that. Not even of him. You'll hang on until you're desperate. But be careful. Don't let him trick you into it. Into what, Rich? Murder, darling. Murder. So you go home, Lydia, and determine to wait him out. He can't last long. There's no point in thinking about it anymore. Time will take care of everything. Get your mind off it, Lydia. Don't think murder, about it darling. anymore. Murder. Murder, darling. Murder. The words keep murder, coming back darling. like the thought of a murder. new toy to a child. And you can't surrender like a child and turn to thoughts of other new toys. Murder is the only toy you want, isn't it, Lydia? As the days pass, it keeps returning unconsciously. The bottle on the shelf in the medicine cabinet, half full. Bought in Gerald's name, flaunting murder. its power at you every murder. day. Murder, darling. Murder. And finally, the night comes when you can't resist it any longer. You go into the medicine cabinet and take the bottle, hold it tightly in the palm of your hand, and walk back into the kitchen. When the coffee's done, you pour a cup and add the contents of the dark little bottle. Uh, no sugar, Lydia. Gerald has told you the poison is sweet. Now, a little cream. That's it. You're ready now. The bottle is in your pocket, empty. You're ready for Gerald playing on the organ in the library. Ah. Well, Lydia, is that really my coffee or some silly substitute? It's coffee, dear. You haven't had any in such a long time now. I'm sure Richard couldn't object. Oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> By George, I wonder if I'll recognize the taste. Of course you will. You know... What? I don't think I have a taste for it anymore. Oh, not that. The moment after your first sip, you'll be clamoring for more. Habit's funny, though. Once you've broken it, it's lost. Friendship, marriage, coffee. All the same. Oh, aren't you joining me? No, Gerald, I... I've been too nervous lately. Mind if I go ahead? Please do. What's uh, making you so nervous? Well, I, I don't know, Gerald. The past few weeks have been rather strange. Mm -hmm. Maybe the awful weather, eh? Well, cheer up, my dear. Spring's on the way. 
Your spirits can improve overnight, eh? I... I suppose so. Well, here goes. Good Lord, woman, what are you trying to do, kill me? Kill you? What are you talking about? Well, this is hot, Liddy, it's hot. Oh. Shall I cool it down for you? No, no. Oh, no. What's the trouble? Oh, it's my heart again. It's acting up tonight. Coffee might be bad for it anyway. Shall I call Dr. Farmer? Oh, don't be so anxious. I just better let this cool for a while. Gerald. Huh? Your coffee's getting cold. Oh, oh yes. I forgot all about it. I say. Now, what is it? This is sweet. You sure you haven't put too much sugar in it? It's just your imagination. Hmm. I suppose. That does taste good. Now, my dear. Yes? You may put the empty bottle on the organ. What? That will make it look like suicide. If they don't find the bottle by my side, you'll be suspected of murder. Go on, put the bottle on the organ. I'm going to play for a while as I wait for it. So you know. And you're not at all embarrassed. Not the faintest sign of a womanly blush. <laughs> you're the worst kind of sinner there is, a deliberate one. You sinned when you married me for my money. You sinned when I tried to commit suicide and you didn't attempt to stop me. And now you've sinned again because you tried to kill me. <laughs> Do you honestly think, my dear, that anyone three times a sinner can escape punishment? In a few moments, you'll be dead, Gerald. Perhaps. What do you mean? The sweetness of the coffee betrayed you, my dear. I knew when I first tasted it, it was poison. But you drank it anyway. It is suicide, Gerald. You knew all the time. Oh, you foolish woman. <laughs> did you think that, that was poison I'd left so conveniently in the medicine chest? Well, of course I did. Martha emptied the bottle weeks ago. I told her to replace the contents with syrup to see if you'd chance another attempt on my life. Well, you came through very nicely, my dear. <laughs> well, Lydia, he's trapped you again. But why? Why, Lydia? He wants you to die for his murder. You're sure of that. He wants to let you go through all the motions time and again, only to be frustrated at the last moment. He wants to build you slowly into a rage that will lead you to a crime of violence and a sure conviction. It's clear now, isn't it? Somehow you manage to keep calm, to appear unconcerned as he sits there, playing on that infernal organ. You, uh... You don't look disappointed, Lydia. Why? Why aren't you disappointed? A minute ago you thought I was going to die. Now I tell you that I'm not. You aren't disappointed. Why? Why aren't you disappointed? That smile, Lydia, why are you smiling? Wait a minute, you... You, you, you found out about the syrup, didn't you? You... You discovered it wasn't poison, didn't you? Lydia. Answer me. Answer me! Your coffee was too sweet, wasn't it, Gerald? Was it sugar? Or did you put real poison in it? Come, tell me, Lydia. There's a strange look in your eyes, Gerald, darling. Seems to be getting stranger by the minute. Sugar doesn't do that, does it? Lydia! You're taking a new tack, aren't you, Lydia? There's no poison in the cup, but there's a new, deadlier one that you hadn't counted on until now. The poisonous power of suggestion. He actually believes he's dying, and you're making the best of it. The real poison is sweet, Gerald. Remember? You're lying, Lydia. You, you didn't do it. But I did. Did you actually believe I'd let you make a fool of me again? When? When, when did you buy it? Yesterday. I, I should have known. It's getting hold of you, Gerald, inch by inch. Oh. Here's the bottle. Here, I'll put it beside you on the organ, just Lydia, as you say. Give me that bottle. Come to me. There. Yes, it's, it's empty. Good. Good. What? I... I told them you were trying to poison me. 
Gerald, what do you mean? The police, dear. The police. Well, Lydia, for once you're a step ahead of him. So he told them you were trying to poison him. You can't resist now. You've got to laugh about it. Relieved, free at last. Gerald slumped over the organ keyboard, dead. It's so much simpler now. Death of a stroke. No poison, no suicide. No prying medical examiners. Uh, just one thing, Lydia. The bottle. That would cause suspicion, wouldn't it? When there's nothing to be suspicious about. So you take the bottle from Gerald's hand. Go down into the basement and crush it to tiny bits with an axe. There's nothing left now but a few fragments of glass. Then at long last. Yes? Richard. Richard, darling. Lydia, what's up? You must come at once, dear. Gerald is dead. When? Ten minutes ago. Lydia, you didn't... Of course I didn't. He died of a stroke, Richard. Oh, you must come at once. I'll be right over. Good. And Richard? Yes? I love you. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about those big red and yellow signal billboards you've been seeing that tell you you now go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. Unfortunately, there isn't room on those billboards to tell the rest of the story, the finer performance in new signal gasoline that makes this good mileage possible. Here's what I mean. New signals quicker starting naturally saves gas. Signals smooth, fast pickup saves gas. And signals effortless anti-knock power that sends your motor purring up the steepest hills saves gas. So you see, the features in gasoline that make driving a pleasure are the very same ones that add up to more mileage. That's why we say your speedometer is the best proof of gasoline quality. If you want the tops in performance from your car, the logical place to find it is the new super fuel that now helps you go farther than ever. New signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. It's over, and you're free at last. For the first time since you and Gerald were married, you're genuinely happy. You want to shout it from the housetops. Tell the world that Gerald is dead, and you're free. That all his cruel cunning and practical jokes got him nowhere. That the trap didn't work. You almost wish Gerald were alive for a moment, just so you could tell him. But instead, you must sit quietly in the living room in your black dress and wait for Richard Farmer to finish the examination. Whew. What a day. I can imagine. We'll have a drink in a moment. So I could use one. Are you finished? Yes. Simple deaths can be just as troublesome as suicides and murders, you know. I can imagine. Lydia. Yes? Lydia, has it occurred to you that Gerald might not have died from a stroke? Of course not. Why? He might have committed suicide. Why, that's impossible. I was with him all last night. You didn't leave him? No, not for a moment. We talked quite a bit. But he might have slipped something in his coffee while you weren't looking. Oh, don't be absurd, darling. Please don't try to make a suicide out of this. I remember everything clearly. He clamored for coffee. I made it for him. He drank it, and soon after, he had the stroke. Why don't you want to let it go, then? The medical examiner from the police department. What? He was the man in the gray suit. Police? What have they to do with Lydia, this? he's analyzed the coffee cup and found it contained poison. But Richard... Martha! Martha! Yes, ma'am? Martha, Martha, tell me. About that bottle of poison in the medicine chest. You emptied that bottle, didn't you? You replaced the poison with syrup. I... I don't know what you mean, ma'am. I never touched the bottle. Martha! Martha, you... you... What's the matter, Lydia? 
He did it. It was a trick. Lydia, dear, don't worry about it. Everyone knows it's suicide. You just didn't see him pour the poison into the cup, that's all. And if he didn't leave the room as you say, then the empty bottle must be somewhere in the room with his fingerprints on it. The bottle? That's all the evidence the examiner says they need. Just the bottle, don't you see, dear? Lydia. Lydia, what's the matter? You look white as a sheet. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal Dealer. This program produced by Gordon Hughes with tonight's story by Robert S. Brody, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Terror Stricken. Fear can become a terrible thing. Gangrenous, disintegrating, warping, twisting, gnawing at a man's mind until he's conscious of nothing else but its presence. That was the kind of fear that took hold of Benjamin Reynolds. And oddly enough, it was the natural outgrowth of the very thing that started him on the road to success. There was a trial, an important trial. There were big names involved, particularly the name of Andrew Miller, the accused. And at that trial, ten years ago, young Benny Reynolds, investment clerk, just out of college, became Benjamin Reynolds, star witness for the prosecution. And uh, he was a good witness. Investment bankers in San Francisco and Wall Street and London glanced at the headlines and commented that this time, because of Benjamin Reynolds, Andrew Miller and his crowd were washed up for good. They were right. Order, please. 
Order in the court. Will the prisoner face the bench? Andrew Miller, you have been found guilty of the charge of grand larceny. I therefore sentence you to be confined within the state prison for a term of ten years. Bailiff, remove the prisoner. You dirty rat riddles! I'll get you for this! Yes, Benjamin, that was the big break. Overnight, you became the banker's champion. The man who almost single-handedly broke up the Miller crowd. Today, just ten years later, you're head of the rental investment company, a pillar of the community. It's a nice morning as you sit at the desk in your private office, looking at reports. Yes, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, Joan, will you send Mr. Barton in, please? Yes, sir. 46,000 alum account. Now, that can't be right. Gross commissions chargeable. Oh, wait a minute now. I know that's wrong. You wanted to see me, Ben? Uh, yes, Ralph. Uh, these figures, are you sure they're correct? Of course, I prepared the statement myself. Oh. Well, things like this don't do my heart any good, Ralph. Uh, sit, sit down, will you? Oh, sure. I'm sure there must be a mistake somewhere. I don't think so. But of course it's possible. Well, suppose you recheck them, eh? Just to be sure. Well, that's a big job. I'd have to go through all the records for the whole year again. I wouldn't ask you if I didn't think it was important. Well, uh, perhaps I ought to call in the Monroe Auditing Company. No, I'll do it, Ben. No use taking on that expense. Well, all right, if you can have it by next Monday. Otherwise, I'll have to call Monroe. I've got to have those figures for the director's meeting. I'll have them for you. Uh, by the way, Ben, have you seen the papers? Yes, I glanced through them at breakfast. Did you by any chance see this? Oh, oh. yes, I missed that. Among those released from state prison today is Andrew Miller. Convicted ten years ago of grand larceny in a trial that caused worldwide comment in financial circles. <coughs> remember him? <laughs> what do you think? I remember what he said when the judge sentenced him. Yeah. Does it make you a little nervous, Ben? I mean, just knowing the man is on the loose again? <laughs> I doubt very much if Andy Miller will do anything that will send him up again. <laughs> Still, you never know, do you? No, Benjamin, you never know, do you? Andy Miller wouldn't think of making good on his promise. Or uh, would he? Somehow you can't concentrate. Find yourself thinking about it, wondering, walking to the water cooler in the corner of your office every five minutes, wiping perspiration from your forehead until your handkerchief is soggy. And the next morning, it's worse as you answer your morning mail. Your order for 100 shares of consolidated power and light at the market, have I acknowledged and... Say, uh, that was consolidated, wasn't it? I think it was Southern California Edison. Oh, yes. Uh, make it Edison, then. And uh, will be executed immediately, virtually yours. Now, let's see. We took care of McDonald. And, uh... What's this? You rat. I'll get you, and don't forget it. What? He had the nerve to sign it. What's the matter? Where's the envelope to this thing? Why, Vera takes them off and... Get Vera in here right away. Well, she's out on an errand for Mr. Barton. All right, then, get Barton. Yes, sir. And don't forget it. Andrew Miller. Of all the cross I... You sent for me, Ben? Yes. Take a look at this. Hmm. Same words he used at the trial. That guy must be crazy. He signed it himself. What do you make of it? I don't know. Didn't lose any time, did he? I think he's trying to bluff you. Or maybe he didn't write it. Oh, he wrote it all right. <clears throat> I don't know. It's pretty fantastic after ten years. But in view of the threatening tone, I'd certainly check to see if it's genuine. Yeah. Yes? Vera's here, Mr. Reynolds. Uh, send her in, please. Well, we'll see what she knows about it. Do you want to see me, Mr. Reynolds? Yes. Uh, Vera, did you notice this letter in the morning mail? Well, I don't read the mail, Mr. Reynolds. I just open it and put it on your desk. I've instructed them not to read company mail, Ben. Oh, of course. Well, I might remember if I saw the envelope. Yes, Mr. Reynolds? Have the wastebasket containing the envelopes from today's mail brought into my office, will you? I'm sorry, Mr. Reynolds. The janitor emptied all the wastebaskets an hour ago. Oh, very well. What are you going to do now? Well, I... I guess there's nothing I can do but call the police.
with the prologue of Terror Stricken, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. If you've been reading the new car ads, and who hasn't, you've no doubt noticed the emphasis that's being put on increased mileage. 25 to 30 miles per gallon from some of the new models. Now, why do you suppose this is? Is it because folks today are interested in making dollars go farther? Well, partly. But even more so, they're interested in the increased engineering efficiency which makes that greater mileage possible. Yes, and right there you have the reason why Signal Oil Company is so proud of the fact that you now go farther than ever with new Signal gasoline. You see, Signal's improved mileage is the result of increased power, amazing new power. The same power that gives new Signal gasoline quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. That's why we say, look to your speedometer for the final measure of gasoline quality. You'll find that the super-powered new gasoline that gives you peak performance is also the gasoline that now helps you go farther than ever. New Signal gasoline. And now... Back to the Whistler. Well, Benjamin, there was a price tag on that testimony you delivered so efficiently at the trial of Andrew Miller ten years ago... And you're beginning to pay for it now. The police don't help much. All you can do is swear out a warrant for Miller's arrest and leave the rest up to them. They can't do a thing about that weak heart of yours. Stop it from pounding every time someone comes to the door. And they can't bring your appetite back or help you to sleep at night. It's later than usual when you arrive at the office next day. Ralph Barton's busy on the books as you go into your office. Hang up your hat and go over to the water cooler for a drink. <clears throat> I guess I... <coughs> Help! Help! Yes, Mr. Reynolds. Help! Mr. Reynolds. Vera, Dr. Crane's in the next office. Get him, hurry. Oh, yes, sure, right away. Now, what's going on here? Mr. Reynolds, what's happened? He came in when he called for help. Get a doctor. Here's already gone for one. What's keeping her? There's a doctor right down the hall. He'll be back in a minute. That isn't soon enough. Oh, but it takes some time. Don't you realize every second counts? Oh, here she comes now. Go right in here, Dr. Crane. Stand back. Stand back, yes, please. Yes, yes, give him room. Doctor, uh, is it serious? Hmm. Can't tell yet. Looks very much like some form of poisoning. That was a close call, wasn't it, Benjamin? When you leave the hospital that night, you're still weak. Positive now that Miller means business. The police report that afternoon. Poison in the water cooler. Just enough to knock a man out. No fingerprints. No way of knowing how Miller could have entered the office without being seen. Nothing they can tell you except to carry on, as usual. For the next two days, you find yourself waiting for it. Tense. Expectant. But nothing happens. And you begin to relax a little. To believe what the police lieutenant said about Miller being too smart to try it again. Perhaps they're right, Benjamin. Perhaps what you need is a change. A dinner out with your wife, Sally, at a restaurant on 6th Street. Ben, dear. Ben. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, Sally. I... I was thinking. Oh, please try and forget it, darling. But the whole thing's ridiculous. The man wouldn't have to take a chance like that. Oh, there must have been a mistake at the bottling company or something. Of course, dear. Now let's forget it, huh? But you're as fidgety as a cat. No, I'm not. But I am hungry. Then do you mean it? <laughs> of course I do. Why? Oh, because you've hardly touched your meals the last few days. Oh, well, that's all right, huh? I'm starved. Well, what do we start with? Well, what about a shrimp cocktail? Hmm? Wonderful. <laughs> then uh, mixed green salad? And a sirloin for two. Medium rare. <laughs> Oh, oh, darling, why are you all I'm, I'm the manager. Are you hurt? No, no, I'm, I'm all right. It, it, it missed me. See there in the, oh, in the wall? Oh, Lord. Well, I don't know how. That Who it... did it? Oh, I don't know, sir. I, it came from over there somewhere. Well, don't stand there with your mouth open. Call the police. Well, of course, right away. Come on. Come on, Sally. Uh, Let's get out of here. Oh, well, 
Whoever fired that shot meant business, didn't he, Benjamin? Your heart's pounding like a trip hammer again as you walk out of the nightclub. The hole in the wall was six inches from your head, and that's awfully close. Your heart almost stopped, didn't it? You're terror-stricken. You jump at every sound. And then you wonder why Miller doesn't come right out and kill you. But you remember he's had ten long years to plan his revenge. No, sudden death would be too easy. He wants to make you suffer. Of course, sleep is out of the question. Even the powders the doctor gave you have little effect on your frenzied nerves. You imagine all kinds of things as you lie there in bed. Ben. Yes? Ben, why is he trying to kill you? Please, Sally, let's not well, talk about it. first the poison water and the trip to the hospital, then that shot tonight. Yeah. Oh, but Ben, the, the police will catch him soon. He can't... Pass. I... I just hope it's soon enough. Oh, sure. Uh, oh, that's the door. I wonder who in the world... Well, no, lie, lie still, darling. I'll get no, it. No, no, no. Oh. I'll get it. Right. Yeah. Hold your horses. I'm coming. Oh. What do you want? What do I want? Yes, that's what I said. What do you want? I'm calling for the remains of the dear departed. Are you drunk? No, I... I don't think so. Now, now look, it's cold here at the door. Uh, hurry and state your business, please. I did. I was sent to call for the mortal remains of... Man alive, will you talk sense? I haven't time for foolishness. This is 1620 Runyon Avenue, isn't it? Yes, it is. Then it's the right place. Who sent you, anyway? The Gold Hills Mortuary. Now, do you understand? No, I don't. There must be some mistake. The party on the phone was very explicit. He said 1620 Runyon Avenue... The remains of the late Benjamin Reynolds. That's not funny, mister. I... I'm Benjamin Reynolds. Oh. Now, get out. Get out of the body of Benjamin Reynolds. We'll give you a very black eye. I... Oh. What's going to happen next? How much more can you stand, Benjamin? Before your heart gives out completely. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You almost jump out of your skin at the slightest sound. Miller is getting his revenge. He must be enjoying it immensely. Sally makes you rest all day Sunday. But you're still befuddled. You can't even talk straight anymore. You stutter. Monday morning you decide to walk to the office. You want to try to think. Yes, that's it. Walk and try to think. What's going on? The guy in the blue sedan tried to run over this man. Are you hurt, mister? Oh. No, no, no. I, I, I'm all right. Yeah, the devil you say, oh. you shake him like a leaf. Oh. Soon, soon as my nerves quiet yeah. down. I... Them that saw it seemed to think it was a deliberate attempt to kill you. Yes, I, I think so, too. Uh, any idea who might be trying to kill you? Sure. Andy Miller. Yeah, okay. Uh. Now i got to make a report of this. Uh, what's your name? Ben... Benjamin Reynolds. Benjamin Reynolds. Oh, you better see a doctor, Mr. Reynolds. You're, you're in bad shape. I, I'll be all right. Yeah, I better send you home in a cab. Uh, you're in no condition to walk. Uh... Another close call, and you're scared almost to death, aren't you? You wonder how much longer your heart will be able to stand it. Not much longer now. You tremble so violently you can't even light a cigarette. Even at home, you can't sit still. You pace the floor back and forth all day long until finally night comes. You can't sleep. You toss and turn. Yes, the days are bad, but the nights are filled with terror. Who, who's there? Ben, dear. I said, who's there? Oh, it was nothing, honey. Oh, oh. What's that? What's that? Oh, stop it. Who are you? Why don't you answer? Oh, it's only the shutter. Oh, Ben, don't be so jumpy. Huh? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yes, of course. Oh. Only the shutter. It was only the shutter, wasn't it, Ben? But all the noises in the night have a sinister meaning, haven't they? After what seems like hours, exhaustion finally takes over and... 
You've just fallen asleep when... <laughs> Who's at the... Who's at the door at this hour? Ben, dear, don't uh, be frightened, darling. It's not the door, it's the phone. Oh. Oh, oh, the phone. Yes. Who the devil can that be? I, I'll give them a piece of my mind. Hello. Is this Benjamin Reynolds? Y- yes, it is. What's the big idea of calling me at this hour of the night? Don't you know? No, and I don't care. Oh, yes, you do. You got a letter the other day, remember? Andrew Miller. Why, how'd you guess? <coughs> I'm going to get you, remember? Say, 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 wait a minute. You haven't much time left to live, wait. Reynolds. It's coming tomorrow. But, but, hello? Hello, hello? Hello? Oh, oh no. Oh, Operator. Uh, place that call quick, please. What is your number? Uh, Morningside 1024. And hurry, please. One moment, please. Oh, hurry, hurry. What number did you call? I didn't call any number. They called me. Do you know the other party's number? No, I don't. That's why I asked you to trace the call. Please hurry. There is no one connected with your number now. I know, I know. They hung up. Can't you hurry? I want to trace the call that was connected with his phone. Please. I'm sorry, but after the other party has hung up, it is impossible to trace the call. No. Oh. Very well. Say, I wonder. I wonder if my hunch. Uh, hey. Let's see. Let's see. Hello? Hello, Barton. This is Reynolds. What the deuce makes you call me at this time of the night? Barton. Andrew Miller called. He he said I haven't much time to live. Is that so? Yes, and I'm at my wit's end. What can I do? He's coming here, Ralph. Lord knows what he'll do to me. What do you mean he's coming there? Well, he just told me. Mm. (coughs) You can't take this much longer, Ben. Why don't you call the police? Well, I've called the police a dozen times. I tell you Miller's too clever for them, Ralph. Then there's only one thing to do. Get out. Yes, but he'd follow me. He he knows where I... He hasn't checked me. Now, look, it's out of the question for you to stay there under the circumstances. I'll be over in the morning, and we'll go up to my cabin for a few days. You've got to get a complete rest. Yes, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Ralph. I, I've simply got to... And listen, there's someone tipping that guy off on your movements. This time, make sure. Don't tell anyone where you're going. Well, yes, yes, but, but what about Sally? Tell her you're off on a business trip or something. Uh, yeah, that's it. The convention starts tomorrow in Cedar City. If necessary, you can call her later from the cabin. Yeah. Yeah, all, all right, Ralph. I'll pick you up in front of the signal station at Runyon and Broadmoor tomorrow morning at 8, right? Right, right. How much farther, Ralph? About 14 miles. Hey, the old heart's banging away again. Doctor said 6,000 feet was my limit, you know. Well, we'll stay pretty well under that, boy. Oh, good. Boy, look at that view. You can see all the way back to... Oh, huh. what's the matter? So that's strange. There's that car again. You don't suppose he's following us, do you? Oh, probably one of the natives. I don't know. Wait a minute. You, you don't think Miller... You're sure you didn't tell anyone where you were going? Well, positive. I, I will have to call Sally later, though. Yeah, sure. Say, here's the spot where I always stop. You can get a good view clear back to the valley. How about it? Oh, great. this way. Yes, kind of steep. I better take it easy. Now, there's a level spot up here at the top. Well, you, you go ahead, Ralph. I gotta watch myself at this altitude. Ah, get that air. You know, this is what I needed. Mountain air, sunshine, quiet. Hey, where are you? Up here. Come on. Huh? This is a real inspiration, Ralph. How'd you think of it? You mean this? I, I mean getting away from everything like this. One sniff of that air and a fellow forgets he ever had any worries. Hey, look over here. Hey, now, hey, now take it easy. <laughs> kind of close to that edge, you know. Look, Ben. 1,500 feet straight down. Yeah, I'd just as soon stay back here if you don't mind. What's the matter, Ben? Afraid? No, just sensible, that's all. You know, funny thing about me in high places, it seems You to... ought to be afraid, Ben. 
That's where you're going. Fifteen hundred feet straight down. <laughs> what? Well, that's good. Fifty. You're... You're serious, aren't you? I'd hate to have you call in the auditors, Ben. I was afraid that was it. There was something wrong with those figures. Yes, there was. But I learned something from Andy Miller. You're not going to be around to testify. You're going to have a dizzy spell. And they're going to find you 1,500 feet down there on those rocks. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, here's news about one of the first of the new post-war developments to make driving safer and more restful. You know how our bright western sunshine glares off pavements and off the windshields and polished chromium of other cars, causing eye strain that makes you squint and get headaches? Well, during the war, the Army and Navy used a new principle of glare control. It's called Polaroid. And unlike old-fashioned colored filters that darkened everything and changed the colors of flowers and scenery, Polaroid is as clear and colorless as your own windshield. But look through the Polaroid, and presto, all glare is gone. Now, here's the good news. This same Polaroid principle has been made into a visor for your car, and they're for sale for the first time on the Pacific Coast at your signal dealers. The Polaroid visor snaps onto your present visor in a jiffy. It's smart-looking, and it flips out of the way when you're not using it. If it's sunny tomorrow, drive into your signal dealers for a demonstration. When you see the wear and tear it saves on your eyes, my bet is you'll want to buy one of these Polaroid visors now to make your summer driving more pleasant. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Benjamin, you seem to be in a tight spot. Just the two of you there, alone at the top of the cliff. Barton, staring at you, white-faced and tense, his fists clenched at his sides. And oddly, you find yourself struggling to keep the smile inside you from showing on your face. It's probably only a few seconds, but it seems like an hour that the two of you stand there silent. Then... Listen, Ralph. You hear that? The car? Yes. They won't stop. Sure he will. That's what they came for. What do you mean? There's a detective and two patrolmen in the car, Ralph. They followed us all the way from town. You're lying. You'd better restrain yourself for a minute and see. Of course, you could pull it off now if you wanted to, Ralph. But it'd be kind of foolish, wouldn't it? The embezzlement charge will put you away for only four or five years, with perhaps a few more for attempted murder, but if you go ahead and... <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> you did it again. What? <laughs> that. It's a habit of yours, Ralph. Every time you're about to say something important, you clear your throat. <laughs> Like that. That's why it hit me between the eyes last night when you called me and said, <coughs> I'm going to get you. Remember? Come on, Ralph. Let's walk down to the road. We'll save the policeman a few steps. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Walter Jensen, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. whistle is
is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Waterford Case. Like all murders, it had a vague and tangible beginning. As Elaine walked home from the trial that afternoon, she tried to put her finger on it, ran back in her mind over the months that saw it develop from a stray thought into the headlines and the afternoon editions just hitting the stands. Son guilty of father's murder. Richard Waterford, Jr. to die in chair. Waterford heir guilty. And for the life of her, she couldn't remember exactly when the idea was actually born. Certainly that day at the beach club with Dick and Margaret had little to do with it. Although it was in her mind even then, as she walked toward them, wondering what they were saying. <laughs> oh, oh, that water's cold. Dick, you're all wet. Oh, stop it. People are looking. Let him. <laughs> oh, I love you, Margaret Winters. Well, is that bad? No. No, it's too good to be true. I mustn't worry about Waterford Sr. Dad's not as tough as his growl. He'd do more than growl if he could see you now. You know, I used to be the fair-haired boy. Only child, son and heir, etc., etc. <laughs> Little Richard could do no wrong. Then I came along, hmm? Oh, no. Nothing as uncomplicated as that. Whatever's happened between Dad and me began long before I met you. What did happen, Dick? She did, mostly. Who? Elaine? Yeah. Cousin Elaine. She's around here today. You'll probably... Hello, Richard. Uh, oh. Elaine. Why, hello. <laughs> nice of you to drop in. We were just talking about you. Say, that's a funny thing, Elaine. You always manage to show up Don't when I... Don't forget your manners, Richard. What? Oh. Oh, sorry. Meg, this is my cousin, Elaine. Hello, Elaine. I was most anxious to meet you, Miss Winters. Richard has spoken of you so often at home. How did you know you'd find us here, Elaine? I thought I'd camouflaged our trail pretty well. Really, Richard, I hope you don't think I've been following you. The fact is, I was on the boat this morning, and I decided to take a stroll along the beach before going home. I saw you from the boardwalk. You should have Richard take you out to the boat sometime, Miss Winters. Very pleasant and much more secluded. Oh, I'd love it, but I'm allergic to deep water. Can't swim a stroke. Oh, well, I've enjoyed meeting you, Miss Winters. Likewise. Oh, what a beautiful ring. Oh, thank you. Family heirloom, I suppose. Well, it may be someday, I hope. At the moment, it's just an engagement ring. Oh. Wish us lucky, Lane. I'll see you at home, Richard. 
So long, Elaine. Wow. Well, that did it. What do you mean? Oh, she'll go straight to Dad. I know it. Oh, it doesn't matter, darling. The sooner there's an understanding, the sooner you and I can set up housekeeping. And this is as good a time as any. No, Elaine. That wasn't the beginning, was it? The feeling has always been there through all the years you've spent with Dick and his father in that great gloomy tomb of a house. Years spent in a careful campaign of subtleties, half-truths, outright lies. So that now the affection between father and son has cooled into a kind of forced cordiality. There are lots of possibilities in the situation, aren't there, Elaine? Now that you have the kind of ammunition you've been looking for... Stop prowling around the room and sit down, Elaine. Dick will be here directly. Uncle Richard, how can you let that Winters girl and her father get away with everything you've worked for all your life? Why are you so worried? You'd lose nothing either way. I'm a Waterford. Your brother was my father. He worked himself to death making a million for you. Do you think I want them to go to her? Your father was stupid. But he was talented. And I was sorry to lose him. If it hadn't been for his brain, you'd be penniless, and you know it. Yes, and I suppose my gratitude should take the form of a handsome bequest to his daughter. Or perhaps you feel that the entire Waterford estate should rightfully belong to you. <laughs> Avarice is a good thing, Elaine, but only when you know how to hide it. I don't know what you're talking about. You rang, sir? Tell Mr. Richard I want to see him at once. At once, sir. What are you going to do? Bought her an engagement ring, has he? They wanted me to be the first to know. Wanted my blessing. I hope you wish them every happiness. What are you going to do? Disown him. What? You'd like that, wouldn't you, Elaine? My only other living relative. If I disown my own son... You'd probably will the money to a cat hospital. <laughs> Good idea, girl. I'd never have thought of it. Come in. Evening, Dad. I'm glad you... Oh. Hello, Elaine. You're looking nice and sleek this evening. How does it taste? How does what taste? The canary you've just swallowed. Sit down, Richard. <laughs> I'll be in my room if you want me. Stick around, Elaine. You'll hear better on this side of the door. Keep a civil tongue in your head, Richard. All right, Elaine. I'll call you if I want you. <laughs> You leave the library door ajar, walk up the stairway to the landing and stand there, listening to the voices of Dick and his father growing louder and angrier, watching Simpson, the butler, walk across the hall and stop to listen, too. A vague, shadowy picture is beginning to form in your mind, a picture clouded over with hatred for the old man, something about a court of law. With Simpson telling the jury what he heard tonight. Deliberately disregarding my wishes, knowing how I felt about this affair of yours. It isn't an affair, Dad. You irresponsible young fool. I spent twice the years of your lifetime building the organization that you're heir to. And the man you want to make your father-in-law is still trying to tear it down. He could never take over from me, so he thinks he'll do it through my son. Don't say that. Richard, this is my final word. You're not to see this woman again. You understand? Dad, I... Be quiet. Lo you disobey me and continue your relations with her? And I tell you this. I'm in a position now to ruin that larcenous father of hers and his whole miserable brood. I can buy him out lock, stock, and barrel. Send him back to writing market figures on a blackboard. It's where he belongs anyway. And I'll do it, Richard, if you persist in this foolishness. I didn't bring up my son to see him throw my life's work away on a cheap... Shut up! All right, Richard. You may go now. When you're quite ready to talk sense, you can come back and remember what I said. All right, Dad. I'm moving out tonight to the club. But there's one thing I want you to remember. I love Meg and we're going to be married. And if you do anything to bring a single moment's unhappiness to that girl, I swear I'll kill you. With the prologue of The Waterford Case, 
the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. Keeps motor six times cleaner. Reduces cylinder wear one third. Keeps motor six times cleaner. Reduces cylinder wear one third. Keeps motor six times cleaner. Reduces cylinder wear one third. Yes, everybody's talking about the amazing new Signal Motor Oil that keeps motor six times cleaner. Reduces cylinder wear one third. Signal Premium Motor Oil. So different, it can't even be compared with old-fashioned straight motor oils. Contains five scientific new compounds developed to meet a demand of the Army and Navy for finer lubrication than a straight motor oil alone can provide. Signal Premium Motor Oil. Yes, just as today's finest foods are fortified with vitamins and minerals, Signal now fortifies today's finest 100% pure paraffin base oil with these five scientific new compounds. To give you... Signal Premium Motor Oil. The improved post-war lubricant that outperforms even the finest of uncompounded oils, barring none. Want proof? Just stop by your signal dealers. Look at his unretouched photos of laboratory and road tests, covering hundreds of thousands of miles. See with your own eyes why, whether you're breaking in a new car or just want to pep up your old car, today's finest oil for you is new Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Yes, Elaine, it had come about gradually. The jealousy was always there, of course, and the awful, nagging desire for the money that was Richard's. The money you felt was rightfully yours. But if there was any point at which the thing changed from a vague feeling into a concrete plan of action, it was at this exact moment, as you stood on the landing, your knuckles white in the banister, listening to if Dick you do shouting... anything to bring a single moment's unhappiness to that girl, I swear I'll kill you! Simpson hurries away... And Dick comes out of the library like a dark cloud, grabs his hat, stomps out of the house. Elaine? Elaine? Yes? Come in here. Yes. Get the pad on the desk. I want you to take a wire to McCormick in the San Francisco office. Ready? Yes. Reopen investigation. Possibly obtain controlling interest. John Winters Corporation. Do not use Waterford name. Advise soonest. Is that all? Yes, send it. You think that'll stop the marriage? Winters is in Europe. They won't marry until he returns. And by that time, I'll have him over a barrel. <laughs> I can see old John Winters letting his daughter marry the son of the man who ruined him. <laughs> Your mind is made up now, isn't it? There's no hope that the old man will disinherit his son for defying him. He was one jump ahead of you, wasn't he? The inheritance is slipping out of reach, Elaine, unless you do something about it and quickly. Perhaps a visit with Dick at his club. It's open. Good morning, Richard. Well, I didn't expect to see you so soon after last night. I brought you your shaving things. Thanks. <laughs> what do you want, Elaine? You didn't come here just to make sure I wouldn't grow a beard. You are a boor, Richard. He wants to see you. Dad? Yes. Wants to see me? Yes, Dad. He wants you to come to the house tonight at around 9 o'clock. Oh, what is this, Elaine? You know the old man would never break down and make the first move this way? It isn't like him. Is this some private scheme of yours? Please, Richard. You mean to tell me he sent you to tell me well, this? Well, of course. Oh. Well, I suppose I'd better humor him, huh? What time did you say? Nine o'clock. Okay. Nine o'clock. You're amazed at yourself, Elaine. You seem to know exactly what you're doing, as if you've been planning it for weeks. At home in Dick's room, you find what you're looking for, the German Luger pistol he'd brought home from Europe and a clip of cartridges. You load it, leave it in the drawer, ready for nine o'clock. You rang this? Yes, Simpson. 
Has Mr. Waterford finished his dinner? I believe he has, miss. And I'm to bring him his coffee in the library now. Uh, if you should want anything later on, miss, just ring. I'll not be going out this evening. Wait, what did you say? I said I wasn't going out this evening, miss. But this is your usual night off, isn't it? Well, yes, miss, but Cook had to leave early. And I promised I'd clear up for her. Ah, I hope it's all right, Look miss. here, Simpson. Don't you attend some sort of meetings on your evenings off? Seems to me you had uh, mentioned once or twice you had a... <laughs> yes, Miss Ellen. Well, should you be there tonight? Oh, I should really, Miss, but... Well, you go on, then. Oh, I couldn't do that, Miss. If Mr. Waterford should find the dinner things hadn't been cleared away... Oh, you can do all that when you get back, Simpson. I'll see that it's all right with Mr. Waterford. Uh, very well. Uh, thank you, Miss. You listen in the hallway until Simpson leaves. The old man is sitting in the library now, stuffed and dozing, with the radio going full blast like it always does. Twenty minutes to nine. Dick would have left the club by now, but must make sure. A phone call. Hello? Is Mr. Waterford Jr. there, please? How long ago? I see. Did he take a taxi, do you know, or did he drive his own car? Well, never mind, it doesn't matter. What? Oh, his own car. Thank you. Thank you very much. His own car. Good. No taxi driver to serve as a possible alibi. No time to be lost now. You put on a pair of gloves and get the Luger from Dick's room. Carefully, you wipe off all traces of fingerprints. Downstairs, you open the library door quietly. The old man is slumped in his chair, snoring softly. Silently, you edge over toward him. The radio blaring away in the corner, loud enough to cover even the sound of a gunshot. You raise the gun. Take careful aim. You can't miss. It's point blank. You lay the gun on the floor where it can be easily seen. Leave the radio blaring away and slip out of the room, closing the door after you. Upstairs now. Quickly. You glance at your watch. Three minutes to nine. I'm ready. Found him. He's... What? Don't go in there. I'm going to call the police. The police? Oh, no, wait. Richard, your gun. You've got to get rid of it. My gun? Elaine, you, you, you don't think that I... I, ca I came in. I found him. The, the, the gun was on the floor. I must have picked it up. I, I don't remember. Wait a minute. My gun. What was it doing down here? Who could have... Elaine. I was in my room. Richard, what are you trying to say? I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm going to call the police. The Honorable Mr. Richard Waterford, Jr., a murder charge staring him in the face, insisting on calling the police. He's playing right into your hands, isn't he, Elaine? The rest of the pieces fall into place like a jigsaw puzzle. Go on, Miss Waterford. I was in my room. I heard the radio playing and Richard shouting. He was downstairs in the hallway with the gun in his hand. Elaine, you're making it seem as though Quiet, I... Quiet, please. You'll have your chance to talk at the trial. 
Now, Miss Winters, you were aware that Mr. Waterford objected to your marrying his son? Yes, I was. You were also aware that Mr. Waterford intended to do everything in his very considerable power to prevent it? Well, I knew that he would And were you aware, too, that on the day before the crime, the accused was heard having a violent argument with his father in which he threatened to kill him? No, no, I wasn't, I wasn't. I heard him say something like, I love Megan, we're going to be married. If you do anything to bring unhappiness to that girl, I swear I'll kill you. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, Your Honor. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty as charged. Well, that's that, Elaine. For a day or two, the headlines howl like banshees. Waterford murderer to die in chair. Richard Waterford guilty. Inherits father's fortune, but won't live to spend it. Then things begin to quiet down and you wait for the law to take its course and leave you sole heir to the Waterford Millions. Then, then, Elaine, out of a clear sky, a new headline. Waterford heir to marry on eve of execution. I suppose you know what's happened, Mr. District Attorney. That depends, Miss Waterford. You know what I mean. You can't let them go through with this marriage. It's illegal. Sit down, Miss Waterford. I'm sorry. It was such a shock seeing it in the papers. It's true, then. Is what true? Richard and Margaret, they're going to be married. Oh, yes, I believe they are. But but how can you let a man marry on the day of his execution? It's torture. It was his last request. And since Miss Winters agreed, there was no reason to refuse it. Oh, I've never heard of anything so fantastic. Isn't it enough that you got him convicted? Isn't it enough that he's going to the chair? How can you stand by and see him married when you know he's going to die a few hours later? Please, oh, please, you must stop it. You must. Don't you see? Richard mustn't marry Margaret. Why, Miss Waterford? Why? Well, well, because it's inhuman. Is that the only reason? Yes. That's the only reason. <laughs> Suppose you've read the papers, Elaine. Then it is true. Yes. Well, aren't you going to congratulate us? Wish us lifelong happiness? Margaret, I've just come from the district attorney's office. The district attorney? Has anything... Has Dick been... No, my dear. I went there to get him to stop the marriage. Oh. Margaret, how can you do this to Richard? He wants it this way. I have no right to refuse. No right to refuse? You have no right to do anything but refuse. Richard is sitting in the death cell this very minute. Don't any of you see what a marriage ceremony would do to him? How can you be so inhuman? The least you can do... Please, What do you think it's doing to me? Do you think I want it this way? Do you think I want to become Dick's widow three hours after I become his wife? Oh, Elaine. Oh, how cruel of me, my dear. Of course, I'm sorry. I was thinking only of Richard. But don't you see that's just why you mustn't go through with it? For him, it'll all be over a few hours after you're married. But you, Margaret, you'll have to live through it all the rest of your life. You could never marry again. You could never face another minister as long Stop as you it, live. Elaine. Oh, Margaret, dear, you mustn't do this thing. For your own sake, because Richard is beyond your help now. He'll understand. I'm glad they could know him. Dick's asked me to marry him, and I've accepted. I don't care about anything else. I don't care what happens afterward. I'm going to marry him. All right, Margaret. I suppose there's nothing more to be said. Excuse me. Yes? Miss Winters, there's some reporters downstairs who want to see you. Oh, please send them away. I can't see anybody now. Yes, Miss Winters. Why don't they leave me alone? I don't know what I'll do if they don't stop coming here. They haven't given me any peace since Dick. It's the truck. Why don't you go away, Margaret? I can't. Not now, anyway. Oh, I don't mean far away. Just for a few days until it's time to go to Richard. You could stay on the lounge. It has living quarters. It's anchored just a little way out in the bay. There'd be no one to disturb you there. You could tell him to come for you when it was time. I could do that, couldn't I? Well, I'll come with you if you like. But they'll find out. They'll know oh, where you I... won't tell a soul, dear. There, now. I'll go home and pack a few things. I'll meet you here in an hour. 
Well, Elaine, she jumped at the notion of staying on the launch. If you fail now, the entire Waterford estate will go to Margaret as Dick's widow. But you won't fail. It'll be easy. No moon tonight. No one will doubt you when you tell them she's committed suicide. Everybody knows the state she's in. Who wouldn't commit suicide under such circumstances? I'm glad you thought of coming here, Elaine. I knew it would help. So quiet. Darkness is like an ointment. Water looks so clean and cool. No boats around, no people. Yes, dear. Just you and I. No one to disturb. You didn't think I was going to let you marry Richard, did you? What? What did you say? Why do you want to cheat me out of what belongs to me? Elaine, what are you talking about? It's mine now. The marriage isn't going to take place, dear. Not now. You did it, Elaine. Yes, dear, I did. I killed Richard's father. And isn't it unfortunate, Margaret, that you can't swim? The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But now, here's a little lady who seems to have a perplexed look on her face. What's the question, Miss Margaret? Well, Mr. Miller, I'd like to know just what those five compounds are in Signal Premium Motor Oil that keeps motors six times cleaner, reduce cylinder wear one-third. Answer. Compound number one actually cleanses the motor of old carbon. Compound two prevents harmful varnish, gum, and sludge. Compound three improves oil circulation to vital engine parts. Compound four keeps oil from thinning out when your motor's hot. And compound five protects costly bearings from corrosion. Well, no wonder Signal Premium is so much better than old-fashioned oil. And no wonder drivers who want sweeter performance and longer motor life are saying... I'm making my next oil change a change for the better. A change to... Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now... Back to the Whistler. So this is the last move, Elaine. Just this one more and it's all over. There's nothing left between you now. Nothing to keep you from your inheritance. Yes, there's every reason to believe Margaret... Frantic, despondent Margaret had committed suicide. A better reason, in fact, than the one the prosecution advanced to convict Dick of his father's murder. Get away from me, Elaine, I tell you. No, you no. don't. No. Quick, Chief. I got her. Let me go. Take your hands off Are you me. You all right, Miss Winters? Yes, thank you. She was going to kill herself. I was trying to stop her. I wouldn't do any more talking if I were you, Miss Waterford. How did you get here? Miss Winters suggested it. Margaret. You had every motive for killing your uncle. We knew it from the first. But everything else pointed to Dick. Quite unofficially, we decided to give you the opportunity of either clearing yourself completely or convicting yourself. You mean... Richard and Margaret? The marriage? There wasn't going to be any marriage. We wanted to see if Margaret was right. If the loss of the Waterford millions would force you to try a second killing. You're wrong. I... uh... I wouldn't talk anymore if I were you. You're under arrest for murder. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Ken Harvey, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service.
That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wait a minute. Have you heard the whistler? I am the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, it's time for another strange tale by The Whistler. Each Wednesday evening at this same time, The Whistler brings you an unusual story of conflict and emotion. Tonight, My Love Comes Home. There's a man who sits at the bar of a waterfront saloon in New England tonight. A man you'd pass on the street and never notice. Unmarried, 45. A truck driver by profession. Ordinary, except for one extraordinary fact. He has held the lives of three people in the palm of his hand. Yeah, well, a beer, Eddie. Yeah, beer, I guess. Right. Hey, uh, give me that paper over there, will you? Hey, yeah, sure. It's full of that murder case in New Bedford. Here's your beer. Yeah, thanks. Smooth trip tonight? <sighs> yep. Yeah. No traffic, no nothing. You know, if there's one gripe I got about my job, that's it. Yeah, what? Nothing ever happens. Yes, Eddie the truck driver with the power of life and death over three people continued to sit reading the paper in the New England bar and drink his beer. The amazing chain of events which had given him this power began two months before at an airfield in northern New Brunswick. Sam Hardesty, a bush pilot, sat in the office writing a letter. And if things go as expected, I ought to arrive on the 15th. I've looked forward to this for so long, darling, through all the long months in this God-forsaken wilderness. Huh? Golly! Six below and a 40-mile wind. Well, I'd like to never got that crate down tonight. What's doing, Sammy boy? Writing a letter to Helen. Ah, oh, that's great. I'd like to see that. Loyal husband, devoted wife, month's leave, fireside and slip. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Nothing. It's great if it works. Don't worry. It works. Yeah, that's what Frenchie said. What does that mean, Bruce? Well, it means that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. What about Frenchie? Well, he, he had a month's leave, only he didn't write his wife he was coming. Well? She was gone when he got home. To Montreal with another guy. Well, so what? So a guy away from home six months at a crack better be ready for it when it comes. They're all the same. There isn't one who'll play second fiddle to a DC-3. If that happened with Helen, I wouldn't want to live anymore. I... I've seen it happen, Sam. A lot of times. Frenchie didn't write. Huh? Uh, he wanted it to be a surprise. Hey, why don't you turn it up? I want it to be a surprise, too. Well, all I know, Mr. Hardesty, is that she closed the apartment. Said she was leaving New York for a month or so. Going to Cape Cod. Cape Cod in the middle of winter? A little town called Oyster Cove. 
She's taken landscape lessons from an artist up there. I think you remember him. Jeff Christie? Yeah. Yeah. I remember him. <laughs> well, of course, Sam, darling. Jeff and I didn't know what to think. You surprised oh, please, us. Please, so. Helen, just a minute. Well, Sam, dear, you... You've acted so strangely ever since you got in this afternoon. Helen, Helen, this is the first minute we've had alone. I, I... Helen, it's not like it was, is it? What are you talking about? Like it was a couple of years ago, when you'd look up at me with your eyes full of it. Well, the Sam, I... Yeah, before you got interested in art. When we made a lot of plans about me going to Canada for the money and you saving it for me down here so we could get a real start. I won't listen to this, Sam. Helen, why are you here? I told you, I'm learning to paint landscapes. And it makes no difference to me whether or not you choose to believe it. Jeff said he thought you had promise. What does that mean? Whatever you want it to mean. All right, Helen, you needn't worry. I'll be civil to him. But you know the kind of guy I am. I'll never give you up to him. I'll kill him first. Sam. That's it, Helen. All right, Sam. That's it. With the prologue of My Love Comes Home, CBS brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. You know, it took 12 million determined young men to keep your home for you. Men who were willing to give up their homes and apartments and their jobs and families to protect yours. Three million of these same young men now have no place to live through no fault of their own. And it's going to take a long time to build housing to accommodate them. And many of them, even men with families, are sleeping in automobiles and public parks. You can help by moving over just for the time being. By making any spare room in your house available to a veteran, and if possible, a veteran with a family. If you have space or know of any, call your local veterans organization or housing authority. And do it now. Now, back to The Whistler. No, nothing ever happens to Eddie, the truck driver, sitting at the bar at Plymouth, reading his paper. Eddie, the truck driver... The man who held the lives of three people in the palm of his hand. One of the lives was Sam Hardesty's. Only Sam didn't know it, did you, Sam? The world was falling around your ears on those first awful days at the Cape as you watched them together. As you tried to be civil to Jeff, as you promised her. As you struggled to ignore the tension that mounted in the strained silences that came so often. Making you remember what Bruce told you before you left New Brunswick. They're all the same. I've seen it happen, Sam, a lot of times. Yes, Sam. The first two days were almost unbearable. And on the third day when they left for the point, you couldn't stand the silence and spent the afternoon in a bar in the village alone. But they were at home that night when you returned, having cocktails. And there was nothing to do but join them. How about another, Sam? I don't know. I was drinking this afternoon. My head's kind of thick. Maybe I'll be skipping. Not backing out, are you, Sam? No, Jeff. Not backing out. <laughs> well, uh, come on, Sam, darling. Join in. The shaker's full, Jeff. Pour him another martini. Sure. The last one tastes a little weird. Well, hard to get good vermouth these days. Here you are. You want any one? Not this round. Hello? <laughs> no, thanks, Sam. Okay, I'll drink along. Skull. Uh, show Sam what you accomplished today, Helen. Oh, well. Jeff, I don't want him to see it until it's finished. Oh, come on now. Don't be modest. Well, I still think it's a mistake to show it to him now. She's a pretty remarkable girl, Sam. Yeah. We seem to agree on that. There. There you are. The harbor, looking back from the point. And you know, I've never seen a beginner handle the ocean like that. You see, Sam? I do accomplish things while you're gone. I never said you didn't. Yes. 
She does get things done while you're away for six months at a crack. Playing tag with the Eskimos. Forgetting all about her. Who says I forgot about her? I'm sorry. Here. Let me fill your glass. There you are. Um, what did you do today, Sam? <laughs> Nothing much. Took a walk around, met some of the natives. There's nothing like a native or two to put a guy in touch. Well, Cape Cod isn't much in the winter. Hardly anyone around. The old reliables are here. It's surprising what a guy can learn. Sitting around in the general store, listening to the gossip. A guy can lose track of things. There's nothing but a DC-3 to shoot the breeze with. Six months makes it a lot of... What's the matter, darling? What? Nothing! Nothing's wrong. It is a fiddle, aren't you, Sam? Sure. Have another martini. Yes, do you think you'd better? Sure, give me another martini. Me and a pickup. Got the shaker right here. Fill her up. Yes. He's all right. Here, Sam, I'll fill your glass. Fill her up. Have another. Fill her up. Fill your glass. Fill her up. And the last thing you remember, Sam, is drinking that martini. Things begin to fade right after that. Helen and Jeff receding into the purple clouds closing around you. The next thing is the water. Ice cold water biting through your body. You're struggling to get to the surface. Then, air. Great lung falls out. And the feel of something solid to hold on to. That bridge. Yeah, that's this bridge. What happened? What? I remember. I better hold on for a while. To rest. Cling to the bridge piling, Sam, fighting the tide trying to sweep you out into the Atlantic. You've hit your head somewhere and it aches. But the cold water has cleared it so you can think. It was the drinks. And the drinks were drugged. They tried to kill me. A half hour later, you're staggering through the little village of Oyster Cove. Dark and silent in the hours before dawn past a row of cabins facing the sea, vacant for the winter. You find a piece of scrap iron and break into the last cabin. There. And a minute later, you're wrapped in a blanket, resting, thinking it's through again. There's a blackness inside you, a hopeless, heavy weight in the pit of your stomach, a feeling that there's nothing to live for, and a strange half-wish that they'd been successful when they tried to kill you. Then your eye strikes something on the wall in the corner. Phone. I wonder. Number, please. Still connected. That's a break. Number, please. Uh, Number, please. Uh, operator, give me the... No, wait a minute. No. No, not the police. They tried to kill me. They committed murder. At least it was in their minds. Why shouldn't they suffer for it? Why shouldn't they suffer for it? Number, please. Uh, I want long-distance operator. Get me the night editor of the New Bedford Gazette. Night editor's desk. I got a story for you. Who's this? Oh, there are reasons why I can't tell you. Got your book? Uh, yeah. Put this down. Sam Hardesty, a pilot for North Canada Airlines, was murdered tonight. Uh, wait a minute. Put it down. You can check it tomorrow. Uh, okay. Go on. He was drugged and hit on the head. His body tossed into Oyster Cove Inlet from the bridge at two this morning. Yeah. That's all. Who are you? I can't risk getting mixed up with the police. I know it's true because I saw it happen. You realize I'm going to check this? That's great. Check all you want. No telling what you'll uncover. Fair enough. Okay. You take it from there. Sam, there's a way to make them suffer for the crime they committed in their minds. It wasn't their fault you didn't die, that the drugged liquor wasn't enough, and the cold water of the inlet brought you back in time to save yourself. You examine the cabin carefully. The electricity is on. There's plenty of canned food and a radio, wooden shutters over the windows for privacy. There's nothing to do now but wait, Sam. 
things will begin to happen in a matter of hours. The first thing, of course, will be a curious representative of the new Bradford District Attorney's Office dropping in to see Helen. You've got to understand, Lieutenant. I tell you, I don't know any more about it than you do. Wait a minute, Mrs. Hardesty. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm aware of that. Well, you act as if I were. Now, you say your husband had taken too much to drink. Yes. We left him alone in the living room for a moment. We? Jack and I. Uh, I mean, Mr. Christie. We only left him for a few minutes. Then I... I called to Sam and there was no answer. He was gone. We took the car and looked for him. And you couldn't find him? That's right. He's a pilot, huh? Away from home for long periods? Yes. Canada. I see. Keep us informed of your whereabouts, Mrs. Hardesty. We might want to get in touch with you later. Strickland speaking. Hello, D.A. Lieutenant Johnson. I just talked to them both. Nosed around town a little bit, too. What about it? Could be. The Macons are all here. Still might be a hoax, but we can't take a chance. We'll drag the inlet tomorrow. Right. And by the way, Chief, about the release of the newspapers, I'd say something to the effect that an anonymous phone call was received indicating that there might have been foul play connection with the disappearance last night of Sam Hardesty, Canadian bush pilot. Police were unable to trace the call and suspect it might be the work of a crime. Since there is no evidence Hardesty is actually dead. A search of Oyster Cove Inlet is planned for tomorrow. Now the football scores. No evidence. Nothing to indicate I'm dead. Now I'll have to make some evidence. No evidence, Sam. It might be the work of a crank. You lean back and think. No evidence. fog is thick over the inlet that night when you arrive at the bridge. Look it over carefully and listen for a minute. It's deserted, quiet as a tomb. You prick your finger, put a few bloodstains on your initialed pocket handkerchief, hang it from a bush near the shore as if it had blown there. You'll find a skiff at the jetty. Row out to a line of lobster pots anchored near the bridge. Pull up the nearest one. Take off your wristwatch. Break the band. Smash it on the gunwale of the boat. Tangle it securely in the lobster net and let it down again. The newspapers ought to have a fine time with that. Hello, press room. Listen, hold everything on the afternoon edition. Take this new lead on the Hardesty case. You ready? Police announced a startling new development in the Hardesty case early today when the missing man's wristwatch was discovered tangled in a lobster net anchored near Oyster Cove Bridge, purported site of the murder. A bloody handkerchief bearing Hardesty's laundry marks and initials was discovered in a patch of underbrush near the site. Current opinion is that the man was murdered, his body thrown from the bridge and carried out to sea by the receding tide. Mrs. Hardesty and Christie, last to see Hardesty alive, were ordered to report to New Bedford for questioning. Well, they're playing right into your hands, aren't they, Sam? Now, one more thing. One more ought to do it. They're both in New Bedford now, and the house on Shore Road is vacant. You still have the key, and you remember an item in the living room you might be able to use. Yes, Sam, one more ought to do it. Two hours later, you're back. You place the item on the table before you. Get out pen and paper and begin to write. Dear Al, I'm writing you this letter because you're my brother. And the only one I can turn to now. Helen is in love with Jeff. She insists on a divorce. Where did you get that letter, Lieutenant? Now, let me finish. She insists on a divorce, but I can't go through with it. I know if I don't, they'll do anything, even kill me. That's all. 
He never finished it. Tell me, where did you get it? It was stuck between the pages of a book you took out of the Oyster Cove Rental Library last week. This lady just brought it in. Why, I... I never returned the book. What about that, Miss Foss? It was returned through the slot in the door. I found it on the floor when I arrived this morning. I told you he's still alive. That proves that Sam wrote that letter. It's in his handwriting. Sure he wrote it. Question is, when? The library's only open one day a week. It could have been returned any time after last Wednesday. I tell you, it was there in the house yesterday. He broke in last night when I was gone and stole it. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hardesty. I don't believe you. You and Christie report tomorrow for the preliminary hearing. That's all. Well, Sam, it took just four days to do it. You ought to be satisfied now with Helen and Jeff facing a murder charge. You tell yourself over and over, ten times, a hundred times, that it's right, that they committed murder in their minds, that they must suffer the consequences. It's midnight when you leave the cabin and walk down to the deserted road. Two in the morning before a truck finally comes by and stops for you. The driver's name is Eddie, and you wish he wouldn't talk so much. But you haven't any choice, and he's going in the right direction. North, towards Canada. Yeah, sorry to take you out of your way, pal. Got to pick up a load of fish at Stillport. Of course, you're lucky to get a ride at all this time of night. Yeah, I suppose I am. Where are we now? Well, them lights up ahead of the airfield. Ten miles from there to Stillport. You can get back on the track up at Plymouth. Back on the track? Yeah, to Canada. Huh? What made you think I was going to Canada? Well, that's where you was going the other night. What other night? Hey, what's the matter, you pal? Tell me, what other night? Well, uh, let me see. Uh, the last time I come through, uh, Friday. What? Well, what happened Friday? I picked you up just like tonight. <laughs> I thought you knew. <laughs> oh, sure. I'm a dunce. I should have known. What? Hey, you couldn't remember anything. You're as drunk as a skunk. <laughs> Stand in the middle of the road and waving your arms. Listen, listen, Eddie. This is important. Huh? Where did you pick me up? Just outside Oyster Cove, about two in the morning. You changed your mind about Canada, though. I had to let you out. Where did you let me out, Eddie? At the bridge. At the airport over there? Yeah. Now stop, let me out. Huh? Again? Stop, I said. Okay, pal. You're the doctor. A million things hit you at once, Sam. She was telling the truth. Everything Helen said was the truth. And in four hours, she'll stand up at the hearing and be charged with your murder. There's one way you can stop it, Sam. One way you can get there in time. There's a plane warming up on the airstrip, and you stand in the shadows watching as the pilot gets out and walks across the field to the hangar, where a mechanic in grimy overalls stands in the circle of light, leaning against the door. Quietly, you move toward the plane on the far side. You can see they're talking. They can't see you. Better gas her up, Marty. Ready to take off. Uh, plenty of gas in her. I checked the indicator. Better check the tank. Indicator went on the blink this morning. Only about five minutes gas, but... Holy cow! Somebody's taking it off! It was the only way, Sam. You'll have to make it right later. The lights of the airport fade behind you as the plane swings southwest toward New Bedford. Five minutes, ten minutes, plenty of gas. You're sure now that you can get there in time to stop it. The shortest route lies straight across the wide mouth of the sound, and you look down at it, stretching below like a huge funnel with the Atlantic at one end and Oyster Cove at the other. Then, then it happens. The motor begins to call. You look around at the indicator, full tank, enough for three hours. Frantically, you work the throttle. My gas is plenty of gas. It's a fuel line, maybe, or the pump. I gotta make it, baby. Don't let me down now. The motor dies. The nose goes down. Nothing under you but water. Nothing within gliding range. You're going to crash, Sam. You pull back the canopy, start to climb out of the cockpit.
The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. This is an emergency. This is America asking you to move over and make room for a veteran. That extra unused room, that attic, that garage, any kind of shelter to keep these men and their families under a roof. If you have such a place or if you can make one available, communicate with your local veterans or housing agency. But do it now. This is an emergency. Now back to The Whistler. It was a long six weeks, but Helen and Jeff were hopeful. The state didn't have much of a case. The disappearance of Sam Hardesty was still a disappearance. In spite of the bits of incriminating evidence that came from nowhere. In spite of the gossip in Oyster Cove. Yes, Helen and Jeff were hopeful. For one very solid reason. They haven't got a case without a body. You've got to remember that. I've been a lawyer for 20 years, and I've yet to see a conviction where they... Uh, There's a call for you, Mr. Madsen. Uh, Thank you. Excuse me a moment, will you? Of course. Chin up, dear. We're going to make it. I don't know, Jeff. I don't seem to care much anymore. We... We did kill him. If he's alive, he'd have shown up somewhere by now, and it doesn't... Please, Helen, darling, you've got to pull yourself together. We're going to pay the piper, Jeff. We tried to kill him. Put the drug into his drink. It doesn't matter what happened after that, don't you see? That was the crime. The planning, the decision to do it. Just because he walked out somewhere before we could go through with it. You'll see where that leads. Mr. Matson believes in us, Jeff. It's his business to believe in his clients. His job is to get an acquittal, and that's what we're paying him for. Wait a minute. Here he comes. It, it looks like something's wrong. Yes, Eddie, the truck driver. The man who held the lives of three people in the palm of his hand sits in the New England bar tonight, reading the paper, drinking his beer. Yeah, can you beat this, Alec? Listen. Christy and Mrs. Hardesty plead guilty. Throw selves on mercy of court when husband's body found at Oyster Cove Bridge. Yeah, the guy was a flyer, wasn't he? Yeah, flyer. You know, funny thing happened to me. About six weeks ago, I picked up a flyer down in that section... Said he was going to Canada. How about another beer, Eddie? Wonder why he made me stop at the airport that night. <laughs> Wonder it could have been that same bum. Ah, that's crazy. Nothing ever happens to me. Yeah, like, give me another beer. Next Wednesday at this same time, the Whistler will return with the story of Leora and Kent, of the blind rage which ended in murder on the tenth floor of a New York apartment, and of the terror which gripped them as they tried to find a way out. The strange story, Panic. Featured in tonight's production were Elliot Lewis and Ann Stone. This program is a featured production of the Columbia Broadcasting System and was directed by George W. Allen. With tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler.
That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, The Judas Face. The movie star lay on the hospital bed, looking up at the white ceiling through narrow slits and the efficient mask of gauze and tape which covered her face. A million-dollar face, the trade papers had called it, with sparkling blue eyes, a delicate nose, and passionate full lips. Yes, in every sense of the word, the face of Sandra Dane was her fortune. Then, in ten seconds, everything had changed. There was an afternoon horseback ride with Janet Blaisdell, her stand-in, a gust of wind, Janet's silk scarf and the horse's eyes, a terrified plunge, a fall, flying hooves all around her in blackness. Then the hospital smell, quiet, efficient Dr. Rogers and his quiet, efficient staff, Janet and Gordon West, her producer, visiting her every afternoon, all of them kind and sympathetic. All of them knowing that the million-dollar face might be gone forever. That behind the mask of bandages was a question mark. Well, don't sit there staring at me, Gordon, darling. The end of the world hasn't come, you know. Oh, of course not, Sandy. I hope not. Janet, dear, it wasn't your fault. The wind blew your scarf and... That's what I keep telling her, Sandra. But you know how she is. If you must feel sorry for someone, dear, how about poor Gordy? He's got a million dollars tied up in the picture, and he can't shoot a lick until I get out of Hawk. Well, that, that's right, isn't it? Sandy, dear, we've been wanting to Please, tell you... Please, Janet. Well, what's going on? Sandy, about the picture... What about the picture? You... You know how bankers are. Bankers? This accident of yours... I know you'll be all right, but so far as they're concerned, well... Uh, what are you trying to tell me, Gordy? You've got to understand, Sandy. The bankers insisted that Gordy test someone else for the part. Of course, I... I thought of Janet first. Janet? You... You're playing my part? She didn't want to do it, Sandy. Neither did I, but there just wasn't anything else we could do about it. Janet, playing my part. <laughs> Please don't feel badly about it, Sandy. Yeah, I feel badly. I think it's, it's marvelous. It's so funny. My stand-in. It just doesn't happen. Oh, it's a wonderful break for you, dear. Wonderful. Well, what did I tell you, Janet? I knew she'd understand. And you don't have to worry, Sandy. No matter how this plastic surgery turns out, there'll always be a job for you at my studio. You know that. A job? But the operation's been successful. I'm sure of it. it... He told me there was no question. Of course. You've been wonderful, darling. Now we've got to run along at... Oh, hello, Dr. Rogers. Hello, everyone. Mind if I see the patient alone for a few minutes? We're just leaving, Doctor. Chin up, Sandy. Goodbye, dear, and good luck. We'll be seeing you. You certainly have nice friends. Yes, aren't they, Doctor? Do you mean that? Why not? I happen to know, Miss Dane, that you believe Janet Blaisdell was responsible for your accident. That in a fit of jealousy over your career, she purposely whipped a scarf into the eyes of your horse. <laughs> Well, how can you say a thing like that? I didn't say it first, Miss Dane. You did. What do you mean? While you were under the anesthetic. That happens frequently, you know. I'm bringing this up for good reason, Miss Dane. In the event this operation doesn't uh, come up to expectations, a thought like this playing on your mind, 
ruin your entire life. I hired you as a plastic surgeon, Dr. Rogers, and not as a psychiatrist. I'm sorry, Miss Dane. I simply felt that now, of all times, was the moment to bring it up. Why? I'm going to remove your bandages. When? Now. Steady now. You must remember that we've done the very best we could. Please hurry, Doctor. Just a second more. I can guarantee that the reconstruction will give you a normal appearance, but... But what? Whether or not you'll be able to resume your career, I, I don't know. Now, there you are. Um, a mirror. Give me a mirror. Very well. Here. I've tried to tell you, Miss... Get out of here! Get out! But Miss Dane... Get out! Very well. <laughs> Million dollar face. That's so loud. She did it. It was a plot. She blinded the horse. I'm dead. I might as well be dead. But she's not going to get away with it. I'll kill her! With the prologue of The Judas Face, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. If you're like me, friends, your mouth waters each time you see one of those sleek new 1946 cars. Unfortunately, it'll probably be a long time before we'll all be driving one. But there's a way we can all enjoy a sweeter running motor right now. Yep, it's with that great new Signal Premium Motor Oil containing five scientific compounds that actually keep motors six times cleaner and reduce cylinder wear one-third. You see, those compounds start to work on your motor the moment you switch to Signal Premium. Compound number one actually cleanses out old carbon varnish and sludge that's clogging your motor, while compound two keeps new carbon and varnish from forming. Compound three improves oil circulation to vital engine parts, while compound four keeps oil from thinning out when your motor's hot. And compound five, that protects costly bearings from corrosion. The result? Man, you can feel it. You can hear it. And you'll enjoy it. A sweeter running motor with Signal Premium. So why not stop by your Signal service station and make your next oil change a change for the better? You'll find oil does make a difference in the way your motor runs. A big difference when you switch to Signal Premium motor oil. And now, back to the whistler. The Million Dollar Face is a thing of the past, Sandra. And Janet Blaisdell, your pretty stand-in, is going to take your place in your picture. It was too much to take, wasn't it, Sandra? Janet in your place. Earnest, eager little Janet. The same girl who stood under the hot studio lights for endless minutes while cameras were focused and mic booms adjusted. The girl who took it for you while you sat in the cool shadows and watched. Yes, Sandra, it's more than you can swallow. But you're not raging anymore. There's only cool, calm hatred now, and a plan to kill. So you go about it methodically. First, of course, there's the matter of the assistant producer's job Gordon West promised you. Oh, you've been so wonderful, Gordy. It's all set then about the job? Sure, Sandy. You're going to be my assistant on Janet's first picture. How's that? It's perfect. Just perfect. <laughs> Step one, Sandra, the job. So you go to work for Gordon West. And in a week or so, you decide to tackle step two. It seems that Janet's picture is a western and will be shot on location. 
There are two possible sites. Hamilton Ranch or Felipe Mesa. And Gordon hasn't decided yet. Frank Reynolds, the chief cameraman, will have a lot to say about that. Gordon depends on him. I don't know, Sandy. Last time I talked to the boss, he was all for Hamilton Ranch. But there's no comparison, Frank. I, I was brought up near there. I know it's like a book. Please talk to him, Frank. I know he'll listen to you. Why? Why what? Well, why are you so interested? Because it'll make the difference between a first-class Western and a cheap yeah, you one. You want Janet's debut to be a topper, huh? Why, why, of course. Why not? I'm a cameraman, Sandy. I've been trained to catch human emotion on film. Look for people's thoughts and their eyes and their faces. Well? Uh, nothing. Matter of fact, I was on my way to the boss to make a pitch for Felipe Mesa, too. I kind of wonder if you and I have the same reason. It has to be Felipe Mesa, doesn't it, Sandra? You weren't bragging. You know it like a book. It's steep sides, the narrow, dangerous trail winding up the cliff to the top that they'll be bound to use for the chase sequence, with Janet plunging down it at a full gallop, the wall falling away sheer on her right for 300 feet. Yes, Sandra, Felipe Mesa is perfect. It has everything you need. Two hours later, Frank comes out of Gordon's office. Frank. Yeah? What did he decide? You win, honey. Philippa Mesa. So you're over the first hurdle, Sandra. And for the next two weeks, as the company prepares to leave for location, you think it through again and again, coolly taking your time, anticipating, preparing, concentrating on the climax that will come when Janet reins her horse at the top of the mesa, pauses a moment, and then starts down the trail. Sandy? Uh, oh, Janet. <laughs> What's the matter, dear? Did I scare you? No. No, Janet. I was just thinking. I'm sorry. You look so funny smiling to yourself that way. I just dropped by to tell you we're leaving tomorrow. Start shooting Monday. Isn't it wonderful? Of course, dear. I'm so, so thrilled for you. And I'm so thankful to you, Sandy. All the help you've given me. You've been so good about everything. Why, don't be silly, darling. We've got to make good, you know. You and I. Yes, Sandra. You've got to make good. And everything is pointing in the right direction. You relax now and wait. Smiling to yourself over Janet's enthusiasm on the trip to location during the preliminary shooting. Controlling the anger inside you as Gordon West raves over her performance. It's still going to be your picture, isn't it, Sandra? Then at last the moment arrives. The day when the chase sequence is to be shot from the ream of the Mesa. The weather has been blistering hot for the past week. And the company is restless as Gordon gives them last-minute instructions. Quiet, please, quiet! <laughs> now listen, everyone. I want to shoot this chase without a break in the action. Get it all in one unbroken sequence. Get that, Frank? Okay, Gordy. Cameras are all set. Now, you men who are the heavies, remember when you're chasing Janet down that trail, don't crowd her. Look as though you're laying on the leather, but don't get too close. I don't want any accidents. Janet. Right here, Gordy. You're sure you've got the action all straight? Of course. I stop for a minute at the top and then take the trail down the south face. Come here a minute. Yes, Gordy? This is the last chance, honey. What about the double? No. Why? Oh, Sandy would never have used the double. Neither will I. Well, she never did a trick like this. How do you know she wouldn't? I know her pretty well. Oh, please, let's not go through it again. Okay. By the way, where's Sandy? Oh, over there, sitting down. I'm afraid the heat's got her. Oh. All right, you'd better get up there. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, I'm just a little dizzy, I guess. Afraid I'm not going to be much good to you today. You're pretty hot at that. Maybe you'd better go back to the camp, huh? <laughs> I was hoping you'd suggest that. Maybe I'd better send someone back there with you. Be alone, you know. Not a soul in the camp. Oh, forget it. I'll be all right. Just lie down for a while. Okay. Oh, and, uh, Gordy. Yeah? Wish Janet a lot of luck for me. Will you? Sure. All right, kids. Let's go. <laughs> They've gone now, Sandra. 
Gordon's on top of a mesa to direct the action by phone. The cameramen and actors are in their places, and you're supposed to be alone in camp with a sick headache. You know the mesa, don't you, Sandra? No one sees you as you slip along the chaparral-covered slope at the foot of the mesa, up through the underbrush to the spot you found the first day of shooting, right next to the trail, halfway to the top. A perfect spot, isn't it? A huge boulder on one side, greasewood and mesquite on the other. You crouch beside a strong steel stake you've driven firmly into the earth the night before. Pick up the ends of a thin wire rope looped around the mesquite root on the other side of the trail. Invisible under the dust you scattered over it. You're ready now, waiting, listening, and then... She's coming, Sandra. You tighten the rope. Hitch it firmly around the steel stake. You're ready for her now. It was your picture after all, wasn't it, Sandra? The weeks of planning paid off. The moment the horse tripped, a flip of the cable loosened it from the mesquite root and it lost forever, along with a steel stake among the boulders at the bottom of the gorge. You're back in camp, lying down, of course, with your sick headache when Gordon arrives with the news. Dead. Dead. Oh, no, Gordy, no. Take it easy, Sandy. Oh, you're wrong, Gordy. She can't be dead. She's just a kid. Not Janet, no. <laughs> yes, Sandra, that was an Academy Award performance. Even though you don't have the face to go to uh, go with it anymore. It's all settled now. There was no question. Just a few formalities and an official statement by the coroner that Janet Blaisdell died as the result of an accidental fall from a horse. The weeks pass and you go back to your job at Gordon's side in Hollywood. Yes, it's settled. You did a perfect job. There's no evidence. And yet there's still a vague, uneasy feeling inside you, as if something was hanging over your head ready to fall. Somehow you can't put your finger on it. At least until the day Frank Reynolds, the cameraman, takes you to lunch. You know, Sandy, I think I told you once about the peculiar insight a guy gets after grinding a camera for ten years. Well, what do you mean, Frank? Well, it's funny. You can almost tell what a person's thinking. Just the way he holds his face. You know, I can spot hatred a mile away, for instance. Jealousy. The cold look of a... Of what, Frank? Of a murderer. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? It's interesting. They can't hide it, you know. It's there in spite of them. It's odd. I, uh, I thought I saw it in your face out on location that day. The day Janet died. Yes, uh, that is odd. It indicates that you're not infallible anyway. It's, uh, not there now, though. Of course it isn't. Now, suppose... Just we... a minute, Sandy. It isn't there now. There's something else. What? Fear. I want you to come over to my house tonight, Sandy. No, I'm sorry, Frank. I won't take no for an answer, Sandy. Be there at eight. There's something I want you to see. You make an excuse. Tell them you're ill. Leave the office that afternoon. He's bluffing you, Sandra. You tell yourself again and again that Frank Reynolds is bluffing you. That there's no reason in the world for you to go to his house at eight tonight. And a thousand good reasons why you shouldn't. There's no proof, no evidence. Why should you fall for it? Of course not. So, at seven o'clock, you decide definitely you're not going. And at eight o'clock sharp, you're ringing his doorbell. Hello, Sandy. Hello, Frank. Well, are you coming in? I can only stay for a minute. I won't be long. I began to think you weren't coming. I came here for only one reason, Frank. To get to the bottom of that double talk at lunch today. That's exactly why we're going downstairs. I've got a movie projector there. You know, rally the folks around for a private showing once in a while. Ah, 
Now sit right down over there, Sandy. Screen's all set Please, up. Please, Frank, I'll... let's stop this nonsense. I told you I can only stay a few minutes. And... What's that revolver doing on your desk? A revolver? Oh, 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 that. I was cleaning it before dinner. Nice thing to have around. No telling what dangerous characters a man might meet in my business. <laughs> but, um... Uh... You're not a dangerous character, are you, Sandy? So I'll put it away for now. Let's look at the pictures, huh? I'm sure you're going to find them interesting, Sandra. You see, I took them myself the day of the chase sequence at Philippa Mesa. Oh, the chase sequence. That's right. The chase sequence. You remember that day, of course. The day Janet was mur... The day Janet died... I'll turn out the lights here. There. Now start up the projector. There we are. I don't think you knew I was on a roving assignment that day, Sandra. I was using a portable camera with a telephoto lens. Managed to get some very unusual shots. Oh, here's a pan start of the chase. Your brain Take a look is at the mason spinning there. like that projection now, machine. Well shot of Janet. You know what's coming next, don't you, Sandra? Frank is gloating now over his telephoto lens. Face. The one Heavy thing you forgot to figure on. Now she Slowly you ease out of your chair in the dark toward the, the desk, the pull the drawer open, grope for the revolver, yeah. find it. The Move the quietly back to your chair, the hiding the gun under your purse That's on your lap. Up, of course, Sandy. Every climax has to have a build-up. Telephoto lens is a wonderful thing, isn't it, Sandy? You'd swear you were ten feet from her. Oh, now we're getting somewhere. Here comes Janet down the steep pitch. Oh, look ahead of her. In that narrow gap on her left, in the greasewood there. <laughs> Surprise, huh? That woman there, crouching next to the trail. Look what she has in her hand. A rope, isn't it? Now, here's a cutback to Janet galloping down the trail. She's almost opposite the woman now. Look. Look at the girl with the rope. Who does she look like, Sandy, huh? Who is it? Stop it. Stop that machine. Okay. Turn on the light, Frank. Hurry up. Right. There. Is that better? All right, Frank. How much do you want for that film? Why, Sandy. What are you... I so said how much, Frank. <laughs> well, I didn't know you admired my camera work so much, Sandy. Will you come to the point? Well, of course, you've got to admit this is pretty unusual stuff. <laughs> it comes high. How much? Well, I figure you've probably stashed away a couple of hundred thousand in your time. Successful star, you know. Forty grand a picture. Two hundred thousand dollars? Yeah. yeah. Suppose we say half of it. And you get the negatives. What? What made you do this, Frank? Well, I always was a guy for a fast buck. And there was something else, of course. Janet and I were going to be married when the picture was finished. Let's face it, Sandy, a hundred thousand is cheap. Yes, I... I guess you're right. I, I can't afford to take a chance. There's only one way to make sure. Hey, what are you doing? Stay just right there, Frank. Right where you're standing. Put on that gun, Sandy. You can't get away with murder again. No. Listen, Sandy. I'll destroy the film. I'll... The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I have good news tonight for you Whistler fans who've been asking, will the Whistler follow the example of so many of the popular shows... And go off the air for the summer. The answer, I'm happy to say, is no. In appreciation of your loyalty that has made The Whistler the West Coast's most popular radio show, Signal Oil Company and the thousands of friendly dealer-owned signal stations throughout the West who sponsor The Whistler will continue to broadcast this program without interruption throughout the summer. So for your Monday night radio entertainment, we of the cast hope you'll continue to make The Whistler a regular stop on your dial. And during the week, we also hope you'll stop by your signal dealers and get acquainted with that great new signal premium motor oil, the new type lubricant containing five scientific compounds that actually keep motors six times cleaner, reduce cylinder wear one-third. It's today's finest recipe for a sweeter running motor. 
Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. It was the only way out, wasn't it, Sandra? It was all there on the film, everything. Absolute ironclad proof. And you were smart enough to realize you could never end it by paying him off. The black, blinding hatred for him closed in as you gripped the gun tight and pulled the trigger once, then twice more, and then... <laughs> Sandy, you poor, stupid little... Frank! I, I shot you, Frank. Why don't you... <laughs> They're all gone now, honey. You better let me have the gun. Get away from me, Frank! Give me that gun. That's it? You're a cold-blooded killer, aren't you, Sandy? But you're at the end of your rope now. What is it? I, I don't understand. The gun was loaded with blanks, darling. All right, gentlemen, you can come in now. Looks like the scene's over. All right, Frank. Come on, Dr. Rogers. Officer? Gordon, what are you... The required number of witnesses, Sandy. Are you satisfied, officer? I don't think there'll be any question. I might as well tell you, Sandy. We faked that film. What? You mean there was no... There was nothing except a healthy suspicion on the part of Dr. Rogers that you murdered Janet Blaisdell. Seems you talked rather freely while you were under the anesthetic some time ago. He insisted we examine a point on the Mesa Trail where Janet fell. All we could find was a hole on the left-hand side of the trail, as if a stake had been driven there. So we made a long guess and shot the scene with a stock actress made up to look like you, just to see what you'd have to say. Isn't that right, Doctor? Yes, of course. There was nothing to go on except what you said under anesthesia while I was working on your face. Interesting, isn't it, Sandra? The one thing in the world you treasured most, the thing you killed for, gave you away. Your million-dollar face. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Mary Lansing and Gerald Moore. This program produced by George W. Allen based on a story by B. Marsh, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women 
who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, The Whistler's strange story... Quiet Sunday. This was going to be a quiet Sunday for Henry Parker. Peaceful, calm, restful. Away from the work and tedium of the office. Just the kind of Sunday Henry always looked forward to during the other hectic days of the week. And more than that, it was a special Sunday for Henry's wife, Ruth, was vacationing at their lodge at Lake Arrowhead and wouldn't be home. That was the best part. It was nice to wake up and not find Ruth there to nag and irritate him. And it was nice, too, to remember that tonight he had a date with Daphne. Daphne was tall and lovely. And Daphne seemed to understand that Henry liked to spend a nice, quiet evening. He was contemplating all this when the doorbell rang. Oh, never fails. The minute I get settled with a Sunday paper, that bird Adams wants to borrow the lawnmower again, I'll... What? Daphne! Surprise, darling. Daphne, what in the world are you doing here? What will the neighbors think? I had to see you, Henry. I was all alone. Come in quickly. Daphne, darling, you know you shouldn't have come here. Why are you so frightened, Henry? Your wife won't be back for another week. Don't you understand that... You don't seem very happy to see me, Henry. You know I'm glad to see you, dear. It's just that... Well, aren't you going to ask me to sit down? Of course. Uh, This way, Daphne. No, no, not by the window. Over here. Why are you so nervous, Henry? That's it. Right, right here. Thank you, Henry. There. Don't I look at home here? Oh, now, Daphne, you've simply got to understand it won't do to have you around the house here ever. Do you have a cigarette, darling? Cigarette? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Here. Match? Yes. (sighs) That's better. Now, go on, dear. Sit down. Put your feet up. Oh, please, Daphne, will you be reasonable? I'm being quite reasonable. Now, please sit down, Henry. I want to talk to you. Very well, Daphne. Now, forget about your wife. She's at Arrowhead, a hundred miles away. But yes, but I... But what, Henry? Well, her friends are always dropping in. You know that. Why couldn't it have waited till tonight? I had to talk to you. Couldn't wait until then. Why? Is something wrong? That depends upon you, Henry. What do you mean? Do you love me? Oh, please don't be silly, dear. You know I do. I'm not so sure, Henry, and I'm very tired of it. The only time I get to see you is when you can get away from your wife. I've tried to explain. I want you all to myself, and... But if it can't be that way, I don't want you at all. That's why I came. Sick of meeting you in back alleys and dining with you in out-of-the-way places where no one will see us. If you really love me, you wouldn't treat me this way. I know, Daphne, I know. It it isn't very fair. Of course it isn't. Can't we talk about it tonight? Yes, that's it. We'll have a nice, quiet dinner at the Willow. Henry, there isn't going to be any tonight. You've got to make a decision now. What was that? Hey, the garage door. Someone's out there. Could it be? No, no, it's it's not Ruth. Oh, then I'll stay. Daphne, we can't take a chance. You better go. I'm staying, Henry. Maybe it's one of her friends. You'll start a lot of talk. I want an answer. Make up your mind. They're coming. Oh, listen, it's you, Daphne. Believe me. I, I promise you I'll free myself and Ruth some way, but you've just got to give me time. Now, please, please go. All right, Henry. No, no, not the front door. Here. You, you, you better go down into the cellar. Uh, the door here. Now, you can wait down there at the foot of the stairs until they go. I'll call you. Remember what I said, Henry? Yes, dear, of course, of course. <sighs> Henry! Henry, where are you? Oh, it's Ruth. Henry! Uh... Oh, there you are, Henry. Well, well, surprise. What are you doing here? You know very well what I'm doing here. 
I wrote you a letter two days ago asking you to join me at the lawn. But I wired you, Ruth. I told you I couldn't take the weekend off. I'm way behind at the How office. How do you think I feel up there all by oh, myself? No. Leona and Emily and Edith, all of them up there with their husbands, and I'm alone. They all want to know where you are. I know. Look, I explained. I feel like a fool. Well, I, I... Henry Parker, you're going back to Lake Arrowhead with me this very afternoon. I've had enough of your excuses. But I can't. Don't you I see? Ask I ask so little of you, Henry. I ask only what a wife expects, no more. You've got to go back to the lake with me today. And why, may I ask? Henry, today is our 10th anniversary. I told everyone you'd be there tonight. Don't think it's strange if you aren't. I'm sick of this pretense, Ruth. I'm fed up to the neck with all of your friends. Furthermore, I don't care a hang what they think. Why don't you tell them, Ruth? Why don't you tell them I want a divorce? You're not going to humiliate me. They're all coming over tonight and you're going to be there. I won't be a laughing stock, Henry. Is that clear? Yes, that's very clear. No one knows I'm here in town. They think I'm still at the lodge. They all went on a picnic to Big Bear today and I told them I had a headache. Oh, Henry, they won't be back till tonight and... When they arrive, I want you to be there. That's clever of you. Why did you do all this? I'd die if they knew I had to drive into town and beg you to come back with me. And what about the neighbors here? Well, I, I took all the back roads, and when I reached our street, I came up the alley and drove into the garage. Oh, please understand, Henry. This means everything to me. I, I couldn't face them. You and your pride. Oh, please, Henry. It's only three o'clock. We can drive there in three hours. It's plenty of time. I told everyone to drop in from, from nine hours. You simply don't understand, Ruth. I'm not going. I don't care what your friends think. Don't you see that? You're coming with me, Henry. That's all there is to it. Now where are you going? Down in the cellar to get your overnight bed. No, wait a minute, Ruth. No, wait, wait. Oh, don't argue with me. Go and get your razor and things from the bathroom. All right, Ruth. All right, you win. I'll go down and get the suitcase. I can get it. Stay away from the door. <laughs> Henry, who is that woman? I told you not to open that door, Henry. you... Henry, what are you doing? You overbearing, stupid. Henry, Henry, don't be silly. Don't be silly. No, you me. don't. I've it's had all of you I intend to me. take. Oh. oh, Ruth. Oh, no. Oh, Ruth. Daphne. Say, we'd better get some water here. Let me... What? What's, What's the matter, Daphne? Daphne, what... What's the matter? Well, don't you see we better... Well, she... Well, don't you think that we... Just we, better stay there, darling. We... There's no point in moving her now. Oh, no, you mean... You mean Ruth is... Yes, Henry. She's dead. <laughs> the prologue of Quiet Sunday, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. Ah, in my merry Oldsmobile. <laughs> Remember those good old days when horseless carriages roared down bumpy streets at the furious speed of 25 miles per hour? Automobiles have changed a lot since then. And so have their requirements for gasoline and lubrication. In fact, outstanding authorities, including the United States Army and Navy, agree today's high-speed, precision-engineered motors need better lubrication than straight motor oil alone could ever provide. That's why Signal now brings you an amazing new type lubricant, Signal Premium Motor Oil, combining finest 100% pure paraffin base with five scientific new compounds each developed to do a job which straight oil alone can't do. The result? Exhaustive tests prove new Signal Premium Motor Oil actually keeps motor six times cleaner and reduces cylinder wear one-third. Yes, the oil you use can make a big difference in the way your motor runs when it's Signal Premium Motor Oil. So, go modern. Join the thousands who are switching from old-fashioned straight oil to Signal's new lubricant that guarantees you a sweeter running motor. New Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. So, 
Ruth is lying dead at the foot of the cellar stairs. And the quiet part of the Sunday is over, isn't it, Henry? Just like that. Her unexpected arrival home. Her irritating insistence that you go back to Lake Arrowhead with her. The argument. The cellar stairs. A flash of blinding rage. And it was over. Death is a strange, terrifying thing, isn't it, Henry? You've never been so close to it before. All you can do is stand there at the foot of the stairs and look dumbly at Daphne. Too stunned even to think. Daphne. Daphne, I didn't mean it. I, it, it was an accident. You, you saw it all, didn't you? The, the, there was nothing. She just slipped. Stop she, it, Henry. You saw it. And, and you can tell them I said stop it. I'm not going to tell them anything. What do you mean? We, we've got it. Forget it. You pushed her and you know it. You mean you're going to tell them? Oh, Daphne, you can't. Uh, but don't you see... Listen, it? honey. There's a way to get out of this gracefully. Now get hold of yourself. I could hear her through the door. What did she say about sneaking away from the lake? Oh, uh... It was our anniversary, and uh, she she wanted me to be there. Her uh, her friends are away at Big Bear, and they think she's still there at the lodge. And no one knows she came down here? No. She wasn't seen? No. No. Henry, supposing she fell down the stairs at the lodge instead of here? Huh? While you were spending a quiet Sunday in town. I... I don't know how she could. Now, wait a minute. Let me think. Um, There's a long staircase up here. I remember it. What if her friends came back from Big Bear at 9 o'clock and found her at the foot of the stairs when everyone knows you're here in town? Well, I... Yeah, but... uh, How how could we get her up there? We've got to try. It's the only way. Well, look, I'll take her car up to the lodge. It's got to be found there. I can get to Arrowhead without being seen. I know it. And then I'll come back with you. Well, uh, what about Ruth? Huh? You've got to take her up in the trunk of your car. Now, there's only one thing more. Somebody's got to know you've been in town all day. Oh. That's right. Yeah, an alibi, huh? Of course. Where could you be for the next few hours? Oh, I, I don't know, Daphne. I, I don't know how I... Uh... Uh, a movie. What about a movie? movie? Yes, that's it. Uh, pick one that you've seen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, wait, wait a minute. Oh, uh, and and uh, there, there's Charlie Hardcastle. He he goes to the committee meeting at the church early every Sunday. Oh, yeah. I, I, I could pick him up, and I'll tell him I'm going to the movies. Huh? Of course. Buy a ticket, go in, and then sneak out the side entrance. Yeah. It'll be dark when we get to the lake, and I'll meet you at at the Y in the road just before oh. the, the uh, before you get to the lodge. Yes. I'll haunt my horn twice. Do you understand? Oh, yes, I understand. Well, we haven't much time. Come on, we've got to get her up to the car. Oh. Get that blanket over there and we'll wrap her in that. Oh, this works. All right. Uh, Hurry, Henry. All right. Here you are. Just throw it over. Okay. Are you, uh, you ready? Yes, all right. All right. Yeah. Oh. All right, we'll go right up. Oh. oh. oh what's that? I don't know. Something crashed through the window. Oh, quick. Back under the stairs. Yes, Hurry. <laughs> What was it? I don't know. Wait a minute. There it is. It's a baseball. Those fool kids next door playing baseball in the big lot. They'll be coming after it. Go out and give it to them before they try to come down. All right, all right. I'll fall down and get it. Gee, I can't see down here. What if old Sourpuss Parker is... <laughs> oh. Hello, Mr. Parker. Hello, Freddy. Gee whiz, we're sorry about the wind. Oh, that's all right, Freddy. Here, let me hand the ball to you. Well, you can't reach, Mr. Parker. I'll come around and get it. No, no, no. You stay right out there. I'll... Here. You see? You can't reach up this far. I'll be down in a sec. No, you, you stay right there, I said. Oh, gee whiz, I only... Now, now, let me throw it up to you. Look out, Mr. Parker. You'll bust the other window. Here you are. See? Oh, go on now. Never mind the window. Go on with your game. We'll divvy up the first one, Mr. Parker. Look, I said never mind, Freddy. Go on, get out of here and close that window after you, will you? Okay, Mr. Parker. Gee whiz, what's the matter with him? That was close. Well, don't worry about that now. Let's get her into the car. Just a quiet Sunday afternoon, Henry. 
Nothing to mar its peaceful stillness. Except the small matter of getting the body of your wife, Ruth, up to Lake Arrowhead. Leaving it at the foot of the stairs at your lodge. Parking her car where she always leaves it. And returning with Daphne to Los Angeles. All without being seen. And, uh, oh yes, there's the matter, too, of Mr. Charles Hardcastle and the alibi. Henry, you've got to get hold of yourself. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe Hardcastle's left already. You're shaking like a leaf. Quiet, here he is. Hello, uh, Charlie? This is, uh, Henry Parker, Charlie. Yeah, I'm fine. Well, um, look, I was going to a show tonight, and, uh, I wondered if you'd like to join me. Oh, you're going to a committee meeting at the church. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Well, how about letting me drop you off? It's right near the theater. Well, good. Well, I'll pick you up in a few minutes. Huh? Oh, no, forget it, Charlie. I'm glad to do it. All right. <laughs> Goodbye. What's that? Charlie will swear to the high heavens I stayed in town. What time is it? Uh, uh five o'clock. You've only got an hour to spare. It'll take three hours to drive up there. Remember... I'll be waiting for you at the Y in the road. All right, Daphne. At the Y in the road. There's no turning back now, is there, Henry? The body is riding behind you now in the trunk of the car as you drive slowly down the street to pick up Charlie Hardcastle. You're beginning to settle down a little, aren't you? The terrible shock that gripped you at first is beginning to wear off, and you're thinking more clearly. Some of Daphne's quick, cool courage was there for you to borrow when you needed it most, when the panic made your knees weak, when you could think of nothing else except running blindly away to hide somewhere. At ten past five, you stop by for Charlie and nonchalantly begin to build your alibi as the two of you drive toward the church. Oh, oh, oh don't be silly, Charlie. It's no trouble at all driving around this way. Uh, nothing else to do, you know, just taking in a show. Yeah, you kind of surprised me, Henry, calling up that way. Oh, did I? Yeah, it's been a coon's day since we've been out together. Uh, by the way, where's Ruth? Uh, oh, been up at the lake for a little rest. <laughs> How I envy you that large. I'd like to get away sometime myself, you know. Well, I'll tell you what, Charlie, as soon as Ruth gets back, why don't you and Sadie go up to the lake? You're welcome to use our lot. Well, that's mighty nice of you, Henry. I'm sure Sadie will be thrilled to pieces. Oh, not at all. You've no idea what a great help you've been to me. Why, many times... What's that? I better pull over. You got a flat, I'm afraid. Flat? Oh, no, it can't be. It just can't. Well, take it easy, Henry. It's just a flat. No, listen, I'll tell you. I'll run on the rim. I don't care about the tire. I haven't got time Wait anyway. Wait a minute. I... Don't be silly, Henry. You don't want to go around ruining a perfectly good tire these days. Let's have a look at it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, the casing's okay. You're lucky. Now, look, Charlie, it's only a few blocks to the church. You better run along. I'll fix You're all talking to the best tire changer in the business. Come on, where are the two? No, come on. Go ahead, please, Charlie. What's the matter with you, Henry? Oh, well, I just don't want you to be late. It'll only take me a minute. I wouldn't think of it. I'll get the keys out of the dash. Uh, tools are in the trunk, aren't they? We'll get her fixed. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait Charlie. I'll, I'll get the keys. Already got them. Here, give them to me. Well, take it easy. I don't mind a bit. I'll get the spare out of the trunk. No, let, let me do it, I tell you. Something eating you, Henry. Oh, I'd just rather do it myself. You sure got the jitters. <laughs> well, don't you see, Charlie? I just don't want to see you get all messed up and dirty before church. Say, look, why don't you go up the street and slow the traffic down? Have them swing around me. I'm not too close to the curb, and the street's kind of narrow. Okay, Henry, if you say so. Here are the keys. <laughs> It's worse than ever now, Henry. Worse even than the moment when you look down at Ruth, lying still at the foot of the cellar stairs. One more second and Charlie would have opened the trunk, looked curiously at the blanket-wrapped, shapeless thing that was your wife, and it would have been all over. But you can't waste time thinking about that now. Your hands won't work. You fumble clumsily with a jack, with the lug nuts on the wheel, glance nervously at Charlie down at the corner directing traffic. A thousand years later, the tire has changed. And you're frantically trying to get the old wheel back in the trunk oh, when... Oh, come on. Hey, let me give you a hand with that, Henry. No, 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 no. I, I, Here, I can't, I can't. I'll take no, it. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, that's got it. 
All set? Yeah, yeah. You can go ahead and get in. We're uh, Hey, you left the jack out. Yeah, let me put it in the trunk. No, 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 no. It's all locked. I'll I'll throw it in the back seat. All right, Henry. Well, better get in. Yeah. Well, I got the keys right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of a tough break, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Charlie, uh... Hmm? I'm sorry I got the jumpy. Funny thing, though, flat tires always kind of throw me a little. Yeah, I don't think I was much of a help, though, standing out there. You're soaked to the skin. Yeah, I am. Well, you see, never would have done to have you show up at church this way. Uh... Oh, gosh, it's too bad you can't go to the show with me. Hey, you know, I, I was thinking, uh, maybe I won't go to church. I wouldn't mind seeing a movie tonight myself. Oh, oh now, I don't want to talk you out of going to church. Uh, don't get me wrong, Charlie. Oh, no, it was just uh, I can let you off right at the door. <laughs> uh, what's playing at the show tonight? Oh, I don't know, some second-rate picture. I'll tell you, I'll give you a report on it, and you can take it in tomorrow night if it's any good. <laughs> I'd hate to think I kept you out of church. All right, Henry. Don't worry. I'm going to church. Next, please. How many? Uh, could you tell me if the main feature's on, please? Starts in about six minutes. Oh, good. I always hate to come in during the middle of a picture. How many, please? Uh, just one. Fifty-five, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have change. Uh, can you break a 20? I've done it before. Let me try, huh? I'm terribly sorry. Oh, uh, here you are. Two, three, four, five, ten, and twenty. Thank you. Thank you. Awfully hot tonight, isn't it? <laughs> you can say that again. Next, please. Yeah, too warm to suit me. Earthquake weather, that's what I call it. Say, buddy, if you yes, don't sir. mind, oh, I... Oh, oh, pardon me, of course. Uh... Good night, miss. Get that guy. What a character. I'll see him in my sleep. That's right, Henry. They'll remember you now. A minute later, you're lost in the comfortable blackness of the theater at an aisle seat near the side exit. You sit there for a moment and then slip out unseen and hurry back to your car. It's six o'clock now, Henry. Just three hours left to make it. Sunday night. The traffic is coming the other way now, back into Los Angeles. Fifty, fifty-five, sixty miles an hour. And always you're careful to watch the rearview mirror. Would never do to be picked up for speeding, would it? I made wonderful time. And there's the Y in the road ahead. Oh, brother, it's dark. Where is she? Where? Oh, yeah. Oh, Daphne, thank heaven. You made it, darling. Is everything all right? I think so. Did anyone see you? No, I was awfully careful. You better go ahead. I'll follow you. You been up to the lodge? No, hurry. Go on ahead. We haven't time to talk. Okay. Daphne. Daphne, there's the lodge. Look, it's dark. Where does she usually leave the car? Over there at the side. Better move it now. No, no, we'll take her in first. Got the keys? Yeah, right here. All right, hurry and open the trunk. I'll help the carrier. Yeah. <laughs> We're in time, darling. We made it. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, since instructions coming with most 1946 cars say, use only premium-type motor oil, every driver should know what is meant by that word premium. 
Here's what the American Petroleum Institute has to say. Premium oil is one with special properties that make it resist oxidation and prevent bearing corrosion in today's high-efficiency motors, where regular oils do not give satisfactory service. Remember that, friends. To measure up to standards set by the American Petroleum Institute, a true premium oil must contain those two extra properties. Two, that is. But in Signal Premium, you get not just the required minimum of two, but in addition, three important other compounds, or a total of five. Five reasons why Signal Premium motor oil far outperforms even the finest of today's straight motor oils. For proof, Stop by your signal dealer. See his unretouched photos of actual road and laboratory tests that prove motors stay six times cleaner, cylinder wear is reduced one-third. Your guarantee of a sweeter running motor with Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now back to the Whistler. <laughs> You made it, Henry. The lodge is deserted, and there'll be plenty of time for you and Daphne to arrange Ruth's accidental fall at the foot of the steep staircase. Leave quietly, lock the door, and sneak back down the dark road to the highway. It's simple, isn't it? Your alibi will hold your sure of it. Yes, Henry, you're safe now. And strangely, the horror that gripped you when you first looked down on Ruth's body is gone. As the two of you carry it up the stairs to the front door of the lodge. Where's the key? I've got it right here. Just a minute. Oh, now where's that darn keyhole? Don't better get a match. No. Now, wait a minute. Here you are. Oh, good. That's got it. All right. I'll go in first. Easy now. Not so fast. Okay. All right, follow me. I know my way in the dark. Where are the stairs? Over this way. Henry! Who turned on the lights? Surprise! What? Surprise, Henry! Surprise! Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Joseph Kearns and Mary Lansing. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Bernard Girard and Zane Mann, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Stan Freeberg. Take a listen to this. Lights out, everybody. John and Blanche Bickerson. Well, if you're a fan of old-time radio like I am, then you want to order old-time radio's greatest shows. It's a collection of 60 of the most popular radio programs of all time. A full 30 hours of entertainment on 20 audio cassettes. All for only $60. Imagine, that's only $1 per show. The Lone Ranger, Jack Benny, Sam Spade, Charlie McCarthy, Suspense, The Green Hornet, and 54 more. All on top quality audio cassettes housed in a fitted album case. 
Plus, you'll receive a 64-page booklet giving you the inside story to each and every show. Call right now and enjoy Old Time Radio's greatest shows on a 30-day risk-free trial offer. That means if you're not completely delighted, simply return it within 30 days and pay nothing. Call now, 1-800-RADIO-48. That's 1-800-723-4648. This 30-day risk-free trial offer is only for a limited time, so you better call now, 1-800-RADIO-48. That's 1-800-723-4648. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you With new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, the affair at Stony Ridge. Myra's mind was numb, and there was a tight, tense feeling in her throat as she gripped the steering wheel of the old car, guiding it up the narrow road to Stony Ridge Farm. She decided it was best not to think, that it was better to have the dull, numb feeling than to go back over it again and again, to realize that it was true that Jody was gone, that he didn't love her, that Jody loved a tall, slender girl with painted lips and lazy, laughing eyes. It was spring, and a line storm was on the way. Soon she'd be back at Stony Ridge Farm with stubborn old Uncle Rance and sharp-tongued Bess, his wife. Soon the rain would come thudding down, drowning out her poor dream of happiness with Jody. And she'd go back to the life she thought she was leaving forever. The road narrowed, and she came over the rise to see Stony Ridge again, narrowing as though to hold imprisoned the farm that rests below Just one more turn, Myra. Don't forget your bag, Myra. The bag that holds your wedding dress. for a moment at the stillness of the house as you put down your bag and move into the kitchen. There's something puzzling in the cold ashes of the stove, the chill of the small water tank. It's later in the morning than you thought. Uncle Rance and Bess must be in the fields. Then, as you move to the back door, a man carrying a gun steps from the barn 30 feet away. A tall, wide-shouldered man who walks with the wary stealth of an Indian. Jody! Myra. It's you, it is you. What are you doing here, Myra? You come for me, haven't you, Jody? How long you been here? Just came. Just now? Yes. 
You did come for me, didn't you, Jody? Yeah. Yeah, I came for it. Jody, I'm so glad. So glad you'll never know. Let's get into the house. Yes, Jody. Yes. Let's sit in the parlor. It's warmer. What you come back here for? I had to, Jody. What do you mean, you had to? Sit down, Jody. Sit down next to me. You little fool, do you want to mess everything up? I told you when to meet me tonight. Don't be angry with me, Jody. When I go to look for you, you wasn't there. But I got in town early. An hour early. Searched for you. Then I saw you with her. Her? You were parked in a car with a girl. Had your arms around her. Oh, Jody. Where'd you go then? Where'd you spend the night? With a friend. I got a baby this morning, drove home. Spent the night in town, eh? Jody, how could you? It's okay. Don't cry. Everything's gonna be all right. Uh, Look, Myra, I come back for you, didn't I? Didn't Jody come back? Sure, I did. And, and you said we were gonna be married, you said so. Well, who said we were? Oh, uh, we. I'd like to see anybody in Tennessee try to stop us. Oh, cut out the crime. What do you say, huh? Jody. Yeah? Who was she? Her? Oh, she wasn't nobody. Just a town girl. Look, Myra, I'm just kidding around. Every man does that once in a while. Honestly, she don't mean a thing. You're my girl. Am I, Jody? We're getting mad today, ain't we? Today? Oh, Jody. Uncle Ransom ain't best. They must know I come back. Ransom best? I, I meant to tell you that they were just leaving when I come. Said something about helping somebody with the alfalfa before it rained. Storm coming then up let's and let's go, there. Jody. Let's go before they get back. Well, what's the rush? We've got plenty of time. They'll be stuck there a long time for the rains. Besides, uh, I want to talk with you. Jolie? Yeah? What you doing with that gun? This? Oh, I, I thought I'd get me a rabbit on the way up. Say, uh, listen, my... Is it on the level what they say about old Reigns? I mean, about all the cash he's got stashed away? Yeah. Uncle Reigns has got some money. Uh, I mean, a lot. I don't know, Jody. I don't know how much he's got. Why? Got no reason. No reason at all. Just heard he had a lot. Somebody said he kept it here. Didn't believe in banks. Who said that? It is here in the house, ain't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they said, all right. Jody, let's go. He kept me find me here after I ran out on him. Look, my bag's still packed. I'm all ready. Plenty of time. I like sitting here with you. This is the way it's going to be from now on. Just you and me together. It's so good. We're going to get along swell together. None of this farm work anymore. We'll head for the big city. I'll get me a job. The city? Oh, Jody. Nothing's going to be too good for you. All you're going to do is sit home and take it easy. How you like that? Go on, Jody. Talk some more. All the pretty clothes you want. And believe me, I mean it. Only, well, you, you got to do things my way. Anything. I'll do anything you ask. That's my girl talking. <laughs> Wish you're going to get along swell. You know, I just think. Yeah? About old Ransom. Yes, yeah, Joe. Where's he keep all that dough, do you know? Just curious. What? Well, I, I can't tell you that. You know, don't you? Yeah. You can tell me, Myra. Shucks, ain't I gonna be your husband? I can't tell you, Jody. It's their secret. Wouldn't be right. What's wrong about it? Don't you trust me? Please, Jody. That's it. You don't trust me. Me, the man you're gonna marry. Well, how do you like that? I'll trust you, Jody. Of course I do. You sound like it. Yeah, you sound a lot like it. 
Well, I guess that's it. Where are you going? What do you think? I'm going to beat it, that's what. I'm going home, and you can stick around in this hole the rest of your life. Don't go. You're going to tell me? <laughs> Look. What did old Rance ever do for you? Oh, best I did. Nothing, nothing but work you 12 hours a day and treat you like a dog. You don't know him a thing, honey. Not a thing. Come on now, honey. Well, where is it, huh? No, no. I, I want that money, Myra. Jody. Jody. I'm going to get it. Nobody, nothing is going to stop me. What are you going to do? Wait right here till Rance and Bess get back. Oh, they'll never tell you. They're mean and stubborn, money hungry. They'll tell me. They don't know them. They'd rather die. They're going to die. Jody. You think they can live after I get the money? They'd have me in jail and I after they got to the phone. Jody. I know you must. Oh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. You mustn't harm them. Well? It... It's in the cellar. Now you're talking. Well, what are we waiting for? The cellar's locked. We'll have to get the key. Okay. You'll find it on the shelf of the hall closet upstairs. Right hand side, I think. You're not skipping out on me while I'm up there. Think I'm a sucker? I'll be waiting right here, keeping an eye on the road below. All right, Jody. I'll get it. Get going, then. And listen, don't go fooling around up there. You just find that key and come down. Right down, you understand? Yeah. Yes, I understand. With the prologue of The Affair at Stony Ridge... The Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. O-I-L. Oil. The stuff drivers put in their motors. Because, well, because they know it's supposed to be there. But does the kind of oil you choose for your car really make any difference in the way your motor runs? If you've ever wondered about that, let me tell you about a test I recently saw. Two identical cars were run for 79,000 miles. One using today's finest straight motor oil, the other using Signal Premium Motor Oil. The new type lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with five scientific compounds. When these motors were torn down for inspection, the one using new Signal Premium Oil had only one-sixth as much carbon deposit and one-third less cylinder wear. Now, what does this mean to you? Well, less carbon means that your motor runs quieter, smoother. You can forget about fouled spark plugs and sticky valves. And less cylinder wear means more power, more mileage from your gasoline. Yes, those five scientific compounds in Signal Premium Oil really make a difference in the way your motor runs, which explains why your switch from old-fashioned straight motor oil to new Signal Premium is your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. And now, back to the whistler. Well, Myra, it's hard to believe that this man, this strange, savage creature is Jody. You're Jody, the man you love. He's waiting for you downstairs now as you start up to the closet to get him the key to the cellar where Uncle Rance has hidden his money. It's all been so bewildering. The sudden, breathtaking way you fell in love with Jody. The shock last night when you found him with a laughing-eyed girl. His concern over the money... As you start up the stairs, you try desperately to believe that Jody is playing a game, a weird, crazy joke, that soon he'll call to you and say it was all in fun. 
You stop on the stairs for a moment. What are you waiting for, Myra? No, Myra. This is no game. This is real. The closet, Myra. Reach up and get the key for Jody. He's waiting. Then, as you turn... Uncle Rance's room, Myra. You can see through the half-open door. Dresser drawers wide open, clothes scattered crazily about the floor. A chair lying on its back, broken in a dozen places. And on the bed, a crumpled sheet with an ugly red stain. Now you know, Myra. Your Jody has killed. All you can think of now is the telephone. You've got to get to the telephone. Down in the kitchen. Quietly, Myra, quietly. Down the hall, slowly, Myra. Carefully. Myra! Yes, Jody? What's going on up there? It's dark, Jody. I can't find it right away. I know it's here. Shake it up, I'll come up and get it myself. No, Jody. No, I'll find it. It's here somewhere. I'll be right down with it. The rain is coming down hard now as you move silently down the hall to the back steps leading to the kitchen. Jody had never meant to marry you, had he, Myra? It was a trick to get you away from the farm so he could commit his crime without a witness. The rain, Myra, the blessed rain. It'll cover the sound of the creaking stairs. Slowly you start down. Three more steps. And into the kitchen. Now, easy, Myra. Lift the receiver. Hello, Myra. <laughs> Better hang up the phone, hadn't you? Jody. I told you not to fool around up there. Shouldn't have gone into that room, Myra. Room? Yeah. I kind of liked you, too. I really do. Now you can open the cellar door. We're going downstairs, you and me. What you gonna do with me? What can I do? You know too much. Go ahead now, like a good guy. I'll be right behind. Jody, don't. Start walking. Jody! Start walking. Mm-hmm. Who's that? I don't know. Quiet. Listen. Mm-hmm. It's Benson's horn. Benson? An old friend, Uncle Rains. What's he want? I don't know. Don't make a sound. You wait till he goes away. Keep your mouth closed if you know what's good for me. He comes in the back way, I'll get him. And I mean get him. But he will. He always does when nobody's home. Then it's going to be too bad. Let me talk to him. I'll send him away. I won't let him in. That's up to you. Tip him off or let him in and you know what happens. I promise I won't. I'll be right next to you behind the door. I'll be listening and watching. Now open it. Hello, Myrie. Thought nobody was to home. They're gone. I mean, Uncle Rains and Aunt Bessie. They're helping the fiddles get in the house out. Ain't here, huh? I'd ask in, but Aunt Bess just... Wash the kitchen floor. Uh, I mean, well, last night... I don't know as I blame you. Anyway, I just stopped for a second. What's the matter, girl? You look sort of peaked. I'm all right. Look peaked to me. What you need is a big cup of sulfur molasses, most like. Well, tell Rance I was around. I will, Mr. Benson. Nothing I can do for you in town? No. No, thank you, Mr. Benson. There's nothing you can do for me in town. Well, uh, I think you better get out of the rain. Bye, Myrie. Bye. He's gone. It's getting late, Myrie. 
Jody, isn't there anything? There ain't nothing else to do. Sell the door. Unlock it. Jody. Get gone. Start walking down. I'm right behind you. Keep moving. Well? There it is. Up there on the top shelf. Old leather trunk. Get it. I can't reach it. It's up much too high. Get a chair. Now get up there and pull it down. It's heavy. I said pull it down. I'm trying to, Jody. I can't move it. You ain't half trying. Get off in that chair. Go on, now get up. Now hold it steady while I get up there. I said hold it steady. It is heavy at that. I'm getting it, though. It's coming. Hang on to that chair, Meyer. You're free, Myra. He's locked in the cellar and you're safe. Quick now, start your car. You fumble for the ignition switch. The keys, Myra. The ignition keys in your purse and the purse is in the house. You'll have to go back. In the kitchen. I'm sure I left. It's not here. He's pounding on that door, Myra. He'll break through in a minute. Where did I? It's in the cellar. I took it with me. The door's giving way. Nothing to do now but hide behind the sofa. Myra! Myra! The door. She's out of the car. He's outside in the rain looking for you. Quietly, you slip up to your room and lock the door. He'd never believe you'd dare hide there. You can see him through a crack in the window up by the car. It's quiet now. Nothing but the rain and the bawling of the cattle outside. Then he turns and comes back in the house. You stand there tense, waiting for the nightmare to begin again. Myra. I know you're in there, Myra. Open the door. I want to talk to you. I won't hurt you, honest. I know you're thinking about Rance and Fess, but ain't you better off without them? They was mean and stingy. Stop acting like a little fool, Myra. I know you're in there. I'm going to bust the door down in a minute. <laughs> You look out the window, 20 feet to the wet ground sloping steeply away from the house. Then you remember the window of the next room on your left. By leaning far out, you can just reach it. You hear what I said, Myra? I'm going to bust this door down. You get your finger under the sill and push. And slowly the sash rises. Quietly, you let yourself out, hanging onto the sill, letting your body swing into space. You get hold of the sill and pull yourself up and into the room. Now, I've got to get down to that phone. You're a clever kid, Myra. No, you don't. Look at me. Shut up, I'll Kill you if you open your trap once more, understand? Okay. Now, where's that money? In your suitcase. It ain't in a suitcase. Where'd they put it? I thought it was. Don't lie to me. Where'd they put it? Jody, I don't know. I, I can't. Dizzy, I feel faint, Jody. No. Where did they put it? Let me sit down. Let me sit down. Answer me. Did you hear what I said? I... You're going to tell me where old man Rains hid that money, and I, I have to beat it out of your skull. I... Listen to me, Myra. Where did he put it? I'll kill you, so help me. Where did he put it? 
Where? Where did he put it? The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to clear up just one more point about that new signal premium motor oil we were talking about before. Where to get it? Throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico, you'll find Signal Premium Motor Oil at those friendly, dealer-owned signal stations, identified by the big signal circle sign in yellow and black. The same stations featuring that super-powered new Signal gasoline that now helps you go farther than ever. The same stations that are famous for their more conscientious service. Yes, I said more conscientious. Because every signal dealer is in business for himself and has a personal reason for keeping your car and you happy. Man, with a combination like that of quality products and finer service, it's no wonder that these days when overage cars have to keep on going, more and more drivers are switching to signal. It's another mighty good reason, I'd say, for making your next oil change a change to new signal premium motor oil. Your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. And now, back to the whistler. The last you remember, Myra, is Jody leaning over you. Shrieking that he'd kill you if you didn't tell him where the money was. And you didn't know. There was nothing you could do. You were helpless. You knew he was going to kill you, Myra, and you were helpless. The room started whirling. He came closer. Then everything went black. When you opened your eyes to look around, you discovered you were in bed in your room. Everything was quiet. What happened? Judy! Take it easy, girl. Everything's all right. Oh, Mr. Bates. You came back. You came back. Yep. Just about the time I got to town, I figures there's something mighty wrong out here. Wrong? Hear them cattle? Rents wasn't the sort of man to leave his critters beller and to be milked. Too good a farmer for that. No, there was something fishy going on, so I come back with the sheriff. But Uncle Rains his money. Jody. <laughs> Funny in a way. I guess cause I've been advising Rance for years on his uh, money matters, I'm the only one he ever told where he kept that money. Never told nobody else, not even Bessie. Know where it was? Sewed up in the lining of his old overcoat. The coat Jody buried him in. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Peggy Weber and Edmund McDonald. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Louis Esty. Music by Wilbur Hatch is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. 
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Blind Bet. Tom Brayton stood quietly in the darkness, in a corner near one of the cabanas, hidden from the open courtyard by a screen of shrubbery and palm trees. The luminous dial of his wristwatch told him it was 11.15, but he hadn't long to wait. He looked with satisfaction on the courtyard and fountain, down the long line of cabanas past the huge, brilliant Casino del Rey, rising like a fairy castle in the desert. The finest, the costliest, the most luxurious gambling resort in the country. And all of it, the music, the glitter, the throngs of well-heeled socialites, a tribute to him... A monument to the patient, calculating gambler's mind that brought this all to pass on a barren alkali flat. Suddenly he stiffened. Two men were coming down the steps of the casino. One of them very drunk, the other helping him. Tom held his breath as they moved nearer. Uh, the old boy, don't get me wrong. You're the best little bartender in the land. It's just that I object to these high-handed... Now, I'm sorry, Mr. Warren. I'm just following Mr. Braden's orders. He said to put you to bed, and that's where you're going. Uh, but I don't want to go to bed, don't you see? I want to go back to the casino. Yeah, I know, sir, but Mr. Braden... Never mind, Mr. Braden. Did it ever occur to you, old man, that Mr. Braden owns exactly one half of this place? That I own the other half? Listen, don't you see, Mr. Warren? He's afraid that in your condition you'll make a bad impression on the guest. <laughs> He's afraid I'll make a bad impression. Now, that's funny. That's very, very funny. Tom Braden, Karjak. Afraid I'll make a bad impression on the guest. Yes, sir. Uh, Here, here, let me open the door for you. uh, Now, this one. Yes, sure. Now, maybe you don't know that I picked Tom Braden up in a rigged house, a clip joint where he was dealing blackjack. Uh, he was not. Sure, I yeah. took him to the right people. I made his connections for him. I... Yes, I know. Come now, on. Let now, let me finish. I... Let me finish. I found the money for him, too. A half a million bucks cash on the barrelhead. Hazel Symington didn't know him from Adam. I took him to her. I spoke the good word and bingo. She comes through with 500,000 bucks, just like that. Yeah, sure, I know. You That's know what? What? Now he wants it all. What do you think of that? I think you better go to bed. Now, come on, Mr. Warren, please. Uh, You don't believe me, do you? Yes, You don't believe he wants it all now. Oh, don't matter. He's not going to get it anyway. Not with that half million dollar note coming up next week. Listen, will you please get inside Uh, and get to bed? Now, come on, will you? I'll go to bed. All right, come on. Well, Tom, your partner's speaking is peace again. Same song, 87th verse. You smile to yourself and continue to wait there in the darkness. Finally, you see Ed leave and walk back up to the bar. You stand there for five minutes longer, just for good measure. And then walk quietly up to the door, whip a silk handkerchief from your breast pocket, place it over the knob, and let yourself in with your pass key.
You flicked your cigarette lighter. <sighs> Just as you thought. John Warren is dead to the world, lying on the bed fully clothed. Remarkable what a couple of knockout drops will do, isn't it, Tom? Quickly, you move around the room. Make sure all the windows are closed tightly. Then over to the gas heater in the fireplace. Once again, the silk handkerchief over the valve. Ah, there. John Warren was right, wasn't he, Tom? You do want it all. With the prologue of The Blind Bet, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. Let me see. One, two, three, five, nine. Just nine more days before your Fourth of July holiday. For most folks with cars, that means a trip somewhere. To the mountains or to the beach. But for too many folks, it's also going to mean accidents. Accidents that could have been avoided by an ounce of prevention. Here's what I mean. Traffic deaths in April were 47% higher than a year ago. One big reason is that today's aging cars are wearing out. In the recent police traffic check program, one out of every three cars inspected had either defective brakes, tires, lights, horn, or windshield wiper. Little parts that cost so little to fix, but can cause such big accidents. So play safe. Stop by your signal dealers to have your car checked over. Caring for your car is his business, and you'll find your signal dealer is prepared to serve you in many ways. He can repair that tire with the weak spot or retread the one that's worn smooth. He'll replace that worn-out fan belt, radiator hose, or windshield wiper, or put a new bulb in that burned-out stoplight. But take a tip. See your signal dealer this week before the last-minute rush. Then, when the 4th of July arrives, you'll know your car is ready for a safe and happy holiday. And now, back to the whistler. You do want all the money. It took the three of you to build the Casino Del Rey. John Warren's socialite friend. Mrs. Symington's money and your brain. And now you've got to have it all. You stand there at the bar, calmly talking to Ed, the bartender, while John Warren lies dying in his cabana. Like every decision you ever made, it was a matter of odd, wasn't it, Tom? A good bet. A thousand to one, he'll be found dead in the morning. The victim of an unfortunate accident involving too much alcohol and a gas heater he forgot to light. So you wait there calmly until finally you see Mrs. Symington waddle into the game room and put her 200 pounds next to the poker table, pull in her cards with those fat, jewel-covered arms and begin to play. You manage to get along with her, don't you, Tom? Of course you do. After all, there's the personal note she holds against you for a half million coming up for renewal next week. Sorry I had to interrupt you, Hazel. Were you winning? Oh, I'm not much of a gambler, I guess. I never bet unless I have a sure thing. You can't win that way. What's on your mind? John. Oh, I suppose he's drunk again. Well, I just had Eddie put him to bed. I think the three of us ought to have a meeting in the morning. I've talked to him till I'm blue in the face. You know, it worries me to have John jeopardize your investment. Now, look, Tommy. We talk the same language. You can lay it on the table. What do you mean? You were dealing a two-bit blackjack game when John Warren introduced us. And when my late lamented husband married me, I was a hash slinger. So you don't need John anymore, eh? I want to get rid of him. What's the matter, Tom? You like the idea? Well, it's pretty rough. Oh? You mean you think that we can... Well, I mean you can stuff his pockets with money and put him on a plane. Send him to Havana or Honolulu. By the time he gets back, you can buy him out. Oh... What did you think I meant? Oh, just that. I wonder. Hmm? Nothing. You better run along. Here comes my good friend, Dr. Latham. Okay, we'll meet tomorrow, huh? Well, if you want to. Oh, by the way, don't worry about that note. I'm in no hurry for the money. Of course not, Hazel. You know I'm not the worrying kind. (laughs) 
so Hazel goes back to the game with Dr. Latham. Disgusting, isn't it, Tom? Latham, 25 years her junior, fawning, flattering, fearful that the life she's leading will kill her before he marries her. That's odd, isn't it? Both in the same boat. You're afraid something will happen to her, too, before you get your hands on that note. You walk up to your apartment over the casino, sit there in the silence at your desk, idly shuffling a pack of cards, thinking... It was a good bet, and you're improving your hand all the time. Eddie, the bartender, was the last man to see John alive. No one saw you leave or come back to the casino. Hazel will testify you expected to meet John in the morning. Yes, Tom, it's a good bet. Come in. Oh, Dr. Latham. Thought I might have a word with you, Mr. Braden. Sure, how much do you want? Do you always think in terms of money? Of course, so do you. I wanted to talk to you about Mrs. Symington. Well, she inherited about $30 million, but I don't know how much she has left. I am not interested in Mrs. Symington's money. Of course you're not. It's her beautiful soul that attracts you. Come on, Doc, come to the point. I happen to know we cleaned you the first night you were here, that Mrs. Symington has been staking you regularly, and that if the AMA knew you were practicing in this state, they'd jerk your license, if they haven't done it already. Now, what do you want? We seem to have a mutual interest in Mrs. Symington's health. Mm-hmm. If anything happened to her, it isn't likely her financial manager would see his way clear to renew the note she holds on you. Right? What's wrong with Mrs. Symington's health? Good heavens, man. You have eyes, haven't you? She's dangerously heavy for her age. Overindulges in everything. Food, drinks, gambling, opiates. What kind of opiates? Ordinary sedatives to help her sleep. Terribly hard on her heart, nevertheless. If you knew she had heart trouble, why'd you let her have them? Because if I cut her off, she'd only buy them someplace else. I'm... Very much interested in Hazel, Mr. Graydon. Unfortunately, I can't say the feeling's reciprocated. Apparently, she depends on you a great deal for advice. You're a little obscure, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Braden, if you were to help me arrange, say, an alliance with Hazel... You'd arrange to get the note for me, is that it? Exactly. It wouldn't cost you a cent. What do you say? No. Why? Well, in the first place, she isn't stupid. Every fortune hunter in the country has been after her for years. And in the second place... (laughs) You double-cross me. Good night, Doctor. So the doctor has the idea, too, hasn't he, Tom? Something about Hazel's health. Something about her estate moving in to collect a half-million-dollar note, should anything happen to her. You know you can never pay it. They might as well ask for the moon. You knew from the first that you'd have to cross this bridge someday... Just as you knew you'd have to eliminate John Warren. But this one isn't easy, is it, Tom? Somehow, some way, you have to get your hands on that note. Yes, it's something to think about. Something to keep your mind spinning all night. And then... Oh. Oh, what the devil. <coughs> yes? Hey, Mr. Braden, this is Eddie. Oh, yes, Eddie. Uh, Mr. Warren's dead. What? He didn't answer his phone, so I went down there. I opened the door and the place was full of gas. Did you call the doctor? Latham's there now. Said Mr. Warren must have got cold during the night and got up to turn on the gas. But he was in a fog and went back to bed without lighting it. Oh. Tough, isn't it, boss? Yeah. Tough. It's the verdict, Tom. Yeah, it's all over, Hazel. The good sheriff just left. Just like that. Just like that. You're a good gambler, Tom. (laughs) You play a pretty tough hand yourself. I've got a couple of high cards, but I'm afraid I'm a little overcautious. Oh? Yes. Cabana tomorrow. I think we ought to talk about that note. Well... The best card you played was an ace. My luck. The sheriff said it was an accident. Oh, of course. The only one who might deny it is John. Oh, pardon me. Am I interrupting a post-mortem? This is no time for flippancy, Doctor. Hazel and I lost a good friend last night. I'm sorry. I should have known how deeply grieved you are. Hmm, you don't look so well, Hazel. I never felt better in my life. I don't think you should play tonight. Now, let's not go through that again. You're overexcited. You've been that way for months. If you persist in this, if you keep up with this nonsense with sleeping tablets... I'm glad you mentioned that, Doctor. I'm out of sleeping tablets. Bring some over tonight, will you, please? But, Hazel, don't you understand? Hazel, you'd, uh... Better listen to her. I'm going back to dress, Doctor. I'll expect you in an hour. Well, I'll bring you one tablet. And that's all. Just one. (laughs) 
Well, Tom, the picture has changed. You wonder what's on her mind, why she wants to talk about the note. One thing is certain, she must have it there with her, and it would be just like her to toss it carelessly in a dresser drawer. And there's only one way you'll ever be safe, Tom. You've got to get your hands on that note and destroy it. You're smart enough to realize that this is a good bet, too. That it'll be a long time before you're dealt another hand like this one. But it's a blind bet, Tom. And the one thing that changed the odds completely, the thing that made your whole plan so ridiculously futile, took place a few hours later in Mrs. Symington's cabana. Now, I hope you understand, Hazel. I'll leave the sedative here, but I don't want you to take it unless it's absolutely necessary. Oh, just a minute. There's my call. Yes? Ready with New York, Mrs. Symington. Hello, Mr. Pierce. Yes, Mrs. Symington. What can I do for you? I'm afraid I made a mistake, Mr. Pierce. I just found I included that Tom Braden note in those papers I mailed you last week. Uh, yes, it's due next week. Uh, did you want me to start action on it here? No, I mail it to me at once and I'll take care of it here. Uh, very well. Uh, is there anything else, Mr. Symington? No, that's all, Mr. Pierce. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, what are you going to do? Foreclose? No. I'm going to tear it up. What? Tear up a note for a half a million? Are you crazy? I don't think so. Under the circumstances, I'm getting off cheap. You see, Doc, I've decided that this business is a little vicious for a woman of my age. Yes, but my good woman, a half million dollars. You don't know what you're doing. And you don't know Braden. It's huh. quite a decision. Indeed it is. I only hope I didn't make it too late. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty generous gift, Hazel. Yes. And I want him to know he's getting it. That's very important. I want him to know tonight. <laughs> Yes, Tom, it was a blind bet. And it might have been off if you'd heard that conversation, if you'd known about the blind card. But you didn't until it was too late. Shortly before midnight, you see Hazel and the doctor come into the game room, but you keep your eyes on your cards. The less you say tonight, the better. Hazel is nobody's fool. I'll bet, too. Uh, uh, hello, Brayton. If you don't mind, I'd like to... Doc, later. I'm busy. Well, could you excuse yourself for a moment? It's a matter of some importance. Look, if you want to cash a check, Eddie will take care of you. Now, run along, will you? I'll see you later. It'll only take a minute. It's... It's about the note. Oh. Well, I, uh... I can't leave my guess. You understand that? All right, Braden. Later. What's the matter with him? He's coming later. Can't leave his guests. Sit down. I still think you're making an awful mistake, Hazel. I know what I'm doing. You're afraid of him, aren't you? Why did you say that? I can see it in your face. Oh, you better stick to your pills. I'm not afraid of anyone. I'm serious, Hazel. You don't look very well tonight. I think you'd better go to bed early. Oh, well. Can I depend on you to tell Tom about of the note? Of course, of course. I'll walk over to your cabana. Oh, you? nonsense. I'll go alone. Well, you're acting sensible for once. Remember your promise about the sleeping tablet, hmm? I won't take it, unless I need it. Oh. Yeah, let me help you with your wrap. Don't you worry about Braden. I'll talk to him sometime tonight. You sit there and watch them, Tom. See Hazel walk to the door and the doctor turn and come back. It was about the note, he said. And you're sure now... But there could only be one reason why she'd be so anxious to talk to you about the note. She's changed her mind, of course. It's just like her. She's changed her mind and wants to call in her note. But why? Why would she do that? You know the doctor could never convince her. She has no respect for him. She must have talked to someone. Theodore Ray, just a moment. I'll connect you. Yes, sir, I'm ringing. Just a moment, please. Hello, Ellie. One moment. Oh, hello, Mr. Braden. Busy night, huh? Not so bad. Lots of uh, long-distance calls? A few. You wouldn't happen to remember who they were for, would you? Well, let's see. Uh, there was one from Chicago for Mr. Piper down in 14. Uh -huh. And one from New York for Mrs. Symington. I and, see. Uh, let me think. There was another, too. Oh, that's all right. I'm just curious. Thanks, Ellie.
That's it, Tom. You're sure now, aren't you? Pierce called her from New York and changed her mind about the note. Of course. She wants her money and you can't get it for her. You avoid Dr. Latham. You don't want to hear about the note. You have to be able to prove that you believed Hazel was going to renew it. That no one told you differently. That there was every reason in the world why you'd want her to live. Yes, Tom. There's only one way out now. That single sleeping tablet in Hazel's room, the one the doctor left for her, is going to be the last one she'll ever take. Oh, Eddie. Yes, Mr. Braden, can I fix your drink? No, I'm going up to my apartment. Look, I don't want to be disturbed in any circumstances. Did you see the doctor? No. He's been after me all evening. Says he's got to see you. That it's awfully important. Well, I can't see him tonight. I got a headache. I feel rotten. I'm going to bed. Tell him that. Okay, boss. Anything you say. It's three in the morning when you use the pass key again. This time on the door of Hazel's cabana. You stop for a moment and listen. Ah, she must have taken the tablet because she's sound asleep. It's a good sleep, isn't it, Tom? Worth half a million to you. You walk quietly to the bed and pick up the extra pillow. Stand over her for a second and then... She stopped breathing now. It's all over, Tom. You haven't too much time to find the note. Carefully now. No one must know the place has been ransacked. The silk handkerchief again. First the dresser. Out here. A nightstand, maybe. Luggage. It's in a luggage. Yeah, the desk. Why didn't I think of that? Sure. Wait a minute. I gotta get hold of myself. I gotta think. The cabinet, maybe. Ah, oh, she's hidden it. Yeah, behind a picture. Under the rugs. In the sofa, the medicine chest in the bathroom. It's got to be somewhere. I know it's here. I know it. No, no, it isn't here. Nowhere else to look. I got to get out of here. I got to get out of here. The bet didn't pay off, did it, Tom? You start out the door now, and then suddenly turn to take one last look. Nothing must appear disturbed. The lights from a distant automobile illuminate the room for a second, just as your eyes fall on the dressing table, and your heart almost stops. You nearly put the noose around your own neck, didn't you, Tom? There, on top of the dresser in plain sight, is the sleeping tablet. Hazel didn't take it. Quickly, you walk to the bathroom, fill a glass half full of water, put her fingerprints on it, and set it on the nightstand. Then you walk into the bathroom and get rid of the tablet. At least they won't get you for the murder. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a question. What would you think of a driver who deliberately did something that would clog up his motor with six times as much carbon and wear out his cylinders 50% faster than necessary? Well, friends, that's just what every driver is doing who's still using straight oil in his motor. Now, here's what I mean. In exhaustive road and laboratory tests, today's finest straight motor oil was compared with the amazing new type signal lubricant that combines five scientific compounds with 100% pure paraffin base. Signal Premium Motor Oil. The result? The motors using Signal Premium Oil actually showed only one-sixth as much carbon and one-third less cylinder wear. Get that? Motors stayed six times cleaner. Cylinder wear was reduced one-third with new Signal Premium Motor Oil. No wonder drivers who want to keep wear down and performance up are switching from old-fashioned straight motor oil. Switching now to the amazing new type signal lubricant that's your guarantee of a sweeter running motor. Signal Premium Motor Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. (laughs) 
The next day, the Casa del Rey is in an uproar. But you're ready for it, aren't you, Tom? The sheriff is suspicious, of course. Two deaths in as many days add up to more than a coincidence to him. He asks careful questions, and you give him careful answers. You tell him what you heard Dr. Latham tell Mrs. Symington about the sleeping tablets. How she laughed at his warning that they were extremely dangerous, possibly even fatal. The sheriff is quite interested in that, isn't he? A few minutes after he leaves to question the doctor, your telephone rings. Yes? Braden, this is Latham. The coroner and I have just finished examining Mrs. Symington. Oh? No marks of violence, no signs of poison. She died of a heart attack. You told him about the sleeping tablets? Of course. No reason to conceal it. You'll substantiate my story that I gave them to her under protest, of course. What are you worried about? I won't mention the note if you won't say anything about my owing her money. I wasn't worried about the note. I'm sure she would have renewed it today. That's just it. She was going to tear it up. What? What are you talking about? She called her lawyer in New York. I'll have to call you back. Someone at the door. Tear it up. Tear it up. She was going to tear it up a half million... Uh, Mr. Braden. Huh? Oh. Well, what do you want? I'm from the DA's office. Yeah? You're under arrest, Mr. Braden. Suspicion of murder. What are you talking about? She died of a heart attack. The murder of John Warren. You're crazy. That was an accident. Maybe. But we received a letter from Mrs. Symington this morning. She mailed it last night. Letter? It seems she was afraid for her life. Looks like she wasn't far wrong. What do you mean? It was marked to be only opened only in case of my death. It was an affidavit, Mr. Braden. She swears she saw you turn on the gas in John Warren's cabana. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Gerald Moore and Myra Marsh. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Bill Tobin, music by Wilbur Hatch is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you With new Signal Gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Solid Citizen.
Worthington Potter was a solid citizen. Cultured, able, and above all else, dignified. For dignity was Worthington's keyword. New England dignity, Back Bay Boston dignity, the right clubs, the proper friends, clothes from Brooks Brothers. For some years, he had acted as financial manager for Althea Kendall, a wealthy Boston widow who thought Worthington was a fine man, wise in the ways of commerce. Unfortunately, she was not entirely correct. Worthington, while long on dignity, was short on financial genius. A regrettable situation, since in his capacity of financial manager, he had occasion to handle large sums of money for Mrs. Kendall. Oddly enough, this is what brought Worthington to Mrs. Kendall's on what was to prove a rather crucial visit. You've been so quiet all afternoon, Mr. Potter. Are you worried about something? I was hoping I could conceal it, Mrs. Kendall. You have a strange power over me. I've been conscious of it always. Strange power? Mrs. Kendall, words are hard to find at a moment like this. Oh, really, Mr. Potter? Quite. Our relationship during the past ten years has been, I trust, as pleasant for you as it has been for me. Well, of course, Mr. Potter. You're a charming woman, Mrs. Kendall. Why, Mr. Potter... I must admit that there have been moments when my impetuous nature came very near forcing me to cast aside dull business to forget my position to hold you in my arms. Mr. Potter, you... you felt like this for some time. Since the moment I first laid eyes on you, Mrs. Kendall, you will forgive me, won't you? I fear my heart has got a little the better of me. Please, Mr. Potter, don't feel that way. I... I admire you for saying it. Mrs. Kendall, uh, Althea, will you do me the very great honor of... of... Of what, Worthington? Of becoming Mrs. Potter. Oh, oh Worthington, I... I don't know what to say. Will you, Althea? Well, a girl has to have time to think, Worthington. One can't decide so... so suddenly. Don't think, Althea. Listen, listen to your heart. I must have time. I... I'll let you know when you come next Friday. Say it now, Althea. No, no, I must get hold myself. Next Friday, Worthington. Next Friday. Too bad, Worthington. Next Friday. Seven days of waiting. And you've got to know now, don't you? Particularly after the phone call you get from Stratton, your broker, that afternoon. I can't understand it, Stratton. Don't you see, ma'am? I've given you every cent I have. I can't advance more money. I'm sorry, Potter. Only one answer, then. I'll simply have to sell you out. You can't do that. I... I'd be ruined. How much do I have to put up? Ten thousand. This afternoon. Ten thousand. Market's barely holding. Ten thousand will jack it up for the time being. But, but listen, Stratton. Uh, Potter, this is your money you're playing around with, isn't it? How dare you? Sorry, old boy. Too bad to have to put it to you this way. Ninety-five hundred this afternoon, or we sell you out. And it isn't your money, is it, Worthington? It belongs to Althea Kendall. Somewhere you've got to find $9,500. At 2.30 that afternoon, you're in the vault of the bank, going over the contents of Althea Kendall's safe deposit box. Yes, it's a desperate measure, but you're ready to try anything. Stock certificates, bonds, mortgages, but nothing negotiable. Nothing you can turn into 10,000 in cash. Then suddenly, you recognize something in the bottom of the box. An earring. A very old one with an emerald in the center surrounded by small rubies. You remember now. The mate to it was stolen years ago. And Althea has left it in the vault ever since undisturbed. There'd be no reason in the world for her to get it out again. It'll probably stay there till she dies. Uh, Yes, Mr. Potter, I thoroughly agree with you. It's a very fine piece. Please come to the point, Mr. Graves. How much will you pay for it? Uh, Let me examine it again. Mm. Yes, it's a genuine Italian Renaissance without a doubt. Perhaps even a Cellini. Looks like his work. 
It's a tragedy, of course, that you've lost the mate. The matched pair would bring at least a hundred thousand, perhaps even more. A hundred thousand? Yes. But for the single earring, though, I, I'm afraid ten thousand is the best I can do. Oh. Uh, very well. There's just one thing, Mr. Graves. If you haven't sold it, I'd like an understanding that I can buy it back in, say, a week or ten days. I'd agree to pay you your profit, of course. That is fair enough. Uh, my price will be twelve thousand five hundred. I must warn you, however, that I won't hold it if I find a buyer. I understand, Mr. Graves. I'll let you know the moment I want it. Now, about the cash? Yes, yes, go on, Stratton. The 10,000 got here in the nick of time, Potter. But you're going to need the rest before you're through. How much? 50,000, roughly. You think the market will hold until, say, next Friday? I don't know. Can you have the funds by then? I'll get them, Stratton. I'll get them. With the prologue of Solid Citizen, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. This Thursday, July 4th, you'll be celebrating Independence Day. 170 years of independence for America. The land for folks who love the independent way of life. Today, with more and more returning veterans expressing a desire to get into business for themselves, there's a tremendous rebirth of that independent spirit. And that's good, because independent businessmen are capable of great things. For instance, not long after World War I, a small group of young Westerners formed their own oil company, Signal Oil Company. In the face of what seemed overwhelming competition, these determined young men succeeded in bringing to Western motorists the first anti-knock gasoline at regular price. They sold Signal gasoline only through independent service stations, just a handful of them at that time. But motorists liked Signal products, liked them so well that the Signal organization grew and grew until today independent Signal dealers serve seven Western states from Canada to Mexico. Now, obviously, there must be good reasons why so many motorists have switched to signal. You can discover these reasons for yourself by just stopping at your own neighborhood signal dealers. There you'll find the tops in gasoline and automotive lubricants, backed by signal's 15-year tradition of quality. And you'll enjoy more thorough, more conscientious service, because signal dealers, being in business for themselves, have an incentive to serve you better. A fine example of the American way of doing business that has made and kept our land such a great place in which to live and make a living. And now, back to the whistler. your good name is at stake, isn't it? Your dignity, your social standing, your honor, it all depends now on one thing. Each day you watch the stock tickers nervously. Each day you breathe a sigh of relief when the exchange closes and the stock is held. Yes, Worthington, only one thing can save you. Althea's answer to your proposal of marriage. Somehow you live through until Friday and hurry out to Althea's home. Althea. Worthington. It's good to see you. The suspense was unbearable, Althea. You have no idea what I went through. There were several times when I almost gave in. I even had the receiver off the hook at one point. For I'm so awkward at this sort of thing. Why, Worthington, not at all. I, I think you're rather skillful. Uh, why, thank you, my dear. It's, uh, it's very kind of you to say that. You, you do love me, don't you? Althea, you'll never know how much I need you. I've come to the crossroads, Althea. One way leads to you, to your love, to the happiness we'll find together. The other way, to, to loneliness and misery. Althea. Yes, Worthington. You, you have decided, haven't you? Yes, Worthington, I've decided. It was a dreadfully difficult decision to make. I, I couldn't make it alone. You went to someone? Well, Dr. Strickland came to the house, of course, on his weekly visit. My heart, you know. Oh, yes, your heart. He didn't entirely approve. Oh, that's ridiculous. Your heart is... My heart is not very good, Worthington. 
He was a little alarmed about my excitement. I see. I uh, think we should be entirely frank, don't you, Worthington? Why, of course, Althea. The doctor suggested that perhaps it was my money you wanted. That's outrageous. It's, it's libelous. How dare he insinuate such a thing? What did you tell him? I told him to leave the house. Why, I should think you would. You see, that was the day I decided to marry you. Althea, darling, I knew you would. It's so right for us. Just a minute, Worthington. Eh? That was three days ago. You, you haven't changed your mind. There must be a power somewhere, Worthington, to take care of lonely old ladies. Oh, I don't understand. Do you recognize this, Worthington? Why... Why, it's an earring, isn't it? Yes, an earring. Where did you get it? I can understand why you're curious. Uh, Mr. Barclay brought it to me yesterday afternoon. Barclay? In response to an advertisement I've been running in a collector's magazine for years. Ever since one of the pair was stolen, they were very valuable, you see. My first husband bought them for me in Italy. Of course, I went to my safe deposit box immediately to get out the mate to it. I see. Naturally, marriage is out of the question, Worthington. I have no alternative but to expose you for the cheating, lying embezzler that you are. You wouldn't dare. You wouldn't dare disgrace me, do you hear? Do you understand Mr. that? Potter, You're not please. going to toss me out of the gutter after ten years. I won't allow it. I won't be disgraced and held up as a laughing stock. I'd kill you first. Oh, Mr. Potter, you please don't. stupid, stumbling old hag. Mr. Do you think I'd marry you? Yes, it was your money, your uh, filthy pile of gold. Oh, I've taken it for years. That's all I wanted. Uh, I bowed and scraped and groveled in the gutter for you. And you're not going to open your mouth, you hear? Oh, please, yes, I'd you. kill you. Uh, I'd kill you in a minute. Oh, please, right uh, now, if I had to. Uh, Althea, what's the matter? Uh, she's dead. I didn't touch her. Her heart... Yes. That doctor was right. The excitement. Her heart. Yes, Worthington, she's dead. It was too much for her heart. Your knees give way and you sit there crazily on the floor, trying to gather your wits, wondering what to do. And then gradually you become conscious of something sharp in your right hand. The earring. There in your right hand is your reputation, Worthington. Your dignity. You're holding $100,000 in your right hand, uh, providing you can get the other one. The mate to it you sold to Mr. Graves. Quietly, you get up from the floor, walk to the telephone, and call Dr. Strickland. You'd better get over here right away, Doctor. I, I'm afraid she's gone. The excitement, you know, her heart. The doctor is satisfied with your explanation. And you stay until he finishes the examination and completes the death certificate. But you're impatient, aren't you, Worthington? The earring is burning a hole in your pocket. And the moment you can get away, you hurry downtown to Mr. Graves' jewelry shop. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Graves is out, Mr. Potter. Well, I tell you, this is urgent. It's, it's a matter of life and death. I've got to get the mate to this earring. Oh, well, I can tell you about that, sir. Eh? He sold it a few days ago to a man named Straker. What? Who is Stryker? Well, he has an art shop in uh, Trinidad, Port of Spain. He left Monday night by plane for Miami. Where is he staying? I believe he said the Bishop Hotel. When is Mr. Graves coming back? Oh, I, I could not say. He was very indefinite. Very well. You may tell him he can contact me at the Bishop Hotel in Miami. But uh, where are you going? To get that earring. Good day. Hello? Now listen, Stratton. I am only going to tell you once. Sell 500 shares immediately, regardless of the market, and have the cash ready for me in half an hour. Yes, Worthington, time is everything now. You're gambling for high stakes, aren't you? It's an eight-hour flight to Miami, but you don't relax for a moment. And long after midnight, you're hurrying again, this time in the lobby of the Bishop Hotel. A clerk is on duty. Please hurry, will you? It's very urgent. I have no time to lose. Striker, you say? It's spelled with an I or a Y? Eight heavens, I don't know. Try both of them. All right, sir. Hmm. Now, let's see. Mahoney, Robertson, 
Seville, Stanley. Ah, here we are. Algernon Stryker, spelled with an I. I don't give a hang how it's spelled. What room is he in? He was in 418. Checked out five days ago. Tuesday, I believe. No. Oh, but I have his forwarding address here if it'll help any. What is it? Uh, number 22, Admiralty Road, Port of Spain, Trinidad. It's going to take you another precious day, Worthington, but you can't turn back now. Somehow you live through the plane trip to Port of Spain. Somehow you arrive at Mr. Stryker's curio shop on Admiralty Road. The clerk is very accommodating. Oh, yes, sir, of course I recognize the earring. It's a handsome piece, isn't it? Please, please tell me, where is Mr. Stryker? Oh, I'm afraid he won't be back for a day or two. Been out on buying trips a lot lately. I see. You say you recognize the earring? Recognize, of course. Genuine Italian Renaissance. Our friend, I'd say it was a Cellini. You know, if you had the mate to it... Mr. Stryker has the mate to it. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. Not anymore. What do you mean? Well, he sold it to a Mr. Bolanus in Miami. Back to Miami, Worthington. Back to the northbound plane and the address of Mr. Bolanos the clerk gave you. You're tired now, aren't you? Very tired. And there's something else, a terrible stabbing suspicion in the pit of your stomach. You have a premonition of what's coming the minute you take the earring and show it to Mr. Bolanos. Why, yes, of course, Mr. Potter. It's the same piece. I bought it from Stryker and sold it to a Mr. Barclay. Barclay, yes, Barclay. Yes, it seems a woman in Boston had been advertising for it for some time. Barclay, of course, had been on the prowl after it for years. I believe he intended to sell it to her. I see. Uh, is there anything else I can do, sir? No, nothing. So that does it, Worthington. The bubble has burst. Ridiculous, isn't it? You're sure now, Worthington. The earring you've been chasing is the one you hold in your hand. So there's no way you can save your honor. But there is a way to preserve the last vestige of dignity. You stop at a pawn shop in Miami and calmly buy a thirty-eight revolver and then return to the Bishop Hotel. There's a telegram waiting for you, a message from Stratton, discreetly suggesting that in view of the approaching audit of Mrs. Kendall's estate, it might be well for you to produce the missing funds. But it doesn't matter now, does it, Worthington? You go up to your room and lock the door, place the revolver and the earring before you on the desk, take out a sheet of paper and begin to write. And therefore, in view of the approaching situation... I made every effort to procure funds to cover. This failing, I have determined to take the only honorable way out, and I trust that the above facts will justify me, at least in part, and preserve a bare shred of honor to my memory. The earring slips off the desk as you write, but you don't even bother to pick it up. Calmly, deliberately, you seal the envelope and address it to the executor of Althea Kenyon's estate. And then, just as you pick up the revolver... Mr. Potter? Mr. Potter, it's the maid. <sighs> Blasted maid at a time like this. Yes? I've come to clean, sir. You'll have to do it later. I'm very busy. I'm sorry, sir. I won't get another chance. I tell you, I... There's another thing, sir. The clerk told me to tell you there's a registered package for you at the desk. What? Yes, sir. It's quite valuable. He says he told me... Never mind. Yes, go on. Uh, Go in and do your cleaning. I'm going down to the desk. Where is it? Where is it, man? Hurry. Uh, Yes, sir. I put it in the safe. Just a moment. Uh, it was insured for such a large amount, I thought it best... Will you hurry? Yes, sir. Now, let me see. Ah, here we are. Ah, it seems to be from Boston. Give it to me quickly. Uh, now, why do they tie things so deuce it tight? Ah, there we are. Ha, ah, a letter. Sorry, my clerk misinformed you. The earring was not sold to Stryker. I had gone out to show it to a client... 
On the afternoon you arrived, Stryker purchased several other items, but not the earring. In view of our agreement, I enclose it herewith and will expect your check in the amount of $12,500 by return mail. Regards, Albert P. Graves. Where, where is it? Ah! There were two of them after all. At last. I've got it. The Whistler will be back in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about a photograph that should interest every driver. Perhaps you saw it in the full-page color ad on new Signal Premium Motor Oil that appeared in yesterday's American Weekly magazine or in recent issues of Pictorial Review, This Week, or Sunset magazine. At any rate, this unretouched photograph showed two pistons taken from two identical motors each of which had been driven for 79,000 miles. The only difference between them was that one motor used today's finest straight motor oil, while the other used Signal's amazing new type lubricant that combines 100% pure paraffin base with five scientific new compounds. But man, what a difference in those pistons. By actual test, there was only one-sixth as much carbon and one-third less cylinder wear on the piston using new Signal Premium Motor Oil. Yes, those five compounds in new Signal Premium Oil really make a difference in the way your motor runs. So for a sweeter running motor, switch now to Signal Premium Oil. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Worthington, it was a wild goose chase, wasn't it? An error on the part of Mr. Graves' clerk sent you flying to Trinidad for nothing. The second earring was in Boston all the time. But you don't care about that now. The point is that at long last you have both of them. The hundred thousand dollars is almost in your hands. The honorable name of Potter will soon be unimpeachable, just as it always was. You stand at the hotel desk excitedly holding the earring Mr. Graves sent you and fumble in your pocket for the other one. Then you suddenly remember you left it on the desk while you were writing your letter and a half minute you're back at your room. What? The maid's gone. <sighs> Let's see. Left it on the desk. Uh, it was here. I left it... Oh, yes, it fell to the floor. Must be here. Couldn't have disappeared. Let's see. It was there on the desk. Must have dropped so. Where is the confounded thing? Maybe under the radiator. Uh, no. No, not there. Perhaps the bed. Where is it? It must be here. It must be. What's that? Oh, the maid, of course. The vacuum cleaner in the room next door. Mr. Potter, you gave me a terrible... Get out of my way. Mr. Potter, what's... I said get out of my way. Give me that vacuum cleaner. There, there we are. How do you get inside this thing? Oh, please, Mr. Potter, you'll get dirt all over the rug. Get away, I said. Blasted thing stuck. Well, no matter, use a knife. Oh, don't rip the bag, Mr. Potter. Oh, please. Don't worry, I'll buy you a new one. There, there we are now. Mr. Potter, you're getting dirt all over. Yeah, quit your bawling. It's here, I know. Somewhere in the filth. Somewhere. It's got to be here. But it's not. What are you looking for? An earring, a gold earring set with an emerald. Here, here, like this one. The mate to it. Oh. You... You haven't seen it, have you? Uh, I know, sir. Don't lie to me, you little gutter snipe. You stole it, didn't you? No. Didn't you? No, I didn't. You Please found it on the floor of my room. Where did you put it? Answer me, you little heathen. Where did you put that earring? Oh, I don't know. I tell you, I don't know. You tell me the truth if I have to wring it out of your hair. You're here? Where did you put it? Where? No! Not that gun! Don't shoot! Please! Answer me! What did you do with it? I'll kill you, Alice! No, wait! You keep out of there! Put that gun down! Put it down! Come back, I said! What's the matter with you? Let go of my arm! You Get back on me! Good work, brother. If there was nothing else I could do, he would have killed her. He's dead. He, he said I stole his earring. The mate to the one in his hand. That's all right, Ernestine. 
You don't have to worry, Porter. I saw the whole thing. Yeah, thanks. Guess we'd better put him on the bed. Give me a hand. Yep. Yeah, sure. Here we Pick up the earring, Ernestine. Such a pretty one. Easy now. Yeah. There we are. I'll call the police. Hello? Hello, operator. Will you connect me with the police department, please? It scared me half to death. Yeah, I wonder what it was all about. Oh, it's awful. Oh, look here. Just finished writing a letter. Well, I guess the least I can do for the poor guy's mail it from. I thought he'd kill oh, me. Oh, Ernestine, maybe you better sit down for a while, huh? What's the matter? Look, they're in the bed by his foot. Huh? Well, I'll be. It fell out of his trouser cuff when we laid him down. It's the mate to this one. The other earring. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's cast were Norman Field and Leora Thatcher. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, custom-built blonde. It was past midnight when Jerry Coonan left the cocktail bar with a tall blonde in the mink coat. On the way out, he gave the high sign to Red Stafford and Shorty Burton, sitting idly at the bar, waiting for the tip-off. And as he guided her out the front door, he could see them quietly get off their stools and prepare to leave. Jerry chuckled softly to himself. The blonde was dumb and rich. The diamond pendant around her neck ought to bring 10,000 at least. And he'd mentally appraised the square-cut emerald on her right hand at 5,000 more. Yes, the blonde was custom-built, made to order. She wouldn't talk after they'd relieved her of the jewelry. She'd be afraid her husband might find out what she's been doing while he was out of town. He helped her into the car and fumbled with the keys until he was sure Red and Shorty had reached the other car and were ready to follow. (laughs) 
The blonde, meanwhile, was having herself a great time. <laughs> oh, Jerry. Jerry, I can't get over that character in the bar. <laughs> really, after yeah, all. I got a million of them. They come out of the cracks when I whistle. Oh, you're precious, darling. How'd I ever get along without you? Hey, you better be careful. You're liable to give me the fathead. <laughs> Underneath it all, you know, I'm really a modest guy. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah. Here's where we turn. Oh, take it easy. Huh? Where are we going? Oh, the black cat. Isn't that where you want to go? Oh, yes, but... What's the matter, honey? Oh, I thought the black cat was back the other way. <laughs> You're a little twisted, sweetheart. This is a shortcut. But, Jerry, are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Now, over to the left. Oh, look, back there. Do you suppose that other car is following us? Oh, no. Well, they just turned, too. Jerry, this is a blind alley. Well, gosh, I guess you're right. Must have made a mistake. They were following us. Take it easy, pal. Stay right where you are. Jerry, he's got a gun. Hey, wait a minute. Shut up. Stay right there. Okay, okay. Come on, lady. Come on, Gabe. This is a stick-up. All right, mister. You asked for it. Put down that gun, you no, stupid... No, you don't. Give me that. <laughs> Dumb little fool. Jerry. Red. Red to cheap. Yeah. In the shoulder. She got shorty, too. She pulled that gun out of her bag and started shooting before I could get clear of the wheel and soccer. Shorty. Shorty, it's Jerry. It's Jerry. What about him? He's dead. Better check the dame. Hurry up, those shots. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. She's still breathing. Pull her out of the car and leave her on the pavement. We gotta get out of here. I can't leave her. She knows me. All right, let her have it. Go on. You gotta shut her up. No. No, I can't. Oh, God. I'm not gonna kill her, I tell you, Red. Listen. Can you get out of here by yourself? Can you drive okay? Yeah. I can get as far as the valley, I think. They'll take care of me at Mendoza's. Okay. Get in the other car and get going. What about the dame? I'm taking her with me. Yes, that's where you're a little different from the others, Jerry. The blonde is a problem, and Red had the easiest answer, but you can't kill. You've always known it, that you had the quickest, sharpest head of them all. But when the chips were down, you couldn't kill. So you take the blonde with you, watching her out of the corner of your eye as you drive towards your home in the suburbs. She lies back against the seat, relaxed as if she were sleeping, and there's an ugly gash on her forehead where you hit her. Ten minutes later, still cursing the woman's stupidity, you pull the car up the driveway and into the garage of your house. As usual, your wife, Madge, has left the doors open for you. You get out and race up the stairs to the inside door. Madge? Jerry, what? I just heard you come in. Don't turn on the lights. Get something on quick. Your bathrobe, anything. Hurry. Well, what's the matter? Oh, plenty. Everything went wrong. The blonde. What happened? Red and Shorty tailed us down the alley, but when they walked up to the car, she pulled a gun, started shooting. I had to hit her. Where is she? In the car, still out. Oh, where's your robe? Right here. Well, come on, we gotta hurry. Wait a minute. Jerry, is she... No, no. She's still breathing. I don't know what to do. I can't let her die. What about the police? I don't know. You could hear those shots for two blocks. Now, here. Hold the flashlight while I take a look. Yeah, yeah. Just a second. Oh, she... She's lying so still. There's something wrong. Madge. Is she? Yeah. Dead. Jerry! We can't take her in the house. You better drive out on the highway. No, no, not yet. But you can't... I can't go running around the highways tonight. I'm going to need a first-class alibi when they get here. Who? The police. Come on, give me a hand. I'm going to lock her in the turtle back. Then I'm going to call my brother. I need an alibi. Bad. Hello. Hello, Jim. This is Jerry. Yeah, you guessed it. I'm in a bad jam. I need an alibi. Oh, uh, tonight from about 9.30 till midnight. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now listen, kid. If anyone asks you anything about me, tell them that Madge and I were with you and Grace till 12 o'clock. Oh, anything. Playing bridge? Yeah, that's good. Playing bridge. Right. Thanks, Jim. I'll explain when I see you. With 
with the prologue of Custom Built Blonde, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. If you've been reading the new car ads, and who hasn't, you've no doubt noticed the emphasis is being put on increased mileage, 25 to 30 miles per gallon from some of the new models. But why do you suppose this is? Is it because folks today are more interested in making their dollars go farther? Well, partly. But even more so, they're interested in the increased engineering efficiency which makes that greater mileage possible. And right there, friends, you have the reason why Signal Oil Company is so proud of the fact that you now go farther than ever with new Signal gasoline. You see, Signal's improved mileage is the result of increased power. Amazing new power. The same power that gives new Signal gasoline quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. That's why we say look to your speedometer for the real proof of gasoline quality. You'll find that the gasoline that gets peak performance from your motor is the same new gasoline that now helps you go farther than ever. New Signal Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. So it didn't work out quite as you'd planned, did it, Jerry? You got the jewelry all right. And with it, the body of the tall, stupid, blonde woman who pulled a gun out of her purse at exactly the wrong time. Yes, it was a wrong guess, wasn't it? She wasn't made to order after all. And now she's in a position to uh, embarrass you with the police. Should one of your good friends down at headquarters get too curious and pry into the turtle back of your coupe down in the garage? Yes, Jerry. You know the police are coming sooner or later. All you can do now is wait and hope the alibi you arrange with your brother Jim will satisfy them. I tell you, I couldn't help it, Madge. When Red and Shorty stuck us up, she pulled that silly little pearl handle twenty-two out of a bag and started shooting. I had to knock her out. Well, I, I don't want to say I told you so, baby. Uh, it's but... a good thing. You've got sense. Oh? I can't think of a worse time for you to open your mouth than now. My big, strong, brilliant husband. Now, wait a minute. You wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why didn't you go down to headquarters right now? Huh? Sure, walk right in. Lock me up, fellas. I just killed the blonde. It was all an accident. Will you shut up? I won't shut up. If I want to say I told you so, I'll say it. Because I did. I told you a thousand times you haven't got the right kind of a brain for this. But you knew it all, didn't you? Uh. No, you never get rattled. You always take time and think it out. So now we've got the blonde in the turtle back, and we sit here and wait for the boys to come around and pick you up. Uh, let me handle it, will you? Why? Tell me that, Jerry. Why? Tin horn alibi. Do you think they'll fall for that? If you had any sense, you'd drive out on the highway somewhere right now. I told right you I'm now. not driving out in any highways. She stays right here. Do you understand that? And if you don't like it, you can... You can go, Madge. Yeah, that's the trouble. Huh? That's what it always comes to when we have an argument. I can go if I want to. But I never want to. Okay. What's that? Wait a minute. It's a police car. I knew it. Two cops. One of them looks like Berg of Homicide. Listen, get back into bed. Yeah. Hurry, let me handle this. All right, Jerry. You handle it. <laughs> Better wait a minute. Who is it? Police. Open up. Okay, just a minute. Turn on the lights. Oh... Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Coonan. Uh, Sergeant Adams. Hello. Sergeant? I'd like to ask you a few questions, Coonan. Mind if we come in? Well, not at all. Thanks. All right, nice little place you got here. Yeah, well, we like it. Sorry to disturb you so late. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to bed. Yeah, I was going to say you were up a little late tonight. Just got home? Yeah. Playing a little bridge over at my brother's place. Jerry, who is... Oh, oh come in, Madge. Yeah. This is Lieutenant Berg, my wife. How do you do? Sergeant Adams. How are you? Hello. So you were over to your brother's, huh? Yeah. You won't mind if we check that. Why not? Shall I call him, Chief? There's a phone over there. In a minute. Conan, it looks like you might need an alibi. Alibi? 
What am I going to do with an alibi? Have you seen your pals, Red Stafford and Shorty Burton, lately? Not for a couple of days. Why? Oh, they weren't at the bridge party, huh? Any idea where they are now? I wouldn't know. Well, I'll tell you. Burton's in the morgue. Huh? And Stafford's at the emergency hospital getting blood transfusions. What do you mean? A car jumped the curb and crashed through a signal oil billboard about an hour ago. Stafford was crumpled over the wheel with a couple of bullets in him. And Burton was sitting next to him, dead from a couple of slugs. Oh, that's awful. Gee, I'm sorry to hear that, Lieutenant. Yeah, tough, isn't it? I wonder what happened. Do you? Yeah. Like I said. Yeah, yeah, like you said, you were playing bridge when it happened. You've been pals with those two birds for a long time, Coonan. What does that mean? Doesn't prove anything, of course, but when we found Stafford, he was still conscious, muttering to himself. He was calling your name. Now, that's funny, isn't it? Not so funny? Uh, maybe not. Maybe he wasn't talking about you. After all, there's lots of guys in this town named Jerry. Where's your gun, Coonan? I don't own one. Not even a little twenty-two. Not even a twenty-two. Well, I'll admit it sounds screwy asking a big he-man like you if he packs a twenty-two, but that's what they were shot with. How about you, Mrs. Conan? I never owned a gun in my life. You can search the place if you want it. You don't even need a warrant. I got nothing to hide. Thanks. Thanks very much. So you just got back from your brother's, huh? That's right. A few minutes ago. Uh-huh. Where's your car? In the garage. Adams, go and have a look. Uh, something wrong, Conan? No. No, nothing wrong. Go ahead, Adams. Right. We've been watching you three birds pretty closely since that banker was knocked off three weeks ago. Red and I were in Chicago when that happened. Okay? Yeah, 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 I know. That's what you said. You're going to have to prove that. Now, excuse me a minute, will you? What's your brother's phone number? Atlantic... 2204. Thanks. Now I'll look it up. I just want to be sure I'm talking to him at his home, wherever that is. Uh, 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 Conan James F. Well, you're telling the truth so far. That's the number. Hello? Mr. Conan? That's Lieutenant Berg of Homicide speaking. I'm calling you about your brother, Jerry. Have you seen him tonight? No, no, he's all right. There's nothing wrong. All I want to know is if you've seen him. Uh, uh-huh. He was there with his wife until 12. Okay, thanks. That's all I wanted to know. Good night. Hey, see? Just like I told you. Uh-huh. Maybe. But you had plenty of time to put him wise. I just checked the car, Chief. What about it? Your hunch was wrong. Motor's still warm. Uh Oh? (laughs) Oh, is that what you were checking? I told you I just got home. Sure, from the bridge party. But I found something else interesting. Yep. What are you talking about? Easy, Conan. Go ahead, Adams. The ownership certificate's got Red Stafford's name on it. Well, 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 now. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Sure, I just bought the car from him last week. You can check with the motor vehicle department. They get the papers. Don't worry. We'll check. Well, uh, anything else, Lieutenant? Yeah, a lot of things. But we'll get the answers somewhere else. So far, you seem to be in the clear from shooting your pals, Coonan. You were playing bridge at your brother's. You bought the car from Stafford last week. You don't own a gun. And also, you and Stafford were in Chicago three weeks ago when that banker was knocked off. That's it? I hope so, for your sake. Come on, Adams. Uh, good night, Conan. Mrs. Conan. You're free to come and go as you please, but I'd suggest that you don't leave town. Okay, Lieutenant. Good night. <sighs> Whew, that was close. I better sit down. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you still think you were right in leaving her there? Oh, that would have looked great, wouldn't it? You alone here, me out in the highway getting rid of a blonde, and the cops come around to check. There's one thing, though. I'd like to know it. They don't know anything about the blonde. They're worrying about Red and Shorty and that banker, whoever he is. Wait a minute. Yeah. 
I knew it. Berg had still another guy with him. There were three. He's left him outside to watch the house. We'll be followed every minute from now on. Night and day. Yes, that's the rub, isn't it, Jerry? You got around one problem by coming directly home with a blonde in your car. But there's a tougher one now, isn't there? How can you get rid of her under the noses of the police with a special officer following you night and day? You lie awake all night thinking about it. How, Jerry? How can you do it? Then at 10 o'clock the next morning, it comes to you. I've got it. I've got it, Madge. Joe Mendez. Who? He runs a repair garage, deals in hot cars on the side. He'll do anything for money. Sure. Yeah, if he can get another car just like mine, 39 Green Chevrolet Deluxe Master Coupe. What are you talking about? Excuse me, honey. I've got a phone call to make. Oh, uh, don't make any plans for this afternoon, baby. We're going bye-bye. Don't be ridiculous, Jerry. You know we'll be followed. Sure we'll be followed. Our friend will follow us right downtown and into Joe Mendez's garage, where we're going to park the car while we go shopping. Then what? Then we let Joe take over. And like I said, baby... He'll do anything for money. So you called Joe Mendez. And just as you predicted, the minute you mentioned money, he was your boy, wasn't he, Jerry? Yes. He'll arrange to have a green coupe in his garage, exactly like yours, for a fee, of course. And best of all, he'll have it there this afternoon. It's three o'clock when you start out with Madge on the shopping trip. And you smile to yourself as you see the police car pull out from the curb and follow you downtown. Joe is all ready for you when you arrive. Yes, sir? My, uh, my name is Coonan. I called Mr. Mendez about having my car tuned up. Oh, yes, Mr. Coonan. I am Mendez. You can leave it here. I'll have one of the men park it for you. Uh, can you have it ready in a couple of hours? Oh, I think so. Perhaps we'd better go into the office. I will write up the order. Oh, sure. Oh, Madge. Yeah, Jerry? Uh, stick around. Huh? I'll be right back. Did you get the car? Yes, yes. He's out there in the line right now. What about this? Take it easy. I couldn't tell him apart myself. Where? Where's the two grand? Oh, yeah. Uh, don't flash it. Hmm? Your friend's out at the front door watching us. Oh, yeah. Now, Listen. After we leave, switch the license plates. Switch the stuff in the dash compartment. Everything. Yeah, here's the ignition key. Yeah. Well, what about the turtle back? Never mind the turtle back. It's locked, and don't try to open it. Leave the key to the new car and the dash. We'll drive it home. Leave mine here. Uh, uh, how long? My brother will come for it later. Just leave it here and forget about it. Okay? Okay. See you later, Joe. We're going to take our friend out there on a shopping tour. I'm awfully sorry, madam. I've shown you everything we have in suede handbags. Uh, perhaps something in reptile. Oh, well, yes, that's an idea. Uh, let's see what you have in Wait, reptile. Just a moment. I'll get them for you. Is he still there? Yeah, over by that pillar. What about Jim? I'll call him tonight. Have him pick up our car tomorrow. We can get rid of the blonde in a couple of days after this blows over. I got a hunch Lieutenant Berg will be around tonight to really give us the once over again. Oh, yeah. This seems to be the only thing we have in reptile. Would you like to look at it? Oh, oh yes, I'll I'll look at it. So you watch the quiet man in plain clothes follow you and Madge from store to store. And finally, back to Joe Mendez's garage at the appointed time. You both walk in the door and then stand to one side, waiting. Just a second, Madge. What are you... Hello, officer. Oh. You, uh, enjoy the shopping trip? <laughs> Almost lost you a couple of times. Where to now, Sonny? Home. Oh, that's my green coupe over there. Come on, Madge. Oh, Mr. Mr. Kuna. Oh, uh, hello, Mendez. Did you get her tuned up all right? Yes. Good. You want to ride out with us, officer? Got room for one more. No, thanks. I got my own car. Okay. Well, here we are, Madge. Get in. 
Oh, how much do I owe you, Mendez? Oh, uh, uh, nine, nine eighty-five. Okay. Here you are. Thanks, and, uh, keep the change. Well, Jerry, you're out of the woods now. The license plate's been changed. The contents of the dash compartment, everything. Yes, Mendez did a good job. An hour later, you're home, with the officer following just behind you. As you expected, Lieutenant Berg is waiting for you when you arrive. Waiting for me, Lieutenant? Yeah, been on for a little ride. You ought to know. We've been tailed everywhere we went. <laughs> okay, Colonel, I'll call off the bloodhounds. Just drop by to tell you that Red Stafford died an hour ago. Oh, that's too bad. He regained consciousness just before he went. He said you weren't mixed up in that shooting last night. Anything else? Yeah, something about a scrape with a woman they tried to stick up. Said she pulled a gun and then drove off after the shooting. I see. Can't understand why she didn't report it, though. <laughs> it is funny, isn't it? Yeah. Now, another thing, the business about that banker. You really were in Chicago with Stafford. Well, so now you believe me. <laughs> I'd know better than to believe you, Conan. But Stafford had the proof. Or I think he had. Huh? Let's go inside. I'll tell you about it. Well, is, it is it important? It's your neck. That's important. Come on inside. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, with reconversion still much in the spotlight, here are some facts I think you'll be interested in. You know, of course, the vital role that independent businessmen played in the building of America. And you know that today more and more men are expressing a desire to get into business for themselves. But did you know that our sponsor, Signal Oil Company, has for over 15 years sold its products only through independent businessmen substantial, responsible men who are so earnest about their business of serving the motoring public that they're willing to invest their own money in it. Naturally, signal dealers are carefully chosen for their ability and integrity, which explains why so many dealers have been with Signal Oil Company ever since the beginning, 15 years ago. So you see, there's a good reason why you find more conscientious, experienced men operating signal stations. And why signal dealers, with an incentive to build their own business, naturally give your car more thorough service that does help it run better and last longer. And now, back to the whistler. Well, you're pretty proud of yourself, aren't you, Jerry? Joe Mendez was a real inspiration. The blonde is resting quietly now in the turtle back of your car, back in Mendez's garage. And the substitute car outside is all ready for Lieutenant Berg, if he happens to get curious. You glance slyly at Madge, wink at her as you escort the lieutenant into your living room. He starts to sit down and then decides to stand. Uh, you had us going for a while, Conan. Oh, yeah, I guess I better do my checking first. Checking? Yeah, I'm a kind of a cynic. That's so I don't believe anything anymore. Stafford said while the two of you were in Chicago, he signed some kind of a legal paper before a notary. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember I witnessed it for him. Yeah, well, that's the proof I was talking about. For some reason, Stafford stuck it in a little valise. What's wrong with that? Nothing, except he tossed the valise in the turtle back of his car and forgot about it. The turtle back? Yeah. Says it's still there. Oh, no. That is that. Uh, I don't think it's there. I, I never noticed it. Huh. But you wouldn't mind if I check. No, Berg. I wouldn't mind if you checked. Here. One of these two keys. Help yourself. Thanks. I will. Hello? Jerry? Jerry, this is Joe Mendez. Mendez, listen, I can't talk now. Call but this me is later. important. It'll keep. I got things to do. But listen, I'm trying to tell you. There was a cop hanging around the place all the time you were shopping. I didn't get a chance to change the license plate. You do... Wait a minute. What are you getting at? I'm saying I didn't make the switch. You still got your own car.
Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Jack Moyles and Bill Conrad. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Will Pryor, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the whistler. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Bulletproof. The country's largest news magazine wrote him up under crime, described him as massive, soft-spoken, methodical. Howard Martin was all of these and more. He was a man who believed in a planned existence. Whether it was business, matrimony, or murder, Howard Martin never took chances. He made his plans and carried them out to the letter. This philosophy brought him great financial success. And it brought him a wife who was young and beautiful to look at and who hated him with all her heart. That's you, Andrea? Yes. How's your headache? What? Your headache. That's why you went to your room, isn't it? Oh, oh, yes. It's, uh, it's better, thank you. Howard, I've come to a decision about... about... Us, my dear? Yes. I'm going away. Oh, now, really, Andrea, we've been all over that before. I'm getting a divorce, Howard. There's nothing you can do about it. You make it very difficult for me, Andrea. After I explained, I can't afford to lose you just now. No. It wouldn't be good for business, would it? Exactly. Oh, that sounds very callous, I suppose. Well, I was in love when I married you, Andrea. In my own peculiar way, I tried hard. I imagine we both tried. But quite apart from that, my marriage to you was the best uh, uh, merger I ever closed. <laughs> when we met, I was a fly-by-night bond salesman. Now you own a corporation. Uh, no. No, we own a corporation. Oh, don't worry. You can have my share. Now, that's very generous of you, my dear. Typically feminine. But I'm afraid without you, there wouldn't be any share. What do you mean? One of your most endearing charms, Andrea, is the fact that you have a great many rich friends. Naturally, when you married me, they felt called upon to make some sort of gesture. Hmm? To show that I was being accepted as one of them. So they entrusted their investments to the firm of Howard Martin, Incorporated. And very wisely, too. Now, what do you suppose would happen the moment the news got around that you were divorcing me? Well, I don't think it has anything to do with it. Well, don't be naive, Andrea. You think I'm going to lose everything I acquired by marrying you? <laughs> I'm afraid you didn't protect yourself very well, Howard. It would seem so, wouldn't it? 
I'm sorry. I'm leaving in the morning. If you sue for divorce, Andrea, you'll make a fool of yourself. You're bluffing, Howard. You've no grounds for contesting. You can't prove I can thing. prove enough to stop you cold. Hey, if you don't believe me, come here. What's that? Here, hold this up to your ear. Hello? Paul, dear. Andrea. I had to call you. I needed some courage. Where are you? At home. I'm going to tell him now. Oh, Paul, what if he refuses? There's nothing for him to refuse. But he's told me he'd contest. He can't. He doesn't know about us. And even if he did, there'd be no proof. Is that enough? Or would you like to hear more? You know, I have quite a collection. It was just a matter of tapping the dictaphone into the private telephone in your room. Every time you got one of your headaches and went upstairs, I threw a little switch down here. Now I have a record of all your headaches. So, that's your proof. It is. Any one of these dictaphone records is enough to throw your divorce suit out of court. Very clever of you, Howard. I had no idea you suspected. Well, what are you going to do? Well, we'll go on exactly as before, Andrea. Your life is your own, my dear. I make only one demand. That you'll remain in this house as my wife. And continue to entertain our friends. Or clients, whichever you prefer. For the greater glory of Howard Martine Incorporated. <laughs> and what if I refuse? I'm afraid you have no alternative. <laughs> Is there some joke, my dear? <laughs> oh, yes, Howard. And it's on you. I'll show you what alternative I have. When I get through with you, you'll beg for a divorce. That's a rather embarrassing prospect. I'll go to them, Howard. I'll go to every one of my rich friends, as you call them. Tell the entire story. The truth, Howard. <laughs> How you married me for their money. How you recorded my phone conversations. Yes, I'll even tell them about Paul. Don't be a fool, Andrea. Would I? Remember, they're my friends, loyal to me. They gave you their business for my sake. You said that yourself. And when I tell them to take their business elsewhere, they'll do it, whether I'm married to you or not. That would mean exposing yourself. You wouldn't. Oh, wouldn't I? Let me see. Who's your biggest account? Martin Whitford, isn't it? Well, Marty and I grew up together. He'll do anything for me. What do you think will happen to your precious corporation when the others discover Whitford's pulled out? I could even phone him now. Wait, get away from that phone. Well? Let me think it over. I'll, uh, take those dictaphone records first, if you don't mind. They're, uh, in that box. Thank you. Well? Oh, you can have your divorce. Only give me a week to work things out. Look, you can afford to be generous now, Andrea. You've got to marry your Paul. You've won. Well, all right. But you've got to stay here as if nothing happened. Otherwise, the story will come out before I can do anything to prepare the ground. Very well. I'll stay. But no longer than a week. Thank you, Andrea. That'll be time enough. <laughs> With the prologue of Bulletproof, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. It takes extra quality to go farther. Yes, it takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal Gasoline has the quality that has made it famous throughout the West, from Canada to Mexico, as the Go Farther Gasoline. But even more important to you than Signal's good mileage are the performance features in Signal Gasoline which make that mileage possible. You see, by rearranging the atoms in gasoline molecules, science gave new Signal Gasoline quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. And it's because of this, because it helps your motor perform more efficiently, that you now go farther than ever with new Signal Gasoline. Now, that's an important point to remember. It's the same qualities that give you extra driving pleasure that also give you extra mileage. That's why Signal says look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. It was like a game of chess, wasn't it, Howard? You had your attack planned right down to the last detail, with a final checkmate only a few moves away. But as it often happens, you were so absorbed in the plan of attack 
that you completely overlooked the obvious simple counter move that Andrea would be bound to make. That you would go to her friends and tell them the truth. All you could do was try to control the rage inside of you until she left the room. You sit alone in the library and try to think, realizing, of course, that there's only one answer now. It's midnight when you decide you'll have to stop thinking about it for the time being. You have a week left and your brain will be clearer in the morning. There's an evening paper on the table next to the chair and you pick it up. Glance at the headlines on page one. An article in the right-hand column catches your eye. Suspect confesses in nightclub killing. Ernest Krug booked on suspicion yesterday. Finally broke down under intensive questioning at police headquarters. The case marked another triumph for Inspector William Conrad of the Homicide Department. <laughs> Who followed his usual routine in shooting cases by first concentrating the department's entire effort on the bullet found in the victim's body. <sighs> yeah, that's it. Good old Inspector Conrad, the ballistics boy. Well, you have a plan now, haven't you, Howard? The next morning, you're quite chatty with Andrea over the breakfast table. Of course. There's no point in holding grudges, is there? Particularly since the poor girl hasn't much of a future. You begin by dipping into your past, the shadowy past of a one-time confidence man named... Not Martine, but Marin, Joe Marin. That was your name in the old days when he used to play around in the fringe of the law, always ducking out just in time to let the other fella take the rap. As Joe Marin, you pay a visit to an old friend in his dingy little gun shop in the slums of the city. What do you have? Hello, Sam. You went up on me, mister. Oh, you're not forgetting your old friends, are you? Uh, Marin. Joe Marin. That's better. It's been a long time, Sam. Almost eight years. From where I said it felt longer. Oh, that little stretch of yours hadn't seen doing you any harm? No. I had that time all my life. Kept wishing you was with me. Oh, I got out from under Sam and you didn't quite. <laughs> After all, I didn't tell everything I knew, huh? If I did, you might have got the chair. That's why I want you to do me a favor. You're killing me. I can pay for it, Sam. Enough to buy back eight years? You always were a man for a grudge. But you're an expert gunsmith, and I need you. I want you to fix this forty-five so it'll shoot twenty-two caliber slugs. It's, uh, for a friend of mine. I'm learning something new every day. What's the idea? Hey, you're not supposed to know why, Sam. Only how. Well... Looks like a waste of good gunmetal to me. Let's see the rod. Can you do it? Yeah, I can do it. But I ain't gonna. No? Why not? I ain't exactly my own boss. I gotta be careful. Oh, yes. I know all about that. You know that's why I'm so sure you're gonna do this for me? I, I don't get you. Well, being on parole kind of fences a guy in, doesn't it? What does it? Listen, ma'am. I don't know what you're talking about. I ain't done anything to violate my parole. That's not the way I heard it. Well, I'll try somewhere else. See you in a little... Wait a minute. Well? Shake down, huh? What do you know, Marin? I don't know a thing, Sam. Not a thing. When do you want this? Day after tomorrow. Pretty short order. It'll be worth your while. Okay, Mr. Big... Patience is your strong suit, Howard. Two days of waiting. Two days in which your seeming nervousness is interpreted by Andrea merely as concern about your precious corporation. Finally, you return to Sam's place and pick up your package. Andrea arrives late that evening and goes straight up to her room without a word to you. You wait alone in the library until you're sure the servants are asleep in their separate quarters. Then you walk quietly up to Andrea's room. Who's there? Don't be frightened, dear. It's only your husband. What do you want? Just a final plea, Andrea. 
Are you quite certain you want to go through with the divorce? Did you wake me up in the middle of the night to ask me that? No, it's only half The answer is yes, Howard. Now, please leave me alone. You won't reconsider? Good night, Howard. Well, I tried. I did everything in my power to... Howard, what are you doing? Howard! No! What's the verdict, Doc? It was instantaneous, Inspector. About eight, ten hours ago. Uh Uh-huh. Twenty-two through the left temple. I want that bullet, of course. I have it for you this afternoon. All right. Yeah, the room looks like it was hit by a cyclone. What do you suppose they were after? No, jewels, mostly. And they got them. Oh, by the way, we're not saying anything about the jewel rate of the papers. <laughs> well, Inspector, here's another one for you to crack in your ballistics laboratory. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Doc, they used to laugh at me at first. They called me a nut. Bullets on the brain, they said. But they're beginning to find out now that the big story in every shooting case is written in those little rifling marks on the bullet. Plainer even than fingerprints a lot of times. Uh, Excuse me a minute, Doc. I just got the doctor's report, Mr. Martin. Oh, yes, Inspector? Your room is just down the hall from your wife's. It's, uh... Funny you didn't hear anything during the night. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I might have heard a shot, but I, 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 I can't think very clearly. Yes, now. certainly, I understand. I seem to remember some sort of nightmare. I, I thought it was a dream. Uh-huh. See, I, I didn't know anything had happened until the butler woke me this morning after. The... I see. I see. You know, it's funny that twenty-two. It's a woman's weapon. Never heard of a second story man packing anything in less than a thirty-eight. Hmm. Oh, uh, Mr. Martin. Yes? This Army 45 of yours here in the trophy case, is this the only gun in the house? Oh, of course, Inspector. If you have any doubt, you may search the house, perhaps the servants. Uh-huh. That's 45, all right. Well, you want to take it with you, Inspector? I can remove it from the case. No, no, it's not necessary. This job was done by 22, and I think you can forget the servants. This looks like an outside job, start to finish. Conrad speaking. Oh, hello, Inspector. Howard Martin. Oh, yes, Mr. Martin. I'm sorry I haven't been much help to you during the past few days. Well, I understand. I just called to see how you were coming along. Well, I'm afraid we haven't much news for you yet. We'll really get a move on, though, once the killer dumps those jewels. And you'll have to do it sooner or later. I see. Well, thanks very much, Inspector. Call me if there's anything I can do, huh? I certainly will. Good night. Good night. Good night. So far, so good. Uh, Pardon me, sir. Yes, Edward, what is it? There's a gentleman in the library. Who is it? I don't know his name, sir. He was quite insistent. All right, Edward, thanks. Hello, Joe. What do you want? Relax, Joe. Pour yourself a drink. Hope you don't mind. I just help myself. Ah, pretty good bourbon. You're just going to stand there, sit down, go on. All right, Sam, what is it? I want to offer my condolences, first of all. Tough, ain't it? What happened to your wife, I mean? Yeah, quite a shock. You know, I said to myself, there's something to think about. All I got is a newspaper to go by, understand? Page one. Society dame knocked off during robbery. Don't say what kind of a robbery. Only that the dame is knocked off with a twenty-two. Now, there's something to make a guy think, ain't it? Go on, I'm listening. Especially unusual here in this town where the homicide inspectors are not on ballistics. So right off, I figured out. Somebody saw in the inspector a curve. That's when I think of old Joe Merrin. Threatening to frame me on a parole violation. If I don't play nice and fix his army forty-five. So she'll shoot like a twenty-two. Marin. Martine. Same guy. I put two and two together. The bell rings. And out comes a hundred grand. It was going to cost you, Joe. A hundred grand. 
I haven't got a hundred grand. Well, I'm a reasonable character. What have you got? I can't do it, Sam. I you can't. You better start thinking, Joe. Uh, wait a minute. I I have got a hundred grand in jewelry. How hot is it? Oh, not hot at all. It belonged to my wife. Now, look, you can turn it into cash in ten minutes if you want to. Let's have a look, huh? Right. There's a way out of this one, too, isn't there, Howard? The paper said nothing about the stolen jewelry. And by the time Sam finds out, he'll be behind bars as the number one suspect. Meantime, you can find another gunsmith somewhere and have the incriminating twenty-two caliber barrel removed from the forty-five army automatic in your trophy case. Then it won't matter how much Sam talks. He has a record. He was caught with the goods. No one will believe him in a million years. Yes, Howard, you found a way out. Well, what do you think, Sam? Diamond brooch? Pearls? If it's hot, to help me out, kill you. Oh, don't worry, you won't have any trouble. You'll get more than your hundred grand. Thanks. Okay, that's it. I'll let you know how I come out, Joe. Yeah, you know where to get me. Yeah. Oh, one other thing. I'm taking your custom-built forty-five along with me. Just in case I need it to back up my store. Wait a minute, you double cross. Shut up, Joe. I'd hate to pull a trigger at a time like this. Good night, Joe. He's gone, and there's nothing you can do now, Howard. Once again, you became so wrapped up in your own plans, you forgot the obvious counter move. This time, the Army 45 in the trophy case, Sam's ace in the hall. You spend an anxious evening. It's late now, and you sit alone in the library trying to think. The house is quiet, with an occasional sound from the pantry where Edward the butler is polishing silver. And then... (coughs) Who is it? Who's there? Take it easy, Joe. This thing might go off in my hand. Sam, what are you doing? Get up. Open the window. It's cold out here on the balcony. Yeah. Okay. You dirty double-crossing skunk. It wasn't hot, huh? Now, listen, Sam, you I... You that jewelry was hot? You knew it was bait to catch your wife's murderer. <laughs> Pretty neat. Lucky I knew the fence he took me off. You always was a rat, Joe. Strictly a rat. There's only one way to handle a rat. You got it all wrong, Sam. I'll try to talk your way out of it. I'm going to give it to you, Joe. Just what you deserve. Oh, uh, Edward, how did you get in here? Edward, Now, just what were you saying, Sam? Okay. Okay, it's an old one, Joe. I guess it's still good. Yeah. By the way, where is Edward? It doesn't concern you. I'm going to kill you, Sam. Self-defense. Made to order. Yeah? Yeah. I don't think so, Joe. They were, uh... No, Joe. You see, the minute you pull the trigger, that little pea shooter, you put the rope around your neck. What do you mean? Don't be stupid, Joe. Just give me the rod like a nice boy. You ain't gonna pull that trigger and hang yourself, are you? Because that's what you'd be doing, Joe. The minute Conrad found another twenty-two slug in my body, same as the one that killed your wife, it'd be all over, wouldn't it? You see, Joe? Get what I mean? Don't come any closer. You won't pull that trigger. You can't, Joe. One more step, Sam. I'm warning you. Besides, you haven't got it. I... You... You haven't got... Cuts. Haven't I, Sam? Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. But right now, since most folks never see how or where the gasoline they use in their car is made, it occurred to me that you might be interested to look in on the organization that brings you the Whistler and those fine signal oil products. It all started not long after World War I, when a small group of young Westerners got together to form their own independent oil company, Signal Oil and Gas Company. In the face of what seemed overwhelming competition, these determined young men succeeded in bringing to Western motorists 
the first anti-knock gasoline at regular prices. Being independent themselves, they naturally sold signal gasoline only through independent service stations. Just a handful of them at that time. But motorists liked signal products, liked them so well that the signal organization grew and grew. Until today, independent signal dealers serve seven western states from Canada to Mexico. Now, obviously, there must be good reasons why so many motorists have switched to signal. You can discover these reasons for yourself by just stopping at your own neighborhood signal dealers. There you'll find the tops in gasoline and automotive lubricants, backed by signal's 15-year tradition of quality. And you'll enjoy more thorough, more conscientious service. Because signal dealers, being in business for themselves, have an incentive to serve you better. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Howard, he's dead now, isn't he? Quite dead. And shooting Sam down with the same gun you used to kill Andrea was just like writing a confession to Inspector Conrad. Yes, he'll find the twenty-two slug in Sam's body and it'll all be over. Unless... Unless you can get rid of the body first. Yes, it's your only chance. And then a short time later when Edward, your butler, comes into the room. Well, Edwards, quite a mess, huh? It was self-defense, sir. He threatened you with a gun. I saw it all from the hall. Yeah, Self-defense. Uh, well, what are you going to do, Mr. Martin? Uh, give me a hand. I, I've got to get him out of oh, here. Oh, but, sir, you can't. The police... Give me a hand, will you? Mr. Martin, you shouldn't... Shut up and grab his feet. Uh, sir, if you'll I only let me... Shut up. Uh, now, go yes, on, grab Mr. his feet. Martin, all right. Out that way. Go on, go on. Yes. Kick the door back. Right. Now, this way. Down the hall. We can take him down the back. Mr. Martin, I don't understand. Will you shut up? Now, hold him up so I can... Conrad. Well, what's going on, gentlemen? What are you doing here? Maybe your butler can answer that one, Martine. I've been trying to tell you, sir. After I heard the crash of broken glass and, and saw this man come into the room with a gun, I, I called the police. What's this all about, Martine? Okay. Okay, Conrad, I guess you might just as well know the whole story. You'll know it anyway when you dig the slug out of his body. It'll be a twenty-two. A twenty-two? Your wife was killed with a gun. Yeah, yeah. Here, here's the gun. Now, wait a minute. This is a forty-five. I had it rigged to shoot a twenty-two. Sam, he's the guy on the... Well, he fixed it for me. Ah. Uh, so that's the way you worked it, huh? Maybe he came to see you tonight for a little dough to keep him quiet. And you shot him with the same gun you used to kill your wife, huh? Yeah. Well, it's too bad you couldn't have used another gun on him. Might have been a nice case of self-defense that way. Sure. But I knew when you found the twenty-two slug Yeah, that I... yeah. Now, let's see how your buddy fixed this gun. What's the matter? I think you're going to be in for a rather unhappy surprise, Martin. What do you mean? You shouldn't have been so quick to spell your story. Apparently, your friend Sam here realized it wasn't such a good idea to carry a rigged twenty-two job around. So he changed it back to a forty-five. What? That's right. The slug you pumped into this man wasn't a twenty-two, Martin. It was a regular forty-five. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal, Gasoline, and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories. And by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Gerald Moore and Mary Jane Croft. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Kenneth Harvey, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That was...
whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you With new Signal Gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Stolen Murder. Ken Broderick and Tom Barton had grown up together and were fast friends. Until Ken married Helen Johnson. Helen had never liked Tom, not only because he was pasty-faced and sickly, but principally because of his influence in keeping her husband, Ken, in St. Augustine, Florida. According to Tom, they were going to write great American novels and bring the world humbly to their door. But Helen had other ideas. A letter to her brother, who was an important literary agent in New York, And she wangled a job for Ken as copywriter in a small Manhattan advertising agency. And so on that night of February 23rd, they were ready to say goodbye to Florida and to Tom Barton. Thank heavens, Ken. This is the last time we'll drive down this street. Look at it. Eleven o'clock and everybody, absolutely everybody in bed. Yeah, I suppose. But you know we're liable to miss this old town after we've been in New York a while, don't you? Oh, Ken, that again. For heaven's sake. I can't help it. If Tom would only go along with us, it'd be different. Tom, Tom, will you do me a favor and forget Tom? When we got married, we were going to travel and meet people and do exciting things. Well, this is our chance. Sure, sure, this is our chance. Okay, here we are. We say goodbye to Tom and that's that. I'll be glad to get this over. Well, coming with me, aren't you? Do I have to? It's the least you can do, Helen. All right, all right. If it'll make you feel any better. Hmm. Looks to me as if he's already in bed. Like the rest of the dear citizens. He's probably in back working on his book. Look, Helen, try to be halfway decent to him, will you? Of course. Funny. I don't hear him. Helen. What? Suppose he had one of his attacks? He's probably only sleeping. I don't know. Door's unlocked. Tom? Hey, Tommy! Tom! Helen, I don't like this. Wait a minute before you wake up the neighbors. Look. Coming up the wall. Huh? Oh. Oh, Tommy. Hey, we were beginning to worry about you. Ken. Helen. What are you doing here? Oh, why do you like that? We leave tomorrow and you ask tomorrow. me... Tomorrow? Oh. Oh, I forgot. I... Tom. Hey, what's the matter with you? Oh, it's... Not... Helen, yes. I'm going to get some water. Quick. Hey. Here, you better sit down on the step. I... I'm sorry, Ken. I... I'm all right now. Oh, the devil, you're all right. Tom, this is crazy. What you need is a good specialist. You can't go on like this. 
Now, if you'd only use your head and come to New York with New- us. New York? Well, sure, there's plenty of room in the car. We could get a good doctor for you and find out what this is all about. Yeah. Yeah. How is he? I guess you're right, Ken. You are right. Uh, I will go with you tomorrow. You will? Oh, that a uh, boy. Helen. Helen, oh, did you hear that? Tom's going with us. Yes, I heard. Here. Drink your water. So you won your point, didn't you, Ken? Tom came to New York with you. But somehow, after six months in the city, that doesn't seem to matter anymore. No. Other things concern you now. Your dark, stifling apartment, your dreary job, your salary that will barely pay the bills, Helen scolding and scolding. And Tom? You don't even see him. He's convinced he's going to die. And he sits in his little room, frantically writing day and night. Writing the great American novel, remember? And then late one night he calls and insists that you come down to see him right away. It's nearly midnight when you get there. What gives, Tommy? You're sick again, right, Ed? No, no. Sit down, Ken. I've got something to tell you. You seen Dr. Hanson? No, it's not that. But that's why you came to New York in the first place. Listen, Hanson's the best there is, and you haven't even been near Look, him. I'm sick of doctors. Anyway, it's too late now. Oh, don't say that. It's true. And I want to talk about it. Ken. Yeah? I finished it. Finished it? My book. No. Yes. But you're going to be surprised. It's not the kind of thing we always talked about writing. It's it's a mystery story. Oh, great. I... Well, I decided since... Since I didn't have much time, I decided I'd write a book that would sell fast and mysteries sell fast. So... So that's it, Ken. And... Well, would you take it down to Helen's brother? Helen's brother? Yes. You said he was one of the biggest literary agents in New York. Oh, yeah. Well, if he likes it, he can get it read fast and published fast. If I just send it in cold, it'll take weeks, maybe months. I haven't got time to fool around, Ken. Oh, stop. I'm lucky if I last a month. Listen, will you cut out that kind of talk? (laughs) If it'll make you feel any better, I'll take it to Bill tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow. It's in longhand. It'll have to be tight first. Oh, that's all right. Listen, I know where I can get a rush job done. Oh, swell. Now, listen, kid. You take care of yourself and just leave it to me. Oh, thanks, Ken. Thanks a million. And so you take poor, sick Tom's book and you get on the bus to go home. You decide to glance through it. But after the first page, you can't put it down. You ride past your stop, excited and amazed. Tom has done what all good writers do, written about the places and people he knows. He calls the town in his book... Centerville, California. But it's St. Augustine, Florida, down to the last duffer sitting in the square. Somehow you manage to get home, and toward dawn as you turn the last page, it hits you. This is a bestseller. This book means money, fame. But Tom, Tom's going to die. And he hasn't any relatives. Such a pity, isn't it? All that money and fame and nobody to enjoy it. Oh, yeah. Hello, Tom. Uh, how are you? I'm all right. I... Haven't you heard from Bill yet about the book? It's been three weeks. Well, yeah, I, I was going to call you. Bill liked the book quite well, but he thinks you should do a little rewrite. Rewrite? I haven't time. I feel terrible. I... Well, I thought the book was good just as it stands. Oh, it is. Except for a few minor points. Uh, look, Tom, I've been thinking... You know that little cabin Helen and I rented in June up in Connecticut? Yeah, what about it? Well, I can get it for you cheap. It's kind of a dump, but it's way off by itself. If you get up there and spend a couple of weeks rewriting some spots and... Yeah. Yeah, I... Gotta get out of New York anyway. That... That's an idea. Well, suppose I call the real estate agent right away and then Saturday I'll drive you up. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Ken. I don't know why you do all these things for me. Oh, forget it. After all, what are friends for? Yes, that's a question, Ken What are friends for? Tom is grateful, of course When you make all the arrangements And drive him up to Connecticut He appreciates it when you spend the day Helping him get comfortable in his new surroundings And he doesn't suspect anything But what would he say If he knew copies of his manuscript 
had gone to the publisher with your name on it as author. Yes. What would he say if he knew you had stolen his work, perhaps the last work of his lifetime? What would he say if he could see you now in the office with Helen's brother? A thousand dollars, Ken, and that's just the advance. I don't know why the devil Helen never told me you could write like that. Well, it, you know, it takes time to get going. <laughs> You're going now, all right. I don't know if I ought to tell you this, but... Uh... Uh, what's up? Well, I sent copies of your story out to Hollywood. And I got a tip-off. It's just grapevine so far, but one of the studios is interested in the book for their biggest star. Pictures? Oh, my gosh, I never dreamed They thought the characterization of the victim, DeWitt, was out of this world. In fact, all the characters. Oh, gee. When will you know definitely? Probably tomorrow. Better stay by your phone, because we want to close the deal quick. And if we get the answer I think we'll get, you're practically a rich man. Hello, Bill? No, it's me, Tom. Oh. Oh, uh, Tom. <laughs> I was expecting a call from Bill uh, on your book. Uh, where are you, anyhow? I'm in Fairfield, Ken, and I've got news, terrific news. Huh? What do you mean? Well, maybe it's early to say yet, and I may be disappointed, but... Well, Dr. Hansen seems so sure. Dr. Hansen? Tom, for the love of Mike, what are you talking about? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm excited. I'm trying to tell you that I came over here to Fairfield. I was going by this house out at the south end of town, and I saw a brass plate on the door. Uh Dr. Frank Hansen. He lives out here. I remembered he was the specialist you were always talking about. Well, I took a chance. It's all an allergy, Ken. Certain foods, they poison me, and... And... And what, Tommy? And... Well, well, don't you get it? Hansen says six months of rest out here and strict diet, and, and I'll be a new man. Oh, think of it, Ken. I'll probably outlive you after all. With the prologue of Stolen Murder, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. When you look up and see a sleek airplane streaking across the sky, it's interesting to consider how modern engineering has not only made today's planes fly faster and perform better, but also get far better mileage. That's interesting, because in much the same way, science has increased the mileage of new signal gasoline by increasing its performance. You see, when science rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to put improved performance into new signal gasoline, they not only gave you quicker starting, faster pickup, and higher anti-knock, but by helping your motor perform more efficiently, they also made new signal gasoline go farther than ever. Well, that's an important point to remember. It's the same qualities in gasoline that get extra driving pleasure from your motor that also get extra mileage. That's why Signal says look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. terrific news. Tom is going to live. And now what happens to you? You've signed contracts. You've accepted money on the stolen book. Hollywood beckons. Or is it the penitentiary? Well, perhaps you can squeeze out of the hole with the law, but not with Helen's brother or with Helen. The disgrace, Ken, the scandal, the humiliation. You can almost hear Helen nagging you now as you hang on to the receiver half-dazed. Nagging, nagging. Ken, are you still there? Huh? Oh, oh, sure, Tom, yeah. Oh, I thought you'd hung up. Well, well, no. It's just the news. I'm so happy for you. I I don't know what to say. Listen, there's something else important. Another favor. Would you get my book back from Bill for me? Get get your book back, Tom? Yes, I've changed my mind. I mean, after thinking it over, I know it's not ready for publication. I've written a lot of new material. No, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I can get it. But it's important to me. I'm coming down tomorrow. I'll get it myself. No, you can't do... Uh, didn't the doctor tell you to stay there and rest? Well, well, yes. Well, then you can't start running all over the place right away. The noise of New York and all, Tommy. 
Listen, I'll bring the manuscript up to you myself on Saturday. Meanwhile, you stay right there. You're sure you can get the book back right away? Yes, I'll get it. Don't worry. Listen, I'll see you Saturday. Okay. And, Tom? Yes? Uh, we'll take the day and celebrate the good news, huh? Maybe a little hunting? Muscles, how's tricks? Well, again, you old son of a gun. It's good to see you, boy. Hey, boy, you look great. Oh, really? I can hardly believe it, but I've gained three pounds already. Three pounds? Yeah. Well, come on in. Come in. Yeah. Hey, that's three pounds, and you look good. Uh, I never felt better in my life. It's great. <laughs> oh, well, here, sit down. Yeah, sit down. Thanks. I was watching for you down toward the road. Oh? Huh? I guess I got lost. I came the back way. You mean you walked all the way from town? Yeah, I thought the walk would do me good. Oh, is that my book? Yeah, yeah, oh, here it is. Good. I... Wait. Hmm? This is just my original in longhand. What about the copies you had typed? Oh, I, I didn't think you'd want that. Look, I want all the copies. These revisions. Okay, I... okay, okay. I'll send them to you after I get back. Uh, Helen said to say hello. Oh. How is she, anyhow? Fine, just fine. He's been bothering her a little. In fact, I was glad for an excuse to get out of town myself. Then. And you are going to spend the day. Spend the day? Sure. We're going after rabbits, aren't we? Oh, you know, sure. like the good old days down in St. Augustine? <laughs> well, I don't know if we'll really find any rabbits. <laughs> don't remember seeing one since I've been up here. But no harm in looking. So, uh, you've got your shotgun up here, haven't you? Uh-huh. It's on the mantel. I'll get it. Oh, unless you want to rest a while. No, no, no. Let's get it... O- uh, let's get all the fresh air we can. I don't get out much, you know. Okay. We can't go far, though. Doctor's orders. That's right. We won't go too far. Well, here's old Betsy. Guess we're all set then. Ready? Sure. It's been kind of warm up here the last couple of days. Well, walking up that road, I sure felt it. <laughs> I bet. What do you say? This way, down by the meadow? Uh, no, let's go back in the woods. I saw some rabbits there in June when we were up. Okay. Ken. Uh, yeah? Something the matter? Something on your mind? No. No, I was just thinking. Tommy, it's been a long time since we've done this, huh? Yeah. A lot's happened. Uh, gun loaded, Tommy? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> Fine thing, hunting rabbits with an empty gun. <laughs> you know, Ken, you don't look so well. No? You ought to give up that job and get one up here in the country. Hey, where you... there's one over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see him. Get a beat on him. Oh, you knocked a man over there. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a beauty. Yeah. Ah, how's that for a shot? Good going. Nice and fat, too. Well, we'll have rabbit stew, Ken. <laughs> In you go, old boy. Ah, come on, Ken. Wait, well, there's one, one rabbit around. There's bound to be a million more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about me taking a gun? Huh? Uh, I want to try my hand at knocking over a rabbit. Oh, sure. There you are. Thanks. Oh. Tommy, listen to me. Now, listen to me close, kid. Tom, I want you to forgive me. Forgive you? What for? Tom, I'm going to kill you. Oh, no. Tom, I have to. It's your book, Tom. It's a great book, and they're publishing it. It's a, it's a bestseller. It'll make a fortune. Ken, what are you saying? You said you got my book back. You said that... I stole it. You stole it? I thought you were going to die. You thought so. You told me just a few weeks. Yes, but... And all that money, Tom, I couldn't resist it. I sold the book in my name. Oh, Ken. And now you're going to live. But you can't. I can't help it, Tom. But I can't let you live. Ken, wait. Listen. You can't do it. You won't get away with it. Listen to me, Ken. You're still it, Tom. No, no. Oh. Oh. So it's done, Ken. All over. And you put the gun under the body just as you'd planned. But you're weak in the knees, and you don't know if you can get back into town unseen or not. And then suddenly you find strength you didn't know you had. Because through the brambles there's a sound. Hey! And a voice. Hey! Who is it? You got a rabbit? Hey! You dive for the embankment of a little stream and press yourself hard against the ground behind a rock. Hey! Good lordy. You can see him now. 
A tall kid carrying a shotgun. And you hang on to your heart as he stops, looks at the body, and, and gazes slowly all around. Then he suddenly leans over, fumbles at Tom's jacket a moment, picks up the rabbit Tom shot, and sticking it under his belt, hurries off in the direction he came. And you, Ken, you lie there wondering if you'll ever breathe freely again. So it's my pleasure to announce that not only will the book hit the stands tomorrow, but... Oh, come on, Bill. Will you stop teasing? <laughs> but the contracts were finally signed in Hollywood yesterday. Ken, you're a rich man. Oh, Ken! $50,000. $50,000. $50,000 $50, and not a care in the world. Yeah. Yeah, not a care in the world. And did you see the publicity in this morning's paper? What breaks we're getting. The lead column in the Times book section. No. Hey, that's wonderful. Haven't seen the papers yet, but... Oh, I, well, I'd rather hope you had. Well, Bill, what's the matter? I... I'd hope that this wouldn't have to spoil the good news, but... Your friend Tom Barton... Uh, Tom? I might as well give it to you straight. He was killed by a shotgun out near Fairfield. Oh, no. They only found the body last night. Oh, Ken. Suicide? No, they thought that at first. Ill health. But a doctor out there says he was in good spirits. He had every chance of recovery. The... the doctor... Then an accident? Worse than that. From the position of the gun and the body, they suspect murder. No. But look, Ken, it's nothing for you to worry about. You don't want to let it spoil the success of your book. What was it you were thinking about, Ken? Breathing easily? No, no, not yet you can't. The delay in finding the body gave you some hope. But now you know exactly what will happen. Question. His best friend. Do you know anyone who would have reason to kill him? You have to go out to Fairfield to identify the deceased. And again to answer more questions and more questions. Bill tries to comfort you with reports of great sales for the book. But every breath is still like a knife in your throat. Then the coroner's verdict. That's something to wait for. Isn't it, Ken? Look, Ken, I, I know how much Tom meant to you. Cut it doesn't... out. I don't want to talk about it. Well, you don't have to snap my head off. You'd think the coroner's verdict can make a difference. It won't bring Tom back. Helen, for heaven's sakes, will you shut up? Will you please, please, just once keep your mouth shut? I... Oh. All right, Ken. The phone. Well, don't you want to answer it? Uh, it might be news about the verdict. That's what you want, isn't it? No. Uh, I mean, answer it. Answer it, will you? Yes. Yes. Who is it, Helen? Bill. Yes, Bill. It came through? He was a... a kid. Helen, what is it? Tell me. Tell me now. The coroner's verdict, Ken. Yeah? A young kid. They picked him up trying to pawn Tom's watch. Uh-huh. He admitted being on the scene of the shooting and taking the watch from, from Tom's jacket. Confessed the whole thing. Confessed the whole thing? What, Bill? He testified that no one was there, so it just had to be accidental? The jury couldn't reach any other verdict, huh? Accidental? Accidental? Helen! You want to talk to him, Ken? Huh? Oh, no, I'll, I'll call him... No, wait. Yes, I will talk to him. I think it's time the three of us went out somewhere to celebrate my book. <laughs> Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about that extra something you get when you have your car serviced at independently operated signal gasoline stations. I'm talking about that feeling of confidence and well-being you have as you drive out, knowing that your car has been thoroughly and conscientiously taken care of. You see, signal dealers, being in business for themselves, do go out of their way to give you the kind of job they're proud to stand back on. When they lubricate your car, for instance, here's what signal dealers do to make sure not a single point is overlooked. Instead of relying on memory, they check each point against signal's lubrication chart, which shows every lubrication point on your car and specifies which of signal's nine specialized oils and greases each part should have for long, trouble-free service. 
But they don't even stop there. No, sir. Just to make doubly sure, they check each point again. Which is why it's called Signal Double Check Lubrication. That's the kind of service you want these days when your car has to last until who knows when. And that's the kind of service you get from your friendly, dealer-owned Signal service station. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Ken, it's all over. The whole chain of events that began on that night you left St. Augustine with Helen and Tom has come to an end. And as much as it surprises you, you find that you can breathe easily. You can breathe deeply the refreshing air of success and security. No more sleepless nights. No more prying, no more questions. Well, no more, that is, except from the publicity men who are eager to make the details of your life into interesting reading for their columns. Well, I think that should give you all you need, Mr. Doherty. good writer can always make something out of nothing, can he? Oh, sure. Sure, of course, Mr. Broderick. But uh, there are just a couple of details about your life in St. Augustine. Uh, can't you give him that bill? I've got some work on Well, uh, no, Ken. He wants exact dates and, uh... All right. What do you want? Well, let's see. You, uh, left St. Augustine about a year and a half ago. I don't suppose you remember the exact date. Matter of fact, I do. It was February 23rd, 1945. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that's all I needed. That's the exact date that Donald Dewey, or Donald DeWitt, disappeared. Dewey? DeWitt? Say, what is all of it? Ken, I might as well tell you now that Mr. Doherty isn't a publicity man. He's from the St. Augustine Police. Police? (laughs) Look, if this is somebody's idea of a joke... Joke? Not quite, Mr. Broderick. The minute someone called your book to our attention, we recognized the locale as St. Augustine, Florida, not Centerville, California. Well, what about it? We recognized the murder victim as Donald Dewey, not Donald DeWitt. We followed the directions in the book down to the last detail, and it led us straight to Dewey's missing body. Only the actual murderer, the author of that book, could have known where it was hidden. Murderer? Oh, no. So that's why he changed his mind about leaving Florida. That's why he didn't want the book. Look, Ken, you'd better not say any more until we get you an attorney. But for the life of me, I'll never know why you did this. To sit down and write about an actual murder. Like the confession of a dying man. Like... Like the confession of a dying man? (laughs) Well, that's funny, Bill. (laughs) What you just said... Is very funny. Next Monday at nine o'clock, the whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Paul Fries and Howard Culver. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Eleanor Beeson, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I 
am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by independent research the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember that every traffic signal reminds you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now The Whistler's strange story, Delivery Guaranteed. The hot afternoon sun wilted his stiff collar and the sidewalk sizzled under his feet. Dark stains of perspiration blotted his gray Palm Beach suit. But Philip Linden didn't notice the heat. Tomorrow he would be 500 miles away from the city, sitting high in the cool Sierras beside a mountain stream, alone with Kathy, away from everything and everyone. They'd be able to make a fresh start. There wouldn't be that continual bickering, those hours of torture when Kathy threatened to leave him. She couldn't leave him. He wouldn't let her. The next two weeks would bring her back to him. Humming softly to himself, Philip turned down a flower-bordered path to the white stucco bungalow and fitted his key into the lock. Kathy? Kathy? Where are you, Kathy? In the bedroom. You packing? Yes. Oh, I'll come in and help you. My things won't take long. Gosh, you don't need all this stuff. We're only going to be gone two weeks. I know what I'm doing. Oh, of course you do, darling. Please, Philip, stop fawning. I'm sorry. Are you going to take this old trunk? Yes. But why? It's big enough to hold everything you it's own. It's mine, isn't it? Well, sure, but that's not what I meant. Please, get out of my way, Philip. I want to pack this evening gown. Well, there's no hurry. The train doesn't leave until tonight, dear. There's plenty of time. Hand me that jacket. Yes, dear. No, 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 not that one. The one with the sequins. I'm sorry. There it is. Do you think you'll need these formal clothes? We're only going to a mountain cabin. Oh, please, don't be stupid, Philip. I'm not going on your silly little vacation. What do you mean? I mean I'm leaving you. For good. Well, you can't. You promised you'd give me these two weeks. Don't you see it wouldn't make any difference? But I love you, Kathy. I need you. I've had four years of your kind of love, and that's enough. I never should have married in the first place. We were happy once. We will be again. Oh, stop kidding yourself, Philip. No, no you don't mean it. Kathy always said A woman will you... say a lot of things when she's 25 and starting to wonder if she's ever going to get a husband. But you did love me. I know you did. Oh, that's ridiculous. I'll be a good boy and call the express company to pick up my trunk. I'm leaving for Reno tonight. Reno? Oh, please don't be difficult, Philip. You'll see that it's all for the best. No, Kathy, no. I won't give you a divorce. I won't. I'm leaving you whether we get a divorce or not. I'll get that through your head. I'm leaving you tonight. And I'm not coming back. There's nothing you can do about it. Please don't say things like that. Give me my makeup box, Philip. You can have everything, but don't leave me, Kathy. The makeup box, Philip. Well, if you come to the cabin for two weeks, things will work out. You'll see. You're just upset. I, I don't blame you, dear. It's been so terribly hot today. I'm getting to this suitcase. Will you lock it? You've got to listen to reason, Kathy, darling. Don't catch me, Philip. What? What do you mean? Oh, can't you understand? I don't want you near me. I don't ever want to see you again. I never want to hear your sniveling voice again as long as I live. I won't let you leave me. Now, get away from that door. I want to phone the express company. I won't let you out of this room. Get out of my way, Philip. Now, get out of my way. No, I won't let you get out of this room. Kathy. I'm sorry I had to slap you. Maybe now you'll stop acting like a baby. I'd rather see you dead. Philip, let go of me. Philip. Philip, don't you drag me. Don't say things like that to me, Kathy. Please. You no, Philip, no, no, no. I won't leave you. You shouldn't say it. I'll stay. You shouldn't. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't say those things to me, Kathy. You shouldn't say it. 
You shouldn't say those... Those things. Kathy? Are you all right? I didn't hurt you, did I? Just say something. <laughs> Kathy, we've got to finish packing for our vacation. You're going with me. You just said you would. <laughs> I knew you didn't really plan to leave me. Kathy? Kathy? <laughs> You're... She's dead. Kathy's dead. I've killed her. With the prologue of Delivery Guaranteed, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. If you've done any touring throughout the West this summer, from Canada to Mexico, you've passed signal billboards that say, you now go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. But unfortunately, there isn't room on those billboards to tell the rest of the story, to tell you about the performance features in new signal gasoline that make this improved mileage possible. Here's what I mean. Science actually rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to give signal gasoline quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. And it's because of this, because it helps your motor perform more efficiently, that you now go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. Now, that's an important point to remember. It's the same qualities in gasoline that get extra driving pleasure from your motor that also get extra mileage. That's why Signal says, look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. Philip, Kathy won't divorce you now. She can't. But she'll never come back to you. And sitting there crying won't bring her back. You didn't mean to kill her, but that won't make any difference to the police. They'll call it murder just the same. So you sit there, your head in your hands, wondering what to do. Wishing you could run away and lose yourself in the quiet green Sierras. Then it comes to you. If you had Kathy's body up on the mountain, you could drop it off a cliff. Tell them she disappeared while she was out hiking. You're standing up now, tense, the blood pounding in your temples. You're thinking now, looking at the trunk still open in the corner of the room. The trunk? It ought to be easy. I could... No, call the express company first. I'll have to leave tonight. Let's see. Electrician. Engineers. Express. Yeah, here's the number. W. I. Two. One. 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 Good afternoon, Express Company. Hello. Uh, Hello, this is the Express Company. May I help you? Yes, I want to send a truck up to a cabin in the Sierras near Silver Pine. Can you get it there all right? Oh, yes. We guarantee safe delivery anywhere. Your name and address, please. Philip Linden, L-I-N-D-E-N, 671 Court Terrace. Court Terrace. We'll send a man over right away, Mr. Linden. Well, well, the truck isn't quite packed yet. Well, it'll be about 20 minutes before a man can get there. Will that give you enough time? Yes. Yes, I'm sure it will. Yes, Philip. That will give you plenty of time. You hang up the receiver, take off your coat, and go back into the bedroom. Ten minutes later, it's done. You throw some of Kathy's clothes on top, let the cover down, snap the lock shut, and write out the shipping tag clearly so there can't be any mistake. Mr. Linden? Yes. Now, where from the express company? You got a trunk you want shipped? That's right, in here. Shh. 
Sure is a scorcher, ain't it? What? That's really hot. Hottest day we've had this year, I guess. Oh, yes. Yes, I suppose it is. This the one? Yes. Be careful with it. Oh, sure, sure. You know our motto, safe delivery guaranteed. You want us to go collect? Otherwise, we've got to weigh it and come back. No, no. Send it collect. Okay. Where'd she go? She? The trunk. What do you want to send? Oh. The address is on the shipping tag. Okay. Now, come on, Steve. Get your end. Boy, these old trunks are sure heavy. Yeah. Uh, will you open the door, Mr. Linda? Yes, of course. Boy, feel that heat hit you in the face? Yeah. Careful, Steve. Don't drop it. Might be something valuable inside. Well, they're driving away now, Philip. Taking Kathy with them. There's nothing more to worry about. You'll catch the 9 o'clock train to the Sierras just as you planned and arrive in time to receive the trunk and pay the collect charges tomorrow. Remember their motto, delivery guaranteed. The door. Someone's at the front door. What? Did something go wrong, Philip? Did you slip up somewhere? Did somebody see you through the window? Who sent for the police? What? What is it, officer? Well, Phil, don't you recognize me? What? Oh, Charlie, Charlie Cooper. What is this, Charlie, a joke? Didn't Kathy tell you? I'm on the force. I was sworn in the day before yesterday. Are you serious? Sure, sure, L- let me show you. Uh, here it is, my identification card. Photograph and everything. Of course, I haven't arrested anybody yet, but <laughs> you'd better watch your step. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. How do you like my uniform? Oh, it's fine. Fine, Charlie. Well, you don't seem very glad to see me. Aren't you going to invite me in? You're not afraid of a cop, are you? No. No, of course not. Come on inside. Well, it's more like it. You know, somebody, someday you may be glad to have a policeman for your next door neighbor. Why do you say that? Well, I might come in handy. Fix up a parking ticket or something like that. <laughs> uh, where's Kathy? Kathy? Oh, oh she, she's out. Oh, I thought you two were going off on your vacation tonight. That's why I stopped in to tell you goodbye. Well, yes, yes. We are leaving. Uh, Kathy's gone downtown to do some last-minute shopping. She's meeting me at the depot. Oh, I'm sorry to have missed her. Uh, what time's your train leave? Nine o'clock. Oh, fine. I'm on duty then. I'll drop over and see you all. No, no, don't do that. Why, don't you want me? Well, yes, of course, Charlie. Only, I don't want you to get into any trouble. And... Well, if, if you're on duty, would your superiors approve? I mean, you're new on the job and all that? Well, I guess you're right. The depot is not really on my beat anyway. Say goodbye to Kathy for me, huh? Yes, I'll do that, Charlie. I'll tell her goodbye for you. And I'm glad you stopped in, Charlie. And, and it's nice that you got such a good job. Oh, I'm just an ordinary cop, but I hope to work up. You know, I'm not so dumb. One of these days, I'll stumble onto something big, and then they'll make me a detective. You'll see. Yes. Oh, I'm sure they will, Charlie. I'm sure you'll make a fine detective. Well, uh, aren't you going to answer the door? What? Oh, oh yes, the door. It, oh, it's probably a salesman. He, he'll go away. I'll get it on my way out. Uh, i got to run along anyway. All right. Uh, oh, uh, Mr. Linden in, officer. I'm from the express company. Yeah, sure. Phil, it's for you. Okay. Well, so long, fella. Hope you and Kathy have a swell trip. Goodbye, Charlie. Did, did you want to see me? Yeah, Mr. Linden. That trunk of yours... What about it? It's not packed right. We hit a bump on Oak Street, and I think it's coming apart. What do you mean? Just like I say, it's coming apart. It ought to be repacked. The weight's distributed all wrong. Then it ought to be roped. I can't be sure to get there this way. Too much risk. All right, all right. Bring it inside. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take care of it later. Ah, uh, you don't want to go all that trouble yourself. We got expert packers. Only cost you two bucks more, and they do a dandy job. Take everything out and put it back in just the way it should be. It's really worth the extra money, believe me. I, I want to do it myself. I couldn't... I prefer to do my own packing. Why, you can trust us. We're all bonded. It's safe to let us pack anything. I, I understand, but I want to do this myself. Bring the trunk inside. Okay, but if it was me on a hot day... Bring like the trunk that... inside. Okay, you're the boss. Joe, he wants the trunk. Well, I'll help you. All right. Well, oh, please be careful. I, I wouldn't want it. Here it is, Mr. Linden. What do you want? Any place. 
Uh, this is your trunk, isn't it? Yes, of course. Well, you better put on a new shipping tag. I don't see the old one. I guess it came off. All right, I will. And you really ought to be more careful, Mr. Linden. Here, look here at the end. See there where that corner's cracked? I can get my finger right through the hole. Hey, want me to show you? No. Huh? Never mind. Oh, well, you see what I mean? You can almost look inside. Don't. Yeah. Don't bother, gentlemen. I'll take care of it and call you as soon as it's ready. Yes, Philip, you'll repack the trunk yourself. Wait until the expressmen leave. Ah, they're driving away now. And you're all alone, just you and Kathy. You bend over the trunk, hesitate for a moment, and then stand up sharply. The key. I don't have the key. But you can't open the trunk without a key, Philip. You can't repack it. You can't send it to Silver Pine. You've got to find the key. Kathy must have had it, yes. Look in her pocketbook. No, not on the bed. Try the dresser. Which purse did she have? Green or brown? Blue alligator? Wait a minute. She was wearing a coat. She always carried her keys in the pocket. Where did you put her coat? Philip, where did you put Kathy's coat? You packed it, didn't you? You packed the key inside the trunk. What are you going to do now? Break it open? No, you can't do that. You need the trunk, Philip. You've got to have it. But you could force the lock. Yes. There's a screwdriver in the kitchen. Hurry, Philip. You haven't much time. The express company will close soon. That's it. Slip the screwdriver under the catch. Someone's at the door. You better hide the screwdriver. Hey, Phil, you still here? Yes, Charlie? What do you want? My identification card. Left it on the table. Well, I'd feel awful silly if I went to work without it the first day. Yes, I guess you would. Say, I, I thought you and Kathy were only going away for two weeks. We work. We are. Why? Well, isn't that an awful big truck for such a short vacation? Well, yes, I guess it is. But Kathy insisted on taking it. But she always takes twice as much stuff as she needs. It didn't even pack it right either. The express company brought it back. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Well, she'll have to repack it. I'll just... I'll just leave it here until she comes home. Maybe that'll teach her a lesson. Oh, wait a minute, Phil. You can't do that. Well? Well, you said she wasn't coming home. She was going to meet you at the depot, remember? Did I? Yeah. I, I guess I forgot. I... I don't know what's the matter with me. Maybe it's the heat. You sure are nervous, anyway. You really need this vacation. Yeah, you're right. Well, Charlie, it was nice of you to drop in. If you'll excuse me, I'll get my bags out. I'm going... I'm going downtown right away. Oh, what about the trunk? Oh, I don't think Kathy will need it. She always takes a lot of extra stuff. She won't even miss it. I'll just leave the trunk here. Serve her right. Oh, you can't do that. She'd never forgive you. You know how women are. She's probably got a lot of important things in there. Well, Charlie, I really haven't got time to bother with it. I'm not very good at packing. Come on, I'll help you. I'm an expert packer from way back. Helen says that's why she's married me. <laughs> no, Charlie, I don't want... I don't want to take your time. Don't you have to go on duty? No, not for a couple of hours. This will only take ten minutes. Uh, where's your key? I don't know. I think Kathy's got it. Yeah, that's right. She took all the luggage keys with her. Ah. Oh. Well, I guess we'll have to let it go then. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks anyway, Charlie. What's that? A, a screwdriver. What are you carrying that around for? Well, uh... Well, I was going to pry the trunk open, but I was afraid I ruined the lock. Oh, well, let me take a crack at it. Oh, let it go. How about a drink, Charlie? It, it's so warm. There's cold beer in the icebox. I... Oh, sorry, Phil. I'm on duty tonight. No alcohol. It's against the rules. Now, let's see how this lock works. Well, some, some grape juice. That sounds good, doesn't it? There's some in the kitchen. Come on out. Now, you go ahead. I, I want to work on this lock. But oh, please don't bother. I'll get the grape juice. Why, oh, this is an old piece of luggage. Hey, how long have you had it? I don't know. Quite a while. It was Kathy's before we were married. Don't worry about it, Charlie. Here, I got something to wet our whistle. I wish I had a bigger screwdriver. Here you are, Charlie. Not exactly champagne, but it's cold. Here, take one, Charlie. Well, I'll be darned. Phil, we're sure a couple of saps. What? The trunk isn't even locked. See? All you have to do is push this little button and drop the hasp like this. Flip these catches and lift the lid right up. No! <laughs> Holy mackerel, what's the matter with you, Phil? The tray slipped. My hands were wet, see? You ought to be more careful. You spilled grape juice all over these clothes. 
We've got to hurry and get them out. Everything will be stained. Don't bother, Charlie. I'll do it later, Charlie. Don't be a sap, Phil. These clothes will be ruined. Here, give me, give me a hand. Charlie, I, I didn't mean to do it. it. It was an accident. I know. Anybody can drop a tray. Here, get this dress. But you don't understand. It wasn't my fault. I know, I know. No, but, but I'm trying to tell you... Take these rugs, will you? Rugs? Let's see. What's all this? Sweaters? Socks? Here's a coat. You never saw so much junk. Look at all these things. Just old clothes. Clothes? Yeah. Well, don't just stand there. Help me get this stuff out. It's your job, you is know. Is that all there is? Clothes? Yeah, yeah. I just struck bottom. Everything's <laughs> unpacked. <laughs> Nothing but old clothes? Well, what did you expect to find? <laughs> Yes, Philip. It wasn't exactly what you expected, was it? Kathy's gone. You put her in the trunk. You know you did, and now she's gone. Where could she be? It doesn't matter. You're safe for a while. At least Charlie doesn't know what you've done. Of course, it could all be a mistake. They may have brought the wrong trunk back. Then you wouldn't have anything to worry about unless they delivered your trunk to another address. Charlie, this isn't my trunk. Well, you said it was. I know I was wrong. It looks the same. But those aren't Kathy's things. I can tell. That isn't... What was packed in the trunk at all? Well, why didn't you say so before? I got this stuff spread all over the floor. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't sure. I'd better go right down to the express company and see them. Nonsense. It's their mistake. Just call them on the phone and tell them to come and get this one. Yes, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. I'll call them on the phone. Go ahead, go ahead. I'll put these clothes back in. Thanks, Char Charlie. What now? Maybe they've still got my trunk and they've mixed it up with this one. Maybe they'll deliver it to the wrong place. I ought to try and catch them. Don't be silly. Use the phone. They'll come back to the office sooner or later. Why are you so worried about an old trunk? It can't be so valuable. All right, I'll telephone. The number's right here. Good afternoon, Express Company. This is Philip Linden. You've got to help me. Yes, Mr. Linden. My trunk, I was I was shipping it to Silver Pine, you remember? Yes, haven't the men come yet? Well, they've been here all right, but they brought the trunk back. They said it had to be repacked. I see. Do you want us to pick it up now? No. I, I mean, yes. I mean, it isn't my trunk. They sent back the wrong one. Oh, that's odd. They, they don't usually make mistakes. Um, what kind of a trunk was it, Mr. Linden? It was an old-fashioned wardroom style. It was black with brass fittings. Just a moment. The truck's driving in now. I'll ask the boy. All right, thanks. Have yeah, they got your trunk down there, Phil? I don't know. They're looking for it now. They've got to find it, Charlie. They've got to find it. Don't get so excited, Phil. It's not a matter of life and death. Hello, Mr. Linden. Yes, hello. Yes, we do have another trunk here that answers that description exactly. They picked up two of them out your way. <laughs> well, that must be mine, then. They got them confused. That's all. Well, I'm sure it is. But sure. the shipping tag on this one's been lost. We'll have to check the contents to be absolutely certain. Don't do that. Be besides, it's locked. You can't look in it. We have master keys here from all the trunk companies. It'll take just a minute. No trouble. Please don't trouble. Oh, it's no trouble at all. Steve, open up that trunk, will you? The man's waiting on the phone. He'll have it open in a moment, sir. Now, for identification purposes, would you please describe some of the contents? Did they find your trunk, Phil? Yes. They did. Charlie. There's something I better tell you. They'll know anyway, as soon as they open the trunk. Kathy's dead, Charlie. I killed her. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Hear that? Just a sound effect. But in your imagination, didn't you picture a cat meowing? All right, now try this one on your imagination. See if you can picture in your mind the trademark of my sponsor, your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. I'll give you two seconds. You were right if you visualized a big circle sign with yellow letters on a black background spelling out the word signal gasoline. And in the center, a traffic signal. Which is why we say let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. 
Incidentally, wherever you see that signal sign, there you will also find that great new signal premium motor oil that keeps motors six times cleaner, reduces cylinder wear one-third, and by no means least, conscientious signal service by experienced dealers who are more eager to please you because they're in business for themselves. Added up, that's just today's best recipe for longer car life. So let Signal's yellow and black circle sign be your signal for the surer protection your car needs today to help it run better and last longer. And now back to the Whistler. Well, Philip, it's all over now. Charlie made his first arrest, and it was a big one, wasn't it? You knew there was no point in trying any longer. The minute they opened the trunk at the express office, there would be the first terrible moment of discovery, the hue and cry, the police alarms, and you couldn't face it. It was much easier to hang up the telephone and tell it all to Charlie calmly and quietly. So Charlie made his first arrest, and he'll probably get a promotion. Of course, he had nothing to do with it, really. It was the express company, and that nice girl clerk you talked to on the telephone. Hello? Hello? Oh, gosh, Stevie's hung up. Well, what'll I do now? How should I know? Well, I don't know either. <laughs> Nothing like this has ever happened before. Well, think of something. Oh, don't get so excited, Betty. He said he didn't want us to open the trunk. You know how people are about their private property. And then he got mad and hung up, or he'll probably complain to the boss. Well, we didn't open it, did we? I found the shipping tag on the bottom. We didn't have to open it. Yes, but what'll we do? Send that trunk on up to Silver Pine. But he got so excited, there there must be something valuable in it. So it's valuable. It's addressed to Silver Pine. That's where he wants it to go. We've got to send it. You know our motto. Delivery guaranteed. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Elliot Lewis and Lorene Tuttle. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Robert Libet and Frank C. Burt, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, it's time for another strange tale by The Whistler. Each Wednesday evening at this same time... The Whistler brings you an unusual story of conflict and emotion. Tonight, The Broken Chain. The thought had first occurred to him six months ago. And of course, he'd shuddered a little and cast it out. Of course. Arnold Stanton, respectable businessman, citizen taxpayer, would be horrified at such an idea. 
So he went back to his routine and resolved never to let himself think about it again. But in spite of him, the thought did come back two weeks later. Then only a week after that. Then at more frequent intervals until he found it popped into his head at least once every day. It was worse on weekends when he had to be with Evelyn all the time. When her helplessness, her utter dependence on him for everything rose up and almost smothered him. By now, the thought didn't seem so horrible anymore. It had attained a kind of normal, logical quality. And he found he liked to dwell on it. Like a problem in mathematics. In short, Arnold Stanton was ready to murder his wife. Is that you, Arnold? Yes, Evelyn. You're a little late tonight, dear. Did you miss the bus? Sam Moore drove me home. Oh, of course. It is Monday. Yes, Evelyn, it's Monday. You look so tired, darling. I think you've been working too hard. Kiss? Of course. (laughs) That's better. You know, we ought to take a little vacation, a day or two. A week, perhaps. We could get a cabin Cabin at Wilder's Cove, right? What's the matter with Wilder's Cove? Nothing. It's been good enough for the past ten years. I suppose it'll do for the next ten. Oh, you're a darling, Arnold. You always manage to see things my way. And Miss Roberts could look after things at the office while we're gone. Dinner will be ready in just a minute. Oh, how is she these days? How is who? Oh, Miss Roberts, silly. Same as ever. You know, darling, we ought to have her out to dinner some evening. Not that I want to share you with another woman. But I think about Miss Roberts and I feel sort of superior. She must lead an awfully dull life. I don't know. She seems to have her interests. Oh, such as they are. Poor dear, working so hard in your office all day. Going home to that dreadful lonely apartment. Oh, darling, I'm so lucky to have you. I don't know what I'd do if anything should happen. But we won't ever talk about that, will we, dear? We're so happy, Arnold. Now, you sit right down with your paper and I'll have dinner on the table in just a second. Very well, dear. But there's nothing wrong, is there, Arnold? No. Why? Well, you, you've hardly said a word. What's the matter? Cat got your tongue? Ah, <laughs> oh, there's a dear. Now, I'll call you in a shake. I have a special surprise. Baked beans, just the way you like them. And apple turnovers, and then I... <laughs> yes, Arnold, this Monday night is different from all the rest. Six months ago, it was just a vagrant, horrifying idea. Now it's an obsession, isn't it? It's a terrible decision, Arnold. And there's no one to talk it out with. No one in whom you can confide. You sit there, staring at the newspaper without seeing it. Thinking. Thinking how you hate her and the senseless prattle you've had to listen to for ten years across the dinner table. But you can't walk out, Arnold. That's the strange part of it. You've decided it would be too cruel to walk out. She leans on you. She's dependent on you for everything. No, Arnold, you can't walk out. Arnold, come on, darling. The beans are on the table. Yes, dear. Coming. It's odd, isn't it, Arnold? How a random thought like the one that struck you six months ago can take hold and grow and finally solidify into something very real. As evening after evening of Evelyn's nonsensical prattle drives you closer and closer to it. Yes, you've decided it has to be tonight, haven't you, Arnold? And you're smart enough to realize that most murderers are tripped up by their own cleverness. That the plan surest of success is the simple one. As usual, you help Evelyn with the dinner dishes. But tonight, your mind isn't on your work. That's my best Havel in China. I don't know why, but it struck me tonight that there's no use letting it gather dust in the closet. We almost never use it. And I said to myself, there's no use having nice things if you can't enjoy them. I think that's right, don't you, Arnold? Don't you think that's right? Arnold, aren't you listening to me? Oh, Oh, sorry, dear. Yes, yes, of course. (laughs) Well, here's the casseroles. Uh, Be careful, dear. I was saying about using the Havilland for every day. Yes, there's no No use use having having nice things if you can't enjoy them. Well, I hope you don't think it's wrong, Arnold. It is lovely china, but after all, what's the use of having nice... Of course, dear, of course. Oh, do be careful with that casserole, dear. Aunt Leona gave it to us for a wedding present, remember? Poor darling. She'd be alive today if it weren't for that terrible accident. What? Accident? 
I don't remember. Oh, of course you do, dear. The bathtub. The bathtub? Arnold! Our best casserole! You try and comfort Evelyn, but she's heartbroken. Her best casserole, Arnold. You do feel sorry for her, don't you? It's clear now that you could never leave her. Why, that would be more cruel than the other way. So there's going to be an accident, isn't there, Arnold? A simple, ordinary accident. Like Aunt Leona's in the bathtub tomorrow morning. Everyone knows she sleeps late. That you always have breakfast in town. That you're at the office working before she gets up. It's ten o'clock, dear. Time we were in bed. I suppose so. I'll... I'm awfully sorry about the casserole, dear. Um, you probably think I'm being silly about it, Arnold. But after all, it's Haviland, and you just can't buy it these days. It, it, it simply isn't to be had, and it's the only thing Aunt Leona gave us. You do understand, don't I'll you, Arnold? I'll try and find another one tomorrow. Oh, it's no use, Arnold. Haviland just Let isn't me try, be... dear. Uh, about tomorrow, I forgot to tell you that the coffee shop where I usually have my breakfast is closed for redecoration. I was wondering if you'd mind getting up early tomorrow and fixing me a little breakfast. Why, I'd love to, dear. You know I love waiting on you. Yes, I know. Oh, it'll be fun, Arnold. We'll have hot cakes and sausages and eggs. Oh, oh my. I am sleepy. <laughs> I, I better run up to bed if I'm to get up with the birds. <laughs> oh, it'll be fun, Arnold. I, I think it'd be nice if we did it more often. Perhaps it would. <laughs> Good night, darling. And you do understand yes, about Evelyn, the casserole. Yes, Evelyn, I do understand about the casserole. It's a long night, isn't it, Arnold? The longest night you ever spent in your life. You lie there, wide awake, looking up at the ceiling, at the shadow of the chandelier in the moonlight. The black silhouette of its chain against the pale gray of the ceiling. Yes, Arnold, a chain. That's what you're going to do tomorrow morning, isn't it? Break the chain. Smash it into a thousand pieces. Huh? Oh. Oh. Evelyn. Are you awake, Evelyn? She's gone. She's downstairs. Too late. I should have known she... Oh. Uh, Evelyn? Is that you, darling? You see, I didn't forget. I'm just getting into the tub and I'll have breakfast ready before you get dressed. Don't hurry. There's plenty of time. Excuse me, dear. There's just one thing before I go downstairs. With the prologue of The Broken Chain... CBS brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. You know, when you mix nitric acid and glycerin together, you get a pretty explosive combination. And when you add an unlimited supply of gasoline to that tired pre-war car of yours, the result can be just as dangerous. 15,750 people died on the country's highways during the first six months of this year. 40% more than the same period last year. And the toll is rising daily. Remember, the next time you get into your car, that it can't always happen to the other fellow. And don't take a chance. Have your lights and brakes checked regularly. And then keep a cautious foot on that accelerator, just to make sure. Now, back to the Whistler. The chain is broken, Arnold, after 12 years. And Evelyn lies dead where you left her, of an accidental fall in the bathtub. 
There won't be many questions. There can't be. There were no questions about Aunt Leona, were there? Lots of people fall in bathtubs, hit their heads, and drown. And it's so simple, Arnold. You take the 713 bus, as usual. Drop into the coffee shop for breakfast, as usual. Report to the office at exactly the usual time. The neighbors all know she sleeps until well after you've left. That she must have been alone at the time of the fall. All you have to do now is to carry on exactly as you always do. To be careful that nothing happens on this day that will distinguish it from the, all the other drab, monotonous days before the chain was broken. Uh, Mr. Stanton? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Roberts. Where was I? Let's see. Uh, we will appreciate anything you can do to expedite shipment since we are committed on delivery by February 1st. Oh, yes. Merton Amalgamated Foods. Please add this, Miss Roberts. Mm -hmm. uh, paragraph. Uh, incidentally, Mrs. Stanton wants particularly to be remembered to your wife and suggests if Mrs. Merton is accompanying you east that you make it a point to stay with us. Uh, regards, and I think that ought to do it. I'll get it out right away. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, by the way, how is Mrs. Stanton lately? Well, same as ever. She was sleeping like a baby when I left this morning. You know how she is about getting up early. Yes, I know. Oh, it's 11.45, Mr. Stanton. Remember, you have a luncheon appointment at 12.30. Well, thank you, Miss Roberts. I'll remember. <laughs> Eleven forty-five, Arnold. Business as usual. They haven't found her yet. They'll call you as soon as they do, and it can't be much longer. Eleven forty-five. Who'll find her, Arnold? The grocery boy, the mailman, perhaps? No, they wouldn't go upstairs. It'll probably be Mrs. Bronson down on the street. Nosy old Mrs. Bronson coming around just about now, pounding on the back door. Oh. Oh. Oh, it's you, Richard. Well, what's the matter, Mr. Stanton? You nearly jumped out of your chair. <laughs> Tuesday, you know, our day to go over the accounts. Oh, yes, the accounts. Business as usual, Arnold. Everything you do this day is going under a microscope. Richards will remember how you jumped just then. Concentrate on the figures, Arnold. 44-45, our account with Great Western Stores amounted to, to $72,800. But you can't concentrate, no matter how hard you try. Mrs. Bronson will knock on the back door and no one will answer. But how will she get in to discover Evelyn? Did you leave the door unlocked, Arnold? You were so excited that you might have forgotten. That would mean you'd have to find her yourself tonight when you come home. No, no, I can't do that. What was that, Mr. Stanton? Oh, I'm sorry, Richard. You said you couldn't do something. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I can't spend any more time on the reports right now. Would you mind leaving them here so I can check them this afternoon? Is anything wrong? No, nothing's wrong, Richard. Please go now. <laughs> There was a Mr. Weston Haverhill to see you while you were out to lunch, Mr. Stanton. Haverhill? I don't know any Haverhill. Well, rather nice-looking young man. Was he here on business? Well, oh. he said it was personal and quite important. I see. Anything else? No. Were you expecting anything? No, Miss Roberts. Nothing. Oh, well, here's your letter to Mrs. Merton. I uh, included that additional paragraph about your wife and... Oh, that reminds me. Huh? Reminds you of what? Oh, I'm sorry. There was another message while you were out to lunch, and I don't know how I could have overlooked it. It was right on my pad. What was it, Miss Rowan? Well, it was nothing urgent or anything like that. What it was... was the message? It was from your wife. She said she's playing bridge at Mrs. Bronson's and, and may be late getting home this evening. She didn't want you to worry about her. That's all. <laughs> Don't faint now, Arnold. You don't want Miss Roberts to see you faint. What she said wasn't so remarkable, just an ordinary telephone call. Business as usual, Arnold. Wait until she gets out of the room. You better say something, anything. Thank you, Miss Roberts. Oh, not at all. Uh, if you'll sign the letter. Yes, of course. There you are. Thank you. All right.
night, Arnold. She's gone. You can let go now. She won't be back. That's it. Put your head down on the desk and let everything go black. It can't be true. She's not alive. I saw her die. She's not alive. I'll go home and... No, I can't go home. I can't take the chance. Business as usual. Miss Roberts might have made a mistake, Arnold. Perhaps the message came in yesterday, a week ago. Perhaps she looked at the wrong page of her book by mistake. Yes, Mr. Stanton? Uh, Miss Roberts? Yes, sir? I was just thinking... I was wondering... Yes? Yes, sir? No, never mind. I I found what I was looking for. Never mind. Well, if there's anything... What's the matter with me? I can't make an issue with a phone call. Stand out like a sore thumb afterwards. She... she... I know she's wrong. I know it. But I gotta rest. I gotta get myself together. Yeah, rest. Try to forget about it. Why, Mr. Stanton? Huh? Are you still here? It's after five. Oh, I must have dozed off. I've been working a little too hard lately. Mr. Stanton, is something wrong? No, why? Well, you, you've acted so strangely all What's day. What's so strange I... about a man getting tired and falling asleep? Well, I, I, I don't know, Mr. Stanton. I'm sorry. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, too, Miss Roberts. It's late now. It's after five. You better run along. I, well, I, I'm going, too. I don't want to be late. Evelyn will be waiting dinner, and I... I... Uh, I, um, I thought I told you, Mr. Stanton, she's playing bridge. Oh, yes, that's right. I forgot. Uh, by the way, Miss Roberts... Yes? Were there any other calls this afternoon? Oh, I, I'm glad you reminded me. Mr. Averill called again and said not to disturb you, that uh, he'd see you tonight at home. Mr. Haverhill. Mr. Haverhill. You don't know who he is or what he is, Arnold. And you haven't got time to think about it now. Perhaps he's a plain clothes man, a detective. Anything is possible, isn't it? You've been such an awful failure. Business as usual, Arnold. Nothing you've done today was usual. Barking at your secretary, jumping at open doors, falling asleep exhausted for four hours this afternoon... And they'll remember everything when the time comes, Arnold. But still, you can't run out now. You've got to go through with it. You've got to go home and find out once and for all. I did leave it on the Evelyn? Are you there, Evelyn? 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 Evelyn! Evelyn? Evelyn, dear? You stop with your hand on the bathroom doorknob. Somehow you can't go in and face it, not yet. Not until you're sure, Arnold. The answer is just inside the door on the right. But you can't take it right now. You stand there for a minute, not thinking, not moving feeling the pulse pound in your temple. And then you find yourself fumbling for a cigarette. Gotta take it easy. Cigarette. You tear it to pieces trying to get it out of the package. And then find you have no matches, so you skip the cigarette for the time being. Hello. 
Mrs. Bronson? Yes. Who's this, please? Arnold. Arnold Stanton. Oh, yes, Mrs. Stanton. Ah. Uh, I don't want to bother you, Mrs. Bronson, but... Well, is anything the matter? You don't sound quite like yourself. No. No, nothing like that, Mrs. Bronson. I, I just... Yes? There was a message for me this afternoon at the office. Something about... Evelyn playing bridge, I think. Oh, yes. She... She isn't there with you, is she? Why, uh... uh yes, Mrs. Stent, she's right here. Would you like to speak to her? Yes, I would. Well, just hold on. Evelyn? Evelyn, dear? Hello? Evelyn. Evelyn. What's the matter with you? Evelyn, I, I don't understand. Wait I'm... a minute, Mr. Stanton. This huh? is Mrs. Bronson again. Evelyn isn't here after all. I'm terribly sorry. She must have left while I was talking to you. Probably on her way home now. Ought to be there. She is, Arnold, just as you left her this morning. There's only one answer now. They discovered her and they're trying to trap you. Mrs. Bronson knows. Miss Roberts knew this afternoon. They all know. You run to the window at the end of the hall and look down onto the porch. A tall, serious young man is waiting at the front door. You know who he is, don't you, Arnold? You have to face him, Arnold. One thing more and you'll be sure. Slowly you walk to the front door. What is it? What do you want? I'm sorry, Mr. Stanton. Get I... it over with. What do you want? My name's Haverhill. I've come to talk to you about your wife. I thought so. It's a rather serious proposition, you know. Well, can't... Well, can't you come back later? No, I want to... Listen, listen. listen. Just give me five minutes. That's all I want. Just five minutes. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Stanton. Go away. Come back later. Go away. Go away. It's a mile across the living room to your desk and the pistol in the middle drawer. You'd given it to Evelyn Arnold because she was afraid while you were away at the office. Because she couldn't stand being without you alone. You take it out and notice how cold it feels in your hand. Check the breech and find it's loaded, ready to go. You're tense now as you sit down in the easy chair by the fireplace. Four minutes left, Arnold, and you won't need all of it. The heat of your hand has warmed the handle. It feels more natural there. You look at it for a moment, then raise it slowly. Your hand tightens on the trigger. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. You know, it's beginning to look like all predictions about summer travel this year are being topped by the actual figures. Mr. and Mrs. America are bundling the suitcases and the kids into the family car and taking to the woods for the biggest vacation season since 41. And, of course, we have it coming. But please remember this. Be careful with fire. Don't throw tobacco or matches from your car, even if you're sure they're out. Use the ashtrays instead. Build campfires only in areas where they're permitted. And make doubly sure they're extinguished before you leave. The forests are ours to enjoy, but they're our responsibility, too. So remember these simple rules and do your part in helping to prevent forest fires. Now, back to The Whistler. <laughs> So the chain was broken, Arnold. Not in one place, but in two. Mrs. Bronson, of course, was the first to discover it. She'd been concerned over the way you sounded on the telephone and had hurried over to find you sprawled in the easy chair by the fireplace. A half hour later, Sergeant Cook was there, too, and the pieces began to fit together. Now, Mrs. Bronson, 
You say you know something about all this? Yes. In a way, I feel sort of responsible. Responsible? Well, you see, Mr. Stanton called me just before it happened, and, well, I told him Evelyn was at my house. Oh, I know I shouldn't have, but Evelyn was such a dear friend of mine, and... Well? Well, I don't think I was a party to it. I never really approved. But there was this other person, a Mr. Haverhill. Mr. Weston Haverhill. Yes, Evelyn had been seeing him for some time. I told her she was very wrong. That the least she could do be tell her husband she was in love with someone else. But she felt so sorry for Arnold. Said he was so dependent on her. Yes? Mr. Haverhill wanted to have it all out with Arnold. To be above board about the whole thing. But Evelyn couldn't face it. So I... I covered up for her. What do you mean, covered up for her? Well, Evelyn and Mr. Haber were going to spend the day together, something special. And I called Mr. Stanton's office and pretended I was Evelyn. Said she was at my house playing bridge. Then when he got home, found she wasn't there, he called me to check up on her. And you told him the same thing? Yes, I told him she just left. What else could I do? It must have been a terrible shock when he found her there in the bathroom. Yes. Yeah. Arnold couldn't stand it, poor man. He just had to be with her. You know? Huh? It makes sort of a perfect ending. He never would have been happy without her. He loved her so. Wednesday at this same time, The Whistler will return with another strange tale. Featured in tonight's production were Elliot Lewis and B. Benaderet. This program is a featured production of the Columbia Broadcasting System and was directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Robert Libet and Frank C. Burt. Music by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by independent research the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember... Let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Stranger in the House. Helen decided she might as well be honest with herself. The suspense was getting her down. It had been six years since her brother Ted had left for the Orient on that government mission just before Pearl Harbor. And he was still out there, somewhere between Manila and Shanghai, alive or dead. Yes, it had come to the point now where Helen was wishing for any kind of a message, even one telling her Ted was dead. At least it would end the waiting. At least it would be better than not knowing at all. 
George, please. I don't want to talk about it anymore. He's been on my mind for so long now, I wish I could forget about him for a while. Oh, I'm rather surprised to hear you say that, Helen. Oh, I know it sounds terrible, but... George, it's been six years now. Six years of waiting, not knowing. I know, I can't stand it much longer, George. He's my only brother, don't you understand? Six years of silence. If, If they'd only tell us something... But you must realize there are thousands of women like you, dear. Just one of those terrible things about a war, that's all. Well, let's just wait, then. Let's not talk about him anymore. But I'm your lawyer, Helen. There's some things we've got to talk about. All right. Go on, George. Now, it's been six years. If we haven't heard from him by next year at this time, he'll be declared legally dead. What does that mean? Well, there's a reversion clause in your father's will, Helen. It means if Ted dies before you do... His share of the estate reverts to you. Why must you always throw that will in my face, George? Why must it always come around to money? Every time we talk about Ted, it's the same thing. I don't care about the money. But we... All I care about is having him back, alive and well. Now, please go, George. If it doesn't have to be settled till next year, let's not talk about it till then. All right, Helen. Uh, George. Yes, Helen? I'm sorry I blew up. I, I guess I'm just not myself. Sure, Helen. I understand. Yes, Helen, the suspense is beginning to tell on you, isn't it? Six years of it. Just a few letters from Ted, your brother, early in 1941, telling you of his arrival in Manila. Then silence. No way you could get in touch with him. Nothing you could do but wait. And you're still waiting. Still rushing out to meet the postman. Hoping each day will be the big one. George is more tactful now about the will. He doesn't mention it anymore, and you're very grateful. And then at long last, the suspense is ended. It's not the postman. It's Rhoda, your maid, coming into your bedroom one morning with a cablegram. When did it come, Rhoda? Just this minute, miss. A messenger brought it to the door. Arriving September 1st, Seattle, steamer President Jefferson. Love... Ted. At last. Oh, Miss Helen, your brother. At last. Yes. Yes, Rhoda. At last. Pardon me. That's all right. I beg your pardon. Pardon me. Pardon me. Oh, Stuart, Stuart. Uh, yes, Miss. I'm looking for Mr. Ted Van Norton. Where is his cabin, please? Just a minute, please. Uh, Van, Van, uh, Van Norton, stateroom 3C, third deck. Thank you. Come in. Ted, darling. Oh, hello. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I must have the wrong stateroom. I'm looking for my brother, Ted Van Norton. What's the matter, Helen? Don't you recognize me? Uh, who are you? Well, this isn't much of a homecoming after six years. Maybe I'd better introduce myself. The name is Theodore Van Norton, remember? Oh, there, there must be some mistake. Why, Helen. Helen, darling, you're joking, aren't you? Who are you? Well, I've already told you I'm your brother, Ted. You're not my brother. You're, you're an imposter. With the prologue of Stranger in the House, the Signal Oil Company brings you another curious tale by The Whistler. This Labor Day weekend, was part of your driving fun spoiled by the way other cars left you behind on the getaway or climbed ahead of you on hills? Well, don't give up. Cheer up. There's probably lots of pep and performance left in your motor that you're not getting out of it. That's why tonight, for the benefit of you drivers who may not yet have tried Signal's great new gasoline, I want to pass along the good news about this new super fuel that's engineered especially to put the fun back into driving. You see, science actually rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to put amazing power into new signal gasoline. Power that gives you quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. Ah, but even that's only half the story. For in new signal, there's an extra bonus of extra mileage. Well, after all, it stands to reason that some power that helps your motor perform so much more efficiently also helps you go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. And that's why Signal says, look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Helen, 
all you can do is stand there in the stateroom and stare at him. The effrontery of this stranger trying to pass himself off as your brother leaves you at a loss for something to say. He doesn't remotely resemble Ted. He's tall with a clean-cut athletic look to him. Ted was short and stocky. Perhaps he thinks it's funny, Helen. Perhaps he's one of those people with a perverted sense of humor, a practical joker. Yes, it's hilarious, isn't it? To pull a trick like this after six years of almost unbearable suspense. Well, darling, have we better get a move on? Are you stupid enough to think you can get away with this? Uh, get away with what? If this is some crude attempt at humor. Not at all. I'm quite serious. Where's my brother? Now, look, do you have to be that way? I explain why. Don't lie to me. Where is he? Uh, excuse me a moment. Oh, Stewart. Yes, Mr. Ben Orton? Would you take care of my hand baggage, please? Yes, sir, right away. Thanks. Come on, Helen, let's go down to the dock. I'll call the purser. I'll have Wait you... a minute. Now, look. Here's the passport with fingerprints and photograph. Birth certificate, State Department credentials. Letters from you. They're forgeries. I'm sorry, they're genuine. You... You're not going home with me. I won't stand for it. Very well, darling. I'll check in at a hotel for the time being. But after all, you can't keep a guy out of his own home now, can you? George, George, I've never been so stunned in my life. He just stood there, smiling at me, saying over and over that he was Ted. You say he had identification, huh? Oh, everything, everything, even letters from me. I wrote them when Ted first arrived in Manila. Genuine? I think so. Well, they must be. He'd know better than to try to get by with forgeries. Helen, you're sure you're right. George, you don't think I know my own brother? Well, it's been six years. He's probably been in a prison camp. It can make a lot of difference in a man's appearance. But Ted's dead. Huh? Or he would have written. Something terrible's happened, I'm sure of it. This man might have killed him. Yes, that's it. So he could get his hand on Ted's half of the estate. Oh, that's a pretty serious charge, Helen. You have to be sure of yourself. Remember, you're the only one in Seattle who can recognize him now. He left here over 15 years ago. Uh, do you have any pictures? No, I thought of that. No, no, there aren't any. Not since he was a little boy. He spent most of his time in the East with Aunt Ida. Oh? Uh-huh. Where is she? She died some time ago. Well, there are a lot of ways we can check on him. State Department ought to know about him. He's been with them for over 10 years. Uh, you say he's stopping at a hotel? Yes. You know, of course, Helen, that if he can prove his identity, he has a legal right to live here in this house. I tell you, he's a flagrant imposter. He's not coming here. If I have to hire someone to throw him out. Who is it? It's Rhoda. What time is it? After eight. Oh, go away. I'm sleepy. I must see you, miss. All right, Rhoda. Come in. What is it? It's... It's Mr. Van Norton. What? Where is he? He's in the bathroom, miss. Shaving! Ah, sweet mystery. Oh, all the unmitigated. Just wait. The nerve oh, fever. Oh, I know. Well, good morning, good morning. What do you think you're doing? Hmm? Shaving. <laughs> morning ablutions. I, I can't say I'm used to having ladies barge into the bathroom when I... Get out of here! Uh, 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 uh. Temper, temper. How did you get in? Well, I couldn't get a room at a hotel, so... I took a taxi up last night, walked in the back door. It was open, you see. Well, you can leave the same way you came in. Uh, no, no, I'm here to stay, sister dear. I've got the proof in my pocket. And if you want to get me out, you can trot right down to the Hall of Justice and get yourself a court order. More coffee, Helen? No, thanks. Hotcakes, huh? Mr. Whoever you are. Uh, The name is Van Norton. Theodore Van Norton. I must say, I've never seen such colossal nerve in my life. You flatter me. You're not at all concerned about the servants. Why, should I be? Aren't you afraid they'll recognize you? Oh, don't be silly. None of them were here when I left home. Fifteen years ago, Edward the butler was the last to go, I think. When was it? Thirty-eight, that was it, wasn't it? Oh, by the way, Helen, whatever became of old Edward... There are other people in town, you know. What about your teachers at Washington Heights School? Why, Helen, you know, I believe you're trying to trick me. (laughs) 
You know Father sent me to Fox Hall Academy when I was 14. I never went to Washington Heights. Where are you going? You seem to know everything. Why don't you tell me that? Uh, Helen, we have some talking to do, darling, about the will. Father's estate, you know. Seems to me the executor owes me close to a million dollars. You knew it was coming, didn't you, Helen? That's the purpose behind the whole crazy business. It's still inconceivable to you that the man can actually expect to get away with it. George was right. There are a thousand ways you can check up on him. And the imposter himself just gave you an excellent one. You make a long-distance call to the Foxhall Academy and talk to Mr. Rigby, the headmaster. Why, yes, of course, Miss Van Norton. I'd be delighted to come down tomorrow afternoon. Ted was always one of my favorites, you know. Any special time? What about two o'clock? Fine, fine. It'll be quite a reunion, won't it? Yes, indeed, Mr. Rigby. Quite a reunion. <laughs> Mr. Rigby, this is George Chadwick, my lawyer. How do you do? Hi. Would you like to wait in the living room, Mr. Rigby? I think Ted is out on the tennis court. We'll call him. Thank you. Come on, George. Excuse us, Mr. Rigby. Of course. Do you still think I don't know my own brother? I never said that, Helen. I only said six years can make a lot of a difference. Oh, I'm afraid Mr. What's-His-Name is going to suffer a little embarrassment. You think Rigby will recognize him? Of course. He'll recognize him as an imposter. He knows Ted as well as I do. Hmm. What's the matter? I don't know. I checked those documents of his this morning and... Will you stop talking nonsense, George? I tell you, they're stolen. Heaven knows what happened to Ted or how this crook got a hold of his papers. All right, Ellen, all right. You better go and call him. Hello, sis. What's up? I was sorry to interrupt your tennis game. Ted. Oh, oh, it's Ted now, huh? Why, of course. I could have been mistaken, you know. Well, I can't say I expected this. I'd be a little foolish not to admit it when I'm wrong, wouldn't I? Come on, dear. Okay, where to? Just to the living room. You can go back to your tennis in a moment. Oh, there you are, George. Hello, Ted. Uh, hello, George. What's going on around here? We're going into the living room, George. Perhaps you'd like to join us. Oh, of course. Well... Open the door, George. Huh? Oh, sorry. Say, what is all this? I don't... Rigby! Ted! Teddy, old boy, how have you been? What are you, old son of a gun? <laughs> hey, what, what, what is this, Helen? A surprise? Why don't you tip a guy off when his old headmaster comes to see him? Oh, you're looking fine, Teddy. Yeah? Good Lord, it's been 15 years. Oh, sure. Last time I saw you was uh, to the Washburn game, remember? Yeah, yeah, that was it at Spokane. Yes. I think he was there, too. Yes. Teddy, you remember when the bus broke down that night outside of Wenatchee? And you and I had a... You stand there stunned, speechless, just staring at them as they slap each other on the back, forgetting all about you. And George avoids looking at you. He's on their side now, you're sure of it. And worst of all, it's beginning to get you, too. He's not your brother, you know it, you're positive. It's ridiculous to go through all this rigmarole, but it seems to be your word against his proof, doesn't it? But there are still other ways, aren't there? Like another long-distance call... This time to the State Department in Washington, D.C. After being transferred to four or five different offices, you finally get through to the right man. You check this matter thoroughly. I'm positive that the man representing himself as my brother is an imposter. You say you were with Mr. Van Norton when he filed his original application here in 1936? Yes, I saw him attach his photograph and fix his fingerprints. I simply want to see that application. I'll forward the file to our Seattle representative and you can check it there. That'd be satisfactory? Quite satisfactory. Thank you. Hmm, I see. You say the file was forwarded here from Washington. That's right. I simply want to examine it, particularly the photograph. Mm hmm. Excuse me a moment, Miss Van Norton. I'll have to look it up. Well, George. Well, what? I can't say I'm pleased with your lack of confidence in me. Well, who said anything about that? Oh, it's quite clear enough. Helen, I'm a lawyer. 
I'll believe black is white if they throw enough evidence at me. Mr. Rigby was a very convincing witness. He's a decrepit old fool, and it had been 15 years. I thought he was an intelligent man. I could have passed you off as my brother. He'd forgotten what Ted looks like. And does that explain why Ted recognized him? Oh. I don't know, Helen. Seems to me you're arguing against yourself when you say Rigby might have forgotten what he looks like. What do you mean? Well, you might have forgotten yourself. After all, it's been six years, you know. A man can change. Don't be ridiculous. I know my own brother as well as I know the... Shh. Here comes the clerk. Here we are. Theodore H. Van Norton. Now, what did you wish to see? Oh, let me see it. Medical examination, education record, application. Where's the picture? On the other side. Oh, here. Satisfied, Helen? It, it can't be. I saw Ted paste his picture on myself. Something wrong? Of course there's something wrong. This isn't my brother. It's, it's that man. Helen, get a hold of yourself. What? Let me see. Yes, here they are. Fingerprints. Listen, listen, clerk. I want this whole record sent to the office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Helen, you need to rest. Things getting you. That's one thing they can't be forged, don't you see? They can't forge your fingerprints. I'm sorry, Miss Van Norden, but I have no authority. You've got to. I tell you, there's a stranger in my house posing as my brother. There's a million dollars involved. Just a minute, Helen. Now, it's most important, Mr. Robbins, not only because of the money involved. You see, Miss Van Norden is extremely upset. Of course, Mr. Chadwick. But you see, I can't simply turn over material like this. I'll make the necessary arrangements with the FBI, Mr. Robbins, and get authority from Washington. That be satisfactory? Quite, Mr. Chadwick. Quite. Hello, Ted. Oh, hello, Helen. I began to wonder where you were all afternoon. Downtown shopping. Oh, the stores are frightful these days. Yeah, indeed they are. Reading? Yeah. How's Dick Tracy? I don't know. I haven't checked him today. <laughs> Funny. You used to read Dick Tracy before you even looked at the headlines. I... I guess a guy gets a little serious after six years overseas. In a prison camp most of the time. Yes. I suppose so. Hey, you're looking calmer today. Did you finally decide I'm kosher? I... I want you to forgive me, Ted. It's... It's so unbelievable that I don't quite trust my senses anymore. Sure. Sure, you're a good kid, Helen. I don't blame you. Will you drink on it? Why not? What'll it be? Bourbon and soda? Oh, you're a man after my own heart. You know, I'm kind of surprised. I thought you'd be a tougher nut to crack. Oh, you expected me to be suspicious. Well, after that episode on the boat, I expected anything. Oh. Here you are. Thanks. What do we drink to? To us, of course. All right. To us. Yes, ma'am? You're in charge of the fingerprinting department here? Yes. I'm Helen Van Norton. I brought in a highball glass yesterday afternoon with some fingerprints on it. Oh, yes. That's the one you wanted us to check against the prints in the State Department application file. Uh, where did you get that glass? A man is posing as my brother, staying at my house. They're his fingerprints. You're sure of the prints on the application? What do you mean? Are you sure they're the bona fide prints of your brother? Of course. I was with him in Washington when he completed the application. I saw him put the prints on it. I see. Well, that ought to settle it for you once and for all. What do you mean? The man at your house is your brother, Miss Van Norton. The prints are identical. I... Can't be. It can't... We wouldn't commit ourselves if we weren't positive. I... I see. Yes, of course. Thank you. Well, Helen, that settles it, doesn't it? You're beaten and you know it. But you still have one more out, just one. It's a desperate chance, but you've decided you have to take it. To determine once and for all whether or not this man is your brother. Whether you can trust your own mind. It's very late that night when you get quietly out of bed and walk downstairs to the telephone. The house is as quiet as a tomb. Everyone's asleep. I want to call Honolulu operator, Mr. Amato Subishi, 28 Kalua Drive, Honolulu. Will you wait? Yes, I'll wait. Here 
manager party. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Is this Mr. Subishi? Who is calling, please? I last talked to you in April 1941. The name I gave you was Grayson. Do you remember that? Why are you calling? Do you remember me? Of course I remember you. I sent you $50,000 to... To take care of Mr. Van Norton. Uh, He was in Manila. You did take care of him. He's dead. He was killed in an accident in May of 1941. You're positive? Positive. Thank you, Mr. Subishi. Thank you very much. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Hear that? If you're a driver, that's a signal you should know. The trainman's warning signal that engineers start to blow a quarter mile before a crossing. And another signal it'll pay you to recognize is the big circle sign with yellow letters on a black background spelling out the word signal gasoline. The sign that identifies friendly dealer-owned signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. Wherever you see that sign, there you'll find not only top-quality signal products, but also more thorough, more conscientious service. Because your signal dealer, being in business for himself, naturally has more incentive to do those little extra things that will keep your car and you happy. Well, add it up, that's just about today's best recipe for longer car life. No wonder Signal Oil Company has grown so, from a mere handful of stations in Southern California to an organization now serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And no wonder more and more wise drivers are letting Signal's yellow and black circle sign be their signal for the surer protection cars need today to help them run better and last longer. And now back to the Whistler. It was a relief to know, wasn't it, Helen? You can trust your own senses now. Ted is dead, and the stranger in the house is an imposter. Somehow, some way, you can prove it. And the $50,000 you paid Mr. Subishi back in the spring of 1941 is still a good investment. Because Ted's million dollars, half of the estate will be yours. All of it. You don't want to think about it anymore. It's been too bewildering. All you want now is your bed and the first good night's sleep in a week. You put down the phone and start toward the stairs. Sit down, Helen. How long have you been here? Long enough. I said sit down. I'm going upstairs. Sit down before you fall down. That's better. You just hung yourself, baby. There's a record of that phone conversation down at FBI headquarters. What are you talking about? You didn't have Honolulu, just in case you're wondering. You were talking to the boys down at the office. We had everything, you see, except the link you just gave us. We knew Subishi paid $40,000 to one of his boys in Manila. The guy who killed your brother. But we didn't know who hired Subishi. What made you suspect me? I didn't at first. I knew Ted had a sister. I knew there were a couple of million bucks in it somewhere. And I had three and a half years in a prison camp to take it over. A guy can do a lot of deductive thinking in three and a half years. So... You looked up Subishi? Yeah. He was dead. Knocked over by a truck the morning of Pearl Harbor. No, we had nothing but suspicion. Tough, isn't it, huh? You could have been a nice kid if you weren't a killer at heart. Yeah, it took us a long time to work it out. A lot of planning, a lot of names, a lot of people to run down. But when we got going, we knew you'd crack sooner or later. Who are you? Your brother's best friend. And... And you did it because you were his friend? Partly. Partly? Yeah. My name is McKay, FBI. And incidentally, this time I'm telling you the truth. Next 
Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Virginia Gregg and Gerald Moore. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton and Mark Smith, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I'm the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Brief pause for murder. He couldn't recall the exact moment when it ceased to be a thrill to beam brightly at a microphone and announce, This is Roger Wixon speaking, and inviting you to tune in next week at this same time. He was sure, though, that the glamour and magic of radio had gone out of his life the moment he'd married Tisha. Yes, and she'd taken a lot of other things out of his life, too. Things like pride and confidence and self-respect. And Roger couldn't recall either the precise instant he decided to kill Tisha. When the helpless, frustrated hate for her blotted out any pangs of conscience, left him frankly admitting to himself that all he wanted were the moment and the means. Of course, there was no plan in his mind on the night of the dance at the country club. No plan, just the decision. He'd come home first, after leaving her there with Trent Crandall, and had sat alone in the living room patiently waiting for her. It was after two when the door opened and she called back to Trent. Good night, Trent, darling. Thanks for the buggy ride. Well, Roger, you waited up for me. How sweet of you. Not at all. Just catching up on my reading here. Oh, mm, Trent's new book. He'd be so flattered, darling. Had to fall back on something simple. Started on the Rover Boys, but I got stuck on the big words. <laughs> so that's why you waited up. You thought up a clever remark all by yourself and you wanted me to hear it. I only want to tell you, Tisha, I think you're being very stupid. You mean about Trent? Right. Makes no difference to me if you want to play footy with the town's most distinguished visitor. But our fellow citizens have a way of talking, you know. You're implying that Trent I'm might... not implying anything. Why don't you join us some evening? Play chaperone. Trent Crandall's a celebrity, Tisha. Whatever he does is news. If he got back to his wife, she might possibly misinterpret she just might assume there was more to your association with Trent than a healthy interest in his books. There is. I love him. And it doesn't concern Mrs. Crandall. The moment she's on her way to Reno. I see. And, of course, it doesn't concern me either. It shouldn't. 
When the divorce is granted, I'll be leaving you, naturally. Hmm. <laughs> oh, there it is again. Yes, what? Facial expression number 2A, the inscrutable smile. You were wearing it at the club tonight. I, uh, I rather expected to see the other one. Patient suffering, I believe it is. Good night, Tisha. You're glad I'm leaving, aren't you? That's why you smiled. Maybe. Of course, you'll have to get along without my money. I said good night, Tisha. Just good night. No recrimination. <laughs> you know, darling, I couldn't sleep a wink if I thought you were brooding over something. No, of course not. You were brilliant tonight, Tisha. I enjoy being sneered at in front of a room full of people. And it was an inspiration you're calling Mr. Gladney, the man I work for, the program director of a peanut whistle. He's an incompetent, offensive stuffed shirt. Why shouldn't I tell him so? Oh, very well, Tisha, very well. Is that all? Yes, that's all. All right, darling. <laughs> this is Mrs. Roger Wixon bidding you good night. So Tisha leaves and you sit alone in the living room thinking... You've discovered a very important thing, haven't you, Roger? The reason you've given yourself for wanting to kill her is gone. She's going to leave you of her own accord and marry Trent Crandall. But it doesn't seem to make any difference, does it? Nothing matters, not even her money. You're going to kill her because you hate her. Because she's destroyed your self-respect. That's all the reason you need. But how, Roger, how? The next morning, shortly after you arrive at the station, you run into another announcer in the corridor. Hi, Rod. Oh, hello, Jerry. How was uh, the thing at the club? Oh, all right. Oh, I hated to miss it. Well, that's funny. I thought I saw you there. Well, you probably heard me. I had the remote last night, banned from the Cedars. Oh, yeah, that's right. I heard you. We tuned in over at the club. Yeah, it's very simple. On the air from the Cedars, can't be at the club. At the club, can't be on the air from the Cedars. Conclusion, Jerry wasn't there. Get it? Yeah. Yeah, Jerry, I get it. You can't be in two places at once. With the prologue of Brief Pause for Murder, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. I say, mister, does this sound familiar to you? You're out driving, sailing down a smooth stretch of concrete, with your motor fairly eating up the miles, when suddenly the little lady next to you cautions... Dear, watch your speedometer. Smart girl, for watching your speedometer will tell you important things you should know besides speed. For one thing, your speedometer will measure the quality of the gasoline you're using, because it's the same properties in gasoline that give you extra driving pleasure that also get extra mileage. For example... When scientists rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to put amazing new performance into new signal gasoline, naturally they gave you quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti knock Well, it's because of this, because new signal helps your motor perform so much more efficiently that you now go farther than ever with signal gasoline. That's why signal says, look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. Now, back to the Whistler. It doesn't matter that Tisha plans to leave you, does it? The decision to kill her has been part of you for so long that nothing she does will ever change it. So you don't think of the why of it anymore, just the how. And part of the how took shape in your mind when Jerry Edwards explained that it was impossible for him to be both on the air from the theaters and at the country club at the same time. Something to think about, isn't it, Roger? And that evening as you're doing your news broadcast, you find something else to think about. Halfway through the show, someone hands you a late bulletin with a local date line. ...toward solving the housing problem. Here's a late bulletin. Police in the city went on 24-hour duty tonight, launching an all-out effort to capture the so-called whipcord strangler, who claimed his third victim last night. The crime followed the grimly familiar pattern. 
Mrs. Dorothea Eckler was found dead in her apartment early this morning. Medical reports indicate death had been caused by strangulation with a cord or thong. As in other cases, the apartment had been looted. Police warned residents to take special precautions. You hope your listeners will attribute that hesitancy in your voice to revulsion at the horrible crime. But it's something quite different, isn't it, Roger? Another part of the how. You've decided now that Tisha will die in a way that will point to the whipcord strangler as the only suspect. At the very moment you're broadcasting from the studio. It'll have to be a recording, of course. So there's another big problem. How can you get one of the station engineers to play a recording of your voice at the right time? And to keep his mouth shut no matter what happens. That stops you, doesn't it, Roger? For three more days, it stops you. And then fate steps in again. Mr. Gladney, the program director, calls you into the master control room to meet a new employee. Want you to meet our new engineer, Wixon, Vern Stevens. Hello. I do. Uh, be working with you on the night shift. I've seen you somewhere before, haven't I? I don't think so. Your name is Stevens? Yeah, Stevens. Well, I've got to run along. Explain the setup to Stevens, will you, Wixon? You bet, Mr. Gladney. <laughs> you know, I'd swear I've seen you somewhere before. Must have been a couple of other guys. Uh, haven't you got a station break coming up? Yeah. Let's do it, huh? As you give the station's call letters and the time signal... You watch the new engineer through the glass at the control room. Try to imagine what he'd look like without the mustache, with a face a little less drawn. Then something clicks. You do know him. Six years ago at another small radio station in the Midwest. You cut off your mic and the smooth voice of the network announcer booms from the loudspeaker over your head, introducing a program of dinner music. Then you re-enter the control room. Stevens is showing elaborate interest in the dials on the instrument panel before him. Hey, Stevens. Yeah? I'm... I'm sure we've met before. I don't know. A lot of faces like mine. Not exactly like it. Huh? You just might be a guy I used to know at WSLR. I tell you you're wrong. You better go at that. Hey, cut the speaker down, will you? I can't hear myself think. Hey, that's better. Look, Wixon, I'm new here. I don't want to be rude, but I've got to study this panel layout. Sure. Sorry, Stevens. I don't mean to bother you, but you look just like a guy I used to work with at WSLR six years ago. Only his name was Spore. Vern Spore. My name is up there on my license. Take a look. Uh Uh-huh. Vern Stevens. Vern Spore. You and this guy could have been brothers. Well, okay. I I guess I'll write to the boys back at WSLR and ask... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Okay, Wixon. You win. I I want to talk to you. Sure. You always were a pretty good guy. How about forgetting you ever knew me? I don't see why not. It's your business. Probably heard about that jam I got into right after I left WSLR. Well, what happened? It didn't seem like anything at the time. Some smart operators were rounding up radio equipment, transmitter parts and stuff, and selling at the stations below the border. I slipped them some old beat-up junk from the station where I was working and got caught. That was tough. Yeah, you're in the clink. Had to change my name when I got out. What about the license? Friend fixed it up. I see. You, uh, won't say anything? Why should I? Thanks, Wixon. Gosh, when you walk in tonight, I, I like to die. Glad he ever found out about my record. Sure, or... sure. Listen, Wixon. If there's anything I can do... Sure, Van. Don't worry. I'll call on you. So that's all there is to the how, isn't it, Roger? Stevens is your man. And he'll play ball any time you ask him. All that remains is when. And you can name your time. Or at least, that's what you think until late that evening when you arrive home to find Tisha talking on the phone to Trent Crandall. Well, of course, Trent, darling. Any time you say. When? Day after tomorrow? Well, it doesn't give me much time to get ready, but... Roger. <laughs> Don't worry about him. After all, darling, what does he to say about it? But why should I talk it over with him? If I want to go to Hollywood with you, that's all there is to it. Well, I think you're being a little unreasonable, dear. All right. 
right, if you say so, I'll talk to him. Yes, I'll call you back. Good night, darling. Good evening, Tisha. When did you come in? Just now. How is the dear boy? Trent. Naturally. Quite well, thanks. Are you uh, concerned about Trent? I seem to have good reason to be concerned about him. Or uh, did I place the correct interpretation on that little chat? I'm going to Hollywood with him, if that's what you mean. You want to make something of it? Yes, perhaps I do. Wait a minute, Roger. No, you wait a minute. You're going to stay here with me for the next week after he leaves. And we're going to leave town for our vacation together. Then you can go on to Hollywood. I'll return alone. Suppose I don't agree? I won't give you a divorce. You can remain Mrs. Roger Wixon. It's all right with me. Well, do you want to call Trent back right now? Very well, Roger. I'll call him. Yes, Roger, it's important that Tisha stay with you. For the moment, at least. Until the when is settled, of course. And a week should give you enough time, shouldn't it? The answer to the when comes unexpectedly the next evening when Lieutenant Krasner of the police department comes into the station to ask a favor. Mind if I interrupt you for a minute, Wixon? Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Not at all. Come on in. Thanks. I've just been talking to Mr. Gladney. He suggested I see you about some announcements on the police benefit next week. So maybe you'd do them for us. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, when do you want him to start? Well, tonight, if you can. See, I've got them right here. Tonight? Oh, that's pretty short notice. The schedule's pretty full. Oh, here they are. Yeah, I know we're throwing you a curve. You've probably seen by the papers. We've been a little busy these days. You mean the, uh, the strangler? Yeah, it's been pretty rough. Pretty rough guy. You're not telling us anything. Oh, uh, your wife home alone while you're working here? Yes. Tell her to keep the windows locked. That's the way the guy gets in. You mean you, you think nobody knows where he'll strike next? Doesn't pay to take any chances. Oh. You got any leads? A few. Got a hunch or two. I think we'll get them. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, what about the announcement? Oh, well, let me check the schedule. Uh, oh, yes, here we are. Well, first time we can give you is the station break at 10 tomorrow night. Is that soon enough? Well, I guess it'll have to be. Can you do it yourself? Oh, yes, it'll be on my ship. Well, thanks a lot, Wixon. I'll tell the boys at headquarters. We'll be listening. And that does it, Roger. The win is complete, too. Police Lieutenant Krasner is going to hear you read that announcement tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, along with his friends down at headquarters. And who could ask for a better alibi than that? Late that night, when you and Vern Stevens are alone at the station, you walk easily into the control room. He's turned off the annoying loudspeaker, as usual, when the boss isn't around, and glances occasionally at the dancing needle on the volume indicator to assure himself that the network program is going out to the listeners. How'd I sound on the 9 o'clock news, Vern? Okay. Why? Notice anything different in my voice? Try to give us something special tonight. How'd it sound? Well, like I said, I thought it was good. Much cooking. Uh, can you keep something under your hat? Try me. I, uh, I'd hate to have the old man find out, but, uh, I got a chance to go to Hollywood. Yeah? A friend of mine with an agency out there thinks he could use me. Well, I'll make more dough on one broadcast than I get in a week out here. Yeah, it's great. Going big time, huh? Oh, no, it's not definite yet. That's why I don't want anybody around here to know. You're the only one I've told so far. Just got a wire from the guy. He'll be going through on the special tomorrow night. If I didn't have to work, I could talk to him for about 20 minutes while the train stopped. But I, I gotta work. Why not trade shifts tomorrow night with one of the other guys? No, well, I'd have to say why, and I don't want anyone else to get wind of it. Won't the guy come up from the depot? Oh, you don't ask guys like that to come up from the depot. No, I guess I'm sunk. Can't be in two places at once. Uh, pretty important you meet this guy, isn't it? Might mean I could get out of this dump. But forget it, there's no Wait use. a minute. What time does a special get in? Uh, 9.55. Let's see. At 9.45, we've got the Signal Oil Sports broadcast on the net from Hollywood. 10, we take Murder Manor from New York. There's a station break at 10 and that police announcement and time signal. I'm sunk because I've got to be in front of a mic for 30 seconds. What are you talking about? Let's record it. Huh? Sure. We can do it tonight right here in the studio. Give the call letters, time signal, and your announcement. I'll play the record for you tomorrow night at 10. That means you can leave here at 9.45. Won't have to be back until the 10.30 break. Gives you 45 minutes. 
Gee, I think it'd work. Why not? Well, suppose Gladney finds I left the station, I get canned. How's he going to find out? We'll be alone here, and after I play the record, I'll destroy it. Then, did anybody ever tell you you were a genius? <laughs> Here's your mic. You all set? Yeah. We'll cut it at 33, a little better fidelity. Got your copy? Yeah, right here. Okay, we're ready. I'll cue you from the booth. Right. This is WTUX, the voice of the wheat belt. It's 20 seconds before 10 p.m. Friends, here's a chance for you to show your appreciation. Scott, hold it. Why, what's the matter? Just got an idea. Start it over and purposely make a mistake, then correct it. Make a mistake, but why? If you get a time wrong and then correct yourself, it'll sound more than ever like you were actually in the studio. Nobody dreaming with a record. That's a good idea. Okay, let's try it. Watch me for the cue. All right. This is WTUX, the voice of the wheat belt. 20 seconds before 9 p.m. Uh, correction, 10 p.m. Friends, here's a chance for you to show your appreciation for the men who protect your homes and loved ones. 24 hours a day. Yeah. So it's done, Roger. The record is made, ready to go. And you know you can count on Vern Stevens to come through for you. The next day is a big one. But you manage to go through your normal routine at home during the morning and early afternoon. As usual, you don't say much to Tisha. Since Trent Crandall has left for Hollywood, she'll be home all evening alone. <laughs> At 9.30 that night, you call Lieutenant Krasner at the station. I just thought I'd remind you, Lieutenant, your announcement goes on in half hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it'll do the job all right. At 9.45, you give the station call letters and start out of the studio. Okay, Vern, I'll see you before 10.30. Right. And don't forget to bust that record. The old man... Don't was... worry about that. I'll carry this secret to my grave. <laughs> You're careful to take the back streets home, keeping well within the speed limit. There's only one person in the world who'll know that you're going to be in two places at the same time tonight. And you know Vern Stevens won't talk, no matter what he suspects. It wouldn't be healthy for a man with a prison record to expose himself to suspicion as a possible accomplice. Ten minutes later, you've left your car in an alley and walk up to the back door of your apartment. You reach in your side pocket. Yes. Yeah. The leather thong is there, ready to go. Oh. Oh. It's you. Hello, Tisha. What are you doing home so early? You scared me to death. I just thought I'd drop by and see how you were doing. I've often wondered if you miss me, Tisha, during these long, lonely evenings. Well, I see you're listening to our rival station. Answer my question, Roger. Why aren't you at the station? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. I just got tired, so I came home. What are you talking about? Tired, Tisha. Tired of station breaks and tired of this dumpy little town. What's the matter with you, Roger? Why are you looking at me that way? Most of all, I'm tired of you, Tisha. I'm tired of the farce you've made out of this marriage, if you can call it a marriage. Roger, I don't know what you... What do you mean, Roger? It wasn't really a marriage, was it, Tisha? It was only a means for you, a way you could ease that frustrated black heart of yours when Trent Crandall married somebody else right under your nose. Roger, Roger, what Yes, Tish, I'm tired of humiliation, of ridicule, of being used for a doormat, playing clown for that crowd of stupid sophisticates. Roger, please, darling, think. Think what you're doing. Get away. Let go of me. Run, run. Think of it, did you, Tisha? Never entered your head that I'd kill you, did it? It's too late now, though. Too late now. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Since the war, have you noticed the increasing emphasis that's being put on the independent businessman? Well, that's particularly interesting because the Signal Oil Company, since they first started marketing gasoline 15 years ago, has sold Signal products only through dealer-owned service stations. 
and for good reason. Not only does the independent businessman represent the American way of life that has made our country such a great place in which to live and make a living, but also there's a personal advantage for you in having your car serviced at a dealer-owned signal station. You see, because your signal dealer is in business for himself, he naturally has more incentive to give you more thorough, more conscientious service that will keep your car happy and keep you his steady customer. This personalized service, plus top-quality Signal products, explains why Signal has grown from a mere handful of stations serving Southern California into an organization serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. Yes, there are good reasons for the swing to Signal. To discover them for yourself, stop in soon and get acquainted with your neighborhood Signal oil dealer. Now, back to The Whistler. Well, Roger, it's done now, isn't it? Tisha's dead and you're free. With over a half hour to get back to the station. You leave her there on the floor, put on a pair of gloves and move quickly about the apartment, dumping the contents of drawers all over the room. Then into the bedroom where you open a window. Yes, Roger. It must look like a typical whipcord strangler crime with robbery the obvious motive. You're lucky Tisha had the radio playing. It covers any noise you might make. And then suddenly, the music stops. You stop dead in your tracks as you hear the announcer give the interrupt cue and begin reading the bulletin. ...program to bring you a flash from the local police department. Chief of Police Fair has announced that a suspect arrested this afternoon has confessed to the whipcord stranglings of three women in the city during the past month. What? Nearly half the loot stolen oh, no. from his victims has been recovered. No! With this dangerous criminal now in custody, citizens can now... With a frantic gasp, you turn the radio down. This is something you hadn't counted on, Roger. One of your alibis is gone. The fall guy is in custody. You stare at the littered room, wondering if you have time to restore the place to order. No, no time for that. The other alibi, that's the one you'll have to depend on now, the radio. It's just ten o'clock. If Vern Stevens hasn't bungled, you've still got a chance. Your hand is shaking so violently, you can hardly turn the dial to the station's frequency. And then... WTUX, the voice of the wheat belt. 20 seconds before 9 p.m. Correction, 10 p.m. Friends, here is a chance for you to show your appreciation. As your own voice comes over the speaker, you begin to relax. A station full of police officers are hearing it. It doesn't matter how she died or who did it. The fact remains, a man can't be at two places at the same time. You have fun and at the same time help the widows and orphans of the brave men who live in your service and die for your protection. 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 Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal, gasoline, and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Joseph Kearns and Mary Jane Croft. This program, produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Lou Houston and Bill Foreman, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Dick Wells speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you With new Signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular Signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The Witness at the Fountain. There were two things about Randy Dean that set him apart from the rest of the world. Basic inner things that made him different. The first one was clear enough on first meeting. He was a newspaper columnist, of course, but in a world of happy-go-lucky newspaper men, Randy was careful and methodical, living his life according to plan, scheduling each day down to the minute. No, there was nothing slovenly or happy-go-lucky about Randy. He'd mentally blueprinted his future on the first day he went to work on the Harristown Tribune some years before, and had set to work building his career like a ship. In the course of construction, naturally enough, he came to New York, took a position on the Star Express, and, according to plan, married the publisher's daughter. And now, though he was a syndicated columnist at the top of the ladder, he saw no reason to let down. The methodical planning, the schedule, still went on. From major events at the newspaper, right down to the problem of his white shirts. Cynthia! Cynthia, where are you? Cynthia! Yes, Randy? Come here a moment, will you? Just a minute. Put the eggs on, will you, Anna? Mr. Dean will be ready for breakfast. Yes, dear? It's 7.55. You're behind schedule. I've been looking for a white shirt for the past ten minutes. Where did Anna put them? Oh, I forgot to tell you, dear. She didn't send them out to the laundry until Friday. Friday? They go out on Wednesdays. She knows that. You have to make allowances, dear. After all, the poor girl's just become engaged. Hang it, Cynthia. Her engagement has nothing to do with it. The point is that white shirts are scarce as hen's teeth, and unless she sends them out on Wednesday when she's supposed to... Not so loud. She'll hear you. I don't care if she does. It's about time somebody talked to her... It's not only the shirts. My gray shock skin suit is still hanging in the closet. What about that? It's Monday, darling. My suits go to the cleaners Monday morning. I've told her a dozen times. But you won't wear it again for weeks. I want it ready when I need it. All right, dear. I'll tell her. Now, you won't say a word to her about it at breakfast, will you? Oh, very well, Cynthia. I'll go and see how your eggs are coming. All right. Oh, Cynthia. Yes? No two and a half minute eggs this time. Three. <laughs> Yes, that was one of the unusual things about Randy Dean, the public one. The other, the private one, was even more unusual, for Randy was basically a criminal. The reason, for example, that he was so irritated about his shirts and his sharkskin suit became clear that very afternoon in the American wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was sitting inconspicuously with a dapper little gray-haired man before a painting by Gilbert Stewart. Properly attentive as the guide discussed its merits before a small group of spectators. Washington, perhaps his most famous. We find Stewart at his best. The delicacy of line, the careful delineation of character, expression, and so on. Let's pass on now to another example of the artist's work, the portrait of John Jay. Are you coming, gentlemen? Uh, no, no, thank you. We'll sit here a moment longer, if you don't mind. All right. Let's get it over with, Broden. 
How much this time? Two fifty, naturally. That's what I thought. Here you are. Uh, thanks. Going to have to raise it, you know. Inflation. Raise it all you want. You'll still get two fifty. A rash statement, Mr. Dean, if I've ever heard one. You'll pay what I ask when I ask it. I have a career, too, you know. A career? A more honorable one than yours, at that. At least it didn't include the murder of my first wife as the most convenient way of marrying a newspaper. And poison at that. The lowest form of murder, Mr. Dean. Be quiet, will you? Oh, we're quite alone, Mr. Dean. And I feel like talking. Yes. I had a career in mind, too. You see, I didn't plan to spend the rest of my days as a laboratory technician in a coroner's office. So when the post-mortem was called on the death of the first Mrs. Dean and I discovered poison in her stomach, I said to myself, Broden, here's opportunity knocking on the door like a woodpecker. No use sending the poor man off to the gallows. He'll be grateful to you. Be happy to support you the rest of your life. You're a born optimist, aren't you? I'm thoroughly practical, Mr. Dean. And what with living costs rising and all that? Well, I'm afraid beginning next week it'll be three fifty. What? Right? Why? I'll have to think it over. Otherwise, I simply write a letter back to Harristown. They'd be only too happy to exhume the body of poor Mrs. That's Dean. That's enough. All right. Now, where will I meet you next week? I'll call you. Just tell me where Oh, no. I'll call you, Mr. Dean. Good day. Yes, Randy. Mr. Broden had a blueprint for his future, too. And for more than four years now, you've been meeting him secretly once a week. First it was a hundred dollars, then two hundred. Next week, three fifty. And all he has to do is remind you of the first Mrs. Dean to make you uh, cooperate. Yes. In his way, Mr. Broden is just as meticulous as you are. He realizes, of course, that his career depends upon yours. And he's been very careful to keep your meeting secret so that nobody has the slightest suspicion that any connection between the two of you exists. That fact suddenly becomes important a few days later. Terry Lund of the Homicide Department is your guest for lunch at the press club. And of course, he falls back on his favorite subject, crime detection. I'm afraid I, I don't get it, Terry. What do you mean, murder is a paradox? It's very simple. The more effort you put into it, the more you try to cover up your tracks, the easier it is for us to come up with the answer. Oh, now, wait a minute. No, wait no, a... no, it's a fact, so help me. I've seen it happen hundreds of times. The fancy Dan kind of killer is a lead pipe cinch. It's the stupid ones that worry us. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, we start with a corpse, right? Yeah. First, we identify the guy. Mm -hmm. Next, we start looking for motives. Yeah. Connections between the corpse and the people who might have reason to kill him. Right. Now, that's where the stupid criminal gives us a headache. Huh? Oh, sure, you're a newspaper man. You ought to know that. Just look at the dozens of little three-line fillers that you throw in at the bottom of the columns in the back of the paper. Unidentified robbery victim, man found in alley, suspected suicide on beach. Yeah. By every one, a case where some stupid bohunk just walked up to someone he'd never seen before and slugged him and walked away. So there we are, standing around a corpse, all dressed up, no place to go. <laughs> you get it? I never thought of it in that way. You, you know, that, that's, that's interesting, Terry. I, I might do a column on it. <laughs> you better let me read it first. No connection, no motive. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you a ring next time we run into one. Let you in on it firsthand. How about it? Well, thanks, Terry. Thanks. I'd like to get in on one firsthand. <laughs> No connection, Randy. No way you could possibly be implicated should your friend, Mr. Broden, find himself in one of those little three-line fillers at the bottom of page eight. It suddenly seems so simple that you wonder why you balked at murder a second time. Why you submitted to Mr. Broden's demands for four long years. And at that point, you make up your mind. The next meeting with Mr. Broden will be his last. As usual, his call comes in late Saturday evening and you're ready for it. But I tell you, I'm all tied up, Broden, until 11 Sunday night. I, I can't meet you at all, unless, of course, you can make it rather late. I see. How late? 
11.15. But that's ridiculous. Why not make... I'll meet you at 11.15. But don't you think it would be... It's settled, Mr. Dean. Now, where? Well, uh... Oh, uh, how about, uh, how about the fountain in Jackson Park? Fountain in Jackson Park. Okay. You realize, naturally, that it's an ungodly hour. I trust it won't happen again. Don't worry, Broden. I can almost promise you it won't happen again. With the prologue of The Witness at the Fountain, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. But now here's a question for you drivers to try your wits on. What three things can your speedometer tell you? Three, that is. Now, let's see, whom shall I ask? Oh, here's Virginia Gregg, one of Hollywood's most charming radio actresses. What would your answer be, Virginia? Well, let's see, Marvin... Your speedometer tells you how fast you're going. That's one. And um, your speedometer tells you how far you've gone. That's two. But that third thing your speedometer tells you... You've got me there. What is it? You mean you didn't know that your speedometer also measures the quality of the gasoline you're using? Tell me more, Marvin. Precisely what I plan to do. After all, isn't it only logical that a gasoline that gets more efficient performance from your motor also gets more miles from each gallon? Yeah. Well... When science put amazingly increased power into today's signal gasoline, they naturally gave you quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. And it's because of this improved performance that you now go farther than ever with signal gasoline. So that's why signal says, look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. Right, for it takes extra quality to go farther, which explains why so many smart drivers are switching to signal the famous Go Farther Gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. So you finally made your decision, Randy. Mr. Broden's appointment with you at the fountain at Jackson Park at 11.15 Sunday night will be his last. No more secret meetings, no more blackmail, no more threats. And it'll be the stupid type of murder, the kind of crime Lieutenant Terry Lunn told you it was almost impossible to trace. The kind in which there is no connection between murderer and victim, no traceable motive. Because you're positive that no connection between you and Mr. Broden will ever come to light. Both of you have been too careful to keep it a secret. But murder, even a stupid kind, is a terrifying thing. And it's hard for you to keep your mind on your work during the next few days. Harder still to sleep at night. It takes all your time, doesn't it, Randy? Just thinking about it. Randy. Huh? What's the matter, dear? You almost jumped out of your chair. You, you startled me. I, I was just thinking of... Uh, about Monday's column. I... Well, we should forget that old newspaper for five minutes. I'm getting worried about you. Randy, I was talking to Barbara Melvin today. She and Jimmy are coming over Sunday night, you know. What? What did you say? The Melvins, dear. You knew they were coming for dinner Sunday night. You didn't tell me anything of the kind. I'm sorry, Randy. I'm... You'll must... have to make it another night. But, dear, it's all set. I'm sorry, Cynthia. Sunday night is out. I... I... I'm simply not up to having company for the rest of the week. I'm... I'm tired out. Exhausted. The... Terrible pressure at the All office. All right, Randy, dear. You don't have to explain. I understand. I, I'm glad you do. You don't have to tell me, Randy. What? Tell you what? Why, you're acting this way. I'll simply tell the Melvins it will have to be another night. That's all. <laughs> Yes, Randy, it does make you a little jumpy, doesn't it? But you keep telling yourself it's worth it. That after Sunday night, you'll be a new man. And strangely, when Sunday finally arrives, you discover you're more relaxed, cooler than you expected to be. It's six o'clock when you stop at the corner drugstore on the way home for a box of sleeping powders. Here you are, sir. That'll be 52. Uh, you say this is perfectly harmless? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sure. Wouldn't make a habit of it, though. Yeah, 55, 75, come on. Tasteless, huh? Hmm. Almost. 
Might take it in orange juice or maybe wine. Ah, excellent dinner, dear. That steak was delicious. You might tell Anna. Hmm? I think you've been very unreasonable with Anna during the past week, You're Randy. You're perfectly right. I'll make it up to her right now. Anna! Anna! Yes, sir. Oh, oh, your coffee, I forgot... Oh, not at all, Anna, not at all. I want to ask your forgiveness. Cynthia tells me I've been quite unreasonable, and I agree with her. Oh, oh Mr. D, I don't know what to say. Well, let me say it, then. I'm sorry. It's quite all right, sir. And now I think it's high time we did something about your engagement, Anna. A toast. That's it, a toast. A toast? You sit right down here in my chair. I'll go out in the kitchen and pour the wine. <laughs> Oh, my goodness, Randy. I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm dead to the world and it's only nine. Where's Anna? In bed. She gave up the ghost a half hour ago. Well, might as well go to bed. I'm tired, too. Oh, the wine, I suppose. What? Always affects me that way. You should know better than to give me wine. Oh, Come on, let's go to bed. <laughs> Yes, Randy, it must have been the wine. By ten o'clock, Cynthia sound asleep. Both she and Anna would swear you were here all night. But it will never come to that, will it? The corridor's deserted when you quietly leave the apartment and tiptoe down the hall and ring for the automatic elevator. Oh, confound it, wouldn't you know? What's keeping that up? Which way to the elevator? Right around the corner of the arrival. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank heaven. Here we are. Hey, 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 hold it, will you? Hmm, I guess somebody's in a hurry. You wish you hadn't picked the fountain. It's too exposed. Lawn stretching in every direction from the path around it. The shrubbery and trees at least 50 yards away. But luckily, the light over the fountain is blown out. The darkness will cover you. Dean? Over here. Uh, dark as pitch. Why in the world you ever picked a godforsaken place like this? If the last time, Dean, if you think I'm going through with this again... I told you it wouldn't happen it again. It better not happen again. Where's the money? Here. You want to count it, I suppose? Count it? I can't even see my hand in front of my... Oh, I told you this was the last time, Broden. It's all over now, Randy. You let him slump to the ground. Yeah, Broden. The last time. Now, his identification. The contents of his pockets. Suit label, laundry marks. It should only take you a minute. And then... Down this way, Eddie, by the fountain. Yeah. No way to run, Randy. Lawn in all directions. He'd be sure to hear you. And then you see a park bench a few feet away at the edge of the path. It's your only chance. <laughs> Life, huh, Eddie? What do you mean, great life? Yo-ho, yo-ho, yo-ho for the life of a night maintenance man. Running around in the middle of the night hunting for blowing on bulbs. He says that light over the fountain? Yeah. I'll go back to the truck and get a lamp. Check. Stone cold dead in the market. Stone cold Hey, what's the matter, pal? Uh, well, my, my friend here is... A... He's a little drunk, I'm afraid. I, w I was walking him through the park, and I... <laughs> oh, so help me like all the rest of them. Now, that's no way to do, pal. You got to keep him walking. You never sober a guy up by letting him pass out on you, sitting on a bench like that. Oh, he'll be all right. Oh, now, look, you're talking to an experienced drunk, brother. Yeah, let's walk him some more. Let me give me a hand. Don't. I tell you, he'll be all right. Oh, no, don't get sore about it. I'm only trying to help. Just 
Just let me alone. Well, you know, if it was me, I'd trot him around the fountain four or five times. And then you know what? I don't care what. Please go on. <laughs> then I dunk his head right in the fountain. Yeah, <laughs> that'd stop it out of him. <laughs> like that. Hey, come on. Come on, let's give it a try. Get away. I tell you, I... Stand! Yeah? They got those 300 watt bucks. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> He's nuts. There's a whole box of them there. Stick around, Pally. I'll be right back. <laughs> Your knees are so weak you can hardly get up off the bench as the night maintenance man walks back to his truck. You know you have about 30 seconds to get him across the lawn to the shrubbery, but somewhere you find the strength. The shrubbery seems a mile away, but finally you make it. There. There. Drag him inside. Oh, don't be that way, Julie. Come on, give us a little kiss, huh? I told you you're my big heart. I... I... Huh? I'm in the bush. What? I don't think Hey! Hey, who's there? You sure? I heard it. <laughs> okay, my friend, I'm coming in there. No, no, there he goes. I am with you. Julie. Julie. There's a body in here. You thank heaven for the darkness. At least they couldn't see you. The maintenance man, that kid and his girl. They'll never be able to identify you in a million years, will they, Randy? An hour later, you're back in the apartment, safe in bed. With Cynthia sound asleep at the other side of the room. Still safe, Randy. Still no connection, no motive. Still safe. Still safe. Randy. Randy, darling. Uh, uh, what? Oh. Oh. What time is it, Cynthia? Oh, I hope you don't mind, dear. I'll let you oversleep 45 whole minutes. You seem so exhausted. Oh, yeah. I was exhausted. And is bustling around in the kitchen now getting your breakfast. Yeah, well, better get up. <laughs> Randy, you're a sweetheart. What? You know, sometimes I tell myself I'm married to an old stick. Then you surprise me like you did last night, and I know I'm wrong. Last night? What? You made a new woman out of Anna. It was a nice thing to do. What are you talking about, Cynthia? Apologizing to her that way, dear, and the wine. She was almost in tears. Oh, that. And believe me, it works. You don't catch flies with vinegar, you know. She got your cleaning off this morning right on the dock. And there's a big sign on the kitchen calendar. Laundry Wednesday. <laughs> well, I, I hope she keeps it up. Uh, better, be, better get going. I'm never going to get to work. Oh, that reminds me, Randy. Hmm? Terry Lunn called. What do you want? Well, I don't know. I told him you were asleep, and he said to have you call when you got to the office. That's all he said? Why, yes. Is it that important? Why? You're white as a sheet. <laughs> Headquarters, Sergeant Baker. L Lieutenant Lund, please. Just a minute. Lieutenant Lund. Uh, Terry, uh, this is Randy Dean. Well, Rip Van Winkle in the flesh. First time I ever caught you in the hay. <laughs> what happened to that schedule? Well, you better talk to Cynthia. She let me oversleep. <laughs> what, what's on your mind? Oh, our friend, the stupid murderer. He said something about wanting to get in on the next one. Oh? Now well, we got one. Kind of bum example, but I thought you might be interested. Guy got knocked off by the fountain in Jackson Park last night. Strangled. Oh, is, is that so? Yeah. You got any leads? Leads? <laughs> Brother, we got the guy. Huh. What do you mean? That's what I mean by a bad example. This time the killer was too stupid. Uh, maybe you'd rather wait, Randy. Might be something more interesting turning up. No, no, Terry. I I'll be right over. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the many of you who have dropped me a line telling of your experiences with Signal products or of little extra services you've enjoyed at dealer-owned Signal service stations. 
Mr. A.M. Stevens, for instance, of 7274 Fountain Avenue, Los Angeles, was kind enough to write. As a former independent businessman, an automobile dealer on Long Island, may I express my appreciation for the service I received on my first visit to a signal station. Now, my car had scarcely come to a halt at the pump when the attendant wiped off the windshield. Now, then he asked about the air and water. After offering all the service he could, he finally got around to selling some gasoline. But perhaps this is, is not the ordinary for a signal dealer, as Signal seems to realize that the, the man at the pump is one of the most important men in the organization. And from now on, I'll be with Signal all the way. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Signal Oil Company is genuinely grateful for such expressions from the motoring public. Letters that make independent signal dealers want to do an ever better job of caring for your car. And now, back to the Whistler. There was no connection between you and Mr. Broden, Randy. You repeat it over and over in your mind as you hurry across town to Terry Lund's office in the homicide department. No connection. No way they could link you with the murder at the fountain in Jackson Park. And yet Terry told you just 15 minutes ago that they had the killer already. Some itinerant, perhaps. Some wayward bum who happened by at the wrong moment. Well, no matter. Mr. Broden is out of the way and a bum goes to the chair and that's that. Ten minutes later, you lean back in a chair and try and appear unconcerned as Terry goes over the story you knew so pretty well already. Maintenance man sees the two of them sitting there on the bench. The killer pretends the dead man is drunk, you see? Oh, yes. Uh, we just went over the records at the cleaning plant, Chief, and found out the cleaner the suit came from. Oh, good. Where? Uh, the uh, elite cleaners on 86th Street. Shall I call him and get the guy's name? No, we better go out there. Uh, get a couple of men. We'll be down in a second. Mr. Dean will go out with us. Right. So the guy bluffs it out, and then when the maintenance man goes back to his truck, this guy tosses the body into some bushes and runs, leaving the world's best witness behind him at the fountain. That's what I mean by too stupid, you see. Witness? What, what do you mean, a witness? Yeah, he might as well have tied himself to that body with a pair of handcuffs. Well, come on, let's go. Wait a minute, Terry. Tell me what... He was all through the minute he left his suit at the cleaners this morning. What do you mean, witness? The bench, Randy, the park bench. With a nice coat of wet green paint. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, the Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Howard Duff and Margaret Brayton. This program, directed by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I 
am the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast radio program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Brief pause for murder. He couldn't recall the exact moment when it ceased to be a thrill to beam brightly at a microphone and announce, This is Roger Wixon speaking and inviting you to tune in next week at this same time. He was sure, though, that the glamour and magic of radio had gone out of his life the moment he'd married Tisha. Yes, and she'd taken a lot of other things out of his life, too. Things like pride and confidence and self-respect. And Roger couldn't recall either the precise instant he decided to kill Tisha. When the helpless, frustrated hate for her blotted out any pangs of conscience, left him frankly admitting to himself that all he wanted were the moment and the means. Of course, there was no plan in his mind on the night of the dance at the country club. No plan, just the decision. He'd come home first, after leaving her there with Trent Crandall, and had sat alone in the living room patiently waiting for her. It was after two when the door opened and she called back to Trent. Good night, Trent, darling. Thanks for the buggy ride. Well, Roger, you waited up for me. How sweet of you. Not at all. Just catching up on my reading here. Oh, mm, Trent's new book. He'd be so flattered, darling. Had to fall back on something simple. Started on the Rover Boys, but I got stuck on the big words. <laughs> so that's why you waited up. You thought up a clever remark all by yourself and you wanted me to hear it. I only want to tell you, Tisha, I think you're being very stupid. You mean about Trent? Right. Makes no difference to me if you want to play footy with the town's most distinguished visitor. But our fellow citizens have a way of talking, you know. You're implying that Trent I'm and I... not implying anything. Why don't you join us some evening? Play chaperone. Trent Crandall is a celebrity, Tisha. Whatever he does is news. If he got back to his wife, she might possibly misinterpret she just might assume there was more to your association with Trent than a healthy interest in his books. There is. I love him. And it doesn't concern Mrs. Crandall. The moment she's on her way to Reno. I see. And, of course, it doesn't concern me either. It shouldn't. When the divorce is granted, I'll be leaving you, naturally. Hmm. <laughs> oh, there it is again. Yes, what? Facial expression number 2A. The inscrutable smile. You were wearing it at the club tonight. I, uh... I rather expected to see the other one. Patient suffering, I believe it is. Good night, Tisha. You're glad I'm leaving, aren't you? That's why you smiled. Maybe. Of course, you'll have to get along without my money. I said good night, Tisha. Just good night. No recrimination. <laughs> you know, darling, I couldn't sleep a wink if I thought you were brooding over something. No, of course not. You were brilliant tonight, Tisha. I enjoy being sneered at in front of a room full of people. It was an inspiration you're calling Mr. Gladney, the man I work for, the program director of a peanut whistle. He's an incompetent, offensive stuffed shirt. Why shouldn't I tell him so? Oh, very well, Tisha, very well. Is that all? Yes, that's all. All right, darling. <laughs> this is Mrs. Roger Wixon bidding you good night. So Tisha leaves, and you sit alone in the living room thinking... You've discovered a very important thing, haven't you, Roger? The reason you've given yourself for wanting to kill her is gone. She's going to leave you of her own accord and marry Trent Crandall. But it doesn't seem to make any difference, does it? Nothing matters, not even her money. You're going to kill her because you hate her. Because she's destroyed your self-respect. That's all the reason you need. But how, Roger, how? The next morning, shortly after you arrive at the station, you run into another announcer in the corridor. Hi, Rod. Oh, hello, Jerry. How was uh, the thing at the club? 
Oh, all right. Oh, I hated to miss it. Well, that's funny. I thought I saw you there. Oh, you probably heard me. I had the remote last night, banned from the Cedars. Oh, yeah, that's right. I heard you. We tuned in over at the club. Yeah, it's very simple. On the air from the Cedars, can't be at the club. At the club, can't be on the air from the Cedars. Conclusion, Jerry wasn't there. Get it? Yeah. Yeah, Jerry, I get it. You can't be in two places at once. With the prologue of Brief Pause for Murder, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. I say, mister, does this sound familiar to you? You're out driving, sailing down a smooth stretch of concrete, with your motor fairly eating up the miles, when suddenly the little lady next to you cautions... Dear, watch your speedometer. Smart girl, for watching your speedometer will tell you important things you should know besides speed. For one thing, your speedometer will measure the quality of the gasoline you're using. Because it's the same properties in gasoline that give you extra driving pleasure that also get extra mileage. For example, when scientists rearranged the atoms in gasoline molecules to put amazing new performance into new signal gasoline, naturally they gave you quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti knock Well, it's because of this, because new signal helps your motor perform so much more efficiently that you now go farther than ever with signal gasoline. That's why Signal says, look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. Now, back to the Whistler. It doesn't matter that Tisha plans to leave you, does it? The decision to kill her has been part of you for so long that nothing she does will ever change it. So you don't think of the why of it anymore, just the how. And part of the how took shape in your mind when Jerry Edwards explained that it was impossible for him to be both on the air from the theaters and at the country club at the same time. Something to think about, isn't it, Roger? And that evening as you're doing your news broadcast, you find something else to think about. Halfway through the show, someone hands you a late bulletin with a local date line. ...toward solving the housing problem. Here's a late bulletin. Police in the city went on 24-hour duty tonight, launching an all-out effort to capture the so-called whipcord strangler, who claimed his third victim last night. The crime followed the grimly familiar pattern. Mrs. Dorothea Eckler was found dead in her apartment early this morning. Medical reports indicate death had been caused by strangulation with a cord or thong. As in other cases, the apartment had been looted. Police warned residents to take special precautions. You hope your listeners will attribute that hesitancy in your voice to revulsion at the horrible crime. But it's something quite different, isn't it, Roger? Another part of the how. You've decided now that Tisha will die in a way that will point to the whipcord strangler as the only suspect. At the very moment you're broadcasting from the studio. It'll have to be a recording, of course. So there's another big problem. How can you get one of the station engineers to play a recording of your voice at the right time? And to keep his mouth shut no matter what happens. That stops you, doesn't it, Roger? For three more days, it stops you. And then fate steps in again. Mr. Gladney, the program director, calls you into the master control room to meet a new employee. Want you to meet our new engineer, Wixon? Vern Stevens. Hello. I do. Uh, be working with you on the night shift. I've seen you somewhere before, haven't I? I don't think so. Your name is Stevens? Yeah, Stevens. Well, I've got to run along. Explain the setup to Stevens, will you, Wixon? You bet, Mr. Gladney. <laughs> you know, I'd swear I've seen you somewhere before. Must have been a couple other guys. Uh, haven't you got a station break coming up? Yeah. Let's do it, huh? <laughs> As you give the station's call letters and the time signal, you watch the new engineer through the glass at the control room. Try to imagine what he'd look like without the mustache, with a face a little less drawn. Then something clicks. 
You do know him. Six years ago at another small radio station in the Midwest. You cut off your mic and the smooth voice of the network announcer booms from the loudspeaker over your head, introducing a program of dinner music. Then you re-enter the control room. Stevens is showing elaborate interest in the dials on the instrument panel before him. Hey, Stevens. Yeah? I'm... I'm sure we've met before. I don't know. A lot of faces like mine. Not exactly like it. Huh? You just might be a guy I used to know at WSLR. I tell you you're wrong. You better go at that. Hey, cut the speaker down, will you? I can't hear myself think. Hey, that's better. Look, Wixon, I'm new here. I don't want to be rude, but I've got to study this panel layout. Sure. Sorry, Stevens. I don't mean to bother you, but you look just like a guy I used to work with at WSLR six years ago. Only his name was Spore. Vern Spore. My name is up there on my license. Take a look. Uh Uh-huh. Vern Stevens. Vern Spore. You and this guy could have been brothers. Well, okay. I I guess I'll write to the boys back at WSLR and ask if they know... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Okay, Wixon. You win. I I want to talk to you. Sure. You always were a pretty good guy. How about forgetting you ever knew me? Well, I don't see why not. It's your business. Probably heard about that jam I got into right after I left WSLR. Well, what happened? It didn't seem like anything at the time. Some smart operators were rounding up radio equipment, transmitter parts and stuff, and selling at the stations below the border. I slipped them some old beat-up junk from the station where I was working and got caught. That was tough. Yeah, you're in the clink. Had to change my name when I got out. What about the license? Friend fixed it up. I see. You, uh, won't say anything? Why should I? Thanks, Wixon. Gosh, when you walk in tonight, I, I like to die. Glad he ever found out about my record. Sure, or... sure. Listen, Wixon. If there's anything I can do... Sure, Van. Don't worry. I'll call on you. So that's all there is to the how, isn't it, Roger? Stevens is your man. And he'll play ball any time you ask him. All that remains is when. And you can name your time. Or at least, that's what you think until late that evening when you arrive home to find Tisha talking on the phone to Trent Crandall. Well, good, Trent, darling. Any time you say. When? Day after tomorrow? Well, it doesn't give me much time to get ready, but... Roger. Oh, don't worry about him. After all, darling, what is he to say about it? But why should I talk it over with him? If I want to go to Hollywood with you, that's all there is to it. Well, I think you're being a little unreasonable, dear. All right, if you say so, I'll talk to him. Yes, I'll call you back. Good night, darling. Good evening, Tisha. When did you come in? Just now. How is the dear boy? Trent. Naturally. Quite well, thanks. Are you uh, concerned about Trent? I seem to have good reason to be concerned about him. Or uh, did I place the correct interpretation on that little chat? I'm going to Hollywood with him, if that's what you mean. You want to make something of it? Yes, perhaps I do. Wait a minute, Roger. No, you wait a minute. You're going to stay here with me for the next week after he leaves. Then we're going to leave town for our vacation together. Then you can go on to Hollywood. I'll return alone. Suppose I don't agree? I won't give you a divorce. You can remain Mrs. Roger Wixon. It's all right with me. Well, do you want to call Trent back right now? Very well, Roger. I'll call him. Yes, Roger, it's important that Tisha stay with you. For the moment, at least. Until the when is settled, of course. And a week should give you enough time, shouldn't it? The answer to the when comes unexpectedly the next evening when Lieutenant Krasner of the police department comes into the station to ask a favor. Mind if I interrupt you for a minute, Wixon? Oh, hello, Lieutenant. Not at all. Come on in. Thanks. I've just been talking to Mr. Gladney. He suggested I see you about some announcements on the police benefit next week. So maybe you'd do them for us. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, When do you want him to start? Well, tonight, if you can. See, I've got them right here. All right. Oh, that's pretty short notice. The schedule's pretty full. Oh, here they are. Yeah, I know we're throwing you a curve. You've probably seen by the papers. We've been a little busy these days. You mean the, uh, the strangler? Yeah, it's been pretty rough. Pretty rough guy. You're not telling us anything. Oh, uh, 
Your wife home alone while you're working here? Yes. Tell her to keep the windows locked. That's the way the guy gets in. You mean you, you think... Nobody knows where he'll strike next. Doesn't pay to take any chances. Oh. You got any leads? A few. Got a hunch or two. I think we'll get them. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, what about the announcement? Oh, let me check the schedule. Uh, oh, yes, here we are. Well, first time we can give you is the station break at 10 tomorrow night. Is that soon enough? I guess it'll have to be. Can you do it yourself? Oh, yes, it'll be on my ship. Well, thanks a lot, Whitson. I'll tell the boys at headquarters. We'll be listening. And that does it, Roger. The win is complete, too. Well, each Lieutenant Krasner is going to hear you read that announcement tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, along with his friends down at headquarters. And who could ask for a better alibi than that? Late that night, when you and Vern Stevens are alone at the station, you walk easily into the control room. He's turned off the annoying loudspeaker, as usual, when the boss isn't around, and glances occasionally at the dancing needle on the volume indicator to assure himself that the network program is going out to the listeners. How'd I sound on the 9 o'clock news, Vern? Okay. Why? Notice anything different in my voice? Try to give us something special tonight. How'd it sound? Well, like I said, I thought it was good. Much cooking. Uh, can you keep something under your hat? Try me. I, uh, I'd hate to have the old man find out, but, uh, I got a chance to go to Hollywood. Yeah? A friend of mine with an agency out there thinks he could use me. Well, I'll make more dough on one broadcast than I get in a week out here. Yeah, it's great. Going big time, huh? Oh, no, it's not definite yet. That's why I don't want anybody around here to know. You're the only one I've told so far. Just got a wire from the guy. He'll be going through on the special tomorrow night. If I didn't have to work, I could talk to him for about 20 minutes while the train stopped. But I, I gotta work. Why not trade shifts tomorrow night with one of the other guys? No, well, I'd have to say why, and I don't want anyone else to get wind of it. Want the guy come up from the depot? Oh, you don't ask guys like that to come up from the depot. No, I guess I'm sunk. Can't be in two places at once. Uh, pretty important you meet this guy, isn't it? Might mean I could get out of this dump. But forget it, there's no Wait use. a minute. What time does a special get in? Uh, 9.55. Let's see, at 9.45, we've got the Signal Oil Sports broadcast on the net from Hollywood. 10, we take Murder Manor from New York. There's a station break at 10 and that police announcement and time signal. I'm sunk because I've got to be in front of a mic for 30 seconds. What are you talking about? Let's record it. Huh? Sure. We can do it tonight, right here in the studio. Give the call letters, time signal, and your announcement. I'll play the record for you tomorrow night at 10. That means you can leave here at 9.45. Won't have to be back until the 10.30 break. Gives you 45 minutes. Gee, I think it'd work. Why not? Well, suppose Gladney finds I left the station, I get canned. How's he going to find out? We'll be alone here, and after I play the record, I'll destroy it. Then, did anybody ever tell you you were a genius? <laughs> Here's your mic. You all set? Yeah. We'll cut it at 33, a little better fidelity. Got your copy? Yeah, right here. Okay, we're ready. I'll cue you from the booth. Right. This is WTUX, the voice of the wheat belt. It's 20 seconds before 10 p.m. Friends, here's a chance for you to show your appreciation. Scott, hold it. Why, what's the matter? Just got an idea. Start it over and purposely make a mistake, then correct it. Make a mistake, but why? If you get a time wrong and then correct yourself, it'll sound more than ever like you were actually in the studio. Nobody's dreaming with a record. That's a good idea. Okay, let's try it. Watch me for the cue. All right. This is WTUX, the voice of the wheat belt. 20 seconds before 9 p.m. Uh, correction, 10 p.m. Friends, here's a chance for you to show your appreciation for the men who protect your homes and loved ones. 24 hours a day. Here's... So it's done, Roger. The record is made, ready to go. And you know you can count on Vern Stevens to come through for you. The next day is a big one. But you manage to go through your normal routine at home during the morning and early afternoon. As usual, you don't say much to Tisha. Since Trent Crandall has left for Hollywood, she'll be home all evening alone. <laughs> A 
At 9.30 that night, you call Lieutenant Krasner at the station. I just thought I'd remind you, Lieutenant. Your announcement goes on in half hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it'll do the job all right. At 9.45, you give the station call letters and start out of the studio. Okay, Vern, I'll see you before 10.30. Right. And don't forget to bust that record. The old man... Don't was... worry about that. I'll carry this secret to my grave. You're careful to take the back streets home, keeping well within the speed limit. There's only one person in the world who'll know that you're going to be in two places at the same time tonight. And you know Vern Stevens won't talk, no matter what he suspects. It wouldn't be healthy for a man with a prison record to expose himself to suspicion as a possible accomplice. Ten minutes later, you've left your car in an alley and walk up to the back door of your apartment. You reach in your side pocket. Yes. The leather thong is there, ready to go. Home so early, you scared me to death. Just thought I'd drop by and see how you were doing. I've often wondered if you miss me, Tisha, during these long, lonely evenings. Well, I see you're listening to our rival station. Answer my question, Roger. Why aren't you at the station? What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. I just got tired, so I came home. What are you talking about? Tired, Tisha. Tired of station breaks and tired of this dumpy little town. What's the matter with you, Roger? Why are you looking at me that way? Most of all, I'm tired of you, Tisha. I'm tired of the farce you've made out of this marriage, if you can call it a marriage. Roger, I don't know what you... What do you mean, Roger? It wasn't really a marriage, was it, Tisha? It was only a means for you, a way you could ease that frustrated black heart of yours when Trent Crandall married somebody else right under your nose. Roger, what, Roger, what Yes, you... Tisha, I'm tired of humiliation, of ridicule, of being used for a doormat, playing clown for that crowd of stupid sophisticates. Roger, please, darling, think... Think what you're doing. Get away. Let go of me. Run, run. Think of it, did you, Tisha? Never entered your head that I'd kill you, did it? It's too late now, though. It's too late now. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Since the war, have you noticed the increasing emphasis that's being put on the independent businessman? Well, that's particularly interesting because the Signal Oil Company, since they first started marketing gasoline 15 years ago, has sold Signal products only through dealer-owned service stations. And for good reasons. Not only does the independent businessman represent the American way of life that has made our country such a great place in which to live and make a living, but also there's a personal advantage for you in having your car serviced at a dealer-owned signal station. You see, because your signal dealer is in business for himself, he naturally has more incentive to give you more thorough, more conscientious service that will keep your car happy and keep you his steady customer. This personalized service, plus top-quality Signal product, explains why Signal has grown from a mere handful of stations serving Southern California into an organization serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. Yes, there are good reasons for the swing to Signal. To discover them for yourself, stop in soon and get acquainted with your neighborhood Signal oil dealer. Now, back to The Whistler. Well, Roger, it's done now, isn't it? Tisha's dead and you're free. With over a half hour to get back to the station. You leave her there on the floor, put on a pair of gloves and move quickly about the apartment, dumping the contents of drawers all over the room. Then into the bedroom where you open a window. Yes, Roger. It must look like a typical whipcord strangler crime with robbery the obvious motive. You're lucky Tisha had the radio playing. It covers any noise you might make. And then suddenly, the music stops. You stop dead in your tracks as you hear the announcer give the interrupt cue and begin reading the bulletin. Program to bring you a flash from the local police department. 
Chief of Police Fair has announced that a suspect arrested this afternoon has confessed to the whipcord stranglings of three women in the city during the past month. What? Nearly half the loot stolen oh, no. from his victims has been recovered. No! With this dangerous criminal now in custody, citizens can now... With a frantic gasp, you turn the radio down. This is something you hadn't counted on, Roger. One of your alibis is gone. The fall guy is in custody. You stare at the littered room, wondering if you have time to restore the place to order. No, no time for that. The other alibi, that's the one you'll have to depend on now, the radio. It's just 10 o'clock. If Vern Stevens hasn't bungled, you've still got a chance. Your hand is shaking so violently, you can hardly turn the dial to the station's frequency. And then... WTUX, the voice of the wheat belt. 20 seconds before 9 p.m. Correction, 10 p.m. Friends, here is a chance for you to show your appreciation. As your own voice comes over the speaker, you begin to relax. A station full of police officers are hearing it. It doesn't matter how she died or who did it. The fact remains, a man can't be at two places at the same time. You have fun and at the same time help the widows and orphans of the brave men who live in your service and die for your protection. 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 Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal, gasoline, and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories, and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Joseph Kearns and Mary Jane Croft. This program, produced by George W. Allen, with tonight's story by Lou Houston and Bill Foreman, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Dick Wells speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program. And remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, The Brass Ring. Babe stood out on the platform in front of the sideshow tent while Duke made his pitch. 
smiling her best professional smile at the sea of faces below her, reserving a personal, intimate wink for the tall, gray-haired man with a carnation in his buttonhole. Babe was an intelligent girl, and the man with the carnation had money. She could smell it a mile off. And it didn't hurt to be nice to the customers, especially the ones with money, like dapper middle-aged Mr. Bundy, staring up at her from the crowd with stars in his eyes. Close. It's the most sensational, most stupendous, most gigantic show in the carnival. Wait till you hear. Oh, wait till you see. You can't miss it. You just won't miss it. Why, it's so hot you just melt away. I said melt away. Hey, babe. Yeah, do. He's here again. Yeah, yeah, I see him. Mr. Finn, five bucks for a ticket and keep the chain. Great guy, do. Great guy. You know something? Now, uh, what? Mr. Finn's name is Bundy, and I'm going to marry him. <laughs> what are you talking... Take it easy. Go on with the pitch. You're crazy, babe. Now get on with the pitch. Hey, you don't know what you're Did talking you about. You said you lose the crowd. They're drifting okay. off. Okay. This way, folks. What a dance she does. What a dance. You have never, never, never seen anything so colossal, so stupendous, right from the top of that gorgeous blonde head to the tips of her toes. Oh, she's hot. She's on fire. She's burning down. That's enough, boys. That's more than enough for some of them. <laughs> now step right up. Step right over here and have your money ready. Two bits. Only two bits. The fourth part of a dollar. Come on, folks. Give them room. Give them room. Here you are. Oh, five bucks again. Yes. You can... Uh... Keep the change. Thanks, Mr. Bundy. Oh, Miss Logan has told you. Yeah, she told me. Sucker. Who is it? Mr. Bundy. Oh, oh, just a minute. There we are. Nice and respectable. Oh, hello, Mr. Bundy. Good evening, Georgette. Uh, am I, uh... Oh, no, no, not at all, Mr. Bundy. Come on in. I don't want to intrude. Forget it. I got lots of time. Hey! What's the matter with you? We're ready to go. You better get on a move on. Stall them off. I'm busy. They're going in right now. Did you hear me, Duke? I said stall them off. Okay, babe. Anything you say. <sighs> you know how the customers are, Mr. Bundy. Get a little over-anxious once in a while. <laughs> I shouldn't wonder. Your dance is very good. Oh, you like it, huh? I haven't missed a night in three weeks. <laughs> well, maybe I ain't good enough for the Ritz Plaza, but I give them their money's worth. You certainly do. Oh, well, I, I don't quite know how to take that, Mr. Bundy. <laughs> uh, see here, Georgette. Must you always call me Mr. Bundy? Well, after all... Charles. Make it Charles, will you? All right. Charles. Charles. Why do you think I've come here night after night for three weeks? Oh, I I guess maybe you like me a little. They all like you, Georgette. All of those people out there. Well, Charles, I can't help it yeah, if they're... I know, I know. The trouble is, I... I don't want it that way. What do you mean, Charles? Oh, quite simple. I don't want to share you with anyone else. Oh? In plain words, Georgette, I want you to marry me. Oh, I... Why, gee, Mr. Bundy, I mean, Charles, I... Oh, I... I don't blame you for being surprised. You see, I was rather surprised myself. Oh, gee, I've got to think it over. You know, a girl can't go into this, I mean, tie up her whole life like that without looking at all sides to it. Of course, Georgia. You know, i, I got a career here, my whole future. You don't need to worry about your future. I'll take care of that. But, but how? I have more money than I could possibly spend, Georgette. Oh, well... You can't blame me if I'm a little cagey, Charles. There are so many fellas. And... Oh, I'll make it legal if you want. I'll get a lawyer and have an agreement drawn. Oh, will you, Charles? Will you? Babe, I told you that wait. Just a minute, dude. Just a minute, nothing. You're going to tear the house down if I stall them any longer. No, I'm sorry, Charles. i got to do my show. What about it, Georgette? Yes, Charles. Yes. <laughs> Huh. With that old goat, never heard anything so crazy in my life. Like I told you, Duke, it's none of your business. It's a sellout, that's what it is. Money's important, sure. I stand out there in the midway seven nights a week, 
Bust with my lungs out. I hustled Pop, sold peanuts, but I didn't have it. But I wouldn't... What wouldn't you do, Duke? I wouldn't sell out, babe. You got money on your mind right now, haven't you? What do you mean? You're through without me. That's all washed up. That's what's on your mind, ain't it? Not the sellout. Uh-uh. It's what am I going to sell when the babe's gone? Shut up. I'll say what I want. The brass ring, ain't it? You've been on the merry-go-round for six or eight years, and you finally grab hold of the brass ring, a sucker. At last, you got yourself a sucker. Why, you're mad, ain't you, uh... I've never seen you look like that. <laughs> Why, sure. That's it, ain't it? You're in love with me, and you're jealous. Past tense, baby. Not now. Not anymore. Too bad, Duke. My heart belongs to Bundy. If you're ever in a shipwreck, give me a buzz, will you, babe? I'll toss you an anchor. With the prologue of The Brass Ring, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. If you've lived out west any length of time, you know that Signal Gasoline is famous as the go-farther gasoline. And if you've noticed Signal's recent magazine, newspaper, and billboard advertising, you know that you now go farther than ever with today's Signal Gasoline. Well, what does this all mean to you? Economy, yes. But even more than that, it means extra performance from your car. For in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. Uh, Let me make that point clear. When science employed the modern magic of catalytic cracking to put amazing new power into today's signal gasoline, they naturally gave you quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock. And it's because of this, because signal's increased power helps your motor perform more efficiently, that you now go farther than ever with signal gasoline. That's why signal says, look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. Good reason why so many wise drivers are switching to Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Now, back to The Whistler. you grabbed the brass ring, didn't you, babe? And Mr. Bundy came through nobly with the legal arrangements. Something about the marriage of six months in Connecticut as Mrs. Bundy to demonstrate good faith. Of your freedom to do what you please after that. With a solid feeling that the money set up for you in trust by Mr. Bundy will be all yours in the event of his death. That's all, babe. Six tedious months with Mr. Bundy. Of course, it seemed like six years, but it had to come to an end sometime. I can't hear you. Georgia? Don't bother me. I'm busy packing. What do you mean, packing? We're going to the Williamsons, darling. Just for the day, there's no packing to be done. You're going to the Williamsons, Charles, not me. Now go away, Ron. I'm busy. Where are you going? (sighs) You didn't really think it would work, did you, Charles? What wouldn't work? I came through with my end of the bargain. Six months. I don't want any more. Why kid yourself? I'm not Mrs. Charles Bundy. It just ain't there. I'm Babe Logan, remember? You haven't given it a try. Oh, what do you think I've been doing for six months? Twiddling my thumb? Oh, now you've got to be reasonable, Georgette. It takes time. That's the trouble. Time. It's precious. You've got to be careful with it. If you're not, you wake up some morning and find yourself pushing 40 and out of a job. That's why I'm going back. Where are you going? Tell me. Back to the drafty tents, the smell of damp sawdust, cat calls, wolf whistles. Oh, you're not serious. Just try and stop me, Charles. Try. I won't let you. They'll laugh at me. They'll all laugh at me. With your don't let them. Uh, listen, Charles, I, I don't want to hurt you, honest. I want to let you down easy. I'm not Connecticut and I never will be. I'm a carnival girl. I belong there in a sideshow with a guy like Duke to make the pitch for me. See? I'll beat it. Well, yeah, I gotta pack. It'll work, Georgette. Really, it will. You've got to give me another chance. I said I'm going. All right, then. I'm going with you. Huh? 
you get tired of it after a few days. You're different Hello, now. Charles. I'm not going to let you walk out of my life, Georgette. I'll do just what I did before. What do you mean? I... I want you near me, that's all. Don't you change your mind. I won't get in your way. I'll just stand around and... and be there. Just like before. just won't listen to me. I tell him over and over again. And he's still out there, night after night, looking up at you with that earnest face of his. Ah, the poor sucker. I don't know that I like that crap. Don't hand me that, baby. You took him for a ride. Now that you got that paper in your safe deposit box, you're... What, Duke? You don't care what happens to him. Well, you don't have to make it worse. You don't have to keep letting him into the show. Why not? Pays his dough. Five bucks and keep the change. Ah, it gives me the creeps. Every show, there he is in the first row, waiting for me at the door when I go home. I guess you'll have to figure that one out for yourself. Maybe I will. Yes, there were strings on that brass ring, weren't there, babe? It's not quite as easy to drop Mr. Bundy as it was to pick him up. And all you have to do is look into those earnest, pleading eyes of his to realize it'll go on as long as he lives. Night after night, day after day, as long as he lives. You wish there were some other way, don't you, babe? It'll be a shame to have to kill him. It comes to a climax on Monday night as you leave by the stage entrance after your nine o'clock show. He's there waiting for you as usual. And it's right then that you decide it can't go on any longer. Monday night, a quiet night at the carnival. As good a night as any. Hello, Georgette. Charles. How long till your next show? Oh, about 30 minutes. Would you Would you like to take a walk around the grounds? Why, why of course. Oh, I'd be delighted. Roller coasters. Oh, I used to love them. Haven't been on one for years. You know, this might be hard for you to believe, but I haven't either. <laughs> that is odd. Sky ride, a tunnel of love. Used to scare me to death. <laughs> Let's try it, Dave. What do you say? Uh-uh. you got to watch your blood pressure. Oh, so that's what you're thinking. I'm too old for you. Oh, don't be silly. Come on, let's win a Cupid doll or something. <laughs> no, I insist. The sky ride. Too high for me. I just as soon stay on the ground. <laughs> now who's afraid? Too old, am I? Well, we'll see about that. Are you game? All right, Charles. I'm game. <laughs> Here we are. No, no, let, let's take the last seat, huh? I feel better if I can see people ahead of me. <laughs> Still nervous, huh? Come on. Here's the last seat. Oh, better take your hat off, oh, Charles. Keep yeah. your uh, safety belt buckle, please. Yes, now. Hold your hat. Oh. Safety belt buckle, please. Here we go. Well, we're off. I don't know whether I'm going to like this or not. <laughs> Look at that hill ahead. George, I feel like a kid again. Is your safety belt hitch? Sure. <laughs> Look down there. No, thanks. I got scared. Go ahead. No, I don't want to. <laughs> Hold on. Here we go. Oh, boy, what a thrill. Yeah, only your stomach stays back at the ticket office. <laughs> I, um, I used to go around with a guy who was awfully foolhardy. You know what he used to do? Can't imagine. What? Well, he used to unhitch the belt and stand up right at the top of the hill, just before you go down. Oh, what's so unusual about that? Well, awful dangerous, don't you think? Oh, oh. <laughs> See what I mean? Oh, I don't think it's so dangerous. What? Oh, don't be a fool, Charles. He was young. Well, he could do anything. I still think I'm an old fogey, huh? Well, watch this. There goes the belt. Charles, we're almost at the top. Get down. <laughs> Get stuff. How's this? Charles! Charles, my head! Where? Over the side, grab it! Look out! No, don't push me! Don't push me! Oh! He fell off! He fell off! All right, 
Mrs. Bundy all right, so it was an accident. It was just a mighty peculiar accident, that's all. Listen, you dumb flatfoot. I gave you the straight stuff. And if you think you can sit back and make a lot of nasty shit... Sit down, babe. That goes for you, too, I Drew. said sit down. Okay, okay, I'll sit down. But I'm not going to take any just more... Just a minute, babe. Sorry, Sergeant. The dame's a little high strung. Quite a jolt, you know, losing her only husband that way. Yeah, I guess it was. You can skip all that stuff about peculiar accidents. I'm sorry, Mrs. Bundy. That's the way it's going on the record. Peculiar that the money goes to you on your husband's death. Peculiar that he decided to take you on the roller coaster the first time he'd been on one in 20 years. Peculiar you picked the last seat. Peculiar his safety belt happened to be unbuckled. All right. So what? So we leave it there. No proof. Nothing else we can do. Uh, by the way... The passenger three seats ahead of you happened to turn around just as you hit the top of the hill. What, what do you mean? He saw your husband a second after he fell. Oh. Too bad he didn't turn around a second sooner. That's all, Mrs. Bundy. You can go. So it's over now. All over. Mr. Bundy is gone for good, and the brass ring is yours to keep. You ought to be able to relax now, get back in the swing, work ten shows a day to pass the time until the probate is complete and the money arrives. Yes, it's smarter to keep right on working as if nothing had happened. No use exciting any more suspicion, is there, babe? You can't decide whether or not it's imagination, but it seems as if they all suspect you. Your friends along the midway are noticeably cooler, more distant since the accident. But it doesn't matter now. The brass ring is yours. You can tell them all where to get off. Then you suddenly realize it isn't over after all. Two weeks later, just before the nine o'clock show, Duke comes into your dressing room. Yeah? Duke. I ought to be flattered, I guess. What's the matter? We pals again? Take it off, babe. Take what off? The chip on your shoulder. I ain't looking for a fight. Ah, <laughs> you're smart. Ain't easy for a broken-down vaudeville ham to find a job these days. And in a couple of weeks, you might be working for me. <laughs> Wonderful. What's so funny? Don't look now, baby, but your conscience is shown. Why, you... Listen, sweetheart, don't blow up on me. I'm the only friend you got left. Ah, <laughs> you're just like all the rest of them, you and your smart. Forget it, will you? Maybe it was an accident, maybe it wasn't. I'm still working the show, ain't I? What do you want? What'd you come here for? I got something that might interest you, kid. There was a guy out there the last show. Looks like he's going to take up where Mr. Bundy left off. What do you mean? Can't figure it out. Pays five bucks for a ticket and tells me to keep the change. Sat in the same seat Bundy had. What is it? What's he want? I don't know. Thought maybe you might. Oh, by the way, the guy's out there now waiting for the next show. That's all, babe. Just thought I'd drop by and give you something to think about. You see him there when you go on for the next show. Sitting in the same front row seat Mr. Bundy used to occupy. And you wish Duke hadn't said anything about it. You might not have noticed him for a while anyway. He's much younger and almost good looking. But he never smiles. Just sits there as you go through your dance, never applauding or whistling like the others. Just sitting there, watching, watching. He's there the next day and the next. The same cold stare, the same expression. You try and ignore it, but it just won't work, will it, babe? You have a pretty good idea why he's there. And you know there'll be a showdown sooner or later... Might as well be now. Hey. hey. Hey, you down there. Me? Yeah, you. Come here a minute. Okay. This way. Now... Who are you, mister? My name is Woody. You're a cop, ain't you? What makes you think I'm a cop? You've been in that same seat six days in a row now. Five shows a day. That makes 30 times you've seen the show, right? 
I like the act. <laughs> Nobody likes it that much, mister. I'm satisfied. I'm not. Get it? No. It's easy. I don't want to look down at that seat and see the great stone face anymore. I know a good way to get rid of me. Yeah? Go for a ride on the roller coaster? What? That's a pretty stupid approach, even for a flatfoot. Didn't you see the report, officer? Did you look it up in the files? Accident, it says. Big black letters. Accident. Now get out of here, you... Wait a minute, babe. Hey, keep it down. Will you everybody outside? Oh, it's you. Get him out of here, Duke. What's the matter, pal? Lady wants to get rid of me. Told her I'd be happy to leave forever if she'd do me a little favor. Yeah? What's that? Take a ride with me on the roller coaster. Oh? That what made you blow up, babe? Get rid of him. I don't want to see him anymore, understand? Why don't you want to take a ride in the roller coaster, babe? You think so, too, don't you? You think I killed him. What are you blowing up for if you didn't? What's there about the roller coaster to get you down? So. All right, Mr. Detective. I'll show you. Come by after the last show tonight, and we'll take your ride. Next car loading, how many, please? I'll take them all. My girl and I want to be alone this trip. <laughs> I get it. It'll be four bucks. Is that a big enough drop for you? Oh, it was so-so. That's a big one up ahead. Yeah. That means along about here is where you unhitched his safety belt. Skip it, will you? That won't get you anywhere. Right about here, wasn't it, babe? Right here? He did it himself. I tell you, he was showing off. You killed him. I didn't kill him. He stood up and he tripped. He didn't trip. You pushed him. <laughs> oh, you stupid dope. You thought this would make me talk. I thought there was more brains than the police force than... <laughs> Wait a minute. You can't slap me. The police have nothing to do with this, babe. Charles Bundy was my father. He never said anything about... It doesn't matter if you talk or not, babe. I'm not depending on the law anymore. You see, I'm going to kill you. Take your hands off me. Safety belt. There. No. No, you can't. You Sometimes can't. the law doesn't work, babe. Sometimes a man has to take things in his own hands. I said let go of you me. You cheap, chiseling tramp. You wanted his money, didn't you? You had that in the back of your mind right from the first. Listen, listen to me, will you please? You're going over, babe. Just the way he did. Oh, no. You're through, babe. No. You're... The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. You know, the proof of the pudding, they say, is in the eating. And the proof of the service you get at dealer-owned signal gasoline stations is, after all, in what actual customers say about it. That's why we're so happy to receive letters such as this one from Mrs. Leon F. Marsh of Berkeley, California, who wrote... During a recent trip, which took me from Berkeley as far south as Calexico on the Mexican border... I met with courtesy from every signal dealer with whom I traded. Especially, I want to commend Harvey Nathanson of 4400 Beverly Boulevard, Hollywood, whose service was both prompt and complete in every detail. I never had to request that my windshield be wiped or my tires checked. These and many other services were done automatically and with a smile. It's men like Harvey Nathanson who make trading with independent signal dealers a pleasure. Uh, Mrs. Marsh, on behalf of my sponsor, Signal Oil Company, I want to take this opportunity to thank you and the many other kind drivers who have dropped me a line, telling of their experiences with Signal products or of little extra services you have enjoyed at dealer-owned Signal stations. It's letters like yours that make independent Signal dealers want to do an even better job of helping today's cars run better and last longer. Now, back to The Whistler. So the career of Babe Logan, carnival dancer, came to an end. It was a sensational ending, of course. Barkers, pitchmen, performers, all of her colleagues gathered around the broken body lying among the timber supports, all talking at once, not in guarded whispers anymore, but openly of the suspicion, the terrible doubt that hung over the midway like a cloud after the first accident a few weeks before. And uh, 
after the second accident, Duke had to change his pitch a little. Not much, just a little. Until you seen her do that dance. What a dance, folks, what a dance. Just like the one with the seven pails. Only this little lady throws away six of them before she starts. Yes, she starts right in with number seven. You gotta see Millie, folks. Millie, the girl with a million thrills. Step right up, folks. Wait. <laughs> Yes, now that Babe was gone, there was a new attraction in Duke's tent. An ambitious young redhead named Millie. And at that very moment, a few blocks away at police headquarters, Sergeant Case had changed his approach, too. There's no use going over it all again. We've been through it before. But it was an accident. He tried to push me. He slipped. I was the one who was supposed to go out of that roller coaster. Sure, sure. You were supposed to go out, but you didn't. He fell. Just like his father did two months ago. Both of them accidents, huh? Can I help that? It was an accident. Maybe, maybe. Maybe they were, babe. But you don't really think a jury is going to believe that, do you? No. No, I guess you're right. They'd never believe me now. Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. Featured in tonight's program were Dora Singleton and Eddie Marr. This program, directed by George W. Allen, based on a story by David Gillespie, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Whistle is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Dick Wells speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations throughout the West from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. A present for Ricky. The spotlight subtly changed from white to a delicate blue, and the small nightclub orchestra slid into three-quarter time as the dance team began their waltz. The Croydons, Clyde and Marie, had held top billing at the club for almost a year, 
and it was well deserved. Drinks stood unnoticed on the table. Conversation stopped. Everyone now was watching the Croydon, or rather, Marie Croydon. Slim, graceful, blue velvet Marie, smiling as she spun across the floor, poised for a moment, floated effortlessly back to Clyde's waiting arms. The customers love it. She's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, Larry. What? It's a kind of first time look about it. They must be in love to dance like that. Yes, there was a first time look about it. Even in the way they murmured to each other as they swayed gently together in three quarter time. You're on your toes tonight, Angel. So are you. Why don't you try your own for a change? Oh, now take it easy. If I have to prop you up on another turn, I'll scream. Yes, the customers love it. Clyde and Marie, husband and wife. Quiet maturity and breathless youth. And at the same time, on the other side of the room, a theatrical agent named Stanley Craig appraised the Croydons a little more critically. You like her, eh, Stan? The girl's good. She just needs a younger partner. The old boy swells her up. See what I mean? Look at that spin. The guy's just too old for. He's killing the act. You wouldn't be fixing to cut him off at the ankles, would you? What do you mean? You just might be promoting that rumber expert you just picked up as a new partner. Name's Ricky, isn't it? What if I am? He's the boy who can do it. He's young, Mike. He's got looks and youth. See what I mean? All right, Marie. Let's get it over with. Get what over with? Your nightly speech, that crack you made out on the floor. Oh, man. Yes, that. Like my hair this way, Claude? I'm waiting, Marie. Well, forget it. I don't want to go through it all again now. Look, I think it's time we had it out. Listen, Clyde, why try to kid yourself? You know it can't go on like this. Oh, I don't know. We just got a pretty good hand. You mean I got a good hand? You may as well admit it. I don't think that's quite fair. Well, it's true. I'm getting tired of propping you up, covering up your fumbles, finding my heart in my mouth every time we go into a spin. Oh, now, wait a minute, Marie. You wait a minute. Maybe you're right. Maybe we'd better have it out right now. All right. What are you complaining about? When I picked you up, you were nothing. Jitterbug champion of West Washington Heights. Why, in Don't five years... give me that loyalty pitch. I've heard it before. If you really want to talk about loyalty, let's talk about your first wife. You forgot about her in a hurry, didn't you? Sure, she was too old, slowing up the act. Didn't matter to you then, did it? No. Sorry, baby, I gotta get rid of you. I know it's tough, but it's show business. Off you go to Reno. Hmm. What makes you think I'm getting old? You're 40, and that's too old for me. And incidentally, that's not just my opinion. Uh, They're talking about it in the trade. Yes, who's talking about it? People who ought to know. Telling each other I'd be on top if I had a partner whose bones didn't creep. Uh Uh-huh. Got someone in mind? I'm my dear. Well, forget it. If you're thinking of teaming up with a new partner, you can save yourself a lot of trouble by getting it out of your head right now. You never were very good at a bluff, huh? I'm not bluffing. As long as you dance professionally, my dear, you'll dance with me. Will I? I have no intention of letting you go, either as a partner or as a wife. Well, you're smart. Without me, you wouldn't rate bottom billing at a third-rate burlesque in Jersey City. Oh, that has nothing to do with it. All right, give me a better reason. Over there on the table. The roses? The roses. And the card. The same roses, the same card, night after night. <laughs> Ricky. Who is Ricky Marie? One of the customers. He likes my dancing. And is that all? So far. I think you're in love with him. That's what's behind all this stuff about my dancing, isn't it? You love this guy. My dancing's just as good an excuse as any. Now, who is he, Marie? Ricky. The name is Ricky. What's his last name? None of your business at the moment. I think it is. He's a dancer, isn't he? Yeah, Inspector, yeah. He's a dancer, and you might just as well end the third degree right there. You're planning to team up with him, aren't you? What if I am? Who is he? What's his name? I won't tell him. Why? Because I don't want to involve him in your stupid jealousy, that's why. 
You won't get away with it, Marie. I won't let you. My career doesn't mean anything to you, does it? Only when it affects mine. That's why you married me, isn't it? For the effect I'd have on your career. You married me for the same reason. Well, maybe I did. But the reason's gone now. I don't need you anymore, Clive. I need Ricky. Now you know. Let's handle the whole thing reasonably, shall we? We wind up here in another week. I'll finish up with you, and then you can... Then I can find myself another partner. No, that'd take too long. I can't start all over again now. No, I guess I'll have to start at the other end with Ricky. I'll look him up tomorrow. You don't even know who he is. I have a pretty good idea who his agent is. That ought to get me somewhere. Stanley Craig, isn't it, Marie? How'd you know? Stanley Craig, theatrical agent. You shouldn't have left his card on your desk yesterday, my darling. All right. All right, if you do anything to Ricky, I'll... Oh. You do love him, don't you, Marie? All right, I love him. For the last time, what's it going to mean? Ricky or me? I already told you. Nothing can change it, Clyde. This is our last week. All right, Marie. That's all I wanted to know. With the prologue of The Present for Ricky, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. But now a question. What gasoline is famous as the Go Farther gasoline? <laughs> well, if you've lived out west any length of time at all, you know that Signal is the famous Go Farther gasoline. Now, naturally, we're mighty proud of that reputation. But even more so, we're mighty proud of the performance features in today's Signal gasoline that make Signal's good mileage possible. After all, it stands to reason that to get more mileage, a gasoline must help your motor run more efficiently. Which explains why, when we put amazingly increased power into today's Signal gasoline, you get not only quicker starting, faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti-knock, but also a bonus of extra mileage. That's why Signal says look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. Good reason why so many drivers are switching to Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. what she says. You know her that well. And you wonder if what she said was true, that without her you're nothing. You think about it all the next day, particularly late in the afternoon as you sit in a bar on 58th Street talking to Joey Louther, a nightclub columnist. You try and concentrate on what he's saying, but it's no use. And then finally you decide to feel him out on it. Joey's your friend. He ought to tell you the truth. As so this yokel walks into the El Morocco, right up to the yeah. bartender. Uh, uh, Joey, uh -huh. Joey, listen, I don't mean to interrupt, but... Uh, well, you got your mind on something else. You don't have to tell me. It's eating you, Clive. Well, it, uh, it's about Marie. She's such a kid, you know. But she can dance. Well, that's what I'm wondering, Joey. Uh, do you think she's right for me? What, what are you talking about right for you? She's terrific. I wonder... Of course, I taught her all she ever knew. Yeah. Now the kid's getting a little bit cocky. Mm. Of course, this is strictly between you and me. Well, oh, sure, sure, Clyde, but I've I... I've been thinking it might do me good to work with a new partner. Uh, what do you think, huh? You want it straight? Yes, I want it straight. You're crazy. I'm your friend, Clyde. I wouldn't give you a lot of malarkey. You better get that idea out of your head right now. Oh, why? The two of you together are a great team, Clyde. But... But what? But you'd never make it alone, Clyde. Not on the top joints. Y you see, the customers are paying to see Marie. I, I know. Yeah, it's tough. yeah, yeah. I know, Joey. Yeah. Well, thanks. No more top billing, Clyde. 
No more expensive nightclub. No more polite applause from the cafe society crowd. No more 1500 a week. Nothing now but a seat on the sidelines. While Marie and this Ricky drift across ballroom floors, on and up to the top. You can't face it, can you, Clyde? It's more than you can take. That's why early the next morning you leave your apartment by the private elevator. And 20 minutes later you walk up a flight of creaky stairs to Stanley Craig's office in the West 40. Yes, sir, what can I do for you? You're, uh, Stanley Craig? That's me. Pull up a chair. Oh, thanks. Well, I had quite a time finding your place. I thought I might be a little early. Say, I didn't recognize you for a minute. Oh? You're Clyde Croyton. That's right. I saw your act last night. Caught it a couple of times this week. Oh, really? Yeah, good act, too. Thank you. Have a cigar? Oh, no, thanks. I just dropped in for a few moments, Mr. Craig. A uh, little business matter. Oh? What can I do for you? Answer a few questions. Sure, glad to. Do you manage a dancer named Ricky? Yeah. I see what you're getting at. Yeah, I manage him. A new specialist in rumbles and tangos. Very fine dancer. That's what Marie tells me. Listen, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't trying to pull off anything, understand? So help me. I was going to put my cards on the table before we made any deal. You see what I mean? I suppose you put them on the table now, huh? Okay. They'd make a great team, Mr. Croydon, Ricky and Marie. Marie is part of a great team already. She's not available. I don't know whether she is or not. I haven't had a chance to talk to her. I dropped by the other day, left my card. Yes, I saw it. She's not at liberty, Mr. Craig. She's my partner and my wife. I must admit that I don't like this sort of thing going on behind my back. I, uh, I'm sure she resents it, too. It's not what Ricky told me. Now, look, Mr. Crichton. You've been in the game long enough to know what youth means in a dance team. You're... You're still a good performer, but but I think Ricky's better. After all, <laughs> I'm not managing you. I'm only trying to get a break for my client. Can't blame me for that now, can you? So you're going to put it up to Marie? Huh? Why not? She's over 21. She ought to be able to make her own decision. I think you're being very fair to me. Well, you know show business, Mr. Croydon. If she goes for it, I guess Ricky will be her new partner. There's just nothing you can do about it. Hmm? I'd like to talk to this uh, Ricky, if you don't mind. Sure, just say when. Today. Where is he now? Oh, out in the park somewhere. He walks for two hours every morning. And good for the uh, legs, you know. Uh, uh, alone? <laughs> Be hard to find another guy who'd knock off eight miles in the park before lunch, don't you think? Uh, yeah, he's alone. Does he come here after his walk? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, say, I, uh, I just happen to think. I, I gotta meet a client in ten minutes. Uh, I gotta run. Now, you don't mind. Oh, uh, no. Go right ahead. You don't mind if I wait here, do you? Oh, no, no, no. Stick around. Uh, wait here. Ricky might drop by after his walk. Uh, might be a couple of hours, though. I have all morning. Okay. The, uh, new variety is on the desk. Uh, you'll be alone here. No one to bother you. Oh, thanks. Take it easy, huh? Oh, sure. And, uh... Mr. Croydon? Yes? No hard feelings? Right. <laughs> no hard feelings. No, Clyde, no hard feelings at all. Just the amazing realization that not one minute ago as you talked to Stanley Craig, you calmly, unemotionally, coldly decided to murder your wife, Marie. was no shock to it at all. It seemed as if it had been there all the time, in the back of your mind, waiting to be formulated into thought. Yes, Clyde, here you are in Stanley Craig's office, alone. Ricky is walking in the park, alone. Marie is at home, alone, probably still in bed. You realize that another opportunity like this might not happen in a thousand years. Yes, if you're going to do it at all, Clyde, you've got to do it now. On top of the file cabinet, you find a package of Stanley Craig's letterheads. On his desk, a battered typewriter. In your pocket, the card signed, Ricky, that came with the flowers. And most important in your mind, an idea. There. 
Now, let's see. Marie, my darling, it is useless to try to put this into words. I've told no one of your decision to stay with Clyde because I know it isn't final. That you love me and always will. That the only future for either of us is together. At the bottom of the note, after all my love, you carefully copy Ricky's signature from the card. Then you check the date. Yes, you've dated it yesterday to make it look as if it had time to go through the mail. On the desk is a sharp letter opener with Stanley Craig's name on it. That's part of it too, Clyde. You put it in your coat pocket, ready when you need it. Now... Back to your apartment. You still have over an hour, and you know Marie will be alone. Hello, Marie. Oh, it's you. Just finished dressing? I was about to go out. Where have you been? You know where I went. Did you see him? Ricky? Who else? Oh, he wasn't there. Seems he was taking his morning walk in the park. Remember when we used to walk in the park together, Marie? You're breaking my heart. I'm sorry. I had quite a talk with Mr. Craig. He's quite a businessman. It's odd you've never met him. I'm going to see him today. I told him how I felt about you and Ricky. And of course, it didn't do you any good. In one way, it didn't. In another way, it was quite a profitable visit. What does that mean? You're about to find out, darling. Uh, I want to show you a letter. Here, read it. It's addressed to you. Who's it from? The signature's at the bottom. Ricky. Clyde, what is this? Go on, read it aloud. Marie, my darling, it's useless to try to put this into words told no one of your decision to stay with Clyde because I know it isn't final that you love me and always will. Oh, Clyde, this is ridiculous. Go on, Marie. Read the rest of it. Mm, I see. Always will. But the only future for either of us is together. You must believe me, darling. I'd rather die than have it any other way. I'm coming to your apartment tomorrow morning at 11... You must decide this once and for all. Oh, my love, Ricky. <laughs> What's so funny, Marie? Oh, God, that's the funniest thing I ever read in my life. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> it's a present for Ricky, darling. Well, I'm afraid I don't know what... Well, what are you doing with that letter opener? Ricky's going to the chair, Marie, for your murder. It's not very funny, Clyde. Your time. And there's something for you, too. A lesson in loyalty. Get away from me, Clyde. Listen. Clyde, please. Please, darling. No. No, Clyde. No. Yes, Clyde. A present for Ricky. They'll never know now that Marie was about to toss you over for him. The letter will be published in all the papers and... That kind of publicity won't hurt you a bit, will it? You move quickly now. Toss the card with Ricky's signature on Marie's desk. Take the crumpled note from her hand and put it in the wastebasket where the police will be sure to find it. Throw the letter opener out the window into the shrubbery several floors below. They'll find that too. That's all, Clyde. You're ready now. Nothing to do but leave the building by the private elevator and return to Stanley Craig's office. You're there in less than 20 minutes with a good half hour to spare. And best of all, you haven't been seen by anyone who could possibly recognize you. Still here, Mr. Croydon? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm still here. I'm beginning to wonder if Ricky will show up at all. Anybody call? Not unless they called while I was out stretching my legs. I walked around the block a couple of times. Oh, sorry, you had to wait so long. Oh, that's all right. It uh, gave me a chance to think things over. Is that good or bad? I think it's good. I 
decided it's wrong for me to try to stand in her way. Uh, if this looks like a break for her and Ricky, I think they deserve the chance. I was hoping you'd see it that way, Mr. Croyton. Thanks a lot. Well, I'd better be going. Tell Ricky about everything when he comes, will you? Sure. Going home? Yes. I, uh, I think I'd better tell Marie. <laughs> Police headquarters. Something terrible has happened. My name is Clyde Croydon. I live in the penthouse at 1232 Warwick Place. That's right. Please send someone up here as quickly as you can. My wife has been murdered. I think we can clean this up in a hurry, Mr. Croydon. I, I, I don't want to talk about it anymore, Sergeant. Oh, sure. I still can't believe it. I, I know how you feel. I'll do anything I can to help, but you understand later on, please. Oh, sure, sure, Mr. Croydon. Tomorrow, maybe. Feel better today, Mr. Croydon? I think so. Oh, that's good. That's quite a letter we found in the wastebasket. What'd you think of it? Oh, I... I don't know what to think. You knew what was going on between this man and your wife? There was nothing going on. It was all in his mind. What do you mean? Look, I have never seen this this Ricky. I, I don't even know who he is. All I know is that he started sending Marie flowers after every performance. He had some crazy idea she was in love with him. Oh, it was ridiculous. She hardly even knew him. Uh -huh. And well, what about the dance business? That was part of it, too. He thought she'd leave me and team up with him. Oh, don't ask me why. She laughed at him. Well, that's as good a motive as I've seen in 20 years. You know, it's a wonder he didn't leave a confession note right on the table. He left everything else. First-class motive, the letter in the wastebasket, the knife with his manager's name on the bushes outside. And yet... And yet what? With all that, after practically shouting from the housetops that he'd killed her... He carefully wipes his prints off the knife. Funny how a murderer's mind works, isn't it? Yes, it's... Well, it's, it's hard to understand. Oh, by the way, Mr. Croydon, this is only a formality, of course. Where were you yesterday morning before you found your wife? In Craig's office. I was waiting for Ricky to show up, I see. Craig seemed to think she'd go for him as a new partner, and I finally decided to go down and settle it. Mm-hmm. Have any words with Craig? Oh, of course not. I just told him if it was all right with Marie, it was all right with me. But I knew, of course, how she felt about him. Well, where was Ricky at the time? His manager said he was walking in the park, exercising his legs. Alone? Yes, I guess so. Well, there it is again. I'll bet the guy hasn't even got himself an alibi. Have you, uh, talked to him yet? Well, the boys are looking him up now. And if you ask me, Mr. Croydon, that guy's a dead pigeon. <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. I wonder if you've noticed the increasing emphasis that's being placed recently on the independent businessman. Well, that's especially interesting to me because not just now, but for the past 15 years, in fact, ever since Signal Oil Company first started marketing gasoline, they have sold Signal products through independent dealer-owned service stations. And for good reasons. Not only because the independent businessman represents the American way of life that has made our country such a great place in which to live and make a living, but also because there's a personal advantage for you in having your car serviced at a dealer-owned signal station. You see, your signal dealer, being in business for himself, naturally has more incentive to give you the more thorough, more conscientious service that will keep your car happy and keep you his satisfied customer. This personalized service, plus the fine quality of Signal products, are two good reasons why Signal has grown so in popularity. Grown from a mere handful of stations serving Southern California into an organization serving seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, 
back to the Whistler. Well, Clyde, all it took was a little nerve. You're over the hump now, all ready to act as number one witness for the prosecution in the case against Ricky. Tomorrow, the story will break in the papers. And the notoriety, the public sympathy over your bereavement should make it easy to pick up a new partner, one who'll keep you in the top spots, in penthouse apartments with private elevators. Yes, Clyde, you can relax now. You've decided it's all over. Now, who can that be? Oh, oh, Sergeant. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Croydon. I was about to go to bed. Uh, anything wrong? We've got Ricky. Good. Just finished questioning him. Mind if I come in? No, not at all. Check the note against Craig's typewriter. That's where it came from, all right. Looks like you've got a case. I'll be perfectly frank with you, Mr. Croydon. Until we found that letter, you were our number one suspect. I... Yeah, you had plenty of motive and you had plenty of time to leave Craig's office, kill your wife, and return. Oh, no, wait well, a I'm minute. I'm not finished. The note threw us a curve. For a while. What do you mean, for a while? Until we found Ricky. He claims he didn't write it. Oh, good Lord, what did you expect him to say? We believe him. Believe him? Of all Just a minute. You never met Ricky, huh? I told you that. Well, that's the one honest statement you made, Croydon. The rest was strictly out of your head. Here, I'll show you what I mean. Come on in, will you? Mr. Croydon, this is Ricardo Montez, also known as Ricky. He did it. He wrote the note, I tell you. No comprendo lo que hablan, señores. Pero yo no la maté. Wait. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, please. Tremendous. No la maté. That's what I mean about the note, Croydon. The boy doesn't know a word of English. But it's a fake. Any foreigner can pretend he can't speak English. Maybe. But there was another thing about the note that tied it up, Croydon. Huh? It seems to me that if he could have written it, he'd have signed it in his own handwriting. But it was his handwriting. Oh, no, no, Croydon. You forged his name. But you copied the florist's handwriting. That whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 9. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, who have asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Joseph Kearns and Betty Lou Gerson. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Gene Fromhers, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black. 
that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Weak Sister. Bertilda stood at the window, looking apprehensively at the old burying ground at the foot of the hill. A little group of people from the village down the road stood in twos and threes around the open grave of Captain Ethan Haskell. Bertilda always liked to stand at the window like this, watching through the dingy lace curtain. Yes, today especially, with Captain Ethan being laid away. There was a strange fascination in her timid little face. A look of morbid curiosity in her pale blue eyes. She didn't hear her older sister, Amanda, come up behind her. Matilda? Oh, oh Amanda, you frightened me. Matilda Sterling, pull down that window. It's beginning to rain. Land's sake, you'd think after all these years you'd have enough sense to be careful. Right, Amanda. Now I'm not going to be able to see the hearse when it comes. Oh, if you ain't the limit, Bertie. You said you didn't want to go to Captain Ethan's funeral. I like funerals, but they always frighten me so. When a body has lived 50 years overlooking a graveyard, it appears to me they ought to be used to it. Here, let me look. Be careful with the curtains. They'll see you. We got a right to look out of our windows. Hmm. Look at that. They'll get soaked to the skin, all of them. Just like Captain Ethan to be late for his own burial. And it's no way to talk about the day. Nonsense, Bertie. Hmm. Look at the sheriff down there. The doctor, too. They wasn't particularly friendly with the captain, Bertie. What do you suppose they're doing down there at the burial? Huh? <laughs> Rolling up your collar ain't going to keep off the rain, Doc. That's not what give me the chill, Sheriff. Yeah, I know what you mean. Don't turn round. Keep your back to the house. I can feel them watching us through that dining room window. They're a queer pair. Thirty years ago, I told them, Sheriff, move out to that gloomy old house. Mix with people, for it's too late. It's still mighty hard to believe she'd poison a man, Doc. Yeah, if you'd stop this funeral nonsense... I'd had proof for you, but now... Had to wait for Enoch Haskell to authorize the autopsy. But with him being the brother of the deceased, only living relative... Mm, funeral's a waste of time, anyway. Uh, I recommend you don't fill in over the coffin. Only going to happen to dig him up again. You don't suppose Mendel will show up, do you? Uh, she's smart enough to know it'll look queer if she doesn't show up. You ask me. I think she's fixing to come down right now. Sterling, what you doing with that umbrella? You're not going out into the rain. I'm going down to the burial ground. Decided one of us ought to pay last respects to Ethan Haskell. You'd catch your death at cold. Probably will. Look queer if I didn't go, though. It's a wonder his brother Enoch didn't come back to town today. Seems he ought to be here for the burying. Maybe he didn't want to come. Oh, likely. I never knew a Haskell that wasn't a stubborn contender. <laughs> You're talking about the dead again. It isn't dead now. Land sake alive. To listen to you, anybody would think we had to watch our tongues or our neighbors down there in the graveyards would rise up in their shrouds and... Please, Manda, don't say such things. Oh, all right, Bertie. I'm going now. I expect you'll want to lock yourself in. I'm so frightened when you're gone. No sense to it, of course. You can watch from the window. Be careful, Amanda. The rain. Don't worry. I'll throw my coat over me. Oh. Oh, there comes the casket now. Pretty one with silver trimmings. They're moving back to make way for it. All mourning him. Amanda, too. I wonder what they'd say if they knew she fed him those poison preserves. I wonder. With the pro-
prologue of Weak Sister, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Miller. Oh, Marvin, to you, beautiful. Oh, well, then, pardon me, Marvin, mm. but a few weeks ago you mentioned that the speedometer on a car can tell you the quality of the gasoline you're using. That's right, gorgeous. Well, my speedometer shows how fast I'm going and how far I've gone. But what I want you to tell me, Marvin, is how can my speedometer show the quality of the gasoline I'm using? Oh, nothing would give me more pleasure, sugar. After all, isn't it only logical that to get more mileage, a gasoline must help your motor run more efficiently? Yes. And you also know that Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. Well, Natch. So, putting two and two together, the thing which makes the good mileage in today's Signal gasoline possible is the extra performance it gets from your motor. It's quicker starting, it's faster pickup, and quieter, higher anti knock For after all, it takes extra quality to go farther. Oh, I see. And the better the gasoline is, the more mileage I get. Right you are, baby. Which explains why so many drivers are switching to signal the famous go-farther gasoline. Is that clear, my dear? Oh, who could help being convinced by the great Marvin Miller? Oh, brother. <laughs> and now, as you always say, Marvin, back, back to, to the, the whistler. whistler. It's a fascinating thing to watch, isn't it, Bertie? This burial service for Captain Ethan. There in the graveyard at the foot of the hill. You hardly notice the wind and rain coming in the open window as you stand there. Because your mind is somewhere else. On the dinner, Amanda served the three of you a few nights ago in this very house. Of the special peach preserve she served to the captain. Of the telephone call in the middle of the night. And the news that he had been found dead in the road where he'd fallen on his way home from the dinner. And you can see her down there now, piously mourning the captain's passing. Yes, that does make it more interesting, doesn't it? The mourners finally disperse and night settles over the graveyard. You're alone a few minutes more and then Manda returns. Here, take my umbrella. I want to make a telephone call. You stayed so long. Shall I light a fire, Amanda? Uh, good idea. Seems as though this place is never really warm. We should have sold it when Father died. Well, what are you waiting for? Uh, nothing, Amanda. I know what you're after. You just want to hear what I'm... Operator. Will you please call the sheriff, Luella? Anything the matter, Amanda? I haven't time to stand here gabbing, Luella. Just ring Sheriff Harris. And don't bother to listen in. Well, I never. Always makes me feel better to say a thing straight out. No use beating around the bush. Sheriff Harris speaking. Sheriff, this is Amanda Sterling. I want to put in a complaint about that grave digger, Ed Parker. What's wrong, Amanda? That grave's still open out there. He didn't fill it in. He filled in in due course, Amanda. Nothing to worry about. Guarantee old Ethan ain't gonna climb out and go wandering around. That isn't the point. Better go pull your shades down, Amanda, and mind your own business. Well, if you think I pay taxes to listen to that kind of... Let me tell you, Fred Harris, if that grave ain't filled in tomorrow, I'm going straight to the town council. Goodbye. Of all the impudence. Amanda, is the grave really open? Yes, it's open. I ought to go down and teach him a thing or two about manners. What did he say? Never mind, never mind. No use fretting you two. Now, where'd you put my umbrella? It's there in the corner. Well, I'm not going to worry about it. Some folks like the sheriff always have something impertinent to say. Oh. Here. Look what I tucked inside my umbrella. It's a flower. Lily. Yes. I picked it up from the grave when the rest had gone. It's pretty, isn't it? Any water in the vase and the mantle? Mand, you've got to take it back now. Oh, don't be silly, Bertie. You must, Mand. It's... Belongs to the dead. Don't 
expect Ethan will come back for it. Now let me see. He's doing that to torture me. If you take a flower from a grave, the dead will come to take it back. Now don't, don't let it touch oh, me. Oh, nonsense. You put it on the mat. I, I won't stay in this house another minute. He'll come for it, I tell you. He'll come for it. Now you know what will happen, Bertie. Working yourself up that way with your heart the way it is. Take it back. That's all I want. Take it back. Oh, the silliest thing I ever heard of. This superstition of yours. Uh, all right, Bertie. I'll take it back to the grave. But just to show you there's nothing to be afraid of, I'm going to take you with me. Watch your step, Matilda. Cruel of you to make me do this, man. Nonsense. It's high time someone showed you how ridiculous it is to be afraid of such things. Uh, that granite storm. Body can't see ten feet. There. There's headstone, Manda. Put the flashlight on. What do you think I've been trying to do? It won't work. Ah, the flash of lightning. Oh, nothing to be afraid of. No, not that. Somebody's over there by the grave. If you're going to start imagining things, I will... Oh, there is someone over there. It's the flower. He's coming for his flower. Be quiet, Bertie. Captain Ace. Manda. And he's coming. It, uh, it does look like him. Now get hold of yourself. I'm getting dizzy. Now, help me, man. No, you go fainting on me. Oh, my goodness, the flashlight, the flashlight. If I could... Ah, there we are. Who's there? Who's there? Who? Oh. It's you. Yes, Amanda. It's me. Bertie. Bertie, look. It's only Enoch, Bertie. It's Captain Ethan's brother. Bertie! Yeah, yeah, well, what's the matter? You scared the life out of her, that's what. Talking around like a spook. Here, help me with her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we are. My, my medicine. Well, now, here you are, dear. Lucky I always carry it with me. Enoch. It was only Enoch. Yes, dear, yes. Only Enoch. You gave her the fright of her life. Uh, you know how she feels about these things, Amanda? Funny you'd bring her down to the graveyard at a time like this. Almost as if you... As if what? As if you were trying to scare her to death. Why, that's nonsense, and you know it. Uh, it might be. But it's a funny time for the two of you to be wandering around here, ain't it? I, uh, I took this flower home from the services. Bertie made me bring it back. And what might you be doing here, Enoch Haskell? I was taking a shortcut to your house. I thought I'd tell you the sheriff wants to see you, Amanda. And in case you're wondering, there's no body over there in the grave. Post-mortem, you know. When does the sheriff want to see me? Right now, Amanda. Right now. Well, Bertie, at least it's done. The flower is back where it belongs. You're shaking now and cold, and your poor, sick heart is thumping inside you. As Amanda helps you up the hill to the house, you glance occasionally at her, at the pale, determined face, the worried look around the eyes. She's wondering how much you know about that poison fruit, isn't she, Bertie? She knows she's going to have trouble explaining it to the sheriff. And you wish you could go with her and instead of remaining home. Alone, locked in the old house. It should be quite a battle. The sheriff is a very persistent man. I'll get right to the point, Manda. You and I grew up together in this town, but this here's an official matter above personal feelings. Hope you understand. Go ahead, Sheriff. Don't need to tell you how this town loves a scandal, Manda. There's nothing scandalous about us and Captain Ethan, as far as I can see. Maybe not. Only Doc thinks there's more to Ethan's death than meets the eye. For instance, what? It was poison killed Captain Ethan. The kind of poison found in home canned goods, preserves, for instance. Ethan ate his last meal at your house, Manda. Hit him on the way home. Hello, Enoch. Have a chair. Thanks, Sheriff. I'll stand. Now, Manda, about the preserves. What about the preserves? Why, Ethan always said he loved your spiced peaches, Manda. Well, what if he did? There's nothing wrong with my sliced peaches. I eat them myself all the time. I'd consider it a favor, Manda, if you'd let me have a jar of those spiced peaches for the doctor in lies. What? 
You going to give her a chance like this, Fred? I've got nothing to hide, Enoch Haskell. Uh, maybe not. And then again... What do you mean, Enoch? Um, I can't forget that look on her face down in the graveyard when she thought I was Ethan. I think you're wrong. Known her all my life. She wouldn't harm a fly. No? Well, I think she killed my brother. Give me 30 seconds with that weak-kneed sister of hers. You keep away from Bertie if you know what's good for you. Why, Amanda? Why? You afraid she might spill something? Is that it? She don't know anything about this. Don't get riled, Amanda. Fact remains, Ethan died from poison. And he ate his last meal with you. Now, that can either mean some of the fruit spoiled, that he accidentally got some of it on his plate, or... Or what? Or it might mean he got it on purpose. In that case, of course, it'd be murder, wouldn't it? Now, I want you to go on home to dinner, Amanda, and uh, come back with them spiced peaches for Dr. Analyze. Sheriff, you're... You're not going to get Bertie into this. It, she's such a frail thing, a weak heart. Sorry, Amanda. If Doc finds poison in them peaches, I'm afraid we'll have to talk to her. Now, if you don't mind, Enoch, there's something I want to talk over with Mandy in private. Where are you, Mandy? In the pantry, Bertie. Oh, please come back and finish your supper. It's getting cold. Thought I'd get a little dessert together. And I've been rushed so today. Here's some cake and a few spiced peaches. Only enough out there for one helping. Here you are, dear. Uh, I'd rather have the cake, Amanda. You always were fond of spiced peaches, Bertie. I don't feel like them tonight. Just the cake. Funny how a body's taste can change. You didn't want them the night the captain was here, either. It's nothing at all. Please, man, it just give me the cake. You said you had to hurry back to the sheriff. What, what does he want to see you about? Nothing, Bertie. Just a few formalities about Ethan. I think maybe you'd better have some peaches. They're good for you, you know. And I don't want them. Please. Why don't you want them, Bertie? Why? Is something wrong? Don't, Amanda. Eat those peaches, Bertie, right now. Do you hear me? Get away from me, Amanda. I won't eat them. I won't. Oh. All right. All right, Matilda. What are you going to do now? Nothing. Nothing I can do, I guess. I'm sorry, Amanda. Sorry about what? You hate me, don't you? You always have. That's a queer thing to say. But it didn't matter all these years, just hating me. Now it's different. You're afraid of me now. That's why you... Go on, Bertie. That's why you just tried to... to make me eat those peaches. I was just finding out how much you know about Captain Ethan's death, Bertie. You know now, don't you? Yes. I know. What, what you going to do? Too late to do anything now, I guess. Uh, would you pass me the peaches, Bertie? Amanda. Go on, give them to me. Hurry up. Here you are, Amanda. Might as well eat them myself, Bertie. No use letting them go to waste now. You know, they're mighty good. Always was proud of my spiced peaches. You're too weak to get up from the table, aren't you, Bertie? That's why you sit there long after Amanda has left on her mysterious errand. Still stunned by her bewildering decision to eat the fruit she knew was poison. It's almost an hour now since she left. And your heart is still pounding. The whole thing, the whole nightmarish day, has been almost more than you could stand. Amanda will die now, just as Captain Ethan did. Somewhere out on the road, an hour or so after finishing dinner. At 9.30, the storm hits again harder than ever. 
and you stagger weakly into the hallway to lock the front door. She's only been gone an hour now, and yet there's a new feel to the loneliness of the quiet house. It's terrible to be alone like this, isn't it, Bertie? You almost wish Amanda would come back somehow. Just to stay here in the house with you until this awful night is over. Take it easy. Mustn't go too fast. Hello? Sheriff Harris, Bertie. Oh. Yes, Sheriff. Wondering what happened to Amanda. How long ago did she leave? More than an hour? Uh, it ain't like her to be late this way. Sheriff, why did you want to see her? About that poison fruit, Bertie. Poison fruit? Captain Ethan died from eating some of her spiced peaches, Bertie. We discovered it at the post-mortem this afternoon. She knew. She knew there was no use. That's why she ate the peaches. Yes, yes. What's that, Bertie? <laughs> Nothing, Sheriff. I, I think you ought to search the road for Manda. Oh, nothing to get worried about, I reckon. She probably... No, Sheriff. No, please. Go out and look for her right now. You worried, Betty? I, I think, Sheriff. I think Amanda is dead. <laughs> Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, in place of the usual message about signal gasoline, my sponsor, the Signal Oil Company, has asked me to take this time to talk with you about the community chest drive. Well, frankly, I'm sure there's very little that needs saying. The fighting war is over, yes. But the war against misery and sickness and juvenile delinquency must go on with ever greater force. And that is where the community chest comes in. Four out of ten people benefit through community chest services, such as clinics, hospitals, maternity homes, and day nurseries, children's aid, boy and girl scouts, campfire girls, the YMCA and YWCA. Also aid to the handicapped, homes for the aged, the Salvation Army, and many other worthy institutions too numerous to mention here. And who pays for all these services? everyone who is fortunate enough to have a penny or a dime or a dollar to spare for those who are less fortunate. And you know, there's a wonderful thing about money that you share in this way. Money that you spend on yourself brings happiness to only one person. But money that you share with the needy brings happiness to so many, including yourself. Now, back to the whistler. <laughs> So Amanda is dead, Bertie. At long last, after 30 years living together, Amanda is dead and you're free. You leave the phone and walk slowly toward the cellar stairs. Yes, there are things to be done, Bertie. The doctor and the sheriff know about the poison preserves now, and they'll be here soon. You're sorry about Amanda in a way. It's too bad she had to die by her own hand, knowing it was coming. It's too bad she didn't die the night Captain Ethan came for supper. The night she graciously gave the captain her dish of preserves, simply because she didn't want them. While you sat across the table from them both, paralyzed with horror at the awful mistake, unable to say anything. Yes, Bertie, it's too bad Amanda didn't die on the night you planned to kill her. Down into the cellar now, yes. Over to the preserve cabinet, Bertie. Yes, to the bottom shelf. And the two jars of fruit you put a special mark on the day you found they were poisoned. Yes, and now to the sink. You smash the jars with a hammer and start to pour the fruit down the drain. Your hand slips. A sharp piece of glass cuts deep into your wrist. And a stream of blood rolls down your arm. You drop everything in the sink and run up the steps to find a bandage. 
The sight of the blood has made you weak and dizzy. You remember the napkins. The napkins on the dining room table. Quickly, Bertie. I'd better sit down for a minute. And then... There's a tap on the window. You raise your eyes. And there's a cold, icy feeling around your heart. And darkness. And then not even darkness. Just nothing. And emptiness. And space. Nothing we can do now. Well, I checked her. <laughs> what is it, Doc? Fright. Her heart probably gave out when Manda walked up to that window. If only I hadn't forgotten my key. That was just like her, to lock herself in that way. Yeah, Manda. <laughs> At least she did your last kindness. Without meaning to, of course. What's that, Doc? She cleared Manda of any implication in Ethan's death. But he got that gash on her wrist. While she was trying to get rid of the poisoned jars down in the cellar. I, I still can't believe she could have done it. I know, man. It was just as hard for me. Knowing how much you cared about her. There was only one way to convince you your sister Bertie was a murderess. To show you she knew that fruit was poisoned all the time. Even before she tried to give it to you the night Captain Ethan came for dinner. Sheriff's right, Manda. Don't you see? That's why we ask you to switch a good jar for the bad one out in the pantry and try her out on it. If she took it, she'd be innocent. If she turned it down... But but it wasn't fair. She must have thought I was trying to kill her. Don't you see, Mandy? It wasn't for her sake we did it. It was for you. She was so weak, so helpless. But it was the easy way, Mandy. The easier way for her. (laughs) Be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 9. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, who have asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure. Drive at sensible speed. The Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Yesterday, The Whistler visited the Jack Benny program, where Mr. Benny sounded something like this. I'm the fiddler. <laughs> As always, Mr. Benny's listeners had a lot of fun, and so did we. But tonight, as usual, the whistler theme by the real whistler will sound like this. Is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program. 
In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, Masquerade. There was a strange, tense silence in the room, broken only occasionally by the sound of the whirring roulette tables downstairs and the muffled cries of the croupiers. Sam Baxter was serious this time, deadly serious. Irene could tell it by the nervous habit he had of blinking his eyes, cold, gray, heartless eyes, stabbing at her now as she sat in the chair across the room. It was like Sam, she told herself, to tackle it this way. To sit there quietly for minutes on end and let the silence work for him. She was almost ready to scream when he finally spoke. You've been hitting it pretty lucky, Irene. How much you win tonight? Go ask your cashier. I hate to see that. Gambling's an awful vice. Don't want to encourage you. I've made a pretty good living at it. I got no complaints. From now on, you can make your living somewhere else. What does that mean? It means you're barred from the casino. It's from now on. Is that why you called me up here? Yeah, I got a little advice for you, baby. You better hit the road. The town's no good for you no more. If I want advice, I'll go to a lawyer. Well, you can save yourself the time. I'm giving it to you now for nothing. I'm going to treat you right, Irene. Yeah, here's a set of railroad tickets with a little expense dough. The vacation's on me. Well, that's a funny way to look at it, Sam. I'm making money for you, bringing in the suckers, doing my job. That's got nothing to do with it. What is it, then? I think a lot of my kid brother, Irene. What's Joe got to do with this? Plenty. He's a sucker for dames. Listen, you... Ah, shut up. I'm telling you, he's a sucker for dames. I had to get him out of one spot before, and I'm not going to let it happen again. With you or anybody else. He's old enough to know his own mind. Where do you get off telling me how to run my personal life? Like I said, baby, the town's no good for you no more. You're taking the train tomorrow. What does Joe think of this? He likes it okay now that I explained it to him. Now listen, Sam, get this through your thick head. I love the guy. I'm on the square. Ah, well, forget it. He doesn't love you. You've got a lot of crust, Sam Baxter. I'm going to see what Joe has to say about this. Wait a minute. Don't be surprised if Joe acts like he's cooled off a little. He's done a little thinking this afternoon. And to remind him of a couple of things. Like what? Another dame like you. Ruffling his hair with one hand and counting his dough with the other. Are oh, you low down cheap double Watch blocking. it, baby. I don't take that from nobody. Now go on. Go on over and see him. He'll tell you where to get off. You might be surprised. And, uh, Irene. Yeah? You forgot something. Your train tickets. You can keep them. Better take them, baby. A vacation might even be good for your health. Yes, Irene, Sam hates you. As you leave the casino and walk toward Joe's apartment, the cool night air clears your head. And you realize how afraid you really are. How easy it would be for a man with Sam's power to snuff you out like a candle. Joe is alone in his apartment when you arrive. And the minute you see his face, you know Sam has put the, the fear into him, too. Joe. Joe, darling, what's the answer? I don't know, Irene. I'm not going to leave you, Joe, not now. Nobody's big enough to separate us, not ever. Irene, darling, I... Oh, I love you, Joe. I love you so much it makes me sick inside. Oh, hold me, darling, the whole thing. Nobody's ever going to keep us apart. Irene. What's the matter, Joe? Irene, you don't know Sam. He's too big for us. He gets what he wants. There are guys working for him clear across the country. He can't be everywhere. We'll leave the country. Anything so long as we're together. I don't know. I don't know. There's no other way, Joe. If you stay here, he'll make a mug out of you, turn you into a criminal. You'll spend the rest of your life dodging the police and around the spur on the lamb all the time. 
That's no way to live. Oh, we've got to try, Joe. We've got to try. Joe. Whose gun is this on the table? It's mine, Irene. You see, he's got you carrying a gun already. Oh, Joe, if you love me, you've got to do it now. Here. Here, Joe, sit down. What are you... Please. All right. Now, here's a pen, paper. Go ahead, Joe. I want you to write a note for me to Sam. But, Irene, please, you... Please, please. Say this. Um... Dear Sam. Okay. Dear Sam, I've thought it over, and I've decided I can't go on like this. So I'm taking the only way out. Irene and I are in love. I can't do it, Irene. Why not? Please? Not now. This isn't the time for it, baby. Well, what do you mean? Look, you go ahead like Sam says, see? I got some things to clear up here. I can meet you later somewhere in a couple of months. Now, wait a we'll... minute, Joe. Just a minute. You love me, don't you? Oh, it's not that. But like I said, there are a couple of things... You're I'll lying like... to me, Joe. Listen, Irene. That's what Sam was talking about. No, you got it all wrong. That's what he I... meant, isn't it? You're different now. Sure, I don't count anymore. Forget Irene. There are plenty of other women around. Just listen to Brother Sam. He's the big boy. He's the only one who counts. Everything's great till Sam gives the word, then you sell me out for a dime. It's always been like that, hasn't it, Joe? Hasn't it? And I've been too blind to see it. Oh, now, wait a minute, right, baby. So you got to... Sam. So it is another day, money, anything, I don't know. You never loved me. You just lied to oh, me. Oh, stop it. Get I away mean, from I... me. All right, Joe. All right. Have it your way. Irene, put on that gun. I'll get out of here. I'll do what the boss wants. It doesn't matter anymore. No, wait a minute, Irene. I... 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 With the prologue of Masquerade, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. Have you had a ride in one of the new 1946 cars yet? Well, I did this evening when a friend gave me a lift down to the studio. And man, was he proud. I was especially interested to hear him brag about the engineering improvements that not only gave faster pickup and smoother speed, but also better gasoline mileage. Because you know, friends, that's the same thing science did for today's signal gasoline when they upped its power. The first thing you notice, of course, is signals quicker starting, its faster pickup, and its quieter, higher anti-knock. But if you check your speedometer, you'll find today's signal gasoline also gives you a bonus of extra mileage. For after all, it stands to reason... A gasoline that helps your motor perform more efficiently also helps you get more miles per gallon. And that's why Signal says look to your speedometer for the best proof of gasoline quality. It takes extra quality to go farther. Good reason why so many drivers are switching to Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. It's over now, Irene. And it's decided once and for all. Joe will stay and you will go. That's all you can think of at first. After the awful finality of the thing that you did begins to sink in. It happens so quickly, Irene. First his fumbling excuses, then the doubt. A few seconds later, the blinding flash of hysteria. The gun in your hand. The shot. And Joe lying at your feet. Still and silent. Then you start out of the apartment, and your eye falls on the note on the desk. Dear Sam, I've thought it over carefully, and I've decided I can't go on like this. So I'm taking the only way out. Irene and I are in love. Why? Sounds like a suicide note. 
Yes. Yeah. Like a suicide note. Quickly, you pick up the gun. Wipe the fingerprints off of it with your handkerchief. Press it into Joe's limp hand and let it fall to the floor again. The handkerchief again now. On the doorknob, the fountain pen, everything you touched. Then quickly out of the apartment, into the service elevator, through the alleyway and into the street. You remember now with immense relief that the night clerk was asleep when you came in. That no one saw you leave. A half hour later, you walk into your apartment house. The clerk looks up as you enter. Now, Mr. Carney, you have a visitor waiting upstairs. What? You didn't let him into my room. Oh, it's a man. It isn't a man, miss. It's a young lady, an old friend of yours. She didn't leave her name. Who's here? Who? Oh, Mitzi. Hello, Irene. I thought you were in Las Vegas. Nobody stays in Las Vegas forever. Just passing through? I don't know. I might stay a while. You seem to be doing all right, darling. Nice place you got here. Nothing like a job with Sam Baxter, is there? Why do you say that? Take it easy, baby. I'm not going to bite you. Something wrong? What are you doing here, Mitzi? Just looking up an old friend. You know, if this was Las Vegas and I was you, you know what I'd do? Missy, I'm sorry, honey. I'm just not in the mood. I'd offer me a drink. How about it? All right. All right, Missy. What'll it be? Ginger ale or soda? Uh, Ginger ale, thanks. I uh, dropped in on Sam Baxter this afternoon. Oh? He tells me you're taking yourself a vacation. He talked about it. Good idea. You need one. Think so? I know a case of shakes when I see one, and baby, you got them. Sam got anything to do with it? No. Sam has nothing to do with it. Here's a drink. Thanks. Here, see you, darling. Oh, I uh, forgot to tell you I'm staying here tonight. Oh, now listen, Miss. Not Mrs. another word, darling. No trouble at all. I'll sleep on the couch. You'll never know I'm here. You can get a room at the hotel. They're all fixed up. I checked them an hour ago. Just be for tonight, so don't worry your little head. Mr. Darling, I want to be alone tonight. I I, I don't feel well. You have got the shirt. Spill liquor down the front of your dress. Oh. Oh. Wipe right off of the handkerchief. Got my handkerchief right here. My handkerchief. Where is it? I... I left my handkerchief. In. Here, here. Use mine. What's the matter with you, Irene? You look like a ghost. Nothing, nothing. I... It's just... It was a nice handkerchief with my initials on Forget it. Forget it. I'll buy you one tomorrow. Better let me put you to bed, baby. You got yourself a case of nerves. Well, Irene, what about your handkerchief? As you lie in bed, you try and tell yourself you must have dropped it on the street. That the chances are against anyone finding it where it would do you harm. But every time you close your eyes, you see it lying on the floor of Joe's apartment, where Sam is sure to find it. It seems like hours later when the phone bell cuts through the darkness like a knife. Yes? Irene? Yes? This is Sam Baxter, Irene. I hate to wake you up like this, two o'clock in the morning and everything. What do you want? I'm up at Joe's apartment. I got pretty worried when he didn't answer his phone. Why are you calling me? You know I am calling you, baby. Oh, listen, Sam, I'm sleepy. I don't want to play games. I always told Joe a dame was going to get him sooner or later. Why'd you have to do it to him, baby? The beef was with me. Do what to him? Kill him. Kill him? Well, Sam, Sam, you're kidding. You know, I could almost believe you if I didn't know you better. But tell me, what's this all about? What do you mean? I mean someone shot Joe tonight with his own gun. Joe dead? Oh, baby, you're great. You're terrific. You ought to be on the stage. Yeah, he's dead. There's a suicide note in his desk. In his own handwriting. Everything's ready for the cops. It wasn't my kid brother. I'd call it a wonderful job. Listen, Sam, I had nothing to do with it. You were going to see him tonight. 
tonight? Well, I, I, I called it off. I, I told him later. I'll I... give it to you straight, Irene. I think you killed him. I ain't sure yet, but I got ways of finding out. If I'm right, you won't have to worry about the police. Listen, Sam. You listen. You won't have to worry about the police because I'm going to let them think Joe committed suicide. So I can take care of you myself. Might happen in a taxi, maybe in a crowd on a street corner, maybe even in in bed some night when you're asleep. But you won't have to worry because you'll never know what hit you. Get it? Sam! Sam, please listen to That's me! That's all, Irene. So long. All you can think of is the lost handkerchief. And what will happen if Sam finds it? You're wondering now, imagining things, fighting the desire to run. And then you discover you're cold and walk to the closet for your robe. As you throw it around your shoulders, your eye falls on something white, sticking out of the lining of the fur coat you wore tonight, just below the right pocket. The handkerchief. He's here in my coat all the time. You take one look at the blood stain on the corner and decide to burn it right now. Quickly, through the side door into the kitchen. You touch a match to some papers in the incinerator and throw the handkerchief into the blaze. And gradually feel better as you watch it go up and smoke. And then a door closes in the other room and you remember... She's still asleep on the couch. Or is she? You wonder how she could have slept through that ringing phone. If she was watching you as you burned the handkerchief. Wake up, Irene. Irene, it's 9.30. No. Irene. Oh, Oh, yes, Miss Lee. Getting late, darling. Gonna have breakfast? Oh, go on, Miss Lee. Leave me alone. Mix yourself some breakfast in the kitchen, then run along like a nice kid, will you? What about you? I don't want any breakfast. I don't want any. I'm, I'm going out. You sit in the coffee shop now, trying to choke down a piece of toast with a morning paper in front of you, carrying a small article at the bottom of page one on the suicide of Joseph Baxter. That's all. Four or five lines. Just another suicide. Nothing more. But over and over again inside your mind, you hear something else playing like a phonograph record. Maybe in a taxi. Maybe in a crowd on a street corner. Maybe some night with your sleep in bed. And you know how short your time really is. So perhaps right now he's making up his mind how it's going to happen. You know now you're going to have to run for it, Irene. No matter how useless it might seem to try to run from Sam Baxter, it's your only chance now. <laughs> Why, yes, miss. Of course, we can dye that blonde hair any color you want it. It just seems a shame. Black. I want it black. And we'll change the arch of your eyebrows like this. That ought to do it. Go ahead now and hurry. Oh, why, why, yes, we can. We can fit you through a pair of horn rim glasses. Your eyes are in pretty good shape, though, and I'd hardly... Recommend... I'm buying them. Go on, make them up. I want a pair of spike heels. Oh, hi, miss. They run all the way up to four inches. That'd add a couple of inches to your height. <laughs> Not so good if you got a short boyfriend. I'll take a pair. Size five and a half. And never mind the boyfriend. Oh, boy! Here's that ticket. Oh, this thing. Uh, you're just in time, lady. Right up here. <laughs> Two cars forward. Oh, boy!
I hope you don't mind my sitting next to you, miss. It's nice to have someone to talk to. Of course, I have my knitting, but even at that, it's a long trip. How far are you going? Montreal. Montreal. My, that must be a lovely city. Regular piece of France, they say, just across the border. This your first trip? Yes, it's my first trip. Well, isn't that nice? Well, we stop up here at Hanford for a minute, and then we'll begin to get some real nice scenery. Then there's a tunnel just beyond there, and then we get into the mountains. Please, if you don't mind. Say, is that a friend of yours up here? No, I don't have any friends. Well, well, isn't that funny? She turned and looked at you just as if she'd... What did you say? Well, that girl crossed the car a few feet ahead. The one with the yellow hat. (gasps) Mitzi. Yes, Irene. Mitzi is sitting up there on the other side of the car. Just a few seats ahead. It's clear now. Yes. He saw you burn that handkerchief, of course. You realize how stupid you've been. How it never entered your head that Sam would use Mitzi to put the finger on you. Las Vegas, Reno, Tijuana. It comes back to you now. Mitzi and Sam together most of the time. Perhaps even in love with each other. And that's why she came to your apartment last night. Sam sent her there. And that's why she's here now. Might happen in a taxi, on a crowded street. Maybe even some night when you're asleep. Might happen in a taxi. Where are we? Hanford, it only stops for a minute. Excuse me. Oh, no time to get off. Please let me out. Well, I never. I thought you were going to Montreal. You still have a chance, Irene. Mitzi's not sure of you yet, thanks to the disguise. You move down the aisle to the car exit with the commuters, start down the steps, and in one glance you realize how hopeless it all is. There on the station platform, carefully watching each passenger get off, is a big hulking man with a telltale bulge of a shoulder holster under his left arm. You turn back into the car just in time, sick with fear, knowing now that Sam was right. There's no running away. Excuse me. Oh, you come back. I thought you were... I just went back there for a little while. Oh, it does get mighty stuffy in these cars. Sometimes you can smell that smoker clean way back to the observation. What's the matter? Oh, I see what you're looking at. Now, what do you suppose that tough-looking fellow's doing up there? I don't know. Maybe one of them survey fellows asking questions. Looks like that's what he's doing with those folks up front. How do we get to that tunnel? What's that? The tunnel you told me about. Where is it? Oh, that's uh, about a half mile beyond Hanford. We ought to hit it any minute now. But I wonder what that fellow's up to. Bet he'll ask me what brand of prunes I'm using. Well, Irene, you're praying now that the train will plunge into the blackness of the tunnel before the man, the same man you saw on the platform, reaches your seat. He's moving closer now, almost to Mitzi, stopping at each seat to look carefully at its occupants, then moving backward in the car, closer, and then... The train hits the tunnel, and in that precious moment of darkness, you struggle out of your seat and back into the next car. The train leaves the tunnel and it's light again. You hurry down the aisle toward the end of the train in the observation car. The sound of steps behind you makes you turn. It's Mitzi, Irene. She's following you. You're almost running now. It doesn't matter what the passengers think anymore. As you run through the observation car toward the rear platform, you see her come in the other end. And you know it's up to you now. It's your life or hers. You slam the door. Stand behind it. Open your purse and take out the little 32 automatic you hoped you wouldn't need. All right, Missy. He slumps to the floor. And you turn toward the railing. The train's moving too fast. But you're going to have to jump anyway. 
Wait a minute, baby. Let go. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Oh, no me. jumping on a train I... today. You... You... There. As of right now, baby, you're all washed up. <laughs> Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about the extra something you get when you have your car lubricated at a dealer-owned Signal gasoline station. You see, Signal dealers, being in business for themselves, do go out of their way to give you the kind of job they're proud to stand back up. It's why, for instance, they take no chances on memory when they lubricate your car. Instead, they check against Signal's factory-recommended lubrication chart, which shows every lubrication point on your car. And they use nine specialized Signal oils and greases, so each part will have the exact type of protection it needs for long, trouble-free service. But do they stop there? No, sir. Just to make doubly sure not a single part has been overlooked, they check each point again, which is why it's called Signal Double-Check Lubrication. Now, that's the kind of lube service you want when today's aging cars have to last until there are enough new ones to go around. And that's the kind of lubrication you get from your friendly, dealer-owned signal service station. And now, back to the Whistler. Well, Irene, there's no use fighting anymore now. It's all over, and Sam Baxter is won. Suddenly you're weak and dizzy. The sky turns a thickish green and the floor gives way underneath your feet. When you open your eyes, you find you're up forward in one of the coaches. The train has stopped near a crossing. And some men in white uniforms are carrying Mitzi into an ambulance. You try to lift your hand to your head and discover you can't. The handcuff, baby. Handcuff? Why... Oh. New York police, homicide detail. The name's Stone. Police? Oh, you know all about it. I couldn't miss it. Everyone in the car saw it through that window onto the back platform. No, I... I mean about Joe. Joe who? Wait a minute. Why did you come under this train? Why did you follow me? We weren't following you, lady. We were following that dame you knocked off, Mitzi Rogers. Yeah, and I'm afraid it's going to go pretty tough on you. Still murder, you know. What are you talking about? Mitzi was wanted for the murder of her ex-boyfriend at his office this afternoon. Who was it? Oh, a guy that was giving her the runaround. Gambler by the name of Sam Baxter. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 9. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, who have asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story was Lorene Tuttle. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, based on a story by David Kahn, music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. 
Yes. I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by independent research, the most popular West Coast program. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to go farther. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal Circle sign in yellow and black that identifies Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story, Backfire. Just a moment before, the music of the little tango orchestra had seemed pure magic to him as they sat at their special table in the soft, enchanting gloom of the Club Madrid. Now it was discordant, a cacophony of meaningless noise and maddening, pounding rhythm. In the club, the dancers, the slim vocalists with the maracas, only heightened the despondency that settled on him like a cloud. And the thing that had worked to change, that had transformed magic into misery in a split second, was the thing that Amy had said tossed across the table to him as if it had been a comment on the weather. I'm sorry, Carl. I don't love you. I never did. Amy, what are you saying? Really, darling, it isn't anything to look so serious about. You must have known that we couldn't go on like this forever. Amy, Amy, we can't just throw it all away. You've got to understand. Well, what the way? Carl, dear, you're being awfully naive, don't you think? Amy, I love you. Is that naive? Is that stupid? Well, it doesn't make very good sense, dear. We've had three months, three wonderful, exciting months. Arnold's coming home tomorrow, and that is that. You know how he'd explode if he ever found out. No? When did you hear from him? Well, he was in San Francisco this morning. Aren't you just a little bit worried about him? Why? We've been discreet enough. You know, it's a little strange how a man can be so brilliant and so blind all at once. You almost look as if you delight in telling Arnold that. Yes. I'm afraid I can't afford to. Naturally. You know, I think Arnold might resent it a little if he knew his wife had become romantically interested in her chauffeur. That puts me in my place quite nicely, Amy. It was meant to, darling. I suppose you run and get the car. I want to talk to the orchestra leader for a minute. Well? What are you waiting for? Of course, Mrs. Pearson. Right away. Of course, Mrs. Pearson, right away. You're back in your place now, aren't you, Carl? Yes, Mrs. Pearson. Of course, Mrs. Pearson. Right away, ma'am. Just like it was when you first came to the Pearson house over a year ago. Long before the thrilling, unbelievable discovery that Amy was interested in you. As you walk dumbly out of the nightclub, your mind goes back to the day Arnold Pearson hired you. Well, Carl, I have an idea you work out quite nicely. I understand you're an excellent driver and uh, mechanically inclined. That's right, Mr. Pearson. Not so much on my account. It's mainly because of Mrs. Pearson. I see. She's a very impetuous woman, inclined to be reckless. She's had two accidents now, while the narrow escapes, I feel much safer with a chauffeur for her. Of course. Mrs. Pearson becomes upset very easily, uh, emotionally rather unstable. When she's troubled, she has a strange habit of taking the car out and driving like the wind. I uh, am afraid I don't understand. Well, neither do I, frankly. Somehow it seems to cool her down, quiet her nerves. I hope that with you here as chauffeur, you'll have to find some less dangerous antidote for these, uh, explosions of hers. Oh, I know I can help, sir. Uh, good. Then it's settled, Carl. I'm going to hire you. And as far as I'm concerned, a prison record means absolutely nothing if a man is really willing to profit by his mistakes. You'll have every chance to make good. Thank you, sir. You're back in your place. Right where you were the day Arnold hired you. Fresh out of state prison. And he hasn't thought of you since. To Arnold, you were a piece of equipment like a lawnmower or a washing machine. Not a human being who might want something else in the world. Something with pride and dignity. You hated him, didn't you, Carl? Him and his righteousness. 
And when Amy became interested in you, you wanted to scream in his face that if he didn't think you were somebody, his wife did. But that's all over now. The evenings at the Club Madrid with Amy are part of the past. She's, uh, Mrs. Pearson again. And you're back in your place as chauffeur. You're a little uneasy when Arnold calls you into his study on the night of his return. I... I don't quite know how to begin, Carl. Something rather unpleasant has been called to my attention. Uh, indeed, sir? Uh, first, however, I think I ought to tell you that I've advised my lawyers about you, Carl. You'll never want for anything, even if something should happen to me. Why? Why, that's very kind of you, sir. I had no idea oh, that why, you... I'm happy to do it, Carl. Oh. All I ask in return is, is your confidence. It's about Mrs. Pearson. Mrs. Pearson? As you know, Carl, I'm quite well known. And, well, the fact of the matter is, a chap from the firm spoke to me about Amy this afternoon. He implied she'd been seen on a number of occasions in the company of a strange man. Oh, well, it's, it's probably only gossip, sir. I'm sure that... I hope it is just gossip. It sort of upset me, that's all. Coming home to a lot of ugly rumors about my wife and an orchestra leader. An orchestra leader? Yes. I believe he's working at the Club Madrid. Stopped you, didn't it, Kyle? So, oh, there was only one reason for all those evenings with Amy at the Club Madrid. Harry Larkin, the orchestra leader. You were stupid not to have seen it from the first. You're raging inside as you walk downstairs to the library. Amy is still there, curled up by the fireplace with a book. Hello, Amy. Well, Kyle. What's the matter, darling? I just talked to your husband. Seems there are rumors floating around. About us? No. No, not about us. Why, I don't understand. No. Oh, those baby blue eyes. Those beautiful, innocent baby blue eyes. You cheap, heartless little tramp. Wait a minute. Shut up. And tell me this, Amy. Who's it going to be after Terry Larkin? Cow. Kind of a hobby of yours, isn't it? Making a fool out of every guy you meet. I ought to do Larkin a favor. I ought to go to him right now and give him a tip-off. Tell him he's due for the high dive in a couple of weeks. You're not going to go anywhere. Do you understand? No. You're not going to do anything. Do you want to know why? Because you're involved as much as I am. Because I can talk, too. Because if it came right down to it, I'd sound a lot more convincing to Arnold and the parole board and everybody else. Uh, what about Terry Larkin? I'll see anybody I want any time I want. You know where that'll get you. I'll decide that. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going out for a drive. Wait a minute. You, you know what Arnold said. Skip it. When I want a chauffeur, I'll ring for one. With the prologue of Backfire, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange tale by The Whistler. But now, may I have a word with you regular friends of the Whistler? As you know, it's your loyalty that has made this the most popular West Coast program. Yet, if you had never tuned us in in the first place, you wouldn't know whether you liked the Whistler or not, would you? Well, it occurred to me that in much the same way, many of you haven't discovered how much pleasure signal gasoline can add to your driving. Because you just haven't gotten around yet to trying signal gasoline. Of course, if you've lived out west any length of time at all, you know Signal is famous as the go-farther gasoline. And you've no doubt heard me explain many times the reason for Signal's good mileage. The extra efficiency today's Signal gasoline gets from your motor. It's quicker starting, it's faster pickup, it's quieter, higher anti-knock. Now, doesn't that all add up to the kind of gasoline you want for your car? Okay then I'd like to ask a favor of you. How about trying a few fillings of Signal gasoline, starting with your next tank full? Let your own car prove to you why, Signal says, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And now back to the whistler. thin line 
time it divides love from hatred, isn't it? There's a blind, driving hate inside you, fighting for expression every minute of the time you're with Amy. Chained to that steering wheel, driving her to secret appointments with Terry, hearing her say the same things to him she used to say to you. Listening to her lie to Arnold about where she's been. Realizing you're helpless, that you can't say anything. It's on your mind all the time. As you lie in bed, staring at the ceiling, unable to sleep. During the day, as you go about your duties. You know now that sometime, and in some way, you're going to kill her. It comes to you quite unexpectedly one afternoon... While you're having the family car lubricated, watching the attendant finish up. Well, there she is, Carl. I don't think you'll find a squeak in an hour. Oh, yes, and by the way. Yeah? Keep an eye on that speedometer, huh? According to our records, you ran over a little this time. You mean you keep a record here? Yeah, sure, and all our customers. Oh, uh, mileage record, huh? Mm hmm. Only takes a minute to put it down, you know. Comes in handy sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Joe. I'll keep an eye on that speedometer. And that's all it took, Carl. A chance remark by the station attendant. Keep an eye on that pedometer, he said, and that's what you're doing. It's five miles to the Pearson home from the station, exactly five miles. And as the little figures on the speedometer drop into place, parts of the plan start falling into place in your mind. Amy and Arnold are at home. Martha, the housekeeper, took part of the afternoon off and went to a movie. Ah, by the time you arrive at the house, you've decided to take the chance. Arnold is alone in his study. You hate to disturb him, but you think there's something that he ought to know about Terry Larkin. Carl, are you positive about this? Absolutely certain? Yes, sir, I am. I'm terribly sorry, sir, and I wouldn't have mentioned it, but you seemed so upset when you heard about it the other time. I I know, I know. It's all right, Carl. You're simply doing your duty. Where is Mrs. Pearson now? I think she's in the drawing room. Uh, Thank you very much. You've been most loyal. Thank you, sir. Well, Carl, it's underway now. And as you stand alone in the study and listen, you realize how right Amy was when she said Arnold would explode if he knew the truth about her. You never heard anything like this, Quarrel. It's more than you'd hope for. Did you see this man, Annie? Answer me. Did you see this man? All right. All right, Arnold. What have I done? Did you see this man? Did you see this man? Answer me. Did you see this man? All right. All right, Arnold. What have I done? It's nothing to you. You're so wrapped up in your career, so what do you even notice? My career has nothing to do with it. I don't care anymore. Do you understand that? I just don't care. And best of all, Carl. You aren't worried about what Amy might say about you. What she says won't matter. It's what she does that concerns you now. All that matters is that she behaves as you expect her to. And she does exactly. The moment the quarrel is over, she rushes out of the house and hurries across the lawn to the garage for another wild ride. You have the car all turned around, keys in the ignition ready for her. the moment that she's sending the big car roaring down the driveway, you're reaching in her dresser drawer for her small 22 caliber pistol. And a minute later, you're walking quietly to Arnold's study for the most important step of all. Oh, oh, it's you, Carl. Yeah. She, she left in the car, didn't she? I was hoping you wouldn't let her do that. Mrs. Pearson does pretty much as she chooses. Now, wait a minute, Carl. I don't Carl, mean with I... you, Mr. Pearson, with me, too. That's quite enough, Carl. You'll do well to let the matter drop right here. Forget all about it. I'll attend to my affairs in my... Carl. Carl, what are you doing with that pistol? You don't feel like what? such a big shot now, do you? I... It kind of brings you down to size, Carl, doesn't it? Carl, Carl, wait a minute. I've waited long enough. Put down that gun. Carl, have you gone crazy? <laughs> Yes, Carl. He doesn't look so big or successful or patronizing now, does he? And he didn't realize until too late that he made a fatal mistake. 
when he put you in his will. Now you'll not only get back at Amy... But what did Arnold say? You'll never want for anything as long as you live. You carefully wipe the fingerprints from Amy's pistol and hide it in her bedroom, where you know it will be found. And then you hurry back to your quarters over the garage. Yes, Carl. Amy did just as you expected, and part of the gamble is won. Now the whole plan hinges on time. <laughs> It's quiet now. Nothing but the tick of the clock on your dresser as you sit there, waiting for Amy to return. Five minutes, ten, twenty, a half hour, and still no sound of the car. Then you hear the squeal of tires as Amy swings into the driveway, and you know you've won. She pulls the car into the garage. The door slammed, and you hear Amy's quick footsteps receding up the drive toward the house. In a half minute, you're into the garage, and those swift, sure fingers of yours are setting the speedometer back to the mileage reading it showed when you brought the car back from the service station this afternoon. Yes, that's the heart of the plan, isn't it, Carl? It begins to add up now. Those little black figures on the speedometer plus the mileage record at the service station, will give the police one unmistakable deadly fact. That regardless of what Amy says about driving alone on the highway at the time of her husband's murder, the speedometer will show that the car had not been taken from the garage. More waiting now, Carl. More pacing back and forth in your little room over the garage. Expecting any minute to hear the scream that's sure to come when Amy discovers her husband's body. But it doesn't come. There's no sound from the house. You wonder. Then begin to be afraid. And then decide Amy simply hasn't gone into the study. Finally, at long last, you see Martha coming around the corner from the bus stop, back from the matinee. You brace yourself. It'll only be a moment now. Carl! Carl, open up! Just a minute. What's the matter? Oh, Carl, Carl, it's terrible. Here, here, sit down. No. What's the matter? Oh, I can't, I can't believe it. That awful, awful Get a hold of yourself, Martha. What are you talking about? Mr. Pearson's dead. She killed him. What? Oh, I knew it had happened sooner or later. That vicious temper of hers. Oh, she's a devil. Where is he? In his study on the floor. Mrs. Pearson's in her room. I don't think she heard me. She's packing, packing her things. I, I can't believe it. Oh, Carl, we've got to do something. I won't go back into that house. I'm afraid of her. Oh, I should have warned him. I knew it had happened. I knew it. Here, just a minute, Martha. Operator. Operator, give me the police. Hurry! <laughs> It's working even better than you planned, isn't it, Carl? Martha discovering Arnold. And best of all, Amy, caught in the act of packing to go away. She must have decided to do that during her wild drive. Realized it was all over with Arnold. That this quarrel was the last one. But who'll believe that story, Carl? It's so fantastic you can hardly believe it yourself. As the police car slides into the drive, the two of you run out to meet it, and you wisely decide to let Martha do most of the talking. Still up there, Inspector, in her room, cold-bloodedly packing to go away. She was there when I came in and found Mr. Pearson. Carl had come home just before I did, Isn't and that I... correct? Yes, sir. I had taken the car to be lubricated. Of course, as soon as Martha told me, I called headquarters. I see... She doesn't know either of you two are here, eh? I went in the back door, sir. I'm sure she didn't hear me. How do you know she's packing? Her door was partly open as I sneaked down the hall past her room after I found Mr. Pierce. Why didn't you tell her about it? I was afraid she'd turn on me, sir. Oh, she's a devil, that one. The quarrels I've seen in sets of the way she'd cut at poor Mr. Pierce with that vicious tongue of hers. It's a wonder it didn't happen long ago. Mm -hmm. So she bustles around in her room taking her time with her husband dead in the study. That seemed right to you, Carl? Why, uh, 
Why, it does seem odd, Inspector, That's but... putting it mildly. Mike. Yes, Chief. Take four men and cover the exits of the house. Stay here yourself till the coroner arrives. Right. Come on, you two. Let's go up to the house. It's terrible, poor Mr. Pierce. It's hard to believe that she would do it. That's what I was thinking. Those shots were fired from a small caliber gun. Does Mrs. Pearson own one? Uh, yes, she has the twenty-two. Uh-huh. Well, let's go up and see her. There's a few questions I want to ask you, Mrs. Pearson. Uh, all right, officer. You've been a little foolish, don't you think? I I have a right to do as I please in my own house. That's a rather interesting attitude at the moment. Well, I think you might explain what this is all about, why there are officers all over this place. I was about to ask you to do some explaining. Well, I haven't a thing to say. I see. Uh, Martha. Yes, Inspector. You say you were out of the house at a movie all afternoon. Uh, yes, sir. I, I just got off the bus a half hour ago and walked up to the house... Then I, I ran out to Carl's rooms over the garage. All right, Martha. And you, Carl. Yes, sir. I have been having the car lubricated. I just got back a few minutes before Martha. Then you were out with the car almost all afternoon? Yes, sir. That's, that's right. Carl! I'd be careful about what I said if I were you, Mrs. Pearson. Carl! What did you say? I said I was out with the car all afternoon. I had it greased and brought it straight home. Nothing wrong with that. Is there, Mrs. Pearson? I... I, I don't know what to... Inspector, if there's any question, you can check the mileage on the speedometer. Hey, keep a record at the station. That's an idea. Now, Mrs. Pearson? I... It, uh, of course, yes. Yes, of course Carl's telling the truth. He was out in the car. I've been here all afternoon. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, here are some facts I think you'll be interested in. You know, of course, the vital role that independent businessmen played in the building of America. And you know that today, more and more men are expressing a desire to get into business for themselves. But did you know that our sponsor, Signal Oil Company, has for over 15 years sold its products only through independent businessmen? Substantial, responsible men who are so earnest about their business of serving the motoring public that they're willing to invest their own money in it. Naturally, Signal dealers are carefully chosen for their ability and integrity which explains why so many dealers have been with Signal Oil Company ever since the beginning, 15 years ago. No wonder you find more conscientious, experienced men operating Signal stations. And no wonder Signal dealers, with an incentive to build their own business, naturally give your car more thorough service that does help it run better and last longer. And now back to the Whistler. Well, Carl, that stopped you, didn't it? There were so many elements in the plan you couldn't calculate. Things you had to gamble on and win. Yet here in the final moment when you expect Amy to explode in a rage, to accuse you of lying... And to finally go down to the feet before the cold, accurate figures on the speedometer, she calmly tells the inspector that it's all true. That you and not she were in the car. So it wasn't necessary. All the careful planning, the manipulation of the speedometer to destroy her alibi, the mileage record, the contrived quarrel, all of it was useless. And you stand there bewildered waiting for the inspector to speak. Well, Mrs. Pearson... I hardly expected it to be that simple. You understand, of course, that you're under arrest for suspicion of murder. Murder? 
are you talking about? Your husband. Arnold? What do you mean, murder? He's still right where you left him, Mrs. Pearson. On the floor of his study. I don't know anything about it. On your own admission, you and he were alone here in the house at the time of the killing. That's good enough for me. And I think it'll be good enough for the jury. So it finally worked, Carl. And you can let down a little now. It was hard to believe, of course. The way Amy talked herself right into the trap. But she said it, and it's on the record, and you try to tell yourself you could never understand her anyway. You try to relax alone in your room, but deep inside there's a strange feeling that something's wrong, that it isn't over yet. An hour later, you're startled by a knock at your door. Carl. Where is she? Down at headquarters. Yeah. Carl, you probably realize that we know about your prison record. Yeah, yeah, of course. What's that got to do with it? I got a phone call a few minutes ago. It knocked me off my pin. I don't know what you mean. Carl, you're sure you were in that car this afternoon? Oh, no, I told you. You could check with the service station. We did. We checked. You drove straight home? Yeah, the speedometer. You checked that, too. Went over the whole car, as a matter of fact. The whole car? So you drove straight home, Carl. Past the corner of 89th and Fowler. Uh Uh-huh. That's the usual route, isn't it? Yeah. License number checks, too. Only one thing, the... Witness wasn't sure, but he thought a woman was driving. Oh, now listen, listen. If you think Mrs. Pearson was out in that car, you're wrong. I ought to know. It is the station man. Backs me up. Yeah, uh, just because some screwy witness thinks he's... All right, Carl. I... That's all I wanted to know. Uh. What made you think you could get away with it? Huh? You serious, you know. With that record of yours, you'll go up for the rest of your life in this state. What are you talking about? Manslaughter, Carl. Hit and run. That man you ran down at 89th and Fowler this afternoon died two hours ago. signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 9, brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, who have asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. (laughs) 